Welcome to Persona 4 and Persona 4 Golden. Released on PlayStation 2, PlayStation Vita, PC, and now coming to all modern consoles. Written and directed by Katsura Hashino, with writings from Yuichiro Tanaka and Akira Kawasaki. Composed by Shoji Meguro, with character designs from Shigenori Sojima. Developed by Atlas, and based on the ideas of the psychologist Carl Jung. With heavy emphasis to Japanese history, Shinto Buddhist tradition, and myth. Persona 4 Golden, after the following research, broadened my lens for grasping context and truth itself. It helped me delve into cultures and history outside my own and help conceptualize ideas in ways that I never could have before. Debatably more so than that even, though, it helped me conceptualize my own past and the essence of time. This analysis intends to look at the character arcs, themes, plot, mythology, etc, etc of every character in Persona 4 and Persona 4 Golden. However, in order to keep a somewhat objective scope of things, we will not be acknowledging some contradictory or questionably canon material that is outside of that. We won't be covering any of the other spin-off video games, any of the anime, etc. This is primarily due to the fact that the people who wrote Persona 4 and Persona 4 Golden are never all working on any of the spin-offs that have ever been produced. This writing inconsistency can understandably lead to things not being quite up to quality standards in most cases, leading to contradictory character moments or characterization issues. This will obviously cause issues in terms of understanding these characters in Persona 4 Golden, as people who didn't even work on the game would then be informing the interpretation of who they are. I hope that you'll understand why I'm not deciding to cover these things, however, if you personally do or don't consider other parts of the Persona 4 multiverse canon, that's up to you. I just want to present what is possible here, and let's get into it. The story of Persona 4 focuses itself, with more integrity than perhaps any other game I've ever seen, on the mythos surrounding Japan's creation and folk history. Fitting of the small town stuck in the past nature, everything from the personas to the fictional locale to the antagonists all feed into information and build on ideas found through the Kojiki, Nihon Shoki, and Ise Naru with striking consistency, while still finding ways to tie these stories to the modern struggles and conventions of its cast and and everlasting message. In this segment, I am going to now analyze how Persona 4 pulls this off in detail, focusing on the plot, narrative, themes, and mythology, giving as little game summary as I think is comfortable to get to know these connections that are present. I think it's important to introduce the characters at play and setting first and foremost to give an idea of things in Persona 4. Persona-wise, the player character is Izanagi, part of two who helped create Japan and create the flood of gods that inhabit it today. I'll go into the pieces of his legend as they become relevant to the story. Upon the original return from Yomotsu Hirasaka, the Underworld, he sought purification, and during the purification process, from washing his body, gave birth to so many more gods. A few of so being Suzano, Amaterasu, and slightly differently, a god of purification itself, Haraedo no Okami. These, of course, are the ultimate personas of Yosuke, Yukiko, and Chie as we know them. They did not awaken to their personas and grow except through him taking them to the TV world, and so, as he literally takes the leadership of the investigation team, he also takes the metaphorical and mythological role bringing them into being as the original god he stands for did. The setting of Inaba does not take place in real-life modern Inaba, Japan, though. It's instead based on a mythical town outside Mount Fuji, to be specific, the Reiseki and Nakayama mountain in myth. In real life, Inaba is based on the Isawa Onsen Station and area of Fuefuki City in Yamanashi Prefecture. This includes the said station, as well as the main shopping street, the shrine, and floodplain all featured in Inaba. Okina Station as well. This is the real-life Inaba of Persona 4. The name of Inaba itself comes from a mixture of both the Isega Naru and Kojiki versions of the story, The Hair of Inaba, which gives name and context to the entire area. The Hair of Inaba in the Kojiki is about a trickster rabbit that, after having his fur bitten off by an alligator, runs into 80 brothers who are all seeking to attempt the princess's hand in marriage. 
An 81st brother, who tagged far along and far behind under the weight of his brother's luggage, also moved en route under their command. The first 80 brothers convinced the rabbit to roll in salt water and dry himself in the cold, harsh winds of the mountains, greatly hurting and disturbing the rabbit for their enjoyment. When the 80 brothers had moved on, and the youngest brother stumbled across along the path, the youngest brother gave good advice to the rabbit, and the rabbit recovers. From there, the rabbit reveals himself to actually have been a god, and sets his youngest brother up to marry the princess. This boy became known as Okuinushi, descendant of Suzano. The 80 brothers with their descendants' blood are actually all forms of weak gods due to their lineage, and so Yaso Inaba, or Yasogami Hai, refers to all of them. The kanji making up Yaso refers to 80, and Gami refers to gods. Yasogami Hai, then, is literally the high school of the 80 gods. Tying it back to this myth, an additional tenuous connection could also be made that since the people we know in Persona 4 who go to Yasogami High are descendants in Ego, or Persona, of the gods, who due to Suzano's connection with Izanagi makes them all technically the same descendancy, like the Yasogami. There's still more ways the story plays into the hair of Inaba though, and they're much more significant than what we've covered so far, so we'll get into that. The first kidnapped person by Namatame was Yukiko, or Amaterasu, and the result of pursuing Namatame as the kidnapper led them to realize the truth and face the real villain as well in Persona 4. I mention this because Namatame is the hare of Inaba. He's the rabbit. Upon tricking the public, the sharks, he was discovered for his adultery and had his skin bitten off. But going to the Isegan Naru version of the story of the hare now, that story describes the hare as biting the clothes of Amaterasu and taking her away through the mountains to a plain up on high, alongside her entourage of gods and men following her. It was Yukiko's kidnapping that caused the investigation team to properly understand their mission and pursue the rabbit Namatame. Along the way, their entourage contains both gods and men, historical figures like Naoto's ultimate personas and kanjis, as well as previously mentioned gods of other crew members. This mountain plain that they rest at is the Isega Naru, the mountain plain up on high. Only after traveling the land are they able to see the land from now up on high and confront their answer. Namatame's truck as well, the Inaba Kyubin, or the Inaba Town Express Delivery Service, has a white hair on it to drive home that Namatame is indeed the hair of Inaba. Late in the game, you convincing the group to hear him out also can be analogous to the 81st brother coming to the rabbit's aid while the others surround it with varying levels of hostility. The fact that Yosuke in particular wants to throw the rabbit in, and that Yosuke specifically is Suzano, also connects him to the ego of the Yasogami in the original myth more strongly. So that's the hair of Inaba and how it ties into the mythology of the setting and central plot. This is only a side bit though, the actual story is a retelling of the myth started in the Kojiki, the story of Izanami and Izanagi. I already mentioned how the original starting cast directly tie into Izanagi in a relevant way, but I haven't really expanded upon that much more. As you probably know, Izanami is the game's main antagonist, and the one truly pulling the strings in Persona 4 Golden. The game even sort of reminds you of the story in a tongue-in-cheek way by having Edogawa give you the general summary on the Persona 3 trip. And his choice wording in some places I'll be referring back to in a moment as I give my own account of the story with details I believe are important from the Kojiki. Here's what I believe you need to know about the story. Izanami and Izanagi, in love, and great gods of Japan, give birth to the fire god Kagatsuchi. Kagatsuchi slays Izanami, and in vengeance, Izanagi takes the blade of Totsuka and slays Kagatsuchi into eight pieces. These pieces form gods of their own, although not linked to the consciousness of the original whole. From the blood was born Take Mikazuchi, Kanji's original persona, who I talked about in their own segment. The Blade of Totsuka, as I've mentioned elsewhere, is also available in Persona 4 Golden. It's the sword that you recover off the Reaper and is similarly Yu Narukami's ultimate weapon, just like Izanagi. After slaying Kagatsuchi, Izanagi wishes to go to the land of Yomi, or the place of the dead, the underworld, in order to bring Izanami back. Going on his journey, he enters the underworld to meet her again. The larger path of the underworld is Yomotsu Hirasaka, the name of the final dungeon location in the game. Once he gets to Izanami, she tells him in the dark that she will negotiate with the god of the underworld to come back to life. 
so Izanagi starts to leave. But despite her insistence, becomes curious as to what Izanami looks like, wanting to see his loved one alive again. She asks that he cast his eyes away from the truth, but instead, he lights his comb ablaze and sees her dead body covered in maggots, rotting. Izanami is so embarrassed and outraged at Izanagi, choosing not to avoid the cruel truth of reality, that she chases him out of Yomotsu Hirasaka with some demons that I mentioned in Chie segment, and eventually leaves a vengeful curse on the world, as Edogawa even mentioned. So, for the parallels. Similarly, when Izanami exposes herself to the player, she seemingly has bandages wrapping around her, seeming clean and proper, before a later phase exposes her rotting self in similar form. A common move that she uses during her fight as well is Vengeful Curse, a reference to her actions as Izanagi left. Near the end of the fight, she starts to use a scripted move, Thousand Curses, which slowly removes all of your party from you, presumably killing them or dragging them down into the land of the dead. This is a reference to Izanami's claim that her curse will take 1,000 human souls every day as part of her curse, and Izanagi responds that if that is so, then he will produce 1,500 to sustain humanity's growth. In the myth, Izanagi sets his comb ablaze for light. This comb is the one that Marie has and struggles to recall the memory of in her own link, and she is part of Izanami like the Sagiri, She's Izanagi's ego, the positive reflection, and the want to grow. Some things Edogawa mentioned specifically is the travel to the land of Yomi, and he specifically words the underworld in that it is a land of shadows, which is of course no coincidence, as within the shadow world of the human subconscious, Yomotsu Hirasaka makes appearance in the game. The shadow version of Yomotsu Hirasaka is of course only possible to exist in the Land of Shadows currently, because Izanami exists as a shadow. She is cognition, an idea conjured by human archetype, and lacks an ego to properly pull her powers into reality, being why she has to go about it in such a convoluted way with the Sagiris and Marie. Going with the general themes of Persona games, the aim of the antagonist god position is to test humanity. They have their idea about who or what or why mankind is, and now you, being selected as the fool, must disprove this belief and rend from whatever subconscious being affronting you's idea of humanity is, giving people the ability to face life with the possibility in their own hands. The god Izanami, then, represents the fog, or the aversion to truth, the willingness for stagnation and the desire of mankind not to confront the harsh realities that face them. This comes from a part of the tale where Izanagi, despite the horrible possibilities that could lay in the darkness, chose to light his comb anyways and see the decaying lover in the dark, having to face what she truly was, that she was truly dead. She, even after being dead, failed to accept her appearance and tried to guide Izanagi not to as well. And now, when he fails to, she aggresses directly toward him. You, as the player, are then also tasked with reaching out to the truth to prove to whatever being may be watching that humans are powerful enough that they can be left to their own devices to seek or deny truth, that it is a moral good to give them that option. You prove your ideals by beating her, but you see this behavior throughout the game as well. Izanami tries to send things your way that make you doubtful of the pursuit of truth, the purpose or virtue of it, or even making you doubt what it even is. From Adachi's bait-and-switch definitions, to the cruel truths of Mitsuo Kubo, to the disasters led by uncritical belief in truth like Namatame, the amount of times that you feel led to a dead end, and even an appeal to the masses. Izanami attempts to make many arguments throughout the game, convincing you not to look, not to continue searching, but after you have pressed her again and again, at the end of the game, she feels she no longer has any choice but to aggress you directly. She realizes that while you live, you will not stop questioning, seeking, and understanding. The full theme overview will be covered in its own segment near the end, but for now, this is the mythological and thematic analysis of the things Persona 4 Golden presents the player. Now then, let's talk about the actual, literal story and how it's told, the decisions made, and how they contribute to the narrative. Persona 4 Golden starts with you, a popular city boy, getting sent to the country with your uncle and his daughter for the next year. Something that Persona 4 initially does to set up the feeling of the small town is by having introductory cutscenes that show the characters walking home from school. 
Probably due to monotony, they cut the more specific residential cutscenes once the message is sent, but you get the idea of this not quite backwards, but a little stuck in the past town, surviving on its own, but facing difficulty acclimating to the new century. With Juness, the Walmart equivalent, moving in and uprooting many long-handled businesses, and with the shrine falling into low usage, the town starts reaching on to some sort of stagnation. Upon arriving, the death of Mayumi Yamano and Saki Konishi happen back to back and almost out of nowhere. There's a bustle and concern from everyone. There's a morbid sense of excitement that the people are waiting for. This kind of gossip, of discussion, bring people into an energy rather than or in conjunction with the horror that it is. You even see this with things like Yosuke's character arc, as after the Midnight Channel rumor has happened, the initial three stumble their way into the personas of the Shadow World. Persona 4's intro is definitely long for getting into the action. Things are pretty much entirely on the rails for the first hour and a half if the person is actually reading, listening, and taking their time as intended. Then, the game doesn't even properly open up until another hour or so when Yukiko's dungeon is in full force. This is definitely one of the weakest points of the game, but for a heavily story and character focused game that's going to sit you through a medium paced 70 to 80 hours or so, this is comparatively reasonable for an opening. Yosuke's Awakening, gameplay wise, is really well handled, in its preciseness for the gameplay. They give you one tutorial fight that lets you understand the central mechanic of normal versus weak attacks and make sure that you can use the one more system before throwing you into a boss fight and accustoming you to the guard system, explaining non-fatally that bosses will normally have extremely powerful attacks that you will have to watch for tells and prepare for, most easily with guarding. In two fairly straightforward fights that are neither too short nor irritatingly long, it manages to give you an idea of all the system's mechanics for fighting that you can slowly expand on with your own curiosity later. Later is once you're in Yukiko's dungeon. Briefly after obtaining your first couple demons, you'll be introduced to fusion, so the way that the game dulls out things on a gameplay perspective is fairly well paced, I think. The biggest thing that makes it take a while is the added amount of characterization lines that add very little to the story, or even of the characterization, and for players who may not find the immediate cast's personalities palatable for them personally, they may feel turned off to Persona 4. I think that's the biggest risk with the game, considering Yosuke, Chie, and Yukiko by far have the most defined and prominent flaws of the central cast in terms of negative traits. Still, facing yourself or facing the truth, understanding yourself and reality as is instead of how you want to perceive it as, and how that ultimately leads you to be the most empathetic, understanding, and rational, practical person you can be, is clearly laid out as the central goal of the game. The first few dungeons serve a general purpose of endearing you slowly to the cast, while they deal with the forward and backward momentum of solving the case while being in a position of seemingly helpless ignorance. Still, each dungeon does do something significant for the central narrative. From Yukiko, they learn how to spot a victim before their kidnapping and rescue them. They deduce women who show up on the TV and are connected to the other previous victims are the people that are targeted. With Kanji, they rule out the women part of their theory, but connect the TV and victim connection angle, this time trying to warn Kanji beforehand, but failing to get through to him. Next is Rise, which they fall back on their theory with again, now with the victims seemingly having no connections after all, and just being a coincidence. They ascertain that victims who appear, whose names and faces are recently broadcast on TV, is actually how they're being targeted. This time, they also get closer, and are able to genuinely warn the person about the possible oncoming danger before the act happens. But while they are able to improve themselves in both criteria and action to get through to her, it does little to help. Each dungeon, each attempt, causes them to form and readjust their theory, taking one step closer to the truth, and getting one step better at preventive measures. But you also see the occasional frustration, as it seems every time they narrow the idea, it gets disproved, and they get back to where they started on some regard, and remain lost in the dark. This is an intentional aspect of the main narrative of the story, though. It's part of the pressure that Izanami is putting on to see if humans will give up the truth whenever it seems unattainable. Seeing humans struggle with their unattainable truth, seeing if they will give up. Showing no signs of slowing down, she sends the message through other Teddy, about how the truth may be grasped at, but the grasper will have no means of seeing it as truth. They push past this and are faced with something completely new, Mitsuo Kubo, claiming he is a murderer and egging them on. 
there is an unsettling bit of the game after this point where the team is unsure if they even caught the right culprit and they just have to wait for the police's decision. Every free day after retrieving Mitsul, the game badgers you about having to wait until the police are done now. It is meant to send the investigation team into a forced standstill, a place where they momentarily have to just fester and deal with things, unable to search further for the truth. Will they give in to complacency and feel content with their hollow victory? Will they take this convenient truth as reality? Something that ended up trapping Namatame, and something Adachi claims that you are actually in later on? No. The investigation team is still skeptical, so Naoto makes herself an intentional target, so hopefully they can ascertain a greater method and information of the killer. Naoto's sacrifice reveals, again, less than they hoped. But they did get some things. They ascertained it is a kidnapper, presumably one person. Someone strong, almost certainly a man, and someone with a TV within a short distance. This is a lot of information, but nothing as concrete as they hoped. Before the next arc with Nanako, you receive a letter that Dojima sees and takes you away to question you on. This is a result of one of two things depending on how the player has made their decisions in the game. If you played a certain way, this is the only thing that you hadn't been honest about in the game, and in your mind with good reason. It also drives into Dojima's character arc with difficulty facing the hard truth about his wife's death. This lack of willingness to be open, critical, but intentional in searching for the truth creates some lack of trust which renders you briefly ineffective as when Nanako is kidnapped. The game's narrative is punishing any semblance of untruthfulness in terms of taking actions to seek the truth directly. At this time, the investigation team finally comes to a conclusion as to how the killer abducts people, and a correct one at that. But even having the truth over this is rendered as a sort of too late, because they made the assumption that a face needed to be shown earlier in the game on TV to make a culprit. When the voice, the idea, the perspective, and the identity being known around town was the actual prerequisite. Well, how are they supposed to know? They weren't, but had they been more cautious, theoretically they could have been ready to prevent it, especially with the info they gathered. From here, you face Namatame, but are surprised to see the dwarf Ame no Kuni instead. They challenge the player and the characters, the needs and wants of mankind, but you don't avert your eyes from the truth. You cast through the lie and destroy one arm of Izanami's reach lashing back against the people who enjoy truth and speak as if they embrace it while truthfully not searching critically outside of themselves to find an answer. Namatame is still seen as the presumed killer, and in a fit of rage, Yosuke sees what makes sense. Others as well, but probably Yosuke most prominently, since he takes the most argumentative role against the player. As I mentioned, this is probably a reference again to the hair of Inaba. At this point, the first seeming climax of the story is happening. One could see the intro through Risei's dungeon as a sort of exposition, and then the rising action being from Mitsuo to Nanako, then the results of Nanako's dungeon to the exposing and facing of Adachi as the first climax. Here, you convince the party to put aside their valid feelings because while they are feeling justified, they can't seek the truth if they allow even the feelings as strong as the death of a child to blind their ability to understand what happened fully. If you fail to reach out to the truth here, you get a bad ending. Nanako dies in the hospital, Teddy never returns, and the fog remains. Game over. You also essentially end the game, killing an innocent, well-meaning man, shaken by months of anxiety, trauma, and confusion just to make yourself feel better. It's a pretty brutal game over. If you do shake them out of it, though, if you are able to eventually bring Namatame to his senses and understand his role in things, that he is not the killer, but was under confusion as to how the TV world operated, having never gone in himself until with Nanako, I mentioned earlier the parallels of this in the Haravinaba story and how Namatame is the Haravinaba and how he guides Amaterasu's entourage to the top of the mountain, where they can then seek out a new truth, but here it's also likely a double meaning as a red herring. Now, I'm not sure if you know this, but a red herring is actually a fish, not a rabbit. But the wordplay is commonly interrelated, and used modernly and commonly to represent a rabbit anyways in other languages. Like Japan, who has taken much of Western culture, phraseology, and even straight-up words in the past few decades. 
The confrontation next is with the true killer, Adachi, who offers the fourth major challenge in the party's ideology the fourth major attempt by Izanami to get Izanagi to look away. The player defeats Adachi, who is revealed, like Namatame, to be fueled with another aspect of Izanami, Ame no Sagiri, the Will of the Heavens, Heaven's First Fog, who again presses the player on their beliefs, which I go into more again in their own segment. After Adachi, if you're going to get the true ending, you must face the last dwarf of Izanami, the Ego, without the memory, Kusumi no Okami, or Marie, who you meet at the very beginning of the game, and in order to access this, must have been helping seek her true self throughout the game. It's funny that the method of her seeking the truth is in recovering the meaning of the comb as well, since the comb is what allowed Izanagi to see the truth in the original myth. After rescuing Marie from herself, allowing her to grow and move forward as her own person, you are able to set up things as if to end the game. You can end here too, pretty easily. If you choose to return home, you can leave happily. The true culprit is killed after all, right? But the true culprit isn't the biggest issue in need of solving. It isn't the murderer that is the greatest damage to Inaba, it is the mentality that breeds that kind of murderer. A mentality that left unchallenged will simply find a replacement for the true culprit, and so you go to fight the originator of this horrible mentality, this mentality of subjective perspective above all else. On perspective of calling your uncritical experience the truth with no regard for contradicting evidence. You insist again and again until Izanami eventually reveals herself and finally realizes her only way to stop your pursuit is to prove her ideal of avoidance better by challenging you face to face. It also makes thematic sense that someone so averse to facing the truth would do everything at hand to avoid facing their problem until they could no longer be denied. Her agreement to face you, though, in and of itself, is a way of admittance and defeat, but perhaps she just believes that her place as a god sometimes allows her to face the truth when needed, and it is just humans who are better without. Izanagi and Izanami have the reunitance of centuries, almost as an unofficial sequel to the original Kojiki myth, and again, directly opposed this time, Izanagi defeats Izanami with the truth. He throws off his glasses before committing it, something that the characters have worn due to the fogginess of the Shadow World. In this moment, the player is at a point where they no longer need tools to see through the lies of reality. They are at grips with themselves and can see through and obtain the truth of their own faculties. The fog, the lies, obstruct their view no longer. So the fog is vanquished, the fool gains the power of the world, and humanity again proves itself more powerful strong enough to conquer the faults that some people find themselves drawn to in society. That's the story of Persona 4, keeping in mind narrative progression and detail. I think due to the many scenes with characters getting to know each other and many dungeons early on that despite giving greater insight to the case, never really reach huge breakthroughs, one would be tempted to say that the game doesn't really ramp up until the end. But I think this is fault of not reading or really understanding what the story is trying to do. The constant back and forth, the perseverance under failure, the continued attempt to no matter the seeming hopelessness or unsolvable nature of the case, that is exactly what it takes to reach out to the truth. And life isn't measured in single moments, where suddenly huge breakthroughs are made, but often in the ways that we piece together and understand small aspects of life as they come into our being. They are no less important, but they take more work, and are more gradual. They allow us to build a picture, to see reality. I was wondering if you could kind of give your impression of the soundtrack as a whole, kind of the vibes that it gives, time period, feeling, themes, how it might tie into the game. Yeah, so I um, I think that I'm going to say some stuff that everyone else has said, unfortunately, <laughs> about Persona's music, which is very poppy. Um, and I think that that really aids the series because it goes for this really kind of saccharine, sickly sweet like shades of yellow and i think that that's pretty well um represented in the music as well mm -hmm. you can see this in a whole bunch of places in the like electronic aspects of the music but um if you listen to the percussion there's a lot of tracks that have tambourine hits which are very like poppy idly um i know that a lot of like city pop stuff has or originated from uh from the inaka like over in the countryside so that's another aspect of it because the country the uh whole game kind of takes place in this slow countryside where the murder mysteries are happening and all that like in terms of time period 
uh, that you're going to hear a lot is in the mixing and mastering, and especially like with the sound capabilities of these older systems. It's a little bit um, like sh more shrill, kind of on the higher end, mm -hmm. uh, lacks body. If you listen to the, the percussion, again, a, a lot of this stuff that like dates things and points towards a uh, genre defining stuff you'll hear a lot of that in the in the percussion and rhythm sections but yeah, it's uh like super if you listen to sounding and yeah. everything <laughs> yeah it's super synthetic and then if you listen to like the bass drum or the toms or something the timbre and the the like pitch of it are quite high um there's not a lot of tracks that have an actual like bass to them which is uh cool when there actually is something like that uh what aspects do you think like cause this sort of because i mean obviously the whole inaka and city pop and bringing back to this sort of feeling of the past and of nostalgia um what do you think like specifically kind of whether it be like notes or melody or whatever it may be kind of invokes that kind of feeling that feeling of like this sort of I don't know, homey? I, it's like a hominess? I, I don't know how to mm -hmm. exactly put it. Yeah, that's a good question. In some tracks, emphasis on minor chords uh, could aid that because you have that kind of melancholy wistfulness to it. Mm -hmm. uh, that kind of like longful thinking, if you will. I know we're going to talk about this in a bit, but the, the P4G opener, if you look at like the harmonica, that's kind of a more folk style instrument, right? And I think that folk style instruments are a lot more grounded and a lot more um generally speaking a lot of people will view them more human in a way like outside of the realm of like quote-unquote art music or something like that and mm -hmm. i think that that's common throughout the score from from folk music to art music it's more in the uh, folk music camp not the genre I, I guess like it goes with the lyrics and stuff too like a lot of that sort of uh kind of prodding along long held notes and like yeah. um like the lyrics even like heartbeat heartbreak and signs of love and everything it has this poppy feeling to it but there's sort of like a it's in a place of like distance it's in a place of like this sort of melancholy um right but yeah. mixing and it I in with that... those more city pop aesthetics no yeah it's it's exactly that feeling it's kind of that that longing for times past and like uh simpler times in a way and even like the colors and aesthetics call back to like the 60s and the 80s and stuff like that yeah with yeah, the really exactly. bright colors and even like peace signs and stuff like that yeah and again you don't need to look any further than the drums like the percussion is very very uh kind of old school and going back in time and then the synths too aren't aren't nearly as like complex or high fidelity as what we have these days and so it is kind of a relic of older times. And uh, you did ask a question of, of like what separates it, what gives it that kind of separation. Um, I would argue a lot of that is is not a lot of it, but there's a portion of it that has to do with the mixing and mastering and what causes it to be so like high register mm -hmm. is also what would cause kind of a disconnect. It's it's like it's like when you play a video game and it has an ice level. Mm -hmm. It does a similar thing with the mixing as there where it's kind of um, focusing a lot on these higher frequencies or higher range. Most people who have played through Persona 4 Golden probably have a rough idea for how the Midnight Channel works, or at least you'd think so. But if you were to ask them, I doubt that they would be able to give a detailed account of what it actually portrays through its dungeons without at some point contradicting themselves. So before I talk about the ways that different dungeons inform the characters presented therein, I think it's important to take a look at how the Midnight Channel works and how it's portrayed in this game. Persona 4 Golden is obsessed with the idea of truth. That much is not controversial at all. Understanding and seeking it, and as a central plot point of finding the killer is linked to the murder method, that is, the supernatural TV world, getting a grasp on how it works is an important, albeit not necessary, element of the story and for the player. In the same way that the main cast is constantly fed incorrect ideas about who the suspect could be, or even being wrong multiple times about their own criteria and conclusions of someone being pursued by the killer, it makes sense then that their theories about different things pertaining to the TV world also end up being contradicted repeatedly. 
One idea is that the people are viewing the Midnight Channel and the events within, something brought up by the cheering of an early dungeon crowd, but due to the fact that no one seems to recognize the protagonist at school afterwards, it makes it pretty much dropped by the cast. It's fair to say that the Midnight Channel doesn't go on air the entire time you're inside of it, but does just merely show who the victim is, where they are, and a general idea of them. But what is that idea of them? A secondary view of the dungeons and the shadows within are, of course, the repressed desires and insecurities of the self that is denied by the host's ego, therefore creating a shadow. This is the general understanding of shadows through most of the game, and is mostly how the game presents the characters, albeit not entirely. A second view that is addressed within the game is that, after gaining fame on the TV, a shadow is in fact the perverted perception of the masses seeing the host on the television screen, and so it is another yet false version of the self. The shadow is, therein, not entirely the person's rejected ego, but is, in fact, partially the creation of the false interpretations of the masses, their perception. It seems obvious at first that the first idea is what defines a shadow and dungeon's action in design, but it is brought up by Teddy once he observes the Midnight Channel for himself that there may be some credence to the second idea more than the first. Now I know exactly what's happening and it's all but confirmed by the Midnight Channel event, where the investigation team falsely believe that they see Namatame's true thoughts expressed on the TV, when in fact it was just the reflection of their view of him, rather than anything replicated from him. It is then driven in again by a dachi controlled by Amino Sagiri, and just the Sagiri itself, that the world of shadows, shadows which occupy the subconscious of all mankind's ego, are the ones who make, take, and control the TV world's perceptions to fit the appeal and interpretation of the masses. Well, if it is the case, though, it seems to undermine the earlier parts of the game, does it not? If you're not clear on what I'm saying. This basically says that our idea of the shadow being this part of ourselves we reject and put down is not actually technically how these are created. Well, I mean, the whole idea was that they were facing themselves, right? The parts of themselves that they denied? If you're telling me now that those parts of themselves weren't even necessarily parts they denied, then it seems kind of inconsistent. If it wasn't a true part of themselves, or the true self as they say, what's the point? Well, this is taking the information a little too plainly as well. You see, there is a common idea that there is the you of your own experiences, and the you as you are perceived through others. No man is an island, as it is said, just a part of the main. You may have your separate identity and who you are, but the who people see you as are also aspects of your identity as well, whether you like it or not. This idea is heavily represented in Persona and popular Japanese media as well. So what is a shadow? A shadow of our characters, at least. Well, they tell you what they are when you fight them. They are a shadow, the true self. But how? Well, our characters each time they face themselves are denying the flaws and problems about themselves, but they are also running away from the world that seeks to label them if their insecurity ever got out. It's also mixing that with the interpretation the public may already have of them. In other words, they are the full self, the unchecked personal self without hiding any insecurity or negative traits, combined with the interpretations of the entire general public and the interpretations that could be. They are the truest, fullest possible self. The combination of all perspectives and interpretations. The thing is though, some interpretations contradict themselves. Some aspects fight with each other. They are incongruous, and that incongruity is because they lack the ability to gain an ego. The ego is talked about a lot, from Naoto's explanation to Teddy's discovery and how he created an ego for himself. An ego, by definition, is the part of the mind that mediates between the conscious and the unconscious. It's the part that is responsible for reality testing and a sense of personal identity. In embracing all interpretations and not reality testing negative traits away, the true self lacks any personal identity, since part of what makes a personal identity is forfeit to the world of the shadow itself. What makes us us in that aspect is the ability to acknowledge how we may be seen or interpreted. 
the insecure things that we may feel about ourselves and have the mediative ability to face that true self and take the parts that we want to make the person we want to be. In other words, we can never grow and become our true self if we refuse to face the self as a whole. Facing all of these interpretations allows us to self-analyze and really look at each part of ourself, what's positive, what's negative, what does exist, but we cannot truly move on or grow past parts of ourselves that we are not willing to face, nor can we just ignore the perceptions of others and pretend like they aren't there. I hope this wasn't too heady. I wouldn't blame you if you needed to rewind or slow it down, but this is fundamentally what is happening in Persona 4 Golden with full clarity as described by the characters and by classic Jungian psychology. And Jungian psychology is the cornerstone of what all of Persona is based on anyways. So to recap and add more context, the dungeons and the shadows seen on the Midnight Channel are the combination to some extent of the host individual's denied and repressed self, as well as the mass opinions of the people who viewed the hosts on their TV appearances. How and what parts of these selves are the insecurity and personal identity, and which are the wishful interpretations of the masses, are intentionally left somewhat unclear, but if you do the social links for these characters as well as hear them out in the game and listen to what they have to say, you can form a clear idea of what pieces of them inside the TV was genuine, part of their real selves. You have to, in other words, seek them out and listen to find the truth, which of course lays into the main theme of the game perfectly. I've honestly never seen people go in depth on how the Midnight Channel works, and the effort that the writers put into actively feeding false conclusions to the investigation team that contradict themselves throughout the game and dismiss their own conclusions, it's honestly super interesting and cool. While I don't think it's super important to the central idea to get everything right about the Midnight Channel, I think most people get a general idea even if they don't know the details, it still gets it across. I think finding exactly how the game operates is part of reaching out to the truth, of fulfilling the point of the game. And so now I hope you can see the answer in front of you, without the glasses. Anyways, now that I have organized the way that the Midnight Channel works here, it will be much easier to talk about this aspect without being redundant when I cover the character subjects of these dungeons in future segments. Yosuke Hanamura, your partner, the idea man, and the first social bond you form in Persona 4 Golden. Yosuke generally has a lot higher scrutiny on him than the average character from Persona 4 Golden in the West. However, in a Persona livestream from 2015, apparently he was actually the most popular character with Japanese audiences. Regardless of anyone's stance on him though today, I want to intend to give him the fullest analysis of his character possible taking all parts of his actions and appearances in Persona 4 Golden to really understand who is Yosuke on a meta level, on a character level, and as a person. Yosuke is the idea guy of the investigation team as I mentioned, the planner, the person who's willing to take action. When we meet him, he is Inaba's previously most recent transfer student, and his feelings toward himself and Inaba are very much reflected in his sudden move from the city. He normally is the level-headed one, trying to look at all the situations reasonably, and only really falls out of this mindset when his emotions, hopes, and expectations take a hold of him. Take why he's even in there in the first place. The manager's son of a branch at Juness, it is mentioned that he had to move because he can't control where he goes as a teenager, living under his dad and parents' roof in general, after all. Even then, with his dad in such a high-ranking position, his dad doesn't spoil him with money, but instead relies on him as a key management staffing role at Juness, being responsible for attending morning meetings as mentioned at the Halloween scene, and often having other workers use him as their mediary as seen in his social link. On top of that, Juness's role in destroying the local economy causes the older generations and some younger students to dislike him being there at the school and in Inaba at all, and see him as some sort of intruder or virus. Still, even with all these things, who smiles, takes things carefree, and does his best holding it together? Yosuke. Shigenori Sojima, the person who designed all the Persona 4 characters, stated in an interview with 1UP that when designing Yosuke, he actually gave him accessories like headphones and a bike to make him seem more out of place and city-like in Inaba. 
After coming into all the responsibilities of the move, despite all the weight and responsibility I mentioned on his shoulders, he's not one to act spitefully or generally be negative, instead trying to cop the voice of reason. Not that he always is, but at least he tries to do that. He of course does have his flaws though, that's what makes anyone a well-written character, but we'll get into that in its proper area later in the segment. For the moment, since we have an idea of who he is, what does he struggle with? Well, Yosuke is the first of three separate characters who enter your party through the game that don't have their own dedicated dungeon. Well, in some ways, this gives us less insight to draw from in regards to his mindset and insecurity, it also gives us a more honed-in, clear idea of all of the parts of himself that he's hiding. The shadow dungeon that develops relates to a combination of the people's perception, the people's desire, the people's insecurity or denied traits, and the person's feared perception. With Yosuke, Chie, and Teddy, however, there was no personal dungeon and no TV appearance on the Midnight Channel showing them either. So, the Shadow Yosuke we see is more likely to be his absolute pure inner self. Since the TV world is still compromised of the total people subconscious, however, there is still a good likelihood that one trait is exaggerated beyond Yosuke. There's a point where the Shadow Yosuke states, I know the real reason you came snooping. You didn't have a single other reason to be here. We know that Yosuke did care for Saki-senpai, so even though the validity represents how Yosuke secretly felt to an extent, this exaggeration, I believe, comes from the part of his shadow fueled by public perception. It's constantly driven home how the locals of Inaba see him as just some city kid who thinks he's too good for the country and doesn't care about them. Some city big shot who doesn't care about their business. Some spoiled child who's ruining the economy. That him and his father and anyone related to Junas is the invading force who thinks they're better than the countryside, and so it's likely that aspect that's being exaggerated here, but only slightly. Aside from that, due to the circumstances, the shadow likely is constructed entirely by his insecurity and rejected feelings. So what's exposed by Yosuke's shadow here is beyond his carefree attitude. This may be the face that's covering for a deservedness, maybe even an actual spite at the situation he finds himself in, and the people who always make his life worse in his eyes. He may act like he has it under control, he may act like everything is no big deal, but deep down, it's all, well, it's all just more effort, irritation, and garbage. He doesn't want to be a part of it. He resents Juness and his father, to some extent, for uprooting him to a place no one likes him. He resents the people of Inaba for deciding who he is and what they think of him before he has a chance to decide that for himself but he keeps smiling and putting up all the treatment because at the end of the day, he's stuck out here in the middle of nowhere with no one. And even if it's a pain, even if it's a bore, and he feels used or not cared about, being suffocated by the resentment is better than being suffocated in isolation and being completely alone. And as Shadow Yosuke says, now that he has this ability, this idea of the TV showing up, now he can't help but jump in excitement despite that tragedy that may be the best years of his youth he thought would be sucked down the drain and wasted in this crappy town. Maybe this TV thing gives him the chance to make something of himself and actually be a big shot, a hero who people rely on and praise without resenting and using him. Honestly, this is such a unique and complex struggle, and was the first point in Persona 4 that I really think the character writing started to shine. Still, this is only the Yosuke that we see at the surface level when we meet him at the beginning of the game, which is incredibly deep for such a short amount of time into the game. Aside from accepting this part of himself after the fight with his shadow, I think that it's only fair before I move on that I go into how he says he felt about this encounter. Firstly, he says that he's understandably embarrassed, and he's crinkled up in a ball, but ultimately, he thanks you. And yeah, I mean, everyone would be embarrassed to have to admit their dirty laundry and have it aired in public, but I think it also speaks to him letting his wall down, not doing what he used to do, just putting up a tough face and trying to come across as chill or cool. You kind of see this too in how he ends up calling people out later in the story for acting weird or decides to have the occasional revenge like leaving Teddy with Hanako at the fireworks festival. He's more open now in his feelings toward things around him and more willing to share when they happen to be negative. It shows some maturity from how he had been previously characterized, but I think a lot of people may not notice or pick up on this change in the first playthrough since you're still getting to really know him at this point when the change is made. Soon after, you get the Yosuke social link, which exposes him as the Magician Arcana. So let's go through and explain how his Arcana connects with his character. 
The Magician is the first in the numbered series and represents the initiation of things. The Fool is zero and the Magician is one. This obviously lines up with him being the first social link as well as the first to awaken to his persona after you. While this is significant in and of itself, I actually don't see as much other correlation between the Magician and Yosuke as some of the other characters in Persona 4 Golden. The Magician represents a transparent intelligence, a knowledge that is available to all. The magic wand that points up at the roses, and below with his finger, the power moves through him to bring the power below, normally associated with the idea of, as above, so below. We had talked about how Yosuke is the ideas man of the investigation through, someone who thoughtfully and rationally concentrates on planning, so I guess that this is where the connection is meant to be made. In his lower polarity, he also represents the traits of the trickster, which I think makes sense with some of his negative traits early in the game. Perhaps this uncomfortable and shifty moment for him is early in the game in the campout, where he tricks Kanji into leaving the tent, and also tricks Chie into verifying they would wear a swimsuit by getting them to say, if only they had one, before pulling a couple out. And also, like, what? Why would you do that under any circumstance? Buy your female friend swimsuits without knowing and pressure? Ah, definitely one of his worst moments. But it aligns with the idea of the Magician Tarot and its lower polarity, being a trickster. Since this is lower polarity and meant to represent the negative aspects of the card, though, it's something that is never as singularly bad as these initial moments in the game and decreases as the game goes on. He's also punished for it. It's not something supported by the meta narrative. In the upper polarity, how we end up seeing him through most of the story, but especially as the game hits the later point where you can theoretically have finished his social link, it represents concentration of skillful choices and still being carefree and relaxed in temperament with that concentration. Being laid back but dedicated is definitely a trait that you see with Yosuke in the game. There's also a bit about thorough concentration and never being alone, which I think is really beautiful how the writers in Persona 4 adapted that. His loneliness and isolation by being fake and not sharing his feelings was accepted, but through his focus on this new case, he was able to meet a group of friends that he could rely on forever, one that he could open up to and not be fake around. It's kind of touching when you think of his loneliness and insecure feelings of worth, finding a place to belong in both purpose and company. Looking at his persona mythology and connection, when he awakens to his persona, we get another aspect of his character to look at. And of course, that is the mythology and reason behind him getting the personas he does. In my segment on the meaning behind the ultimate personas, I explain the connection of each of them to each other in the mythological narrative. One thing about Suzano being birthed from Izanagi's nose during the purification process, alongside Amaterasu and Haredo, aka Yukiko and Chie. Since Yu's arrival to Inaba and seeing Yu's ability to enter the TV and face himself being the catalyst for the purification of the cast's inner shadows, the truest form of his persona also matches this mythology, as described in the Kamiumi. But his persona doesn't start as the ultimate form that it obviously takes later on in its other forms. Instead, it starts with Jiraiya. He's a shape-shifting ninja that uses his magic abilities to transform himself into a giant toad. And, uh, ninja? Toad? Yeah, I think that translates pretty straightforwardly into the game. He has shuriken eyes and green camouflage, aside from the giant frog feet and doing a big hop as his major attack. In the tale of Jiraiya, he meets a man named Senso Dojin, who teaches him magic of the storms, how to control the wind and the rain, which also matches with Suzano, as I'll get to in a moment. There's a story of an innocent man who is going to be hanged, to which Jiraiya approaches the magistrate in charge and claims guilt, being hanged in the innocent man's place to save his life. Then, after the hanging takes place, Jiraiya turns himself into a frog and escapes the noose, hopping off into the mountains. Jiraiya is generally portrayed as a well-intentioned and kind, self-sacrificing, but also subtle and non-confrontational person. He doesn't go and kill the magistrate, for example. Instead, he makes up a tricky lie to get himself hung instead before transforming into a frog and fleeing. This fits the trickster element of the lower polarity magician arcana but also the skillful decision-making of the higher polarity. There are a lot of small ways this connects with Yosuke, but this also could just be an archetypal form of Suzano in action. 
Since Yamato no Orochi, the eight-headed snake hydra, is killed with Amaterasu and Suzano in ancient tradition, and Tsunade and Jiraiya also fight Orochimaru, the dragon's coil and the snake, there are clear parallels between these characters and stories, although Tsunade was his wife and Amaterasu was his sister. Then again, that's not too unusual for old Japanese myths. That Tsunade is Yukiko in context of Persona 4, by the way. His evolved persona is Takehaya Suzano, or like a more formal name for what his ultimate persona becomes, Suzano. The full name is Takehaya Suzano no Mikoto, the god of the sea and storms. It makes sense that the strong winds associated with storms and agility buffs connect to Yosuke in his skills in the game. Anyways, I hope that I gained some more insight into this characters, but between Japanese mythos and tarot placement, I think it's about time we get to the in-game events, so now we'll be looking at his character arc beyond his initial transformation. The first part of his social link generally introduces you to what I covered already, which is the disdain the older people of Inaba feel toward him due to the fact that the Junas takeover has left wrecking local businesses. Still, your first time out with him is actually supporting those local businesses, buying steaks in the shopping district. This shows that even when Yosuke takes action that benefit the community and financially engages with them, it's seen as some offensive action. It reinforces the idea I alluded to earlier that he never really had a chance to leave his own impression, but instead had it cast on him first. Something else that's really important is an internal reference he has to keep note of how he has to pretend to be kind and nice to other people in his place. Even if ostracized publicly and openly, he still feels the need to keep his manners for his father's sake and for the Juness business. This is actually the exact same place and thing Naoki says about his parents' business in one of his first social links that you end up seeing me talk about in his own segment. The reason that this is special is because I think attentive people are supposed to see this parallel as a bit of foreshadowing once his link starts, because, well, I guess I'll get into that when we talk about Naoki. After that, Yosuke tries to bond with you over the city atmosphere in his next link, but instead it focuses on the spam mail that he's been getting on his phone. He talks about not wanting to change his phone, because even if he hasn't been contacted since he moves, what if somebody does contact him? He also doesn't want to inconvenience them by calling everyone who might not even care about him. The heavily implied purpose of this link is to drive home his loneliness. Even when visiting the big city, or at least the closest thing he could get to that, he feels like the city doesn't really miss him, that he was just a small piece that's drifted along without being noticed. And it's driven home by no one wanting to reach out to him and ask how he's doing. This clearly paints the loneliness more clearly for why he's putting up such brazen enthusiasm in the face of this hardship. He wants people desperately to like him, to rely on him, to come to him for help, to miss him when he's gone. The next social link is part of a set of three. They also drive the role of forced responsibility with grading lazy Juness teens who go to Yosuke and try to make him adjust their schedules, while they subtly dig at him personally. He tries to put up a brave face. Later in his social link, he sees the heathens again, but this time you have the opportunity to stand up for him and call them out. This makes him feel much more comfortable to be open with the situation and his struggles with you, and shows his growth at being a more authentic self, as he realizes that you're a real friend, and that he doesn't always have to put up fake cheeriness to avoid being alone. I mean, he had initially learned that from whenever you saw his deep down self, but I think it's still that feeling of discomfort that is slowly being eroded away. It makes him feel really appreciated when you call them out. But let's actually go back one social link, since I think it made more sense to cover all the ones with the heathens better together. The social link before this is the first time that you go to your room, and other than some guy talk and him being supportive to Nanako, he affirms to you in seriousness and dedication to the case, which reinforces his arcana of the magician, the relaxed and calm combined with the concentrated and focused. All the while since you've met Yosuke, a consistent thing that has been mentioned by others or by Yosuke himself is his link to the death of Saki-senpai. Even after learning that she didn't like him, even after facing his shadow self's traits that went for the wrong reasons, it's clear that the death weighs very heavily on his mind. 
Of the entire investigation team, Yosuke is the only one to consistently ruminate about being bothered over the real death of one of their classmates. And that's not a dig, of course. I, I mean, half of them didn't even come to Inaba until after the deaths, let alone know her, but it's clearly a big part of his character arc that is silent contemplation and grieving over her death. Starting at his rank 7 to 8, the social link finally puts his underpinning contemplation in the foreground. I think that it's smart they did this, because while getting to know him, we had an idea that this was on his mind constantly, and slowly got peaks of it as we got to learn more of what he's thinking and how he acts. Most of which we see is self-embarrassment and pity, a general self-loathing to change. He mentions how when he moved here, he did think that he was above it all, but that Saki-senpai told him parents are just parents, and he is him. He mentions how even now, after learning that she was just saying it to put up a face and be nice to him, those words still made him start to appreciate and see Inaba in a positive light. Yosuke begins crying out loud in this link, angry that she was taken from him, or really even taken from the world. Even if she didn't care about him romantically, it doesn't matter. She was the first person that made him see Inaba as the good place that he believes now it is. The fact that he will never have the closure to get or say or thank her, that she's gone due to some corrupt evil forces or mentality, it makes him mad for selfish reasons and for selfless. He mentions back to the part of himself where he faced his shadow, who was excited for the murders, but how he frames the reason behind those feelings in a bit more charitable, while well, not contradicting his shadow's words. Instead of the mocking tone calling him a hero, he puts it as him finally having a point of being in Inaba. That his lack of freedom, his living place, his job responsibility, that all of this unending judgment and loneliness wasn't for nothing that he was given something that he can do that makes him special. The resolution in his revelation to change, the change that we see in the following links. I don't want to recap things too much as the game already lays it out perfectly and clearly, so I'm actually going to play a segment from his rank 8 to 9 that I think demonstrates what he meant by special and how he's truly grown now. The catch is, I made a video all the way back in September of 2019 on my main channel called When Yosuke Hanamura Became Special, and I recorded it with an Elgato recorder of my PS2. This was the first way that I played Persona 4, so I'm gonna play the footage I gathered all those years ago now, too. I wanna tell Saki-senpai something. That what's important isn't where you are. This town I hated so much, now I love it. There's still nothing here, but I have family and friends, and you. The important things are never far off, they're all around you. I always wanted to be special. I thought my life would finally have meaning if I was special to someone. That's why I was really excited when I got my persona. But I really didn't need it. It's not what you have or what you can do. Just being born, living your life. Before you know it, you're already special to someone. Yeah, like you. You're special to me, you know? His rank 10 is essentially to lay that part of him to bed. He asks for a fight to get all the bad stuff out of his head, sort of a metaphor so that he can look back on it physically. I mean, he technically asks you for a punch, but the brawl teaches him that he's just as special as you are, or perhaps just as equal. It reaffirms his change in perspective, his perseverance toward his newfound purpose, and his resolve to do better. One of the best social links, now that I rewatch it for this video. Super well-paced, very dynamic, and existing in a way that reinforces his arcana and persona, as well as his established struggles, his personal regrets, all accumulating without just dumping how he feels in a plain way the whole time. Before we recap the character arc, though, I'm gonna just address some of his other additional character moments. Among the cast, Yosuke is probably one of the most criticized by Western fans, and that primarily comes down to one thing. 
Because it's more focused on, we'll cover that flaw issue last, but first, as the bro character, he sort of takes the role of ogling in the story. Well, aside from Teddy, who honestly takes things much further and much more consistently once he crosses over to our world. But we're obviously covering Teddy in his own segment. Yosuke's teenage lechery is pretty much the major negative trait that he exhibits, and this comes back to the lower polarity of the magician arcana. Him preparing the swimsuits for Chie and Yukiko at the camping trip, and him signing them up without consent to this beauty contest are both cases he found a tricky loophole or a way to spin his words to get something more lecherous achieved for his teenage boy self. It should be noted, though, that he does have a genuine compassion and friendship toward the people that he does this to, though, and that even if his actions are disrespectful and across the line for many, as it should be, honestly, there is an implied personal line that Yosuke doesn't ever cross or allude to crossing, especially with people who aren't extremely close with him. Which is no award, by the way, I'm just stating it for the record. Never ogles with crude description or anything of the sort. In other words, the extent of his evil in this flavor is really the teenage curiosity, and him saying things like, you look amazing, and wow, she's beautiful, with the only exception being Rise, which he ogles, however, it was before he really met her. As Rise is a celebrity, a public figure, and a model, he... Well, like most people when talking about celebrities, probably never thought twice about outside that context. What he said or thought or even considered would ever get back to her in some way, or that it would even matter that he said it, since it's part of her blatant profession set among confidants. He was wrong about that, obviously, but it's clear that he does have a moral standard of his own here. The major problem in these situations, but mainly the second one, I think, is instead of guilting them over something stupid that they could just say no to, the school board actually forces signees to participate. This is a violation of their personal choices, and I find it pretty darn disgusting. Even though through the character writing, Atlas does punish this character for what he did through Chie's reaction and the cross-dressing contest. I will say Chie's response to this is even more out of line, but I'll go into that and why in her section. The biggest elephant in the room, and this is an ultimate analysis after all, I guess, quote unquote, how he treats Kanji, primarily in the first half of the game, in regards to his speculated sexuality. Now, Kanji's dungeon was really extreme, and the investigation team at this point didn't have a solid grasp on what exactly was truly them and what wasn't when seeing the reflection of the TV world. So, on the first problem of not believing Kanji when he directly denied having those feelings to Yosuke, it's not likable, but reasonable from what he saw and experienced. What's not reasonable or appropriate is how he dealt with this doubt, because whether he believed it or not, it's clearly a very personal and serious insecurity for Kanji regardless. Yosuke already went through facing his own self, but he at least got to do it in some decent privacy. Kanji was viewed by the whole team up to that point, and that initial image of Kanji being broadcast on the channel, it's so much worse. It shouldn't have become a punching spot for jokes so prevalently in the early half of the game without consistent punishment, especially when it's obviously a sore spot for how Kanji feels. That's not good friend behavior. That being said, as a friend group, the investigation team actually does find a habit of doing this exact thing with every person in their group. They all have a few people they generally pick on the insecurities of, or decide not to, and that is actually laid out really strategically. For elaboration, here's a spreadsheet I made. This isn't a hardline rule, and it's more important to note how general tendencies change over the game, but this is, aside from a few notable exceptions, how the character dynamics work consistently through the game, being positive or negative. You generally see the characters who put more teasing out get teased more, or tease each other, which is realistic. Most of the things they do to tease each other are also tied to their insecurities. Yosuke often digs at Chie's feeling of insecurity as a romantic partner for her tomboyishness when insulting Chie for being stubborn. He never intentionally tries to embarrass or hurt Yukiko, however. He dehumanizes Teddy early in the game, but pays for it when Teddy blames, lies, and embarrasses Yosuke from July 10th onward with relentlessness. From there, most of the payback Yosuke gets is mostly letting Teddy suffer the consequences for his own actions. Yosuke teases Kanji's sexuality, but, as is a rarity, is actually met with friendliness by Kanji outside of those circumstances. I think this is probably something that sets people off the most, as it feeling kind of weird for Western fans. Yosuke thinks the world of Rise, and in return, Rise is the only girl to lean into this and actually praise Yosuke when he does a good job. 
He teases Naoto for whenever she gets emotional or acts immature, which is her primary insecurity from her dungeon. Although, in return, Naoto is often flustered and outside of these circumstances is generally complimentary to Yosuke. As such, he teases four people and is generally teased by three. This sort of dynamic persists. The more you embarrass or tease others, the more teasing generally comes your way. With Chie, she speaks almost nothing positive of Yosuke in the game, unless it's in a mocking tone. So Yosuke teases her insecurity. She acts complimentary to Yukiko, and Yukiko is complimentary back. She dehumanizes Teddy, probably the most of any character, with an actual genuinely dehumanizing line that doesn't even read as a joke. In exchange, Teddy repeatedly goats Chie for dates and embarrasses her in pervy insinuations. Chie doesn't typically praise or tease Kanji, which makes sense that Kanji is generally friendly toward her. Chie also doesn't really praise or tease Naoto, and in return is generally treated with respect from Naoto. Yukiko teases Yosuke by never validating his opinion, shutting him down at most opportunities, and telling him to his face that he's not good enough to date her, which highlights Yosuke's main insecurity of wanting to be special and valued by others. Already mentioned Chie, but Yukiko also dehumanizes Teddy and dismisses him. In return, Teddy embarrasses her by bringing up the romance stuff and retreading the scoring with a hot stud line. Yukiko is friendly with Kanji and has been for years since Tatsumi Textiles helps provide materials for the inn. In return, Kanji is also friendly with her. Yukiko dismisses Risei as a manipulative idol, but in general, Risei doesn't seem to react to teasing and instead doubles down on her traits that earn pure ire, primarily from Chie and Yukiko. Finally, Yukiko doesn't tend to be overly friendly or ever insult Naoto, which in turn is met respectfully by Naoto. We've covered quite a few interactions, so things will be going a bit quicker to save on the repeating too much from now on. Teddy has a brash, tasteless sort of complimentary behavior that embarrasses Yukiko and Chie, although it doesn't get under Risei's skin, at least not to the point where she lets him see it. He teases Yosuke the hardest, doing stuff like showing porn to Yosuke's parents at breakfast, blaming things that he did on Yosuke, and not doing work at Juness that gets Yosuke in trouble. In return, well, Yosuke tries to get revenge, but most of the time it doesn't go anywhere, and Yosuke takes the brunt of it. Kanji, because of his old single mother, seems to have a general respect for elders, and is by default respectful and kind to all of his senpai, being Yosuke, Yukiko, and Chie. He obviously has a crush on Naoto, and ends up teasing Teddy, by making Teddy uncomfortable with things like wanting to pet his fur. This generally switches later in the game, though, as Teddy becomes human, with Teddy embarrassing and, uh, yeah. The only person that Kanji genuinely antagonizes is Risei, who is not his senpai, and who he generally just doesn't understand the hype or personality of. Risei is superficially friendly to a different degree based on how the others treat her. Likely due to her idle days and dealing with fame, she never really shows when people strike a nerve, likely to avoid this sort of extra bullying. She only confides in you sometimes when things have bothered her. The only people she tends to pick on is Chie for her bummishness and ignorance of femininity and things with boys. She also teases Naoto to Naoto's flustered awkwardness, and Naoto generally treats her respectfully back. The way they act are teased and teased back is generally reflective of many dividing parts of their characters. For Naoto, she has a hard time reading sarcasm or understanding jokes at all. Due to her spending a lot of time with her grandpa, she also doesn't have much experience in witty comebacks or even when or how to use them. So generally, she speaks with everyone in a polite professional manner, while generally brushing off occasionally getting flustered by the people who tease her, Yosuke and Risei. It's notable due to this that she generally has the least extreme compliment to dislike from everyone, which is perhaps where some people get the idea that Naoto is a less fleshed out character than she really is. So there are a few exceptions with the way the investigation team treat each other. Sometimes it's light, sometimes it's rude or harsh, sometimes they argue, sometimes they brush it off, and of course, sometimes taking into account Japanese archetypes and socially acceptable behavior, as well as drastic changes in social climate since 2008 when the game was first released, some things have aged better or worse. I never get the impression, though, that they ever meant to genuinely hurt one another, though, or that anyone ever got genuinely hurt. And while some of them do heinous things that I find disgusting between each other, mainly Yosuke, Chie, and Teddy, there is a sense of sort of adolescent ignorance at play. Well, 
except for Teddy, but we'll get into his segment later. I placed this segment here because it fits the most, and the most talked about element of the teasing dynamics, in the West at least, is the inappropriate and gross way that Yosuke teases Kanji at times, especially in the first half of the story. I just want people to not conflate any of the character's actions or personal flaws with the positions of the creators, as I've seen done plenty of times as that view of media and character writing, while good to consider, is clearly not reflective here. Back into Yosuke's flaws, though. Some people defend not the actions, but the context of the actions of Yosuke's homophobic remarks by stating that Yosuke is just a high schooler. This game was released initially before 2010. The culture, the societal dialogue on LGBTQ plus issues was very different, so judging his behavior with a modern lens is sort of unfair. To be honest, I do mostly agree with that take. It's not like he bullies or harasses anyone else for being like that that we see, just someone who he considers to be his good friend, who he fights alongside and would eventually literally die for within the context of the game. So jokes among friends is one thing. Kanji, though, clearly doesn't like it. But then again, as I displayed in the chart, Yosuke, as well as the rest of the cast, constantly tease each other for the exact things that they were insecure about from their shadows. So in a similar personal manner to Kanji, I think it's a hard balance and more easy to see as the rough yet realistic dynamic of a real friend group, of growing high school friends trying to understand themselves. But that's just from a writing perspective. It's still, with all those excuses, obviously inappropriate, rude, and not a great thing to do to your friend, especially in the modern day, and especially if they have expressed discontent with it. But there at least is some more sense to make of it than it's generally treated with. Another reason I think this might have existed, however, is something that many Persona fans love to mention when talking about Yosuke, and that is the cut romance link. It could be reasonably speculated that Yosuke's initial role in the story would have involved something to do with coming to grips with his bisexuality, which would explain the insistence on him talking about girls. There are people who dismiss this, though, acting like the cut romance link retcons Yosuke's sexuality into being straight again. And I've gotta be honest, I disagree here. It could explain his bullying toward Kanji as an insecurity and projection rather than disgust, and it could explain why the game feels insistent upon putting Yosuke in countless situations where he has to take on the role outside of his sexuality and comfort. These games, with how big they are, are written a lot of times at all points and aspects of the story, constantly coming back to different places and pieces, adding and changing things to create a holistic and consistent seeming experience. So it's possible that fragments of his character arc were kept in as subtext. In fact, it doesn't just seem possible, but fairly apparent, that this part of his character still shows its face in multiple places of the story. This isn't just to soften the impact of his bad behavior, though. The game constantly puts Yosuke in moments where he has to face his own sexuality and gets flustered and tries not to think about it, rather than continuing to treat it like a joke, even saying that you would be the ideal guy in one of the group date situations before getting embarrassed and backpedaling on his own words. He's not someone confident in his own sexuality, and as much as he flusters Kanji with jokes, Yosuke reacts far more severe when the arrow is turned on him. This is blatant subtext. Him having a romance link cut doesn't cut the fact that the story and character writing generally implies sexuality at many turns, and even uses this as a way to punish him for his treatment of Kanji, putting the same embarrassment on him that he was trying to divert on others. Lastly, on these Yosuke Sexuality Chronicles, there's a group who generally insults specific aspects about Atlas when criticizing Yosuke, as them not having bravery to include a gay romance link and that the reason for it being cut, despite prior to this having some gay characters in their games, a response to this type of criticism has a more reasonable answer on why his Yosuke romance link was dropped. I think it's pretty clear to the current build of the story that Yosuke's role in the story changed. We don't know how severely exactly, but I wouldn't discount a radical change either. In the game's files of the original Persona 4, there is an unused beta credit sequence that other than not having audio or some finalized portraits and Persona graphics, is mostly the same. The credits of the actual Persona 4 introduce the characters in the order that you met them. Yosuke, Chie, Yukiko, Kanji, Rise, and Naoto. But in this beta ending, the order is totally changed. Instead, you see the protagonist, then Yukiko, Chie, Yosuke, Naoto, Rise, and Kanji. 
We don't know how much this would imply or change, but we do know that at some point, Yosuke became the emotional anchor that connected the investigation team to one of the murders. That at some point, it was decided that his role in the story on a narrative level would be to ground them to this event, and they needed the grief and frustration toward the death of this person to be as strong as possible for the sake of the strength of the story. The way Saki Konishi was implemented makes the most sense to tie it with Yosuke, as the childhood friend dynamic was taken up by Yukiko and Chie already. To then center Yosuke's arc over the grieving of a girl that he deeply cared about and loved, and who introduced him to this town, and then somehow turn that in a moment to a romance in the last two social links, they probably thought that would significantly hamper the focus and message of his character. Not only that, but most romances have heavy implications toward romance fed through the rest of their social links, so combining this grieving over a girl that he loved with occasional flirting would have been another very strange choice for the magician Arcana, an Arcana that's dedicated to focus. Those are just some of my thoughts, of course, but I have read every line of dialogue that Yosuke gives countless times, and it seems to me that this is by far the most reasonable option. Occam's Razor and all that. <clears throat> Sorry to talk about his character flaws so darn long, although I do find the group dynamics and stuff really fun. This is an ultimate analysis, quote-unquote, after all, though, so I want to make sure that I don't half-cover or avoid any major point of discussion and hope that this makes some sense. Back to his character arc, though. Yosuke Hanamura. The first name Yosuke means the helper, the assistant, and the mediator. Hanamura means the flower in the village. Yosuke learned he was special, something beautiful and desired to the people around him. And he found that by working his best to assist in solving the murders as your partner, your secondhand man, and your ideas guy. Yosuke was sick of the world and everything within it. He saw the lives other people lived or could be living, but never felt like he had a chance to make it his own. After being generally accepted but ultimately forgettable, the people he grew up around in the city didn't even care to keep up with him after his dad got a new job managing the branch of Juness in the country. Feeling forgotten and alone, he was thrust into a place that was actively hostile toward him, and decided to define the role for him before he even had a chance to figure it out himself. The general hostility of the town and the family business mounting on priorities, along with the generally empty town of Inaba, left Yosuke to feel like the place he was at in location, work life, and friends was garbage, soul-crushing, and isolating for someone who had plans of making a difference, being special, and living an extravagant life. When taking him out of this despair, finally one person reached out to him and made him start to open up. A semester later, a new kid moves to school from the city too, someone he might actually finally be able to relate to, but at some point, the only person he came to know and cared for was killed. Suddenly, he's at a crossroads of perspectives. Help solve the case and find out what caused her murder to save the town, or use the people that he can and save the town to be seen as the hero, someone special who people will finally honor, respect, and love, someone who will be appreciated Yosuke faces these dark thoughts steeped in loneliness, the yearning to be relied on and accepted, and through his grief, focus, and hard work, he redefines what being special even means to him, all the while finding people who can finally love and accept him for who he is. Because of the idea of a person, the life he was chasing, the truth is that it wouldn't have helped his loneliness, it would have only distracted him from it. Through his true friends, though, he's able to finally see and find that place, the place that he now belongs, that he always wanted. A place where he's special, but special to specifically the people around him, who are also special to him. Lastly, I want to get into a few moments that I didn't touch on otherwise in this video. This is partially due to the English voice actor's surprisingly stellar performance, but Yosuke's role in arguing with you over the fate of Namatame, come Nanako's apparent death, is easily a huge highlight of the game for me. Genuinely makes me uncomfortable to listen to, and the range in that whole scene is just so vast. It's a well-written scene in general, but wow, those are some pipes. Another is a place that's generally laughed off. Yosuke gets embarrassed after he says it, but during the beach trip, he briefly waxes philosophical, saying, Yeah, in a way, your nature is like a wall, after all. Surrounding yourself with high walls makes things simple, but simplicity isn't always a virtue. Which, while he didn't mean for it to, totally gives insight to his character. Someone who thought he could put up his walls and only show his laid-back, subservient side so everyone would like him. Always earnestly apologizing and doing what others wanted, 
His walls were high. How he had to interact with others was easy, but he wasn't getting what he wanted playing defensive like that. So he faced himself and became more honest in encounters. He says this to Kanji, but it's clear that this line is coming from his own experience. So finally, Yosuke is an awesome character, extremely well-written, nuanced, and multi-layered, whether you look at him in terms of his story involvement, mythology, arcana, as a friend, or as an individual. He offers a lot to Persona 4. But lastly, I want to cover how his arc connects to the theme of Persona 4 Golden, that being truth. Yosuke believed in a truth that could fix all his worries, that could give him importance and belonging and a peace of mind. But this was just a lie that he imagined. When he turned to reality and saw the value of the things around him, even in this town, the flow of the river, the connectedness of the houses over the floodplain, when he saw the people who were born and raised here, and the people who found themselves landing here just like he did, he could reanalyze himself and saw the answer he imagined through his lie. He could let down his walls. He could be himself. He could belong. As my aim is to analyze this game fully, let's take a brief romp through the gameplay of Persona 4, addressing its positives and negatives without diving in too much to the comparisons of said positives and negatives to other games, especially newer ones. I'm going to try to look at the strengths and weaknesses of its systems and how they stand on their own, and try to reason out the aspects for why I find certain things dealt with stronger or weaker as we go. Also, I'm not going to cover a lot of the more basic and consistent systems of Persona, as I'm assuming you're already familiar with them, so in interest of respecting your time, I'm not going to just reiterate a bunch of Wikipedia descriptions. At least, hopefully. Instead, I want to focus more on specific things that I find interesting and worth delving into. I am also not going to describe the basic idea of special stats or dialogue options, but mainly game balance and AI, as well as what ties in with the creativity, thematics, and additive ideas for Persona 4 as a story, as an RPG. Special stats in Persona 4 operate pretty similarly to 3, although with plenty more optional ways to boost skills passively without just sanctioning them to a time slot. You can read, study, take a huge variety of jobs, cook lunches, collect models, and spend time with social links to make things go up. Despite the huge amount of options though, it's something you still have to tend to raising, not something that automatically just maxes out as you play through the game without any care in the world. So the abundance of choice doesn't break the purpose or the feeling of the time management sim mechanic in the game, but it does lend to the idea of Persona 4 as a role-playing game, allowing you to take many different avenues to up the traits that you want, sometimes even rewarding or supporting with said trait upgrades in exchange for tasks that you may have not previously understood the individual purpose of. As for the mythological backstory for each of the investigation team's personas, let's start with the protagonist, who has Izanagi, one of the two gods who birthed Japan and created the other births of the gods who are listed in the ancient Japanese document Kamiyumi, which covers the time after the birth of Japan. The story of Persona 4 Golden has much to do with the reuniting of a vengeful Izanami and the protagonist wielding Izanagi after the events of the Kamiyumi, but once again that will be discussed in more detail elsewhere. After going to the land of Yomi or the underworld, Izanagi seeks to purify himself, and from that purification, the many gods were born. Before I link this to the others, I think it should be said that this is really fitting for the protagonist of a Persona game, as the protagonist can hold the personas of countless gods, spirits, beings, and archetypal figures. Then to say, from Yu's first Persona Izanagi, Yu Narukami began to be able to obtain and create further personas and gods, fits the characteristic of Izanagi as a mythological figure as well. The mechanic of having multiple personas suits Izanagi's own story of birthing the gods from his purification. It should also be mentioned that the ultimate weapon the protagonist gets in Persona 4, done so by killing the Reaper, is the Blade of Totsuka, which is also a reference to Izanagi, who killed his son Kagatsuchi with the same blade in revenge for Izanami's death. The full name of the blade is Totsuka no Surugi. 
While Tomoe, Chie's initial persona, refers to a hyper-mythologized and possibly fake historical figure, Tomoe, which is based on the family that fought for the creation of the first shogunate, Tomoe was also said to be a warrior willing to fight any demon and having the strength of a thousand people. Chie's ultimate persona, however, connects back to Izanagi directly. Haraido, or Haraido no Okami, the name Haraido, coming from Harai, refers to redemption or purification. Therefore, Haraido no Okami are the gods enshrined in Haraido, sometimes also said as the Harai Dono and Harai Dokono. On the day that Izanagi performed the great Misogi no Harai, or purification rite, upon leaving Yomi in his own story, the gods of purification were born, one of which being the birth of Chie, or her ultimate persona, Haraido no Okami. Yukiko's ultimate persona is, of course, Amaterasu, and is a pretty culturally well-known kami even outside of Japan. But who is Amaterasu? Well, Amaterasu is a female goddess of the sun, who was birthed alongside Chie during the purification process, exactly when Izanagi washed his left eye. Amaterasu is the god of sunlight, a great overlooking being, her Japanese name roughly meaning the great divinity illuminating heaven. Yukiko's initial persona is Konohano Sakuya, who is said to be goddess over the volcanoes and sakura blossoms. I mention this because the ultimate fire move in Persona 4 Golden, only accessible to Yukiko, is a severe fire type move called Burning Petals, which animates as a blossoming flower. Yosuke's ultimate persona is Suzano, who was also birthed from the same harai that Yukiko and Chie came from, this time from washing his nose in the purification process. Suzano is also the brother of Amaterasu, and they have many stories listed together. It should be said as a small bonus that in the Persona 4 fighting games, you may recognize Tsukiyomi, who is actually another god birthed from Izanagi from washing instead this time his right eye. The reason I throw in this bonus fact here is because in terms of Personas born of the purification process, these are the four that directly connect back to it. So Chie, Yukiko, and Yosuke were born from Izanagi in his purification, or the protagonist. It was the players arriving that entered into their lives, and almost immediately and at that same rough time, that being before the first dungeon's completion, awakened them to their personas through this alternate realm. By facing their dark selves and being purified through the players' actions, they were able to bird their personas, who eventually reached their ultimate potential and true form. Then, who are the other members if not from this Izanagi purification process? Teddy, who of course, for an unknown length of time had already existed among the shadows and partially developed himself and his ego, has the ultimate persona of Kamui Moshiri, which is actually not a single person or thing at all, but is instead an alternate world entirely outside of humans, where all Kamui dwell. When the Ainu people of Japan went to worship the Kamui, they worshipped to the place of Kamui Moshiri. This makes sense as the shadows in the alternative world inside of the TV all take the forms of various Kamui, or spirits and gods. This sort of makes his ultimate persona mean that he is the god of the TV world. His persona also takes form of a rocket or a giant ship, as if he is in fact the literal representative for the world inside the TV, which of course couldn't fit him more perfectly. He also connects with another Persona user we meet later, so he's not completely separate from the others as it may seem now. The person most disconnected, perhaps, from the original story of Izanagi seems to be Kanji, his ultimate persona Dairoku Tenmao coming from Buddhism instead of Shinto tradition. He's actually the antagonist to Buddhists and isn't really seen as a good guy. I guess a connection you could make is that the rough evil impression that people generally have is similar to Kanji's delinquent self, even though his actual behavior is anything but. Dairoku Tenmao is also said to be based on the warlord Oda Nobunaga, who was well known especially for his cruel and vile actions toward others as he conquered Japan ruthlessly. This mimics some of Kanji's natural movesets, such as vile assault and cruel attack. It's not all negative though, Nobunaga was also said to be a great unifier in Japan, so I believe the idea here is, it's all about perspective, just like Kanji's rough exterior. He beats up people, sure, but he beats up gangs of people who are hurting others, and he wouldn't hurt his mother, a child, or any of the other residents in Inaba. 
While not his ultimate persona, and talked about more in Kanji's segment specifically, we should mention that Take Mikazuchi, his original persona, actually does originate from Izanagi. It's one of the eight gods that were born whenever Izanagi took the Blade of Totsuka and cut Kagatsuchi into bits. Risei's ultimate persona is a Bodhisattva, a being from Buddhist tradition and history. Even though this sort of breaks the rule, I actually talk about all of this in her own segment, so I'm gonna leave it here for the most part. What should be noted is Himeko connects back to Amaterasu through a mirror that she's given, and that Kanon, Risei's true self, links more directly to her place as an idol. The last party member to join the pack, and so the last one I'll cover, is of course Naoto. Naoto Shirogane's ultimate persona is Yamato Takeru, who, like Risei's initial persona, comes from the same dynasty or greater family line. Takeru, who is known, among other things like being an emperor, as the one who dressed up as a woman during a celebration in order to personally assassinate warriors, using the guys to cover their tracks. I think the correlation makes sense with Naoto in your head, but I'll address it more in my full Naoto video. Yamato Takeru was also said to have many run-ins with the Ainu tribesmen, who of course reference back to Teddy as well. But I think more specifically, this idea of dressing the opposite sex to assassinate your enemies comes back to how Naoto put on the clothes of the opposite sex so that she could be accepted by the police force who otherwise seek to invalidate her. And we're back. Uh, this time we're going to be talking about the Persona 4 and Persona 4 Golden Openings. Uh, kind of what kind of gets across in terms of like thematically or visually, what feelings they give, uh, which songs we prefer, why, etc. Um, so I guess we'll start with the original Persona 4 PS2 opening. And for me, I have to say, I think it has a much more like serious and anxious feeling to it that I feel like was sort of scrubbed out with the P4G opening. Um, but what are your thoughts on like the music and everything? I love the music. I'm also super biased. I've said this to you in in private, but there's a the dance version, and uh, that's in Chunithum, which is a rhythm game mm -hmm. in Japan. It's very very fun. But I love 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 the piano in this track. It has a filter on it, which we kind of touched on in the uh, the general impressions portion of this. But it lets kind of the higher parts there. It's called a high pass filter. Um, so there's really like lacking body and then it's also on a hard piano So a hard piano has a has a much well harder sound to it And it's like a lot more aggressive and it makes the uh, the the sound sharper not in pitch, but in like uh, Rhythm it's more staccato. It has a lot more accent and attack on it um, And I think that that's used to great effect because it's partially it's like used in this very rhythmic way in comparison to like p4g it's less like full there's less going on and the song has like less structure. Yeah. Something whenever we were reviewing like the footage of the opening uh, that you mentioned was sort of the kind of creepy voyeuristic thing with the camera yeah. focusing on each of the party members. Uh, if you wanted to elaborate on that, I don't want to steal your thunder, but I thought it was a oh. good thing that you noted. I just like, I had, when we were watching through it together, I had never noticed how absolutely creepy the middle section is. Like it's around 50 seconds in or something. Um, and it's basically this section where there's cam car camcorders or on the TV or like uh, a picture. And I just thought of it from, it, it looks like you're watching it through Adachi's eyes. And if you think of it that way, it cutting to all the members of, of the cast, except for like you, obviously, it's really creepy because it's, it's like kind of spying or like looking and it's played off very cute, but like someone has to be watching through this stuff. And like, mm -hmm. it's not like you, Narukami like ever I think it's also like looking at like from where the perspective is so I'd say like with the Yosuke one for example it's like questionable whether the person is like seeing it from far away and they're zoomed in or they are recording him singing it's not something that's present in the game but sort of invokes something similar but with things like Chie's it seems like she's being recorded from like an elevator camera or yeah. um, with Yukiko it's like a model shoot or whatever and I, I call back personally to like her interview about the Amagi Inn um, that's mentioned multiple times uh, near the beginning of the story, or Kanji, how it seems like it's kind of like the camera is shaking, it's a little farther away, and it's him beating up the biker gang members. So it could also yeah. be like from the position of this is the perception given by the public that's like not the true selves. And I think um, I, I think the one of the creepiest ones for me is Naoto stuck in the stack of TVs and they sort of turn to face the TV and like yell 
but you can't hear anything, obviously. Um, so it's sort of like they're trapped in this game, trapped in this um, maze of perception, uh, which the song, you know, talks about, lyrically speaking. So, yeah, I think I think it also just has like an anxious, like impending sense of like doom or like we need to hurry up and solve this type of thing that is maybe lost a bit in the P4G opening. Not that it's Agreed. inherently better or worse, but like the time counter is ticking down. Um, I don't know. Uh, is there anything else like musically that you think is uh, fairly interesting about the original P4 opening before we move on to P4G? I think the most interesting thing to me is probably the piano and how it plays with the like rhythmic uh, elements. So like the progression and stuff like that and how it itself kind of becomes a rhythmic element and it's just like so constant is is the point and you kind of talked about the impending dread and stuff and i don't think it's a i don't think it's an anxiety inducing song by any means i think it's a bop you know mm -hmm. but i do think if you like listen for this constant rhythmic thing kind of like the ticking of a clock it's nothing like a tick tock tick tock tick tock or whatever but it's it's like didn't 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 and it's like that throughout the entire thing which is mm -hmm. pretty interesting very touching lyrics uh some of my favorite lyrics in the opening but it's we're all stuck in the maze of relationships that go on with or without you a lot of the stuff with adachi is that he had this idea that he would be granted a future granted uh everything he wanted you know a beautiful wife who loved him a great paying job a ton of respect and reverence if he just got good grades you know, got to the right school, mm -hmm. went to the right thing, and none of it turned out for him. And he's very bitter about that. And I feel like it's sort of, I guess, reflective of, like, these characters have yet to get to that stage of their lives. Um, and so it really is, like, you know, you can finish the social links or you don't. You know, days will go by, day, things will happen, you can get through the entire game, and you can never see the actual conclusion to so many links. But it's, like, representative, again of like what happened with Adachi where it's like life does go on with or without you it's your task to choose which relationships matter and work your way through this maze you know otherwise you will be left alone so what do you think of the P4G opening I love the harmonica and That's I so love good. the poppy vibes I, they're, they're, some people don't like the P4G opening I think it's still a huge banger um I, oh, I think it's a banger too. I think the visuals are probably the biggest lacking sense, although they're very artful and very like striking in terms of their like color composition and like the angles and everything. Uh, but I feel like they uh, maybe denote a bit less. Um, I don't know. Yeah. What's your overall impressions of that? I think that the harmonica is a great touch for like, I, I don't think that it's exactly indicative of the Japanese countryside, but I think they've kind of adopted some more Western... Uh, thoughts artifacts. with with yeah with like cultural artifacts and stuff um, especially when it comes to like p4g and, and playing into like the hippie stuff and uh, the psychedelic colors and you know kind of stuff along those lines I think that this track is also kind of reminiscent of Jackson 5 at the very end <laughs> there's it's very reminiscent of mm -hmm the Jackson 5, that kind of outro section. And not just like in the note content, the melody or, or whatever, but just like how it's handled. Um, you can mm -hmm. find it in plenty of those those tracks as well. I'm thinking of the lyrics again. I think it's just that it addresses things a bit differently. I feel like the original P4 opening deals a lot more with that anxiety, that like impending time and the structure of how the game works as a game. Um, and connecting that to its narrative and thematic structure. But I think a lot of the lyrics delving and talking about the truth and talking about how like people accept and deny it and uh, what defines your world, uh, is it truth or lies? The entire game is based around this incessant like pursuit of truth and a pursuit at the abandon of things that make you comfortable, at the abandon of things that you take to be given truths because they seem so obvious. Uh, the game punishes you, you know, in original P4 and P4G uh, for miscalculating, misreading, and reading things that you aren't supposed to, you know, rather than uh, looking at things, like, I guess, objectively. One thing that comes to mind is I, Ebihara's uh, social link. If you try to romance her, um, romancing her is completely antithetical to her entire, like, message, the entire theme, the entire point of her arc. 
And so the game punishes you by putting you in this toxic relationship that eventually is doomed to end in a breakup. It reverses their link and you have to literally mend and repair the relationship again. Or, or like obviously with the original endings, like there's multiple different endings that all are based on basically how much you're willing to truly look at all the facts and details and how much you're willing to let you know, your emotions and everything cloud your judgment. You know, whether you throw Namatame into the TV, you know, the whole idea of truth and lies are like the fundamental like message of the game. And so I, I do appreciate the lyrics. I do think they're really good. P4 has a very simple structure, I would say, and it kind of always returns to this one motif. Whereas the P4G opening has a lot more diverse sections to it that it kind of goes through. Like it still has uh, certain sections that it repeats, but it has more diversity and variety when it comes to like the actual musical content underlying the lyrics and stuff like that as well. From where I'm sitting, Inaba is probably one of the most dynamic and comfy breathing spaces in RPGs for at least the time it was released. Even the most minor of unnamed characters at school will have whole character arcs if you just talk to them every dungeon or so. And even if it's not a big character arc or a big story, it's cool to see how their lives have progressed. It gives a feeling of wholeness in the world. And so today, we're going to cover all of the things like that that make Inaba a dynamic location. Some of which being much more major than what I just mentioned as an offhanded comment. So let's get started. One thing I think is really cool is that small details and consistencies can be found across all social links and optional events through the story. It gives a real feeling of cohesiveness to all of these links that makes it so they don't seem like they're just in a vacuum. And that wholeness is doubled down by the fact that every time you go to do a social link, you're able to see it. Whether it's sunny, cloudy, covered in snow or fog, it always represents the location and time period that you are currently doing that part of the story. It makes it seem like it isn't just a segmented off cutscene for an unrelated character arc, but part of Inaba as a whole. Those are just general things though. The first thing I think of easily for a truly cohesive idea is the group of juvie delinquents stealing from people. This group of people is never talked to directly by yourself or seen outside of social links and events, but they make mention across multiple social links unrelated. Three to be exact. In Chie's social link, they are the most prominent, as her standing up to them and rescuing both the child and her quote-unquote friend. This is actually the only time you see the group properly and get a lot of lines out of them. But I remember, I thought it was weird on my first playthrough that they just seemed to show up in her link. Then I realized they aren't just showing up in her link randomly. Before Kanji's link, there's a girl that can be found that tells you that she feels unsafe now that Kanji's at school and tells you where to find him because supposedly he's been bullying people with a gang of others. This doesn't seem like much, but later in Kanji's link, after he's given the boy and their family the stuffed animals, Kanji gets stopped by the police as they mention a group robbing children and cite him being seen with a kid at the floodplain. Considering they're also robbing a child in Chie social link, that detail is a really nice touch and brings them together pretty nicely. But hey, two isn't a pattern, three is. So then again, at Dojima's rank 10, after you max him out, a cop is calling out as Dojima asks what's up, and he's told, oh, it's that group of juvie thieves. This sort of internal consistency is small, but it adds up so much to the world, and it's only one of dozens of details like this around the world of Inaba that you may not have even put together on a first playthrough. It gives the sense that the entire story was written cohesively rather than just one disconnected junction at a time. Now, I promised Cole that I wouldn't tell anybody, but another kind of deep lore Persona 4 Golden bit of trivia is that Cole has a crush on Chie. This is never discussed in either him or Daisuke's link, but instead is found late into Ai's social link after she wants you to pry and see if he likes her. This isn't it though. For anybody who knows he likes her right out from Ai's social link, it's also something expanded upon in the optional and kind of hard to see without a guide book club cutscenes. Not really a book club, but I, I call them that as shorthand. Basically, in order to read every book in Persona 4 Golden, there are specific one-time chances and requirements for three optional Strength Arcana cutscenes that give you books. Chie shows up in two of them, and Cole is visibly flustered. Doing these with the added information of Ai's social link 
lends to how bad he is at hiding his feelings, despite nobody seeming to pick up on it. Chie even mislabels Cole in the second book club scene as someone in Yukiko's fan club, which Cole awkwardly tries to deny, but it obviously is restricted, since he can't just say he likes her instead. I mean, I guess he could, but you know, he's a, he's a good old shy boy. Another really deep cut most people don't put together, and I don't think I've ever seen someone else mention, is that Yosuke actually canonically hits on Miss Kashiwagi before she took Reigns as your replacement teacher. When Yosuke gets a number on Operation Babewatch, and the number he calls ends up being Hanako, that wasn't just a prank from some mean girl from his school, remember? It was an older woman who gave him that. Literally everything, when we look in retrospect, points to this being Kashiwagi, and I'm gonna go through why exactly. I want to cite something Yukiko says on the end trip, where she mentions that Hanako and Kashiwagi often spend time together on little vacations, such as coming to the end to cry a lot. They come and stay here now and again. Usually they come to cry when something breaks their hearts. And so aside from Hanako currently being in Okina City to shop, which makes sense for Kashiwagi to be alongside, listen to how Yosuke describes the woman when Yosuke mentions how he got the number. <laughs> Of course I did. One phone number right here. Amazing! Man, it wasn't easy too. She was crazy hot. I just had to push myself a bit and go for a sexy older woman. Time to give her a call. I hope you guys are ready for this. He says this, which I find hilarious in context of knowing it's Kashiwagi he's talking about. Now technically this is all in the main story events, and I don't normally consider those to be a part of making us feel like the world is a kinetic place regardless of actions taken, but in this case, it's something you can only know in retrospect with knowledge of later portions of the game, and putting it back together. Which I think lends to the idea still that even when we aren't equipped with the information to understand the full length of situations, they still carry out all the same in Persona 4 Golden. The world isn't built around events that we interact with, but instead we interact with events that are already moving within the world. It's a hard thing to accomplish in games, and a lot of that effort goes underappreciated. Here's a few speed rounds, because one way Persona 4 Golden keeps a lively world is actually the same way it tries to hint you towards social links and options. Like the example I mentioned earlier of the girl tying in the rumor of Kanji being involved with the delinquents to letting you know where he's available. So here's the speed round. The male student in your classroom by the window mentions some supposed genius in elementary school who studies all the time and how his mother wants him to be like that and be number one. We eventually find later in the game a character named Shu, and his mother is doing that exact thing. And while in America technically he's implied to be in middle school and not elementary, I believe this may have been an accidental translation error from the original Japanese. Another one. There's a girl named Shy Student on the second floor hallway who's gay. Look, everyone, representation. No, but she basically has an evolving arc surrounding her love for her senpai that goes through some trials and tribulations throughout the game. It's just nice to come in and see how it's going. The stylish student also has a tale about love and heartbreak, refocusing his priorities. Good for him. Obviously, Mitsuo Kubo and Nametame can also be seen showing up at various times and locations as NPCs in the map, namely in the shopping district, as well as Namatame being by the river, makes it feel a little less like they just popped out of nowhere when they made their main story appearances. There's an old man that sometimes takes walks at night, and his middle-aged housewife daughter mentions in the daytime at the shopping district that she's worried about her dad being out so late since he's old. People wouldn't probably think of it, since 99% of people probably do Nanako and Ryotoro's social link in their first playthrough, but the constant overlap with both each other and the main story is also really well handled, and gives a lot more context to the Heaven Dungeon once it arrives. But if we want to talk crossover between links, I honestly think that would be cheating, since it's the same primary characters involved in that stuff, so of course they'll be overlapping. I will say one small detail that people might overlook though, Naoto's dungeon is a secret base, but she used to call her childhood treehouse that we find out in her social link. Everyone knows that there are multiple social links that only start and only become available via other social links, like I and Hisano's social links, but there's also subtle nods between the social links as well. 
mentioning being unable to help in one of Daisuke's social links because of serious family commitments, which seems casual enough, but takes on a new life if you've done Cole's social link on another playthrough and roughly knows what part of his life he's currently in. B with his family restricting his freedom with sports and trying to train him as a proper heir to the family line. There's the obviously multiple references to the TV show The Featherman Rangers, a parody of Super Sentai, that has been present in every Persona game, even back in the Persona 2 duology. This is mentioned by Kanji at one point, is a plot point in multiple ranks of Eddie's social link, and of course there are the Featherman outfits in the game. Also, Kanji mentions that Naoto's secret base reminds him of Featherman, and this actually seems to hold weight with some of the design inspiration of the original Super Sentai evil bases. Something I like as well is that the large number of social links take place outdoors, and is something that Persona 4 does more than any of the other Hashino Personas. This outside aspect combined with the variety of weather has characters constantly changing outfits, minor changes to the scenery, and this even causes minor dialogue additions to some social links that allude to the weather changes, like how Ayane mentions that the rain is lightening up, or that she's going to practice under the gazebo thing instead of staying out in the rain. The extra attention to detail with every aspect of Inaba's world often goes undernoticed and underappreciated, because I think it's the sort of thing that, when it works well, it feels so natural. But it's easy to imagine the countless RPGs where dialogue is plain, unchanging, and blatantly tutorialized. I want to address him more in a different segment, but take a look at the Bookman, for instance. He serves basically as a sign to tell you when the new books are coming in, and eventually becomes a mini quest vendor. But if you pay attention to what he says when he says it, he actually really has a passion for reading, and has plenty of extra lines to flesh out some of these stories that you only get brief descriptions of. Like when he sadly calls out for one of his favorite authors to come back knowing that his final book is dropped in a long series that you've read throughout the game. Something else that really breathes life into Inaba are the bits of foreshadowing that are sometimes impossible to pick up on on your first playthrough, due to them being fundamentally unimportant details by any sane regard. Mainly the recurrence of Namatame's truck that he used to kidnap people. Now, if you've been into Persona 4 for a while now, it's very possible you already heard about the Namatame truck going by when the investigation team in Adachi chased the creepy otaku guy down the street just before Risei's arc. While they move away, Namatame's truck drives by, and you may not think much of it, as this is too early in the game to even have a reasonable suspicion, or even get close to that reasoning. But less people, I think, know about its earlier appearance at the gas station at the very, very beginning of the game. There is a question asked of Izanami as when Namatame and Adachi received their powers from her and shook hands with the gas station attendant, but the game gives us its presumed answer, and it's moments before you yourself arrive, which can be taken by the gas station attendant quickly running over from behind the truck as it leaves. Inaba breathes. It moves. Sure, you don't get literally new dialogue on every character every day, but most of them updating with major events and dungeons is often enough to give that impression that the game is moving along with you, rather than being a static place where you do the same five tasks a hundred times. Back in 2019, when I played this for the first time on PS2, my initial impression was, wow, this game is a whole lot smaller than Persona 5. You have countless places to visit, mini games to play, stores to go inside, and yeah, Persona 5 did expand the world a ton. Hey, even Persona 3 has a larger feeling to it, but the shorter budget and turnaround time of Persona 4, although given more content later with Golden, I came to see as, while not as many areas, there is a feeling of denseness, of movement within these areas with the people living within them. And it feels like there are people living within them. It's clear that they were not underbaked in the slightest, and I've come to appreciate how this feeling, this smaller yet beautiful living world of Inaba, contributes to the idea that even though it seems like there's nothing to do out in the boonies, there are so many beautiful things and people living there that are worthy of respect. Let's talk about game options and accessibility. 
Persona 4 Golden on PC added a number of quality of life changes, like language customizability from voice acting to cutscene subtitles to an entire language adjustment. It's personally great for me who's studying Japanese to play through the game and sentence mine or try to find vocab that I don't already recognize. The difficulty also has an entirely nuanced tab to choose the aspects of the difficulty that best fit your ease of play. Now, this wasn't handled perfectly, but that mainly has to do with the system's original mechanics. While at worst, adjusting these individual tabs can totally break any semblance of game balance and challenge, both in being so monotonous and unfair, and in being so pathetically brain-dead easy, it does allow me to play the game how I like, and in the very least, I like that the game is willing to give me that customizability, willing to trust me with that. Generally speaking, a game is designed around one difficulty. It may be playtested to make sure things are at least possible in other settings, sometimes it isn't even done that with other companies, but generally speaking, there is one difficulty that was quote-unquote intended for the player, and as a game experience, you will get that the best in normal difficulty. If you're playing Persona 4 Golden for the first time, you really should select normal difficulty, and that's mainly due to the design philosophy with older RPGs being carried over that part of what hard mode does is decrease the money and experience points for each battle won from the standard amount. Unless you're prepared to be drastically underleveled and thereby to do very little damage, you will have to grind to keep up with enemies. Some people do genuinely enjoy the monotony of grinding in JRPGs. It's peaceful for them, like when I sit down and speedrun Sekiro. But for me, it's nauseating. And I love the broader Shen Megami Tensei battle system and formula. But I never like feeling like I'm doing busy work. And that's why I love that Persona 4 Golden allows me to adjust the difficulty where I do damage and receive items, money, and experience as if I was on normal difficulty, while being able to get punched by enemies like I was playing on hard mode. For me, it's the most difficulty with the least monotony and just the right amount of grinding. So I genuinely welcome more games to offer these sort of accessibility options and generally think it's a positive. Part of me does wish that they hid the higher experience and higher money rate part of that scale that you can choose from as a bonus for the first time beating the game, because they are so busted that you can easily get more than 10 levels above what you're supposed to be at just from grinding for an afternoon or so, but I'll let that be someone else's battle for now. Chie Satanaka, the tomboy, the hard kicker of things, and the person who introduces themselves to you first, at least at school, in Persona 4 Golden. From the Newsflash Persona Channel 2015 livestream, the results of a popularity poll in Japan hosted by Atlas put Chie as the second most popular character in Persona 4 Golden. In the West, she tends to be more polarizing, but once again, I plan to give a full analysis that details her positive and negative character traits in detail, organized to a hopefully satisfying degree, below. The initial impression of Chie is that she represents the more country vibe that they are trying to instill in you coming to Inaba. But the way the games go about this is a bit different. Something that does characterize her is her brash and aggressive manner, sometimes seen as an American type of personality on Japanese forums and boards. She's obsessed with eating meat and isn't afraid to share her mind with others. In terms of her role in the party, she normally serves as a play off of Yosuke for comedic moments, a levity in the story, and generally is the most open and loudly optimistic person on the party. Well, aside from Teddy. She has poor social and academic intelligence, as is driven home with comments about her failing many of her classes in the story, but she often surprises the investigation team sometimes when doing one of her classic speaking her mind off the top of her head ends up actually giving them the answer they need to solving some part of the murder case. Generally, her love of kung fu and learned of past, pretending to be a kung fu master and a hero fighter in the woods through elementary and middle school, seems to imply that she's a person people would previously define as somewhat chunibyo. But it's clear by the events of the story that while she still enjoys things like these, she's matured a lot from that being a fitting descriptor for herself. Prior to her encounter with herself, you can see a few small jabs clearly peeking out from her insecurity with you on your first walk home with Yukiko. Chie confronts you on Yukiko being really pretty and popular and asks if you think she's cute too, because Chie has gotten used to that sort of treatment. Yukiko is visibly uncomfortable and asks Chie to stop in a few different ways multiple times, but Chie is really getting a kick out of it and ignores Yukiko's uncomfortability with being characterized this way. 
This is something you see toned down and never addressed to this awkward extent ever again after Chie faces herself. So this scene is the primary bit of foreshadowing we get in regards to her character flaw and personal insecurity. Chie is the second of three main party characters who lack their own dungeon in Persona 4 Golden. And so because of that, we have less insight to gain from her life spent in the TV world. Still, she does face herself and her shadow here, and that is significant. What we learn going into the TV is that despite her abrasive, loud, action-packed, steak-loving behavior, she's actually embarrassed about the fact that she's like that, to an extent that deep down, she envies pretty, delicate girls like her best friend Yukiko, who she feels to be the ideal woman, the complete opposite of her. This insecurity and envy metastasizes to a feeling of control over Yukiko, where she gains positive self-worth by subtly keeping Yukiko in this unobtainable, ignorant box, reliant on what Chie has to say. Yukiko looks up to Chie and finds her as a great friend, to a point where when the Shadow Chie hears Yukiko's honest reliance on her, that part of herself revels in the position of power. When you find Chie taking in these comments, it is followed by her running into danger without a regard for her own safety, only to save her friend. While a good initial sentiment, this drives home how, for a new player, that Chie is someone who generally acts without thinking whenever she believes someone is in danger, or whenever she is generally impassioned. This kind of brash, reckless loyalty and kindness is found to have a sort of nuanced nature to it as Chie's shadow appears mocking this notion. Because Chie never had a Midnight Channel appearance and is in someone else's dungeon space entirely, it is likely that the shadow that she's seen can be taken almost entirely for what it says the public perception and subconscious aren't summoning her image on the screen, and she's likely not well known or actively thought about enough, at least at the current time, to spur a drastic exaggeration away from the insecurities she personally has. Since we can assume that this is a pretty accurate representation for Chie's feelings, and it was sprung on in the moment she listened to Yukiko's monologue and told herself an incomplete truth, this frames Chie's running into action maybe as more equal parts to save her self-worth and personal feelings of superiority that she gained from Yukiko, as well as the genuine care that she had. And it's true that Chie's outward feelings aren't a lie either. Her wanting to save Yukiko is valid, something that we see in her wiping her eyes just as the shadow shows up, and she comes back to her senses. She was clearly moved and felt really bad about what Yukiko was saying when she was saying those things, even if they were technically kind to her. From here, we see the Shadow elaborate on how it's funny Yukiko misunderstands their dynamic so much that truly it's Chie who's worthless, not feminine, not polite, not caring or smart, like a frog attached to the princess. But Yukiko foolishly sees that frog as a prince charming, and Shadow Chie points out how funny that is, in a sort of dark way. Yukiko's shy, often disconnected nature and extreme popularity attracting vain or ill-intended people made it so the only long-standing friend she ever had was Chie. This made her rely on Chie, not knowing what was going on without Chie. Didn't know who to ask or turn to without Chie. Chie is her jail keeper. But of course, while somewhere deep down she may feel in charge of this feeling, while it may give her ego a boost up, she also genuinely does care for Yukiko which is why she puts so much effort into protecting her. After all, when the shadow says it, it's worded more like a self-burn than an attack on Yukiko. But Chie does genuinely envy and look up to Yukiko in every way. She aspires to be like her, and the fact that Yukiko sees her so high despite her feeling worthless gives Chie a sense of security. If you're wondering why or how or it feels like I've been repeating myself, it's because it comes down to how she's wording it. The wording is very important. Shadow Chie actually has one of my favorite boss dungeon themes in terms of her appearance and how that connects to the negative side of her inner self. On one hand, she seems to have some connection with the demon Yomotsu Shikame, which is depicted in SMT3 and onward as being a woman made of hair with a pointy headband. In some versions in Japanese lore, it also refers to it as a pointy hat. The compendium for Yomotsu Shikome in Persona 4 is actually accurate with the story and traditional Japanese mythos as seen in the Kojiki, as Yomotsu Shikome is the first demon sent after Izanagi by Izanami from the Underworld, which fits with the final dungeon being the Underworld Yomotsu Hirasaka and with the main boss of Persona 4 being Izanami, as well as the main character protagonist, his inner self being Izanagi. This demon also comes from the Underworld, as the name implies, Yomotsu Shikame. 
Shikome is interpreted a couple of ways, ugly hag and also many hags, which fits with Chie's insecurity that she is ugly, unlike her friend Yukiko, and also matching her shadow's portrayal, sitting on top of many different women. Another demon Shadow Chie likely refers to is Fudakuchi Yona. The story goes about a beautiful woman who came into town and married a stingy man. When all of the man's food went missing, he discovered underneath her hair there was a second mouth, eating all the food. And when Futakuchi Yona saw her husband had seen her true self, she shot her hair out like tentacles and murdered him. This manages to connect to a lot of the parts of Chie's character, actually. First, as we later discover, her obsession with eating and food being something that she feels insecure about makes good parallel for Futakuchi hiding her mouth. When Chie's shadow, her negative traits are revealed, she turns into a monster with tentacle hair that exclusively targets Yosuke for her big attacks. Yosuke, of course, is often paired with Chie in casual conversations, as well as when the team splits up, and it's a running gag between those two characters in the story that Chie spends all of Yosuke's money and leeches off of him for food. It makes complete sense that her shadow self would have this multifaceted aspect as well. As we will see technically in Yosuke's mythos, despite Amaterasu, who is Yukiko's ultimate persona, being Suzano, who is Yosuke's ultimate persona's sister, Yosuke's initial persona is Jiraiya, who came in a similar in structure but fundamentally different myth. One demon shows a closer tie to the mythology held and recreated in the meta-narrative of the game, and one demon shows a closer tie to the personality of the individual character. Because at the end of the day, few nuanced characters are just their archetypal figure. Every chariot shows similar traits and motivations, but every chariot is indeed different. Getting out of the Japanese mythology behind Chie's shadow now, though, her design also shows a very poignant perspective on herself in a sad way. She's sitting on top of these other girls, putting them down and making them rely on her so she can lift herself up, even if it threatens to crush who they may become. This visual imagery is just amazing. You could also take that this is a double meaning, from the hairstyles of the girls beneath her and the fact that this is all her singular shadow, that these girls underneath her are actually the worthwhile traits in herself that she refuses to acknowledge, and that her insecurity is actually crushing the aspects of herself that need to be loved. Another small detail, of course, is the happy face etched on the hat, while her true face is cruel and envious underneath. That's a really good touch for showing how she is encountering these more nuanced negative thoughts while putting on a smile and overall positivity for everyone else to see. Hope that was insightful, and hope you find Chie interesting too, because we still have a lot more to go through. After Chie's shadow is defeated without being even able to stand, Chie still insists upon marching forward. This lets us know something that is hinted at more later, which is that Chie may have an idealistic, slightly chunibyo view of the world, or at least had one at one point in her past and is recovering from it still, as she, through dedication and lack of second thoughts, still needs the convincing to not push forward even when she is literally incapable of doing so. It's valiant in some respect, if not a tad unnecessarily showy and obnoxious. It's something like this that makes it clear why Chie's character draws many people to love and many people to be annoyed by her. While both interpretations are simultaneously parts of her whole, some people find the negative aspect more irritating and some people find the positive aspect more pure and enjoyable. Okay, well, we defeated the Shadow, so now we're getting into the Persona. Tomoe. While I get more into her ultimate persona in the other segment, I want to talk a little bit about the mythologized Tamoe. Tamoe was said to be someone willing to fight even the strongest demon, someone who ran into battles, spear blazing, and someone with the power of 1,000 men. She also has connections to the first shogunate and the family line leading back to Amaterasu, who, once again, is Yukiko. Mythology, from what I've seen, is really muddy on who Tomoe exactly was, but I think we can draw from the willingness of Chie to run into the castle, with essentially no weapon, in order to save Yukiko as a fitting figure of Tomoe fighting any demon to secure the first shogunate and preserve Amaterasu's lineage. If you look at it that way, and as Yukiko looking for her prince, it really lines up pretty nicely. 
Sorry this wasn't as in-depth, I wish I could have gone into Tomoe longer, like with a lot of the other segments, but with Yosuke's initial persona, it directly links in with the appearance and nature of his shadow self, while Tomoe has a fairly separate persona appearance from the demons her shadow is based on. Perhaps this change from a demon represented as ugly and a woman concerned for wanting to appear as liked by others in physicality, turning into a proud woman who fights and sticks to her ideals is the real thing that they're trying to emphasize this change in perspective that Chie went through that is now an opposing idea entirely. Chie faced herself, the person who desperately hung on for being seen important who leached off of others, and embraced the good parts of who she is, her determination and her spirit for sacrificing all to fight for the people and place she loves. Getting slightly ahead of ourselves here, but this also fits with Chie's desire to become a police officer and protect Inaba after it's saved, which is something we find out way farther into the story. It goes back to something she says on the last day of the game, when you say bye to her before the final dungeon, and she states how she told you that I wanted to become strong so that I could protect what matters most to me, right? Well, I want to protect this town. We all worked to win this piece. I want to keep it that way. I think that mentality is really what she came into when she faced her shadow. She realized her strength and decided not to be ashamed of it anymore. The social link for Chie further expands on who Chie is and the other things that she holds important, like all of the player characters, but I really think that it emphasizes that quote from a few moments ago in all it aims to do. Chie takes you out for a quote-unquote training, which is mainly just her kicking the air and exercising. She's letting you know that she's doing it here because she kicked a hole in the shoji, the shoji being a wall divider in classic traditional Japanese homes, giving an impression that Chie's family has probably been in Inaba for many, many generations. It also drives home that Chie's reckless acts before thinking personality apparently is not something that runs in her family. The last thing she states in the start of her social link is a direct addressal of her shadow self making her feel pathetic, and that since that's a part of her, she needs to work even harder at overcoming it so she can become truly strong inside and out. Next is a really fun mechanic that exists within Rise, Yukiko, and Chie social links, at least off the top of my head. Nanako shows up. The thing is, if you do this during the Heaven Dungeon or later, Nanako doesn't appear and the script for the social link changes a bit to exclude her. Just a fun detail I thought I'd mention. In this social link, you find out that Chie is extremely afraid and freaked out by bugs. This is the first look at the idea that Chie may have some traditional femininity traits in her after all. Nanako reassures Chie that she's not weird for not liking bugs, although she does so by comparing her with the literal elementary schoolers, which is kind of funny. But aside from that, it gives a first opportunity to tell Chie that she's cute which I mention for her specifically because her character insecurity and self through the story is directly connected to this feeling of not adding up as a likable or cute woman. Or as the shadow self says, I can't, I can't win, win as, as a girl, girl let, let alone, alone as a person. I'm pathetic. Next, you get introduced to a quote-unquote childhood friend of Chie and Yukiko, Takeshi, who shows up and essentially belittles her training as childish, bringing up the embarrassing stuff that she did when she was younger. Takeshi sucks. This guy is awful, and thankfully only shows his face in Chie's link. After belittling Chie a bit, he asks if Yukiko still hasn't got a boyfriend yet, and if she's still good-looking, then mentioning that he should maybe try for her again. This paints a whole other dynamic of Chie and Yukiko's childhood that, while implied, definitely gives more sympathy to the way that Chie was feeling in Yukiko's dungeon. It's clear since childhood, Chie maybe tried to be likable and gentle with other guys, polite and everything, but no matter what, they always went for her friend instead. Eventually, she got to the point where she began assuming any time a guy talked to her that he was doing so to get with Yukiko. It's a really sad idea that maybe she would intentionally try to be a little more gentle and friendly, so that when Yukiko did predictably reject them, that maybe they would still give her a second thought. It also gives more context to how Chie was kind of selling Yukiko on you when you first met her. And at the end of this link, you even see with how stuttery and shy Chie is when taking in the rudeness from Takeshi, not standing up for herself. It's clear that while Chie may have faced herself and her shadow and is trying to overcome her envy, it doesn't mean she no longer feels insecure about her own value as a woman and doesn't lack confidence in herself still. That's part of what this whole social link is about. 
this is probably the most sensitive aspect of Chie's character that I personally find intriguing. She stutters, Hey, don't get me wrong, he's just an old classmate to me, and suspicions are confirmed. She follows up on doubling it down with, w We're just friends, you know? We used to get that a lot, though. You get the idea that she does still kind of like him, even though he is horrible. Her next social link gets back to showing her more traditionally masculine traits, at least through the lens of Japanese culture. Her wolfing down tons of food and meat happily, but she excuses it as beefing up to fight for people like Yukiko. She mentions how she's worrying about her, but if you actually say that you're more worried about her, she pretends not to understand and brushes it off. Like, what? But I've been training. I'm fine. It shows she's still very closed off and uncomfortable to the idea of being the one that people are concerned for. She just defaults to concern for Yukiko because that's what she expects other people who spend time with her to be wanting. Now the main plot line for her social link kicks off. After presenting her insecurity and the points the social link intends to connect with, as well as introducing Takeshi, we hear from a police officer that a group of delinquents are around robbing people and to be careful. A sort of chuny line that comes back to Tomoe and her previous actions is her third person line in this link. To protect this town's peace, she throws herself into the battlefield, unbeknownst to all. This is the first time Chie blushes at you in a way you don't cause directly by asking if you would help fight them with her. Fighting being more abstract than literal, I imagine, but if it's a real fight, then she's willing, at least to help others. The next link introduces us to the group as Takeshi is now being robbed. Takeshi first runs behind Chie for cover when he sees her. Then, when things start to look hairy, he runs off because Takeshi sucks. I hate that guy. People like him should not breathe. Eventually, though, Chie and your efforts cause the group to back down for the time being, but it isn't the last they'll show up, obviously. Also, what kind of delinquent wears a pretty blue scarf? Even though Chie asked you to help last time, you stepping in actually upsets her, asking if it's because you thought she couldn't handle it. Of course, she immediately apologizes for this assumption, for being unreasonable, but it really speaks to her fear of being seen as weak. But even more so, her fear of opening up and having others actually care for her. Her fear of that unknown. Afraid they'll leave or change their mind when something better comes around. And they always will, because there's always something better. I love Chie's insecurity in Persona 4 Golden. It looks at societal expectations and the way childhood disappointment and underappreciation has led to her believing a lie about herself that makes her double down in radical behavior to cover for her insecurity. That actual struggle of fearing not being good enough for someone, and so working really hard to at least protect them, be meaningful in that way, is very clever and not something I see explored often. Takeshi, the horrible devil on Chie's shoulder, shows up again. This time, after essentially using Chie as a meat shield to save his own hide, leaving her to three other men, he comes to apologize and frames it as him taking off, like he left a group hangout without saying bye. Chie understandably frustrated with being disregarded whenever she stood up for him and recalling your willingness to stay, asks why he won't just say he ran away and instead of holding his ground. You know, be a man. Maybe harsh, but more than 100% reasonable considering. Takeshi then strikes with his words, asking if she's always been that anal and driving home what we know is Chie's personal insecurity, that she won't have anything left if she gets rid of her sunny disposition. This is where you see she may have not only internalized her feelings about herself from childhood lack of care, passing her up on Yukiko, but also that boy that she liked literally told her these things as she grew up as far as before starting high school. Chie gladly isn't taking it anymore, not playing the shy game. She tells him to shut up, but then he pivots the conversation to Yukiko immediately, now making fun of Yukiko's admittedly horrible laugh, and saying that Chie might be ruining what he finds attractive in Yukiko, like his opinion on her ever really even mattered. Here you get some backstory on Yukiko and Chie's friendship, and when she met Yukiko, she had been told that she couldn't keep a dog that she found, how she looked sad and gloomy, even dead inside. Chie decided she wanted to do her best to bring the joy back into Yukiko's strict lifestyle, and simply wanted to make her laugh again. This is something fun referenced later in the game when Yukiko becomes more open with the laughing and Chie goes, Man, you'll show that laugh to anyone these days. She fixes on this old memory, wanting to work on herself, and becoming more of someone that she could take pride in after she became reliable to Yukiko, 
but somewhere along the line her reliability became an escape from improving rather than a reason to. She even mentions her excitement towards solving the case. Maybe it was just another way for her to feel reliable instead of improving herself. Really good personal insight, so from here, she is going to start changing for real. She guesses that everyone is out there looking for that thing that lets people say, this is what makes me worthwhile. The next social link involves learning that when Takeshi was inevitably cornered again by the gang, he leaked info about Chie and Yukiko's relationship, including their addresses. The punks, now harassing a little kid, try to use this information to blackmail her into inaction, but Chie stands firm, and they back down again. After hearing the kid thank her, she determines she really deep, deep down does care about protecting people. It's not just because she likes being relied on or likes the power, but because she wants to see people that she cares about safe. This is the point where you can choose to enter a relationship with Chie, if you're sure about it being the right decision. After all, it's her you're talking about. This is another step to Chie learning to find value in herself. And of all the girls in Persona 4 Golden, she's maybe one of the ones whose character arc and romance link directly intertwine for a more positive conclusion. She ends her social link inconclusive of what the good parts of herself are, to her at least, but she ends with the hope that one day she will keep on looking for them, and that she does feel like she's at least found what she wanted, the power to protect others, and not for furthering her own self-reliance like running in ahead without thinking, but instead to run ahead as a spear and a shield in her ultimate third persona awakening. Her third persona awakening surprises me, as one of the most insightful awakenings in Persona 4, and speaks to a lot more growth that has happened since earlier in her story. She talks about how she's been broadening her new horizons and trying to understand the world as a whole, not just as it is from her perspective. She spent some time thinking about how Adachi's perspective on things were and wondered if she could have become cynical like he did. After all, she's the girl that people pass up on. She's never the one that people want. Adachi's spite toward being alone and unloved, combined with a lack of responsibility and a few other sugars and spices, led him to become who he was. Chie realized that the her she knows, and the her that sees the world, isn't all there is to understanding both her and the world. She is the amalgamation of hundreds if not thousands of years of history. The battles, the mentalities, they are all important in some way. With family lineages, culture, they are all connected to her. The mythology, the battles, the wars of the past, she is in those stories, and those stories are in her. Fitting for someone whose initial persona is a pseudo-historical figure known for her prowess in battle. And she states even if things like math doesn't come to her naturally, those things are tools to better understand the world. They're important. Even if after this she does still do some self-deprecating, it shows that despite her still not knowing what her good points are, without fully reaching her conclusion, she's taken the idea of finding them seriously, which is truly the character arc that you want to see. Chie is the chariot arcana in Persona 4. The Hebrew letter for the chariot is Shet, which describes a field with a fence around it. The chariot is the cultivator of this field, where many come out and go to play. Another word I would like to think is synonymous with cultivator in this context is the protector, which fits Chie's desire really well. She protects this land of Inaba, the inner limits, the place full of things and people who has made her who she is, and the people within the field are her friends and loved ones, the places she's always loved to visit. The black and white sphinxes on the card that guide the chariot on either side represent the yes and the no, and are somewhat transferable in terms of meaning to the black and white pillars seen on the priestess, which is Yukiko. I think this shows some connectedness between the two, as friends within the game, and the fact that they both awaken within the same dungeon. But the fact that Chie controls the movement of the chariot, and her yes and no's guide the way, gives insight to her nature as someone who acts, makes big movements, and perhaps does so in place of someone else. This being Yukiko's, whose yes and no's are not moving beings, but still pillars. The chariot is depicted outside of the city and across from the river, away from the others. 
This refers to time taken alone to focus in order to let a higher self decide the actions away from the influence of others. We see this with Chie rediscovering herself and wanting to protect others not for herself, but for a sense of higher calling, for this exact idea of protecting itself. We also see this solitude later, as when she takes up the time to start researching her good points, we reconvene with her to unlock her ultimate persona, and it turns out that she has been taking time to research and study things about the world in order to understand her true self and her place in the great scale of things. How to protect, and where to find what she is made for. On the higher polarity, the chariot is mental control, guided by a higher self. On the lower polarity, the yes and no can tear a person every which way, dividing them from searching for their goal earnestly and with clarity. As we find her at the beginning of the game, the chariot, also in its upright position called the triumphant chariot, can also allude to courage in the face of unlikely odds or harrowing situations, brazen confidence and standing tall, all of which are traits that fit Chie's aggressive and confrontational attitude, as well as Tomoe, her original persona. A reversed chariot may also refer to the infighting or argument, which I think can be seen from her stubbornness, causing her to not back down and argue with teammates for extended periods of time. Now we're going to be getting into some of the extra aspects of the character that aren't represented through the main dungeon or the Persona Awakening or the Social Link, aspects of the characters that go on without that. This includes some of her character flaws, the things that make her human, and it is with a candid honesty that I have to admit, from all of the Persona protagonists from Persona 3 to 5, at least the ones who don't betray you, Chie probably has the most unchecked and rampant character flaws of any of them. One good example is the beauty contest in the cultural festival, where Chie is the only one to display shyness about her less feminine characteristics. Since she doesn't feel confident in what makes her her, she lies on stage and gives off a very tacky, stereotypically Japanese feminine answer, which Yosuke obviously scoffs at in the crowd. This moment is very sad, because this is the same sort of quietness she's clearly trained herself to do, that she tried with Takeshi in her link, and clearly she feels that this is the right thing to do when she's trying to appeal to others. She realized too that she needs to take confidence and pursue who she is, but maybe due to her still working things out in her head, it causes her to backtrack again. That would be the narrative reason, of course, one could focus on, but from a more meta perspective on the game design, you could also say that there's a good chance many people would have not finished her character arc by this point, and for those people who barely touched it, this would make sense with her character. But I don't think this creates a dissonance one could assume by the narrative either. After all, if that was the issue, it would likely stand out less to make her not lie, but be shy or tone things down instead. Having her blatantly lie, I think, fits what we know about even though after she finishes her link, she's still trying to find herself and what she considers positive. She knows that she should have more courage in who she is, but she still isn't sure of what parts of herself that should be, so defaulting back to how she's always dealt with the insecurity and fear of being rejected, especially on a big stage like that, while sad and unfortunate, it does make sense with her character flaw, regardless of place in the story, either social link progress, high or low. The culture festival in general speaks to some of her lower polarity of her stubbornness, causing the spiteful fighting and discourse, that mainly being that when Yosuke on his own signs up the girls for the beauty contest, which is not cool, she retaliates by signing up all of the guys for the cross-dressing contest instead. If we were to purely look at what's fair, I think it would be funny and kind of fair to punish Yosuke with cross-dressing festival, despite it being worse than just a normal beauty contest. Because that's just what he gets, you know? He signed her up without permission, he didn't care what she thought about it, so obviously why should she do the same? But by signing up the other guys, I think it shows her running in and acting without thinking again, another flaw we see at the beginning of the story. You and Kanji had no role in this situation, and no matter which way you cut it, it's a 2012 rural high school. A cross-dressing contest, especially in Japan, exists to laugh and make fun of how wrong and gross the guys on stage look, as is exactly what happens. While a beauty contest is focusing on and thinking positively about those on the stage. Now, once again, I'm tempted to look at things from a meta point of view, 
saying, okay, well, maybe the story writers just wanted to make a scene like this in the game because it's entertaining, and this offers some light fan service before the darkest arc gets set into place. And from a story writing perspective, that would be a reasonable observation, but you can't randomly dictate when a character within their narrative should no longer be held to realism of the world or events, and when they should be taken seriously, just because of how you perceive the writing. It's just cherry-picking that way, and isn't a fair way to look at the characters in any definable sense. On top of that, it's not like this is out of Chie's well-defined character flaws either. She's acting totally in character here. Speaking of scenes likely made for comedy that show bad lights for Chie, there's one more dynamic and event that is possibly a callback to her mythological backing of the Futakuchiona, the two-mouthed woman we talked about earlier. Chie is the only person on the investigation team without a job. Yukiko works at the inn, Kanji helps his mom at the textile shop, Rise was an idol, but now assists her grandmother at the tofu shop, Naoto is a professional, prefecturally recognized detective, and Yosuke seems so work-relentless as many of his social links are even spent while he's taking breaks or on work at Juness. And for the protagonist, of course, he can have any multitude of jobs, a few of which are directly linked to social links. Chie is, then, the only one who doesn't work for her money, and she also is the only one who constantly guilts and find ways for others to pay for her food or snacks, this mainly being Yosuke. You're probably wondering where I'm getting to, though. This is mainly an issue in the scene Once Teddy Becomes Human, where Chie somehow, without permission, uses Yosuke's money to buy an extremely expensive outfit for Teddy. Before Yosuke knows what Chie has done, he actually gives Kanji the USD equivalent of around $10, so he and Teddy can split some ice cream bars to celebrate the occasion of Teddy coming over to their world. Kanji, even given the circumstance, is a basic human being with morals, so he says, I can't just take this from you. But Yosuke insists, this is meant to be a real show of kindness, since Yosuke spent months saving up for a motorcycle which was immediately ruined on their first excursion. It's common knowledge that Yosuke is pretty light on money right now due to that, but on top of housing Teddy, he's also trying to do his best and be reliable here. Chie makes fun of Yosuke for trying to do this in a mocking tone. And this is sort of the normal dynamic Chie and Yosuke have, for better or worse. At least it would be, if this wasn't in contrast to what she's about to reveal that she's done, and how she reacts to his reaction. Chie mentions not having the money and charging it all on Yosuke's bank account. When Yosuke gets mad, Chie blames him for the prices at Juness, which with the knowledge of Yosuke's character arc, his resentment for having his whole life uprooted, abandoning his friends, and basically made to work out the ass at Juness to help his father, and even besides all of that, not obviously having control over the prices at Juness, pile on him being ostracized by all of Inaba as part of the reason the shops are closing down, an unfair association that has stigmatized him in his entire social life since he got here. She somehow tries to twist this as his fault, since it's something Juness related that he has no power over. And it seems to really strike insensitive considering everything we know about Yosuke. When he brings up that he has almost no money right now due to the motorcycle he just saved up and bought that just got broken, she says, so what, if you're already broke, a little more debt isn't gonna make much of a difference. Which is maybe as unlikable of a line as you can possibly write for someone who just betrayed their friend's trust by stealing their money while they don't even have a job themselves. This scene closes with Chie not once showing remorse and instead insisting in some way that it's Yosuke's fault for being upset, but this isn't a one-off scene. It actually gets referred back to later on multiple times. While Nanako, months later, is in the hospital, they all agree to pitch in and buy an on-sale kotatsu for whenever she comes back home. Yosuke gently then brings up that he doesn't want to be stuck footing the whole bill this time. And Chie jokingly acts like she doesn't know what he's talking about. It's then confirmed that Yosuke had to spend multiple days of work paying off what Chie spent on Teddy's clothes. Days. Like, think of that. Days of his life working in retail for money you aren't going to see a cent of because your friend decided to steal from you. After him mentioning it, Chie jokes about it again, even more on this, but if we're assuming something around the minimum wage for 2012, that would full-time come out to about 30,000 yen a month. Now, obviously, Yosuke is not full-time because he's also a full-time student and he has to hang out and do this other stuff. If we assume the minimum of three days of work Yosuke spent paying this off, 
The amount of money in USD that Chie likely spent, adjusted for modern inflation and converted to USD, would likely be $120.27, and likely over $200 if you factor in that being the bare minimum normal interpretation of the word days. While it's fun to play game theory and find out how much money though, this isn't really the point. Chie spends hundreds of dollars from her friend without permission, refuses to apologize even once for months on end, and instead opts to belittle and be stubborn about it to them. Different characters grow in their character flaws, such as Yosuke eventually apologizing and stopping his teasing of Kanji over his perceived sexuality. But for better or for worse, Chie is the most outspokenly flawed person in Persona 4, never apologizing for anything heinous she does. And that's a reason that so many people love her, I guess. If I had to twist this whole thing into something positive, I'd say it at least makes it pretty clear that she's not a waifu simulator girl like some people who have no reading comprehension try to dub the Persona games flatly as. She's a character I, at times, find genuinely frustrating, and at times find extremely relatable to. But it's never because she's poorly written or inconsistent in her characterization. It's because of who she is. And I respect Atlas for being able to write male and female characters with such dynamic flaws. Back to the positives, though. Wow, sorry for spending so much time on the flaw section again. I just thought that in terms of analysis and not repeating myself, Chie would serve as the best place to explore the dynamic character writing Atlas has created in flawed characters, both in showing flaws that make you empathize with the character and flaws that make you frustrated. Chie Satanaka, first name meaning wisdom and blessing, second name meaning center, the parent's home, or the village, if we were to give context to the game directly, her name's meaning would generally read as the story or blessing on Inaba. Her name perfectly represents her drive and desire to protect the place of the ones that she loved, the place that she's already fought to defend, like a guardian angel over the town, eventually choosing a profession that she hoped would help her do that better in the future. Chie's character arc is that of a good-hearted girl who desires to be appreciated and looked after after being bullied and passed over, which formed into a feeling to protect others when she herself felt unprotected. To give others what she was passed over, and a genuine love and care to keep the ones who mean the most to her safe. Chie is brash and courageous, willing to stand up to any injustice and wrongdoing she sees without regard for personal safety or odds. While this materializes in sometimes unjust stubbornness, it all comes from a good place. Chie is smarter than she knows and most people realize. She is competent, often leading to genuine discoveries and mental paths forward in cracking the murder case, while still feeling shy when it happens. Chie is hard to write a segment covering her character arc because she really is the most in progress of the investigation team, even come to the end of the story. She is still searching for that thing she considers her good points, and still working to make those things better, so sometimes she doesn't even have the answer herself for everything around her. She's relatable in that sense, to anyone who's still growing as a person and finding themselves, and that should be, on some level, everyone, because the moment you stop growing is the moment you die. Something she does overcome is her envy, though. She had slowly let this feeling of being relied upon corrupt her in service as a substitute for the hole that she felt in her worth deep down inside. But after facing herself, she works to be less manipulative, and as addressed in my color theory segment, is something that she's shown to have completely conquered come the true ending, extra epilogue scenes. Growth is something that pervades us all. It causes us to question and re-examine. Our values, our opinions, our perspectives. If we ever stop doing that, as difficult as it may be, we may find that the comfort of our own limited perspective is too warm to venture outside, and we become corrupted in a lie that we once thought was the truth. Chie, in regards to the theme of truth in Persona 4, represents the Seeker. While all of the other cases reach themselves to some extent or another, but still seek to know more, Chie's whole arc is about the act of seeking itself. Just because perfection exists, and you know it's a literal unattainability within most contexts, doesn't mean that it's not worth striving for, to become the best that you can be. In Chie's case, and to some of our own, truth itself is obtainable but aspects of it may be more elusive and complex than others. 
Just because it's difficult, or we may not fully understand it, doesn't mean that we don't gain a world of insight just by devoting ourselves to continue seeking for it. Hey, welcome to the first intermission! If you couldn't tell by the introduction of this video, I'm not exactly comfortable on camera, but I'm glad that you've made it this far. I just want to let you know, you don't... Do not watch this in one setting. It's a horrible idea. It's a terrible idea. Do not watch this video in one setting. Um, I intentionally divided this video up into multiple different ways that you can watch it. Uh, mainly the big segments are peppered with smaller segments and then those smaller segments have even smaller segments wedged between. It's intentionally viewed so you can easily pick up and leave where you left off. But yeah, so this is just the first intermission to tell you if you need to, take a break. You can always just do something else and come back. This is too long to watch in one sitting. Otherwise, I hope you're enjoying. All my favorite segments are still yet to come. Uh, but I want to give a big obvious thank you to people that I find inspiring. Uh, that being Matthew Matosis, uh, Tim Rogers. I'd say those are two of the most significant uh, analytical people that I look up to. And obviously some of the aesthetics of... Uh, the, at least the start of the video in these live action segments as well as the thumbnail uh, were clearly inspired by that. This is a project that I've been working on for an entire year and to see it come to fruition is um, uh, partly horrifying. Um, <laughs> I kind of hoped that I'd be in a little better shape by the time that I was able to do this but you know life gets in the way. Um, this is my full-time job, and I want to do this again, but it's hugely time and hours consuming. So I'm also going to leave this as an opportunity to plug my Patreon. If you want to see something like this again, it is necessary. It might be impossible for me to get a project like this done ever again if I am not able to sustain myself through Patreon. Uh, I don't even know if this video is going to get in the algorithm, you know, fingers crossed. But uh, thank you for getting this far in the very least. Um, anywho, uh, let's get on with the show. Now we're gonna talk about color theory. In my opinion, probably the closest analysis ever toes the line towards pseudo-intellectualism. At least, that's the feeling in my gut I have trouble shaking. But while it may not always have something thought out in every piece of art from every person who's ever done it, this is a renowned form of art critique and style that has been a part of public art discourse since the turn of the century in 1704 with Isaac Newton's theory of color. Since then, the way we naturally associate emotion and ideas with colors has been studied thoroughly, including with special mental elements that amplify these subconscious feelings, like synthesia, which naturally associates for the person different mediums with each other. For example, to people with synthesia, things can taste red or sound pink. So before you give in to your natural implications, keep in mind that there is some validity in color theory, even on a biological level, with the way our brains compartmentalize and associate things subconsciously. And as for the art that created Persona, at least, if we've seen already that the structure and characters are handled mindfully elsewhere, why should we arbitrarily decide that we're too good for it and that it stops here? Especially when, and here's the most validating part, the people doing the character designs are well-renowned and paid character designers. I think we shouldn't dismiss it. Let's have fun taking color theory to task as we look at the overall design for our main cast of characters in Persona 4. Shigenori Sojima, the artist behind Persona 3 through 5, among obviously countless other Atlas titles, who did all the character designs and was the one who decided Persona 3 would be blue, Persona 4 yellow, and Persona 5 red, has already stated how he was mindful with how these colors would present certain emotions. He admits that it was semi-unintentional with Persona 3, but when Persona 4 rolled around, he wanted a happy and more uplifting tone represented by something like a yellow handkerchief of happiness, giving it a cheerful vibe, which of course stands by the color theory interpretation of it. But also probably just matches your natural intuition, because for most people, that's how color theory works. Yellow is often associated with things like optimism, idealism, hope, sunshine, and summer. He also cloaks a dark yellow over the murder scenes to give it this sickish vibe. Some negative emotions naturally associated with yellow are illness, hazard, and things like deceit. 
So since we have on record Sojima considering aspects of color theory into his design on Persona 4, I think it's now more than reasonable to draw analysis here. In fact, Marie in some of her social links even makes slight fun of the fact that Chie is always wearing greens and Yukiko is wearing reds and pinks. So let's jump into the main cast and see some of what their design says about them. I'm gonna round back to Yosuke, but how about we hit Chie first? with our car. No. <laughs> Chie is primarily green with yellow stripes. The positivity and idealism is something that we already have covered is part of yellow, and makes sense with Chie's positive mentality. The fact that she ends up actually dedicating herself to becoming a police officer in her future is something to consider too. Wanting to help bring up and keep the peace in her town that she's already fought so hard for, green is also associated with youthfulness, something shown in her childish idea of training by doing kung fu moves Moves, despite no longer being a kid and actually not putting effort into proper technique. Other traits like youthfulness and vigor contribute to her energetic nature with green, but possibly best of all, green stands for envy. Heck, we even have a common phrase that someone can be green with envy. Chie's initial character arc comes from her envy toward her more classically feminine best friend Yukiko, and her feelings of insecurity as to not being a great woman in her own eyes. Being envious of the pretty and ladylike girls unlike herself. Um, also, in some portraits, she also has a jacket open, exposing a white shirt, which also can stand for pure youthful nature. Interestingly enough, and very wholesome, is after the time skip, there is no green on her person at all. The lack of green obviously leads into her character arc finally overcoming her insecurity and envy through the events of last year, and having the yellow present in her other outfits still make it up to rest here, it shows that she still has that positivity and idealism turned up even more after facing herself and maturing as a person. Blue is now, from an occasional minor color, the other dominant color on her outfit, and I think in this context it represents its meaning of truth and confidence. Her gained confidence on who she is as a person and as a woman. Her gained truth through the trials conquered. Now back to Yosuke as I promised. Yosuke is defined through most of his outfits with primarily orange with stripes of red. Red obviously has association with anger, but it also has a connection with passion in general. As Sojima pointed out himself when giving an interview on deciding to give Persona 5 its red color focus. This passion toward the case, this even more outspoken anger toward the killer, being personally connected to a person killed there. The orange, I think, balances this as it represents humor, warmth, flamboyance, and enthusiasm. Yosuke's warmth and humor is something that defines and makes him sit out from the rest of the group quite strongly, having a sort of radiant comfort to him in some scenes. He's still hot-tempered and drawn by negative desires as well, but generally I think this all fits Yosuke to a T. In his true ending appearance, his orange and red have melded mostly into a slightly reddish pink color. Pink is associated often with contentment and of someone who is happy and healthy. This innocent, relaxed self also fits in with the idea of the inner self conquered and an era of peace after the game's conclusion. Yukiko has a more varied primary focus outfit to outfit, but generally has a base of red and white, which transitions into pink, which also fits her persona, Konohano Sakeya, who uses fire moves and mythologically is tied to pink cherry blossom trees, even emphasized in her ultimate fire move, burning petals. I'll attempt not to repeat myself too much as we go on, but in Yukiko's case, red representing love makes sense in the same way that Chie's green meaning envy did. Her personal insecurity and wanting to be swept away by someone who can love and take care of her is central to the conflict of her dungeon. The pinks, on the other hand, while representing innocence as I said before, they can also refer to things that are soft, delicate, and traditionally feminine in nature. This makes sense as Yukiko is easily the most reserved, classically feminine, quiet, and traditionally Japanese of the bunch. I mean, she's the only one they went out of their way to give black hair and is repeatedly called things like traditional beauty other than the obvious connection to an old Japanese inn. Once again, at the end of the game, the red is almost entirely gone from her outfit, instead cloaking her in a light, gentle blue, coming back to trust, truth, and unity that represents the color. 
there's plenty of other things it represents with her here as well, although they honestly just sound like synonyms at this point, so I'll leave it there. Kanji is normally adorned in blacks and dark colors, giving us a look at both sides of him from our wrong first impression in-game and our knowledge of him when we understand him. Black can mean, obviously, as seen in millions of metaphors and examples since the beginning of time, ever, evil. It means fear, unhappiness, and mystery, which all fits the feelings of curiosities of the early investigation team and town of Inaba toward Kanji at the early part of the game before rescuing and seeing his dungeon. On the flip side, black often represents sexuality, power, and a rejection of proposed norms. Kanji being someone torn and confused by his sexuality, and being against societal norms by being into traditionally feminine interests, fits him too well. The other colors we see pop up in prominence are yellow and purple. Yellow, as we've covered, can refer to joy, optimism, and hope. I think this is the vibe that's given by a black jacket draped over his shirt. That inside, Kanji is a sugar bun of simple happiness, a good ideal friend who really cares and is very sensitive, but feels too afraid into holding on a facade that keeps that true self hidden. The purple, as we haven't covered yet, can refer to transformation, while still holding on to connection to ideas of eroticism and sexuality from his other colors. This purple is only seen in the last month of the playable game, so his transformation makes sense to show purple, all he's gone through, and now all he's grown. At the end of the game, just like every other character we've covered, Kanji loses his primary color, the black representing and associating with his insecurity conquered, with exception to his naturally black hair now, which could be taken to mean that he has come to grips and accepted who he is, no longer putting on a facade. The white and yellow also being prominent shows his willingness to show a more authentic, trustworthy, ideal, and joyful self openly after conquering his inner self and feelings over the previous year. Risei Kujikawa is overwhelmingly pink and orange, both colors we've already covered. Her energy, flamboyance, and vibrancy fitting her tendency to joke and poke fun at others like Kanji and the other girls being made apparent. The pink being romantic, charming, playful, and feminine also makes sense. For God's sakes, she's literally the lover's arcana. She's pink, which means love. It's not that hard to see. Her outfit ending in primarily blue, though, with some pink, covered in a partly transparent white top, the blue and white feels like a theme again and again. The truth, unity, and confidence carries over with our Persona cast together, as they come together after conquering themselves and Izanami's plot to make them avoid that truth. Naoto is blue. Oh, so blue. She's very blue all the time. Her hair is blue. Her hat is blue. She's basically always wearing blue and forever. I think if I were to extrapolate a meaning of this dark blue, it would probably be stability, since we consistently see that as part of her design. It also represents someone concerned with order and security. The security also makes sense with her dungeon being a literal secret base, all based around security protocols and threats. Sometimes blue refers to cold, in both temperature and perception of socialization someone who is cold, reserved, and standoffish. A description of dark blue sometimes is conservatism, not politically, obviously, but emotionally, personally, conversing and protecting the self. That's something we see a ton with Naoto through the game, in her inability to properly understand jokes or really converse with others in an open manner. In her shadow self, a yellow tie appears, showing a sort of emphasis on the negative traits of yellow, jealousy, covetousness, and idealism, although not in a negative way, wholesale. Her final outfit is overwhelmingly white, representing the same as the previous to her. But note that the outfit design accentuates exposed arms and a more feminine shirt giving focus on her defined bust. This also shows how the blue and white she has now has turned into that confidence and self-assuredness that she wanted about herself, a level of inner peace that she loves and accepts herself as who she is, even enough to confidently show herself that way to others. Now let's try to run a little bit more of an abbreviated speed round for some characters not in our main party. 
Nanako is almost always primarily in white with some pink, representing purity, innocence, and love. Adachi is cloaked in a dark, almost black color, representing his identity, with a deeper red tie showing his anger. Red also represents blood when mixed more darkly rather than bright and colorful. In contrast, Dojima actually wears a light gray and bright red tie, the bright red referring more to positive traits like passion and strength, but aggression and anger are still a part of his character there as well. The gray or silver is more earthly, grounded, and natural. Ai Ebihara focuses on pink and white, lives up to her name and general personal focus as well, but you've probably heard me ramble on about her already, so... I think with what I've said, you can pretty accurately deduce the general goal of each of the characters' outfits from here on out. But I thought this would be a fun, interesting change of pace, and a good moment to focus on the more subtle aspects of professional art whenever it comes to context of story and narrative that you usually don't see a lot outside of school. Anyways, on to the next segment. The One More System. Okay, so combat operates on the One More System, which is different from the Baton Pass seen in Persona 5 and the Press Turn System seen in the modern Shin Megami Tensei games. It's the same battle system seen as Persona 3 with a few changes. Down an enemy, get a free turn. Down them all and get a free group attack. Aside from that, the battle mechanics are fairly self-explanatory if you've played any other Atlas game or any other half-decent RPG. And since you're watching this, I'm assuming that you have. The amount of strategy allowed in one more was overhauled into a genuinely fantastic fluid baton pass system in Persona 5, but I can't blame it for not having the improvements of a game that improved those things. I can complain, however, about its strategy not being nearly as robust as the already popularly established press turn system which made its debut and continued appearance on the same system Persona 4 launched on. So, this is how it goes. I can't say I love one more, but at least it offers more than the standard, classic style of turn-based combat. Plus, I'm happy that they chose to change and spend more time writing characters than overhauling battle systems, considering Persona 4 was made with a very short turnaround time from Persona 3, and at still not that great of a budget. Daisuke Nagase is one of the two people that you can get when you choose a sports team in Persona 4 Golden. He is the soccer option. The first impression of the soccer team in general is a sort of projected groupthink that, since you're from the city, you must look down on them and be full of yourself. They do practice and don't even bother to introduce themselves, but one person on the team is an exception to that rule. One person does. It's Daisuke who shows compassion to you, telling you to just play and have fun and eventually they'll be over themselves. Cole, who is now established to be a friend of Daisuke's, also comes in after practice with a bit of typical biting sarcasm. And you find out that the soccer team, just like the basketball team, is pretty pathetic in Inaba. Despite that though, Daisuke is the star player, someone who naturally does really well without even needing to apply themselves a ton. But he does apply himself. He enjoys doing it all the same. Daisuke even defends you a bit from Cole's off-handed sarcastic bullying, calling you a transfer student. On a meta level, the game is trying to show you Daisuke's acute ability to read people, despite being a bit of the brawn over brains archetype. Rank 2 shows the soccer team saddling you with all of the work for cleanup, which honestly is kind of odd. And here's the reason why. People's general impression is that Yu Narukami is a huge Chad who everyone loves, and likely that is due to the largely mimetic non-canon anime adaptations hey, let's make out. that intentionally lean in on fan service moments from the games the sister complex Kingpin of Steel. and expound upon them. But here in the actual game, you're just some city outsider, and other than Daisuke and by virtue of that Cole, nobody in the soccer team could care an ounce about you. You're not special. And in fact, the idea that you could think that you were special is derided by them. While Daisuke initially just suggests bailing without cleaning since it's not your responsibility anyway, you all end up cleaning together as a way to impress the team suggested by Cole. But this is the first hint, I think, toward Daisuke's character that while he's well-intended and good at reading people, he doesn't like to do things he feels unfairly saddled with, and more has a principle-based, rougher approach to answering dilemmas. 
Although, here the game may be hinting at the aversion to do things that hurt, take time, or are unwanted. In other words, his tendency to run away if they don't seem needed or deserved. Something that becomes a major part of his conflict later in his arc. After practice, you visit the ramen shop where the central conflict is first introduced. Cole mentions this first year girl enamored with Daisuke who is watching him from the crowd, but Daisuke claims that he didn't even notice her and changes the topic saying, enough of that crap. It's strangely aversive, especially for a talented popular athlete like him, why he feels uncomfortable being the object of positive attention by girls. While I can't shake the idea that the meta-narrative reason partially has to do with the fact that Cole and Daisuke fit a lot of the shoujo fujo tropes involving implied homosexual and homoerotic relationships, it's fujoji shipping bait, in other words, something that anime does a lot, marking characters with gay undertones and then never confirming or deconfirming the subtexts in the canon. In the case of both Cole and Daisuke, neither of them are gay, or implied to be interested in both as we find out and as is important to both of their links explicitly. Instead, the answer within the regular old narrative is actually a mild guilt and trauma in Daisuke's past, causing him to avoid women after perceived unresolved mistakes. But we'll get into that more as it becomes more relevant in the story. The next link is mainly a repeat, the team picking on you, but Daisuke takes the opportunity to practice more. He's clearly devoted, but then when some girls come up to confront him, likely the same girl mentioned by Cole before, he blows them off somewhat rudely and says, he's busy with practice still. Now we get a clearer message of using dedication toward a hobby to block time that should be used confronting an issue. Daisuke is running from the truth by using otherwise positive activities, which is something you don't actually see covered a lot, where something good is used as escapism rather than something neutral or bad being used for that. Rank 4 introduces Ai Ebihara. This scene is virtually the same as Cole's, and so in the same way that I covered it in Cole's part, I'll keep Ai to her own segment. This introduction does prompt the soccer team to discuss Ai's looks though, giving another opportunity to reinforce Daisuke's own disinterest in women. Something new that we become privy to though, is that the team's reaction is to write off Daisuke's feelings as being caused by his popularity, making him picky and stuck up. This is good information because it helps give us a reason for why Daisuke is not willing to open up with others about his strange feelings, being presented with topics surrounding girls that never truly ask Daisuke why, but rather presuppose his place and feelings in things. Feelings of disappointment and regret. Especially involving women and at his age with who he is, is causing him to be closed off and stubborn from the offset. Already, Daisuke is rough around the edges and inarticulate with his feelings, but with the soccer team, we sort of see this reinforcement in Daisuke's mind over the odd nature of his feelings, giving him all the justification he needs to assume that he won't be understood and to push his feelings farther down. In fact, this assumption that he isn't understood or that people won't want to get to know him and that he just exists to others to fulfill their relationship with stock popular guy is reinforced on the only weak complaint he actually levies at women. That is, that despite never talking to him or knowing anything about them, that they ask him out on dates repeatedly. So he feels objectified by his male teammates and the women who pursue him and take that while he doesn't understand his regret, he feels no one else will either, and no one else even wants to know or understand it. Instead, they want Daisuke to play a role, and to do it well. So his toxic escapism is actually being reinforced by the people around him in his life, pushing him to be this popular archetypal role model while he himself is burning deep down. Rank 5 essentially fulfills your own personal arc, finally proving yourself and being accepted by the team as an apt athlete. Both Daisuke and Cole are happy to see it happen, but this services Daisuke's link more in the ranks onward. Starting rank 6, Daisuke seems to have lost a lot of vigor and passion for playing the game. It even spawns a minor argument with Cole and Daisuke about always putting 100% in. I think a shallow view of this, and one that is also sorely missing the point, would be that since you're doing well, he now feels inferior. But I think instead it is a combination of the events of rank 5 with his own built-up mental arc intersecting. 
First, your win and skill does in fact take the soul sports champ stigma off of him, at least on the team, lightening their pressure and the load on his shoulders. But with their lightened pressure gives way to more time for him to stew over his regrets and wonder why he's doing what he is, unable to push them down successfully, especially with how he has seen himself and Cole band together to get to know you for real and help the real you. He sees on some level now that he does have a tight-knit group who maybe would be there for him if he ever chose to open up, but he's not ready to confront that, or even to know what exactly the that he would be confronting is. You see this willingness to maybe stop using this escape, as when he earns extra laps for one of the girls coming up to him again and talking, asking if it was her fault, he says no. This doesn't seem like the gentleness that he would have afforded a few links earlier when deep in his denialist attitude. The link finally ends with Cole saying that he needs to talk to you, but that it needs to wait until next time around due to family stuff. Now, this seems innocuous enough, but as a bit of a side tangent, it's actually a really smooth, charming bit of consistent writing, as this actually mirrors Cole's apparent business in his own rank six, which, as the rest of Cole's social link, connects to his family in higher detail. It's also cool to point out here that just like in the rank six of Cole's link, where Daisuke actually tells you of plans that he has to help Cole in his rank six, you see the exact thing mirrored in this link of Daisuke's. So in a way, they both end up plot-wise mirroring each other's pacing in some of their story beats. The difference is that the personalities and problems of the characters are sending them through very different journeys, even if they're along the same path. Rank 7 involved Cole confiding in you about his observation about Daisuke's sudden change in attitude, lacking passion for soccer, and this new sullen attitude toward girls, questioning if they could be related. Cole's plan, then, is to set up a 3x3 triple-blind date. A very Cole idea, and as I mentioned in the other segment, is something his own social link calls back to as a joke. Just another bit of character consistency across arcs, and I appreciate that a bunch with Persona 4 Golden. Here, just like Daisuke does early in Cole's link, Cole confides in you with the existence of a girlfriend that Daisuke once had. She apparently broke up with him after she claimed that he didn't actually love her, mainly because they never even made a move to hold hands while in the relationship. According to Cole, ever since then, Daisuke has claimed that he doesn't understand what it means to like another person. Link 8 goes about as well as you would think. Daisuke learns what is going on, then flees the situation. He didn't want the date, didn't sign up, didn't ask for it. Back at Inaba, Cole and Daisuke get into it. Cole asserts that Daisuke is scared that a girl will reject him if he opens up for who he is, and that he's scared to play soccer and plateau or fail to improve, something that's much easier to see now that you've joined the team. Daisuke tries to shut Cole and you out by saying that they don't have a say in his life, but when Cole challenges and asks what you and Cole are to Daisuke, Daisuke finally feels comfortable to give in to the trust that he's developed in you both that he was repressing with his fear. He talks about how a girl asks him out, they claim that they don't understand him, and then they leave. As we know, this misunderstanding has to do with his physicality in a relationship. It reinforces the things I talked about earlier, of the stereotypes and false self projected onto the object of Daisuke, rather than the person he is. They don't expect Daisuke to be complex, or have his own mind about things, to have thoughts and actions that don't align with the lie of his stereotype. It comes out that not only does Daisuke still feel regret over his girlfriend, Cole mentioned before, but that he still actually likes her. He felt he disappointed her, and that of course he liked her, she was the first girlfriend he ever had, and that matters to him. This gives a window into the sensitive and gentle person that Daisuke really is, something foreshadowed in his gentle kindness to come up to you when the rest of the soccer team wouldn't bother. But to think that it really does run this deep is heartwarming for me, really makes me want to see the real him blossom and be accepted by others, not as a stereotype or to fill some objectified role. So he vows to you, his friends, to make it up to her. 
Daisuke goes to share his feelings and clear things up with his ex, just to find out that she had moved on and was with another guy, one of the seniors on the soccer team. But even so, it was never about getting back together with her, it was about sorting things out for him and getting closure. I think Daisuke really resonates with a specific kind of guy that I think feels alone or uncomfortable in themselves in a sexual scenario. I know for years in high school, girlfriend after girlfriend, I would be uncomfortable and feel weird getting intimate with them. In my head, I liked them, I found them attractive, but there was always a sense of awkwardness, a strange uncomfortability. When girls came on to me, I felt that I needed to escape the situation. I was hit with waves of anxiety. I wondered at one point if I was asexual or demisexual or gay. I wondered what was wrong with me. But I felt uncomfortable sharing that when the people around me didn't seem to share this psychological wall that I was having troubles with. After I lost my virginity, I felt extreme anxiety any time a girlfriend would get intimate with me. This is despite me still looking at porn, having fantasies, but when the fantasy reached its moment of realization where it could actually happen, my body would shut down and I would have panic attacks. Now, I know my circumstances are pretty unique and partially due to my trauma, but even prior to that, the uncomfortability I felt and sometimes feel with partners still to this day is nothing wrong, and it took me a long time to understand this. This is part of what Daisuke's arc is all about. The stereotype of the popular athletic guy is a guy who will be physical with the girl he's in a relationship with. The girls that come up to Daisuke expect that from him, and they feel unloved and don't understand his actions when he doesn't do it, judging him and lashing out. Because part of the stereotypes, the objectification in our culture, is that women should be coy and shy and that men should be sexual and aggressive. To be a woman and provocative is looked down upon, to be a man and not obsessed with sex or sexually forward is deemed less than a man. And so, this aspect of Daisuke's struggle is dealt with so casually and with such tact that I would say I've literally never seen it ever anywhere before in media. The way that the game links this overall message of accepting the person you are, even when the self that you aren't is projected onto you, as an object by society and those around you, is also a general message that can be taken in a lot of different ways for a lot of people who don't relate to this very specific way that it's relevant to his character. Daisuke learns in his rank 10 to have confidence in his true self. If people don't accept, if people don't understand, that's on them. He's going to give his 110%, no matter what, toward what he cares about and continue being honest with himself. Eventually, doing this, he'll find people who understand that part of him too. He's already found two who do that, after all. Daisuke Nagase, The Strength, another super solid branch of the split arcana of Persona 4, almost feels like a shame that you were tied to one or the other. But both stories we got are highly different, yet highly unique and compelling stories. Now, for what the name means, Daisuke, Nagase, and how the Strength Arcana applies to them. Daisuke is likely referring to big or great here, and Nagase likely refers to leader, a superior, or a torrent of water. So then Daisuke Nagase follows with the strong leadership, his towering position of strength and diligence, his commanding leadership and compassion, something always sought in a superior. His name fits well with the rough but well-meaning person that he is, who works hard to do his best, especially after his arc, having gained the confidence to believe in his true self and those ambitions for his own cause and end. As mentioned in the other segment, strength is depicted by a woman taming a lion. Not with force, but with coexistence. The lion is the animal instinct or nature within someone, and it has great to offer when wielded properly. The issue with Daisuke was that he was forcing the lion down, not working alongside it. He was controlling with force and therefore suppressing those feelings, rather than letting them breathe healthily. A very different sort of relationship problem than that of Cole, but one that matches the Arcana just the same. 
In alchemy, the taming of the red lion is equivalent to self-realization. Daisuke suppresses the aspects of himself to fit and fall under the watchful speculation of his peers, but he was able to truly act at his best once he realized and accepted those things in himself. This card sometimes refers to a change in health for someone. For Daisuke, I think it's mental. Daisuke is suffering from mental struggles that plague his ability to work properly on the field, but is able to increase his mental health after resolving pieces of his trauma, becoming a more self-affirmed self. Sometimes lower polarity strength can refer to a poor work ethic, either from a toxic overworking or a lack of drive to get things done. In the case of Daisuke, we actually see both of these at different points in the story. At one point, he does work to give in to others' expectations and to help repress his true feelings. It's striving to a level that is actively toxic toward him. And later in his social link, we see him doing things half-hearted before eventually reaffirming not only working hard and well, but also for the right and healthy reasons. The Strength, Daisuke Nagase. Okay, so now we're gonna talk about Castle, uh, which is Yukiko's dungeon theme. Uh, it's defined by two majorly different uh, aesthetic <laughs> like segments uh, that kind of yeah. fade into one another. Is fade too generous of a word? Um, um, <laughs> I don't know. It's it's generous, but I think it's I think it's deserved. I think it's deserved. Yeah. What what are your what are your thoughts on it? I mean, obviously the very first part is very abrasive. It's yeah. So um, I I kind of talked about this a little bit when we talked about the general impressions uh, about the synths and, and harshness. Um, I think that that is no more evident than in Castle. It is very very abrasive, and the synth sounds very old uh, it's very high high end heavy but once it gets to that more laid back section it's actually quite beautiful and that electric piano comes in and kind of glides over the top and i think it's really quite gorgeous so it's interesting to have that dichotomy of this slower more traditionally beautiful section and the abrasive anxiety inducing panic section <laughs> with the super harsh synth that makes me want to like turn down the volume because it's uh it's it's brutal like accompanied with the incredibly in-your-face percussion it uh is a very i will be generous and say unique um <laughs> feeling that it evokes <laughs> from the player i think it's really great when you're being like chased by a shadow for example it invokes exactly the kind of emotion that you want from the player and i think that amongst the soundscape going on in the game the footsteps stuff like that um it is a it's a bit more palatable than if you listen to it separately i think uh thematically speaking i think there's a lot that you could probably take from uh castle in regards to yuke Ko's character at that point in the story um i think that you know her perspective how people see her as this gentle beauty this extremely smart person who runs and resides over the inn responsible um but still cold far away hard to see there's that perspective which i feel like is kind of portrayed through this sort of gentle beautiful segment and then there's sort of how yukiko feels being trapped in that uh, I think the fact that it starts with the abrasiveness and ends with the abrasiveness and sort of like segments this this piece uh, in between it, I think there's a lot of different perspectives that you could probably get from that. There's a lot of different interpretations you could make yeah. in the, her balancing this sort of weight that's all over her, this chaos of all these aspects of her life that she feels she can't control or she's too afraid to try and control. And then the the serenity the serenity of being rescued, of not having to deal with these horrible sounds, these horrible issues all coming down on her and just give it up to someone else. Um, because that's that's what it is, you know. She doesn't she's afraid to make this decision for herself. She's afraid to organize the mess. She wants somebody else to come and do it for her. And so it's sort of like the the anxiety of what's around her and her pushing the issue on others. Um but, I mean, there's a lot of other interpretations you could make, too, for it. I, I think it makes sense. Yeah. Yukiko Amagi, the reserved intelligent one, the future inheritor of the Amagi Inn, the low-key sadist, and the third addition to your party in Persona 4. 
According to Newsflash, Persona Central 2015, on an Atlas livestream, Yukiko was the ninth most popular character in Persona 4, making her the least popular of the investigation team, only edging out Teddy on Nico Nico, a popular Japanese video and streaming service in Japan. In the West, this opinion seems to have historically been similar for once as well. People find Yukiko boring, but regardless of any of that, I'm going to do my best analyzing Yukiko Amagi to the most in-depth extent that I can think possible and maybe have more people offer her some charity in return. Yukiko Amagi's initial impression is that of the cool beauty archetype, someone unobtainable and cold you quickly see by virtue of Chie and spending a moment alone with her prior to the kidnapping, that she's actually also following the cool beauty archetype, fairly easily embarrassed and immature secretly and deep down. Where people saw a cutting silence, there is an implied pressure of the in that may have driven down confidence in her own perspective and desires instead. You get a sense that she is very stressed and has a lot on her own plate, making her pretty much unaware of the very popularity all around her. One thing brought up near whenever you first meet her is a thing called the Amagi Challenge, a challenge where a guy tries to ask Yukiko out and without fail, always they fail. They get turned down. She never goes on a date. It should be noted as well that the Amagi Challenge itself is a reference to the hair of Inaba and the 80 brothers, the Yasogami who all fruitlessly attempted to prove their love and sway Amaterasu but were doomed to fail due to the divine interference of the hair and introduction of Okuninushi. So obviously having the students of Yasogami also all attempt their hand at winning Yukiko's interest, it makes for another of the countless fitting parallels and small references that are just cracked into the base of Persona 4's story. Everyone sees her as the jewel of Inaba in a way, the pretty, hard to get, daughter of Inaba's most renowned tourist location, but it's clear that this description of her feels odd and off-putting. She works and does her schoolwork. In a way, her nature of keeping her head down and quietly excusing herself to her tasks does come off as boring. You wonder what else she has going on. The lack of something radically recognizable hopefully is enticing to some of the viewers who want to learn more. That more is delivered upon. It becomes pretty clear Yukiko is going to be kidnapped, but the investigation team still doesn't have total confidence that she is, or where, or how, or really anything, and what to do about which way to prevent it. They decide to watch the Midnight Channel, and the image is radically different from the reserved traditional girl shown days prior. Yukiko is the first party member to have a dungeon, and is also the first victim of the first proper dungeon in the game, the castle. As I talked about in my segment on how the Midnight Channel works, dungeons of victims who appear on the Midnight Channel have dungeons and shadow selves created of the public subconscious, the shadow parts of the world psyche. Meaning the shadow claiming to be the true self is true, both being the classic perception of the own person's perception of themselves and the perception of all of those who look after them. A sick amalgamation of denied traits by the ego and personal insecurities hidden away with the desires of the judgment from the public. Yukiko's central conflict is revealed. While she remains obedient to the expectations of her upbringing and the authority figures surrounding her, she instead wants someone to be her liberator. Someone reliable, liable, intelligent, and stable. Someone to whisk her away from the rigidness of her upbringing. To whisk her away like a princess from the castle. As we see entering the dungeon with Yukiko's commentary, she wants people to seek her, to validate her, but only so they can compete for who's the strongest contender. Not someone worthy of her love, so to say, like stereotypes and tradition would bend your ear towards, but instead someone worthy in their capability to liberate and rescue. It is the act of becoming free itself that she seeks more than any man, but from her traditional upbringing she sees a man as the easiest way to obtain this freedom. The illusion of her Prince Charming isn't the prince, but the idea that if he can provide her that liberation, he can have anything he wants of her in exchange. Almost like a game or a business transaction, a survey with the technical precision of a true love encounter, artificially formulated for non-love related technical success. This is displayed by the over-the-top game showmanship of the tacky billboards, which is not replicated in dungeons like the rest. Some are more like interview shows, some plain Edo shows, 
most of which are in some way supposed to represent public broadcasting tabloids, conspiracy theory type content that make up most of the locally rented TV slot space through the cable of old. The visual imagery then of a princess in a castle is pretty straightforward for Yukiko, albeit with those slight adjustments given the context. Her being the princess of the Amagi Inn, Inaba's most prestigious landmark, being seen as beautiful and unobtainable, and her discontentment with life at the inn, wanting someone to sweep her off her feet and take her somewhere that she can live worry-free. Her dress being a pink and white ball gown, as I talked about in my segment with the Sojima interviews in Color Theory, not only fits with her natural color scheme, but is also leaning more heavily into the ideas of passion, romance, and sexuality present in her shadow's portrayal. It should be noted that the flowers on her dress also serve double duty, with the obvious idea of the rose with thorns playing into it, as well as the generic word for flower, Hana, tying back into her later revealed persona and mythology. Another thing she mentions is that maybe her Prince Charming is playing hide-and-seek in the fog. The shadow intentionally belittles and mocks the ways that these aspects of themselves have been shunned away by their holder. So this is likely a jab at Yukiko being aware of the fact that this is a fruitless hope and idea. The fog, which unanimously stands in as a metaphor for lies in Persona 4 Golden, is something being mocked. Like, maybe you can find the man of your dreams if you keep wishing hard enough. If you hunt for him, eventually the perfect man will just show up. Regardless of her not being willing to reach out and meet the men who do, if she just keeps dreaming about being saved, eventually it'll happen, right? The Shadow is mocking that idea. It's making fun of her childishness that someone will, without prior motive or knowledge, perfectly fit her purpose and be willing to follow through with them, even without any separate feelings on any of the matters that she finds important. With Chie's awakening encounter, we learn that Yukiko, despite holding this childish little girl's wish that a handsome man will come in magically on a beautiful horse and save her from her cage, also doesn't feel like she possesses any traits worth saving. Her name, Yukiko Amagi, means two things. The Yuki is, of course, snow, as she's drawn attention to. The Ko is simply to mean a child, therefore a child of the snow. The way that she interprets herself is a fleeting, transient thing with no value, but snow instead is something beautiful and unobtainable, something that you can never keep under control. It shows her level of worthlessness as she quite effectively flips the metaphorical meaning behind the beauty of snow in order to back up her feeling of not having a purpose. Her last name, Amagi, is constructed from two characters that together mean castle and sky, a castle in the sky. Yukiko is already free in the clouds, equipped with her ability and height to soar far, but she feels like the princess of a guarded castle. Little does she recognize that as the princess, she is the castle's keeper, not the other way around. She feels insecure that she can't do anything on her own without relying on others, and so despite wanting to leave and wanting someone to save her, she just feels like she's just dead weight, offering nothing. And it's not like she knows where to go anyway if she were to be rescued. Her powerlessness from others makes her want to escape but her solution was just to have another person take care of everything for her. Her responsibility may change, but is she really escaping from her problem, even if her dream comes true? When we finally get to her boss room, the tiles on the floor all have flowers in them, the gold rug design being made of flower stems and vines. On either side of her pillars, which represent her arcana, but we'll get back into that in its proper segment, small gold cages hang from the ceilings, and bird wings attached to the heart print on the tapestry drape behind her. Next is the confirmation of what I already shared. She confirms that Chie was a prince. Someone to rely on, someone strong who made decisions. The utility of what a prince means to Yukiko is the ability to let her escape. This likely developed when she was young. When Chie and Yukiko met, Yukiko was sad as she had been told to get rid of a dog that she found, as we find out through Chie's social link later on. Chie found her sad and offered to take the dog in for herself. From then, Chie made effort to bring happy moments back to Yukiko's sore, sad life, and even allowed Yukiko to somewhat have the things that she liked, like wanting a dog by virtue of visiting Chie's house. Chie was Yukiko's taste of escape from being told no all the time as a child, being driven in proper manners, being made to work at the height of customer service, but somewhere along the way, Yukiko realized that while Chie could help her feel better about her problem, Chie didn't have the ability or strength to fix it. 
that's what her Prince Charming is. The heart, as depicted on the wall, isn't about love, but who can free her heart, giving it the ability to soar toward the things that she wants. Now Yukiko speaks up. She does love her mother and the workers at her inn, despite feeling pressure and guilt to sacrifice herself to them. But the most important thing is how the flower imagery changes with her kimono. Shadow Yukiko is this lustful rose with thorns, a lust for her freedom and a thorn for those who cannot provide. The flowers on Yukiko's kimono, though, are sakura blossoms, not roses, and her outfit lacks the aggressive red of the shadow. Once again, all this flower imagery becoming important in a moment with her persona. The chandelier descends, showing Yukiko as a bird in a cage once the boss fight starts. Except no, she actually isn't. She perches on the edge of the cage, spreading her wings broadly. This is a twist on the normal visual metaphor showing that this trapped feeling Yukiko has is not because she's genuinely trapped, but because she mentally feels like she is. She has the power and ability to talk to her mother, to let them know how she feels, but she chooses not to, instead locking herself in. So in actuality, she could fly free at any time, but stays perched at the edge of the cage, hoping someone else will make the choice for her, as she's too scared to take the step despite the thing that she feels trapped of directly relating to feeling that no one lets her make those choices. Eventually she summons a prince, but note its design. It's decorated and dressed like a prince should be, sure, leading into the aesthetic, but the body underneath is robotic. There's nothing sexual or romantic about it. It goes back to the idea that finding love or finding someone for themselves isn't the goal. The goal is a utility, a prince who can do her bidding, protect, and free her from her confines. After the fight, she concedes this and accepts herself. She was looking at Chie as a way out. She did feel like she wanted someone to save her from her responsibility and from having to make her own decisions. Then the shadow transforms into Konohano Sakuya, who is depicted with Sakura blossoms as wings, the same as were on her kimono. The story of Konohana Sakuya Hime, the Hime meaning princess, is a goddess of volcanoes and the growth of the cherry blossoms, explaining the cherry blossom imagery and the vines used all throughout her dungeon. The volcanoes make sense with her fire type attacks. In a well-repeated story where Kaguya's husband accused her of infidelity once she became pregnant, Konohana Sakuya locked herself inside the building and set it on fire, claiming if the baby was theirs, the children would escape the building without harm. And so she and the children did, proving her innocence. I think it's good to keep account on the shallow end that this also connects with fire proving Sakuyahime's pure actions and lack of infidelity, which works well as Yukiko then uses those flames of Sakuya to continue facing her true self and seeking the truth of the case. But also the fact that she locked herself inside the building, not her husband or anyone else that tested her with this act. She did. This also comes back to the key, the lock, and the door, all being something Yukiko had control over. She sought freedom, but maybe to prove her strength and assure her love for those in her life, she kept herself under that strict obedience. Even when we hear nothing about her parents demanding her to study, and seemingly never even asking her to cook for the inn. Her dedication to her studies and eventual attempt at learning to cook is a pressure that she has placed upon herself to prove her willingness to be a positive force, her pure intentions to be worth something on her own. I have another segment talking about ultimate personas, so I will pass that information on for later there. But before we move on to the social link, I want you to keep in mind what I said earlier about the fact that Shadow Yukiko stood between two dormant pillars, equal distance on the right and the left. Those pillars are a nice detail for later once again, so I'm asking you to remember it once we finish talking about her social link. Yukiko, after recovering from her event from the TV world, still remains uncomfortable and shy, opening up to the player after the events inside the TV. She's grateful to them, but she has trouble knowing how to act in order to not have the wrong impression. She seems very aware of how it looked uh, on the inside, but for some reason is still scrambling for if she can trust you or what to take of your inclusion in that situation. Since, to her, you're still basically a stranger. It's after a few more times spent together, such as getting her number while spying on Kanji, that she finally opens up a bit and thus lets you start her link. 
She's not the only character to do this, by the way, by a long shot. Nanako doesn't open up until after the vacation plans get cancelled. Naoto doesn't open up until you have a logical reason to hang out with her. But Yukiko is the first to seemingly delay out of the things she has issue with, taking on her own initiative, which her social link will explore. The time spent in the Shadow World caused her to face the part of herself that fell for the lie of being rescued. Now that she has faced herself and is no longer waiting for someone to save her, she has to learn to take her own life into her own hands and become a more rounded and competent person. Which is where things immediately pick up in her link. Normally, if people remember Yukiko's link, it concerns with the cooking aspect of the later parts of the shrine, but the first social link actually starts with her buying a book on job offers and a declaration to herself and you. When she graduates, she's leaving this town. That she refuses to inherit the Amagi Inn. Now, for the first time, she will try and see what the outside world has, the way that things are like. She laughs proudly that she was able to even say something like that out loud, and perhaps this is the most important thing taken from the situation. Not what she said, but that she felt she was able to state how she felt aloud, and validate the feelings she had that she would have otherwise have pushed down and dismissed, leading to how we saw her prior. One thing she says that she wants is to be an interior decorator, something she feels she's grown familiar with working at the end, straightening up rooms, rearranging furniture, she probably knew she liked that sort of thing, and if she had total control over it, that would be liberating and fun for her. She insists on not telling her mother, though, but interestingly, doesn't actually say anything specific about her mother cracking down on her or putting blatant disapproval, which becomes a subtle theme of this link. This makes it so Yukiko's link sort of mirrors Shu's link, just like Yosuke mirrors Naoki's. Rank 2 consists of the introduction of the food portion of her arc. Her reasoning is that she needs to learn to make good food and shop for groceries because eating out is bad for you, and she's going to be living on her own after so long. She acknowledges that it's one of the skills she needs to learn to operate competently outside of the inn. Although it honestly is just a good skill to have in general, I, I love cooking. It's the best. She wants to make sure that she doesn't settle, though, so she asks you for your honest opinion in the taste of her future dishes. This also implies more specifically what Yukiko does at the inn, or had been made up to do growing up. It's clear that she was given some sort of vice managerial role, maybe picking up errands or doing sweeps, double-checking around the inn. I know that the Persona 4 animes actually do show her doing several general service and cleaning works things, but since the Persona 4 animes blatantly contradict the events of the games at times, changing the individual scenes to fit different character interactions, and also blatantly flanderizing and leaning into fan service where they previously didn't exist in the games, it's impossible to include them without using a very biased lens to cherry pick what does and doesn't count, so I'll leave that to you. For the sake of being consistent and accurate, I'm going to leave out any information from the animes in this analysis. I'm concerned with the game Persona 4 and Persona 4 Golden, written by Yuichiro Tanaka, Akira Kawasaki, and of course, written and directed by Katsura Hashino. It's also likely, as a host, that some of the tea servicing or spare work was also pushed on Yukiko working at the inn. The point really is that more vital, difficult things like cooking were seen as something she didn't have to focus on, giving a more lax view of her time in the inn subtly. Social Link 3 involves one of those optional events with Nanako I mentioned in the Chie segment, where depending on what you do with this link, Nanako will either show up or not for story purposes, slightly changing the content of the link. This link basically comes down to Yukiko's first try making food being awful and letting her know that you're still willing to see her get better and try her food. She mentions only having about a year left, which goes to emphasize to her and to you about the length she still needs to strive to achieve this personal competence in daily living. Oh, by the way, this next rank, this scene right here at the tables, this is the only time in the game that you see this. Interestingly enough, the closest thing you get to seeing this link is in Naoki's rank 8 at the set of table and chairs behind Yukiko, meaning there are two entirely separate yet extremely similar scenes only used once in Persona 4. For someone like me who has literally been gouging my eyes out over footage for over two months at the point of writing this essay and for a little over three months as of the time of recording this audio, 
Stuff like this is so infinitely interesting to me. The production history and all that. If they were previously more planned, or if it was done early and went unused, so they just decided to throw it in as to not waste it. Since it has a unique, prominent ice cream cone in the scene, I wonder if getting ice cream was something planned for the upper ranks or something, similar to the omikuji at the shrine. It's weird because detailed writing is on the transcription, despite it being out of sight pretty much every time you come to Juness, mainly due to the huge billboard sign blocking it. A at least aside from that small group study date in October. Crazy stuff. The main sign says soft cream, by the way. The small ones on the back are a bit difficult for me to make out, even in 1080p. I can make out individual characters, but yeah, back to the topic. This social link comes back to her wanting to start studying with a proper job license. She's going overboard with seemingly childish view of what she needs though, buying everything she can think might be nice, including a specific desk. I think that this is meant to lend an idea of earnestness and worldly ignorance to her idea of being on the outside world and how to prepare for it, liking it to classic school studying rather than anything else. She also mentions getting a nighttime job from the work offer billboard that you showed her as well. Anyway, the next part is where her plotline starts properly setting off. Some men arrive who Yukiko is familiar with, but she hasn't mentioned before. Turns out that they're from some shady broadcast station looking to capitalize on the murders by making the Amagi Inn into some creepy special place that Yamano was murdered at. Long-standing reputation be damned. When they insult Inaba as the dumps and having nothing to do, she politely begs to differ. This is something to mention again that Yukiko never badmouths her mother or Inaba in general. Still, after they leave, she mentions that maybe they should accept that, because the ruining of the reputation of the inn really would lead to them closing it in her eyes, and then she wouldn't have to feel shackled by this responsibility. But she follows it up with saying that she's taking her own life into her own hands and making her own choices. This is an important follow-up because this can be seen as her addressing her regression, accepting it as serious feelings, but choosing to take her own positive action rather than wishing for good or bad things to liberate her from the weight of her taking her own action, like is her primary struggle. The wish for the inn to fail is a weakness, a version of events where she doesn't take any initiative, but life just happens to go where she wants, just like the Prince Charming situation. She sees this thought, admits that it's a valid feeling, and moves on to a mature solution. Once again, we get brought back to the food gathering for her cooking practice in Link 6, although this time the focus is more on her inn's reaction to her trying to learn to cook. Yukiko is surprised to learn that the people who work at the inn, even at her behest, refuse to stop helping her in her personal decisions, offering advice and caring for her, even though it's not even related to their job. They embrace the new thing Yukiko wants to do. This is the start of Yukiko's realization that we'll see more going forward. Another birdcage she didn't realize was already open. Even the workers, their family. Since she didn't mention wanting to leave, it became about a boy who she was cooking for and everyone wanted to make sure that she did the best that she could. She mentions her parents getting involved from there as well, trying to help, not shutting her down or making her do work elsewhere, but giving her an entire room to grow where she said she wanted. The next part is the first time directly shown to the player that Yukiko likes you, although the confession link is still ahead. Next are the shrine social links, my personal favorite in Yukiko's link, with the rank starting with how much she likes coming to the shrine to pay respects and how she comes here with the waitresses at the inn as well. She's always done it since she was little and felt comforted by the shrine, in times before big guests and so on. This shrine and Yukiko are actually connected metatextually as well. The town of Inaba is based off of Fuefuki City, previously Isawa Town in Yamanashi Prefecture, with many personal Japanese blogs posting photos of their pictures. The shrine in Inaba is based off of a shrine you can find there that branches off from the shopping district as seen in the game that exists in real life, and actually has a sign explaining the history and backstory for the shrine. This actually depicts Guess who? Konohana Sakuya, which is Yukiko's persona. An extremely esoteric detail that I thought that I would share with you, maybe for the first time on the English-speaking side of the internet. If you're not getting this, the shrine in Inaba is a real-life place that it's based off of, and that real-life place happens to be dedicated to the persona that Yukiko has. Yukiko starts rambling about all the significant things that she's done with her family, school, and thinks to herself, 
once she leaves this shrine that she actually considered as a part of her, which, as we see in real life, honors her, or rather the persona who represents her, once she leaves, she won't be able to simply come back again, will she? We see her finally faltering in a commitment to leave in general, as a worker at the inn comes up to her and decides to tease her, supportedly asking if this is the boy that she's heard so much about, praising that all of her hard work must be paying off. After she leaves, this reasserts the supportiveness of everybody at the inn, adding new information like the fact that the workers actively choose to use their break time to help her cook, and that everyone is excitedly celebrating the first time that she didn't mess up entirely. Yukiko ruminates on how she feels so happy to be supported like that, mentioning that she's also grown to have all these friends, and how she really feels very lucky and wants to do the best for everyone. This, of course, adds to later, with this seemingly coming into contradiction of sorts with her declared statement at the start of the Link. Next Link has a lot happen. First, the supportiveness is pushed in like three times as Yukiko mentions how the staff all want you to come by the inn and meet them. Next, the deputy mayor mentions a lot of people at the inn, and finally Kasai sets this social link into full motion. The people wanting to make the show tricked the inn and were now looking for her as their slam piece. This is really Yukiko's shining moment for me. After taking the harassment and trying to defuse things politely as she always has, we think back to her comment about wanting them to maybe cover the inn and ruin it after all, a few links prior. Here, she has the opportunity if she stays in her cage. She has the opportunity to let life run its course. She has the opportunity to get the thing she claimed that she wanted. Instead, Yukiko finally lets them have it. When met with a threat of defaming the inn, she quickly responds with a threat to their sponsors, sending them off for good. This represents the action made on the declaration. The declaration that was never about the said goal, but was actually about the fact that she intended to make actions for herself. She begun working on goals tangentially related to her declaration, but no progress had actually been made on the goal itself. In a way, this allowed Yukiko to feel free pursuing herself without committing to a long-term decision. Along the way, the surprising support caused her to realize that maybe she misunderstood the people around her all along. So here, not tangentially, but entirely, she acts in a way toward an immediate goal by her own loud expression. She leaves the cage for seemingly the first time for what she deems the correct action, without letting her feelings continue to be shut down. The next link is where Yukiko affirms to you that she's not going to leave Inaba along with her romance opportunity. This is a point where a lot of people criticize and mischaracterize her as going back on her goal. But hopefully after laying everything out, painstakingly so, from all the reinforced social links details, it's obvious that with even half of an attention span or general reading comprehension, that her social link was never about what decision she was going to make, but the fact that she truly felt confident enough in herself to make a decision and carry through with it. This is actually something repeated with many other social links, but for some reason I never see them hit the same criticism, even though they are also addressing the same theme. Like Rise quitting show business but deciding to go back. When Yukiko finally decided to outstretch her wings, she found that all the people surrounding her were abundantly supportive of her new ventures, whether it be cooking, showing interest in a boy, or working part-time. Yukiko felt from her high expectations and strict regimen that her opinion and her life were no consolation to her, not something that she had control over. This social link showed her crush those doubts and grow into a confident, direction-forward person who does what she wants for her own reasons, rather than the perceived will of others. I've decided not to leave Inaba. I never really objected to being the inn's manager per se. I just didn't like the fact that it wasn't up to me. I felt that my life was on rails. And I thought running away was the only choice for me. But no longer. I want to protect the family inn. After all, it's near to my heart. I wanted to become completely self-sufficient. But I think I was being presumptuous. I have the inn, I have my family, I have the waitresses and chefs. I am who I am now because I was raised by such a kind group. When I think of it that way, my problems aren't just my own. That's why I'm going to stay here. Here in rank 10, she awakens from Konohana Sakaya to Ematarasu, 
I already gave info on her ultimate persona elsewhere, but I want to note one more thing that I've seen people reference in covering Yukiko, but not always with this exact explanation. A famous story of Amaterasu, who rules the sun, was a time when she shut herself away. All the people's voices made her desire to re-enter the world. Yukiko did shut herself away, in the same way that we referred to with the cage and with Konohana Sakiya earlier. But this bit about the voices of others bringing her back now also makes full clarity with her current link. As after she realized the support of the wonderful people at the inn, as well as you and the rest of her friends around her, who she cites as making her start to realize this, she decided of her own power to return to the inn, to come back to the world. It's just a very fitting change on nearly any level of analysis, and little chef's kiss things like this litter nearly all of the mythology in Persona 4. Yukiko fittingly gives you a shrine charm to remember and protect you by. The charm technically would protect you from whichever goddess is honored there, which again leans into the real-life shrine paying honor to Yukiko's initial persona, Konohana Sakiya. Really makes this even more touching, I think. Coming back to Yukiko, at the end of the game, from her final Persona upgrade, shows that she is dedicating herself further to the inn in ways that she had never personally even tried to opt in for. I think Yukiko spells herself out perfectly here, though, so I'm gonna let her talk about it. I told everyone at the inn that I hadn't planned to take over as manager, that I wanted to leave Inaba. I thought it would be me finally coming clean to everyone. But they all just laughed and said they knew already. It made me realize how small I was. I was surrounded by good people, but I didn't understand that at all. I had myself convinced I had to bear my problems alone. I lied to myself, and looked away from small opportunities, and only put my efforts into leaving it all behind. But after making so many good friends like you and Chie, I realized something. If I'm going to take one step at a time away from here, Every step I use to run will take me somewhere I don't want to be. And if I keep averting my eyes, one day I might find myself blind to everything. The upgrade, Sumeo Okami, is a descriptive term given to Imatadasu. I guess you could say, rather than a formal name, it's a phrase that describes the self. In Yukiko's case, Yukiko no longer represents an idea. She understands the meaning behind that which she represents, proudly and with strength. Yukiko Amagi is the High Priestess Arcana in Persona 4. One might immediately draw a sort of power similarity between the position of the priestess as the inn manager's daughter and the princess of her castle, but that is far away from where the comparisons stop. The Pillars. The High Priestess is depicted with a pillar on either side of her. The left pillar is negotiation, where someone makes a choice to stand firm and refuse proposition. The right is a pillar of affirmation, saying yes to a decision and moving forward with it. The Priestess is caught between the center of two responses, like Yukiko, unable to choose with her own directive which path she really wants, or make choices to make those a reality. The High Priestess, then, represents the feminine side of God, alongside the masculine side found within the Magician. Of course, within Persona 4, Yukiko and Yosuke, who is the Magician, have personas who are brother and sister, Amaterasu and Suzano. The creation of Amaterasu, a female god of the sun, and Suzano, a male god of the storms, are both gods who were born from the god Izanagi. They are literally pieces of him, with Amaterasu coming from his left eye and Suzano coming from his nose. On the High Priestess's head is the Crown of Assis, represented by a waning, full crescent-like moon. Like Thor's hammer, the only person with the power to lift Assis's crown is the High Priestess herself. This goes back to no one in the world being able to perfectly understand and act out the goals of Yukiko, aside from Yukiko, who chooses to take action herself. On the High Priestess's high polarity, it represents the reconciliation of opposite paths, the peace of finding her own path through reconciliation. On the lower polarity, it represents a self-doubt, an inability to deal with opposing feelings or perspectives, unable to find peace within herself. 
This lower polarity represents Yukiko as she begins her journey in this social link, and before her encounter with herself. The higher polarity is the momentum she achieves at the decision and carry-through of her link, as we saw. Now we're going to talk about a few things concerning Yukiko's character that I haven't already mentioned in her primary links or arcs or parts of her character. These are extra elements, character flaws, and quirks. So let's get into it. For one thing, she has a terrifying laugh, although knowing Chie and Yukiko's backstory, this actually represents a very positive thing. The strained and restricted sense of humor for Yukiko that had been silenced at a young age, not likely literally, but from being told no, and being told to help work, both of which a few too many times. This caused an uncertainty and joylessness to grip Yukiko as she lived. Chie comments on her personal goal to bring joy to Yukiko from that moment of their childhood, and her amount of horrible laughter increases through the entire game around more and more people. It's really an emblem of her character growth as a whole, even from a point before you enter the story. Not just making decisions or growing out of her shell, but relearning to enjoy and love life, taking it into her own hands. An actual character flaw, though, that we see in the story stems from the sense of inaction that's core to her arc. If Yukiko were given the trolley problem, she would probably choose not to touch the lever out of the mentality that it was destined to happen. Her not stepping in doesn't make it her responsibility. And hey, maybe you agree with that, or maybe you agree with that idea, but not for the same reason. Whatever it is, for Yukiko, this inaction causes her to incidentally contribute to sliding her friends multiple times. When Chie spends hundreds of dollars on Yosuke's account, sending him into brief debt and multiple days of unpaid work, she was present for the entire event, but she never stopped or encouraged the behavior. Chie and Teddy are generally not responsible people in the slightest, or people that understand and take things of others into a serious capacity. This isn't a slam, it's just accurate from everything we've seen that happens in the game. In theory, Yukiko then should have been the responsible party who reeled them in, but she chose instead not to act, which contributed to the harm of one of their friends. During the hot spring trip, where Yukiko makes a mistake on the scheduling times of the baths, she considers getting out so that the boys can have their rightful turn, especially after hitting them with wooden buckets as an apology. But when Rise suggests that they just pretend they never noticed, Yukiko lets Risei make that decision for her, and decides to do nothing. Even Yukiko's bad cooking comes down to Yukiko's non-committal attitude. During the omelet tasting, you note how strangely Yukiko's omelet managed to have so many ingredients and yet no flavor. Kanji agrees too. This is a more comical way of putting her inability to make decisions in meaningful ways which her whole character arc focuses on. Another aspect of her character is that Yukiko can't read social situations. She's totally unaware of romantic advances most of the time, unaware of different turns of phrase, and yet combined with that endearing trait is also a tendency toward violent overreaction. Whether this be pushing Kanji into the river at the camping trip, or how the camping trip implies that Yukiko beat him unconscious without thinking when he entered their tent. Something that most people seem to forget about since it's so subtle, and while people complain about Persona beating its players over the head, the players seem to miss it when they don't. There's also that time that Yukiko thought that Yosuke was making a sexual joke and slapped him when he actually wasn't and was actually just leading into a very wholesome, normal thing. On a contrary interpretation, Yukiko seems in some moments to be more aware than she's leading on as to how much she perceives, such as her knowledge of the King's game, and more so her sadistic behavior and threats sometimes, like when Kanji doesn't want to initially cross-dress because of the way it crosses into his understanding and security, and Yukiko pushes him into it by bringing up Kashiwagi and the attendance record, essentially blackmailing him into doing it, or how she laughs at or just finds humor in moments where other characters are mild mildly hurt in the story. Her schadenfreude is on clear display. This additional aspect of her, while showing its head fairly infrequently, does make someone really reassess who she is. If it was ignorant anger, or a joy to harm someone else with the social acceptability to do such a thing. I feel this aspect of her, while having a clear amount of evidence, is still left indeed ambiguous as to how much that mixture is her leading it on, and how much that is genuine ignorance. So all that we're left with really is we can assume that there is a level of awkward social aloofness and a level of sadistic manipulation to greater or lesser extents on either end all throughout the game and her actions. 
These parts of her really only start happening though as the friend group and fun moments happen more and more as well. So this could be her way of experimenting with the feelings and actions she had, which had been also restricted over the course of her finding a guiding directive. So, in a way, these negative traits could actually be feeding into part of her subtly coming to grips with her new directive in life. Hopefully that gave you a lot of new back-to-back -back information to think about, but let's get back into the character arc. What is there to say about Yukiko that I haven't already exhausted from seven different directions? Probably a lot, actually. Like how if you revisit Yukiko's dungeon, you can get the Suzaku feather, Suzaku being a red phoenix-like bird, one that looks like her boss, funny enough, but also the symbolism of a phoenix burning and being reborn from the ashes fits nicely with Konohana Sakuya's hut. I could talk about the 160 cherry blossom trees that line the onsen street from Isawa Onsen, the real-life place of the Amagi Ryokan is based on, with many generational inns connected to that hot spring street in Fuefuki City. I think we've at least covered her, though, in a way that does not minimize her intricacy. Yukiko Amagi is a person through a likely strict upbringing due to constant business and work around the inn came to internalize the lack of time that she had to do such things as take in a dog. It's something that stifled her own spirit. Quietly, she suffered with some sense of relief from her only friend Chie as she tried to keep her head down the best that she could getting the best grades, keeping up satisfactory public appearances, but rarely getting close to another person, rarely taking opportunities to splurge in her interests, and as her unobtainability deified her among other schoolmates, she wished someone would obtain her, kidnap her, take her far away from this crushing responsibility and this public image. So consumed with the idea, she stopped reaching out or trying anything on her own, so that by the age her family and in-workers finally recognized her autonomy and considered her mature, she never even tried to do anything anymore, despite earning the trust of her family that she knew what she was doing. In an almost painfully Japanese style, neither side reached out to express their feelings honestly, but eventually, Yukiko faced this self-pitying, dreamy-eyed helplessness and looked up to the world again with her own directive. When she looked up, she peeked out from behind the rock like a Matarasu. She discovered the world was far more full of love and support than she remembered, and she became radiant as the sun goddess she represented, finally seeing and deciding to her own way and with her own decisions to protect the inn and the people who carried and loved her. She stopped burdening herself with the flow of the wind and stood up to it, before deciding which direction best fit. Yukiko reached out to the truth like all of the others. For her, it was seeing through the lie of confinement that she had given up inside. The greatest limit on our potentials is our will to try. And that was the cage that Yukiko didn't break from, but simply chose to open the door and leave. The lesson is not to buy wholesale even the things we tell ourselves about the world, because we are not the world. We don't know for sure that they aren't a lie, too. One must closely reanalyze and look at our own thoughts that limit our decisiveness, and think clearly on an individual basis which pillar we choose to pass. Certainly, someone else can't decide for us. Alright, let's talk battle variety. Battle variety is decent in the games, with at most 9 dungeons and roughly 13 main differently designed bosses, depending on if you consider Adachi separate from Ami no Segiri, and if you count the more tutorial bosses like Chie or Yosuke. I'm also of course including the super boss, Margaret. There's also a set of souped up enemy bosses where the previous dungeon heads were, which are serviceable as more challenging fights, but more often than not are just tedious more than they are strategic, and many of those bosses in question can be solved easily just by rushing them all right before Magatsu Inaba, which kind of trivializes their existence. They have some unique moves, but they really are just bonus content to unlock the super boss. The actual boss fights, however, are very unique, with them having varying levels of strategy at play. Yukiko is pretty straightforward, although the mechanic with the prince adds a sense of freshness to the fight. The kanji fight also makes good use of the one more system by balancing weaknesses and strengths of one enemy on either side of kanji to maximize the attacks and damage dealt per turn. 
The Risei fight lacks a general battle gimmick, aside from her scan, which is more plot relevant than anything, and Teddy's shadow fight with the claw attack, which unfortunately amounts to being a heavily telegraphed block, is more easily telegraphed than the first boss fight of the game, Yukiko, as the visual cue is basically impossible to avoid seeing. The Mitsuo fight deals with a unique mechanic of rebuilding shell around the actual host, where constant effort is made toward large single-turn damage output. This also minimizes the abilities of Mitsuo to attack you, which makes the fight unlike anything else in the game. But while it's a cool concept, the battle still mainly comes down to operating on a raw number output rather than hard strategizing. The Naoto boss finally deals with a lot of concentrated buffs and debuffs, as well as a number of elemental attacks to abuse weaknesses. The fight probably offers the most strategies so far, but due to no weaknesses or a way to double up on moves, the One More system kind of sits useless in the fight, making it a more classic turn-based style, which is not playing to the strengths of its system. Naoto is weak to electricity, technically, but it never says they're weak. In the game data, they take 125% damage instead of the usual 100 for the ones they don't resist. And really, I would consider this an unnecessary issue with Persona 4. A lot of enemies will be given unchoreographed weaknesses that you just have to watch for higher numbers to see, which means a lot of trial and error for no real reason. Damage is also, of course, not a set number either, so there's always a chance that an attack does more or less than average by chance. And so generally it ends up being a mechanic that is almost entirely unutilized by anyone other than trivia junkies. Like, hey, thanks for watching this video. <laughs> In general though, this fight makes you think more on your fight than the others do, and gives you more options to do that thinking with. And unless you're overleveled, can be a genuine source of challenge in the game. I wish I could continue to say that about the upcoming bosses though, especially the next one, because I really do like this one. It's one of the coolest boss mechanics in the game. Kuni no Sagiri, they briefly brainwash your party and have them attack you. It could be one party member or all three, which is like so scary if it's your first time in the game and you're not prepared. This fight also has a move that causes certain attacks to do tons more damage while other damage is reduced, but it doesn't seem to apply to physical, so you can keep on slamming that if you have nothing else to do. Once a magic move is set with their special move, they'll pretty much always try to attack you with it. A Makarkarn from your new partner Naoto, or buffing your team with a magic barrier will essentially make the boss kill itself though. A smart AI would have a move set to realize and learn from, some other SMT games have already addressed this problem, although they've dealt with it way too hard on the other end and just start spamming almighty attacks. So I wouldn't exactly say that's an improvement, they're just equally bad in opposite ways. I'm glad it doesn't spam almighty attacks, but ideally the AI should have something to make up for what is essentially a cycling loop of hurting themselves in front of you with the right item. On one hand, that makes this the most creative and strategic fight, while on the other, making the fight basically a one-question test. A complex question, yes, but once it's solved, it's over. The only thing to worry about otherwise is decent damage output. Even at higher levels, without social link buffs, many attacks can one-shot kill your party here. All in all, I'd say Naoto and Ami no Kuni are the most creative and strategic fights in the game, though. Amino Sagiri is essentially extreme buff and extreme debuff with a huge build-up warning to block. Nothing you haven't really faced before at this point, but an unlucky critical or two can have you easily on the brakes. It definitely causes you to be more careful with every turn. The boss isn't as creative or unique or adding any features, but a challenging boss fight in general that makes you think on your feet. So I'd say it's pretty good. Marie's boss fight is a real breeze compared to the other bosses though, coming a whole dungeon yet only two levels above Amino Sagiri. The boss fight is essentially breaking the resistances and temporarily wailing on those weaknesses until the barriers go back up and rinse and repeat. I think this fight services really well aesthetically, musically, and thematically though. So even if the fight is simple, I do find it to be a more artistically compelling fight rather than an overly challenging one. Then again, if you don't realize what you need to do, and don't block when needed, this fight is downright impossible. 
you won't be able to get a hit in because she literally resists everything without the special items. So while it's not nearly as difficult and doesn't take as much strategy as the boss before it, the creativity I think makes up for it. That, and it feels excused for being a sort of bonus side boss, something I can't say about the actual final boss, Izanami. Izanami, other than her form shift and plot-related attacks, is honestly fairly underwhelming in regards to strategy. I find by the time I often get to this fight, even if I'm not overleveled, it just feels like I am. Just rinse and repeat buffs and debuffs, and at this point, if you've been playing the game half competently, you should probably have Chie's ultimate attack. At this point in the game, the amount of things you could be equipped with makes this feel more than anything like a victory lap. So, unless you ignored half the game's mechanics or are severely underleveled, it's unlikely this boss will offer more than its narrative conclusion. The last fight you'd experience would be the New Game Plus Margaret fight, and it's very typical of the age for what Atlas was doing. It's an Atlas super boss, after all, and in that way feels pretty BS, with her having such high accuracy, being able to target and down constantly, and with the large SP recovery items not being plentiful, it is a long, painful, and boring slog. One where she gratefully has an artificial turn timer, meaning if you don't kill her fast enough, she basically hacks an unsurvivable attack. Which, honestly, is better to know so you can just go, okay, I wasn't prepared enough, instead of wasting another 30 minutes. Pretty standard for super bosses of the time, and very similar to her P3 equivalents, but while lack of strategy makes bosses dull, computer perfect movesets I also think does this to an opposite effect. The goal of a turn-based system is to give the player a difficult puzzle and watch them solve it. There may be 100 ways to do it, but there's always traps and wrong moves set along the path. It's about testing their knowledge and understanding of the game's mechanics, not the move-for-move -move memorization of the AI opponents. Because turn-based battles at their best are strategy games. They require foresight and puzzle solving. They require intuition but in order for them to properly play out like that, they need to be fair. The ability to be cautious while testing waters. Gladly, it feels like Atlas may be getting better at this, as the best mechanical super boss I've seen in any of the Atlas games I've played is the most recent Shiva from SMT5. Thoroughly challenging, filled with obstacles, but ultimately doable with strategy and reasoning, not with looking up a stupid guide or wasting an entire day of your time. Still, even if I don't find the Margaret fight good, the exact way that you obtain it, and as a gimmick and what it represents, it's definitely still a very satisfying and fun part of Persona 4 Golden. Standard enemy variety is fine enough, with groups often covering each other's weaknesses and made with some sort of forethought. The AI also has teammates that take care of each other in mind. The only real downside is the constant reuse and recoloring of models, most of which are reused from Persona 3, which is kind of underwhelming. Lastly, this is gonna sound so weird, but while Golden Hands were a great addition for those people who would rather have less, more intense encounters rather than more, less so, the AI for Golden Hands can be a bit off. When you enter a battle due to the Golden Hand touching you, they get the first move and a guaranteed critical attack, which allows them the additional turn of getting away, a handful of times, pun intended, that I had this happen over playthroughs though, my agility would be so high they would actually hit me and not do a critical attack. But due to their programming, they still exit a battle, despite not having an extra turn to actually perform like that. A small thing, but pretty frustrating, as rather than the standard frustration a player may feel, it sort of gives off the feeling that the game is cheating, or shouldn't have wasted your time entering into a battle in the first place if the battle was programmed to end without a chance of you getting a turn anyway. Cole Ichijo is one half of the forking strength social link in Persona 4, the other being Daisuke. This particular fork is part of a total of four social links that you have a great chance to miss out on purely based on your decision to pick one or the other. But unlike the girls who share the sun, which are Yumi and Ayane, Cole and Daisuke's relationship are intertwined with each other as they are good friends, which somewhat makes talking about their links separately complicated. I still think that it does best justice to both of them to examine them mostly separately though, so I will be doing that in this segment as I have in Dice Gaze. If you choose basketball as your sports club in Persona 4, you get Cole Ichijo. 
The first impression of Cole in his first rank is accompanied by the semi-distracted basketball team during your introduction to them, stating them as goofing off. After the initial practice, Cole formally introduces himself and lets you know that he's happy to have another person interested in basketball on the team. It's already obvious from every other corner of the game, but Inaba is small, and not always in a homey way. It seems like they lack even enough people here to ask another basketball team for a proper match, but that's something that, while implied here with the scant three members they show on the screen, it's going to be something that's more important later on. After Cole's introduction, Daisuke introduces himself in a very short and formal way, stating that they go way back. Cole takes this opportunity to joke and say that he's sick of seeing Daisuke's face. Already, from Cole's aesthetic and how he treats people in his first link, it gives a proper, strong impression of his character. He seems to be the sort of crossbreed of jock and pretty boy, without really teetering entirely into either description, and also lacking some of the stereotypically negative traits. Cole comes off as a generally casual, jokey, but passionate person. Someone who will get in people's face, but not really be doing so seriously. There's already this surface well of traits that he has, and I think it makes things a little difficult to predict in terms of which way the Link is going to go in the future from here. In other words, I think it's a really solid start. Next, we get to know Cole's disappointment with the other basketball team members here, as he laments wanting to practice more, but feels that the other members decided it was way too tiring and went home early. Lastly, Cole complains semi-sarcastically about how due to him staying later, he always gets stuck with cleanup while the other guys go to parties, and how he wants to do that. You assume that it's because he has to stay late, but an extended thought on it would imply that he's only blaming this thing he clearly enjoys sarcastically, while something else may be actually limiting Ko's life behind the scenes. The most obvious thing then would be his family, but we don't technically have an answer yet. This mix of sarcasm with a tinge of truth, and a diversion from real topics with made-up problems to consider, places Cole as an immediately layered character in a way so straightforward that you might miss it. It's natural, especially with lines like, oh, I love balls. Ah, oh, yeah, I, I love balls. Oh, all right, scream at the Fujos harder, why don't you? But really, this introduction for Cole feels so well layered, so casually, and so conversational that it's no wonder that so many people told me upon discovering that I hadn't played the Link don't worry, I've played it like three times now, that I had to do it, and that it was one of the best ones. As an introduction goes, it feels really natural. So after Daisuke and the protagonist help Cole out with cleanup, all you need to do is head home until your next link. The second link, Cole asks you out to eat, but you don't actually end up going. Daisuke mentions how a girl had made sweets for Cole once, and while he admits he likes sweets, which traditionally is seen as more feminine in Japan, he dislikes that she affectionately calls him Cole-chan when he says that they're just friends. Clearly this girl has a different idea of their relationship, but the real thing that we're meant to latch onto here is the affectionate name Cole-chan. Chan is an honorific in Japan that signifies a sort of cutesiness when attached to men. It can be used sarcastically as a way to tease men or endear them by their wives. It can also be used as an overly romantic way to display affection. Classically, Chan, though, is used for young children, or sometimes by teenage girls to each other. There's a whole list of other places that it's used, but hopefully these examples will fill a certain type of image. A child. What we're meant to attach here is that Cole feels uncomfortable with being seen as something cute or endearing rather than someone with respect, demanding, someone powerful. Powerful in that he has the agency that young kids would typically lack. Being called Kolchan subtly makes him feel infantilized, which, while we can imply here, is really brought to the forefront later on in his link. They have introduced the theme of Cole's struggle before the main acting problem itself, and disguised it like Cole did in The Last Link with a false pretense about not wanting to be seen as romantic with her. It's great writing, again. 
Something I also want to praise is the translation here, choosing to use Japanese honorifics rather than trying to translate it into complete English. That's something that I generally love about Atlas translations and any other show or game that does the same. They are in Japan, honorifics make sense, and they offer far more context to the character than a full translation ever could bother to. To give an example, some other shows would probably translate Kolchan as Coco, which just sounds cringy and yucky, or maybe translate it as My Little Co, which, like, sure, kind of implies the infantilization subtext, but still sounds too silly to take seriously. Nobody would ever say that in English. It cartoonifies this character in English in a way that we don't see in the original Japanese, and also debatably muddies the message even worse. Cole also mentions here that he hates his name, which is a flash of unfiltered honesty, but as to why, we'll get back to that later. Rank 3 picks up after finishing cleanup and planning to go to Aya, but then Cole remembers that he has personal stuff that he needs to take care of, and he dashes off. This isn't him being sly or ditching us, he genuinely did forget, but Daisuke fills us in on the real insight to Cole outside of school. You and Daisuke end up going to Aya anyways, and Daisuke mentions the house of Ichijo. Cole lives in a small house next door to his parents, by himself, giving the impression of wealth. Daisuke also mentions that they are very distinguished and traditional in their viewpoints. It's even implied in their name, Ichijo, meaning the first article, first street, or number one. It was also the name of a famous emperor. There is an air of superiority there. It seems the current head of the family is Cole's grandma, and she doesn't approve of basketball. His grandma believes basketball is barbaric and non-proper sport. This is likely meant to represent a sort of old xenophobic mindset toward Western culture, since basketball comes from the West and is associated with a lower class hobby. The common uncouth, uncivilized man, while something like Japanese kendo or judo is precise, sophisticated, and much more structured. Daisuke mentions how due to his grandmother's mindset as head of the family, Cole has been forced to quit many things since he was a child. This, of course, explains his oversensitivity toward being called Chan. He feels crushed, being forced to give up things he enjoys because he's looked at as a child rather than his own man, his own person, who can make his own decisions. We'll find out that there's even more to that later, of course. Daisuke says he comes to you in confidence here because he wants you to help him keep Cole in basketball, if the time arises where he's trying to be taken out. Not give in to his family's pressure. Honestly, all of this would be enough setup already if this was a typical social link, but Cole's main conflict has still yet to even be introduced still. As a small aside, something that I'd like to mention as well for his link is the book dates, though. For Daisuke, if you return to your room on certain dates with little exception, you can do the book dates. But for Cole, the optional book events are very specific, and sort of canonize a timeline for these book events within the social link and story of the game. So we're going to look at each of those and see if they add anything to Cole's story. The first link demands you be at rank 3 or lower, and that you have finished the bathhouse dungeon on 529. After all that forward, you're probably expecting something grand to come from this first link, but not really. This link reinforces the usual relationship of friendship between Cole and Daisuke, with Daisuke being good-hearted and a bit fumbling, and Cole being a teasing wise guy with genuine curiosity for his friends. The main thing this does do is become the first scene to imply that Cole has a crush on Chie, something that is later confirmed in Ai's social link, should you be doing Cole's link in tandem. I think it's important to look at the context we understand Cole's struggle in at the moment, and then know how that relates to Chie. Cole, someone surrounded by luxury and prestige, who wanted to break into his own self through basketball, but feels the thumb of his family on top of him, probably admires Chie's brash, free-acting nature. Whenever they run into each other, he asks exactly what she's out doing, and she confidently thinks for a moment before saying that she's training. That sort of brash confidence and freedom to make up what she wants to do on the moment is something Cole probably finds extremely attractive, feeling unable to gain the confidence in himself to do so in his own life. So it does actually give us some better insight into his character, beyond being a fun bit of trivia whenever you ask your friend, hey, did you know someone canonically has a crush on Shie in Persona 4? 
In other words, I think this irritatingly obtuse scene to access is done very intentionally in understanding Cole the best that you can. Rank 4 picks up with the basketball practice as the introduction of Ai Ebihata as the reluctant team manager. Cole and Yu finally go grab Aya after mentioning it in nearly every link so far. He opens casually, talking about how the food had been calling him in his dreams ever since he had to bail last time. Daisuke asks straight out, how did it go? And Cole responds sarcastically, what, my dreams or my family? which keeps up this consistent bait-and-switch sort of way that Cole interacts with his troubles and generally jokes around them. He states it's complicated, mentions the story of high society, things that he's been dragged into over his life, the arranged marriage events, and the balls. He laughs, saying how silly it is to imagine him there, but that if they ever meet his family, that they shouldn't mention to his parents that he eats at Aya at all, or even that he talks the way he does. Now this is also something that I think was best left fairly directly translated rather than trying to elaborate on this in terms of showing a crazy way that he speaks as somehow strange or informal. At worst, some shows, games, series, etc. that I've seen have overdone this child or teen dialogue by making it more messy, throwing in some weird idea of slang into the characters. But that way of emphasizing this would have just missed the point. It would have made a joke of Cole's character. The point isn't that Cole speaks with slang, it's that he's a normal kid trying to be himself. There's nothing weird about who he is or what he's saying at all. The point gets across without making major changes to the dialogue, and without needing to somehow westernize the idea of the multiple formality levels of the Japanese language. This does reinforce what we saw a bit, though, with the optional Chie scene. He wants to be himself and do what he wants, but he doesn't like pressing against the boot heel or getting himself in unnecessary conflict. Sometimes when those two things are stressed, it's hard for him to know what to do or pursue a course that makes him happy. You get the feeling, though, that even though he feels restricted, that he still feels indebted to his family. They feed him give him a place to stay and live. They give him an allowance. They allow him to do so much and do so much for him, so he doesn't want to cause too much of an issue for them. I imagine many Western people, although this mindset is definitely not exclusively Western, might think, if invested in Cole's conflict, well, he's their child. Their goal is to foster him into the person that he wants. He didn't choose to be born under their house and their rules, but they're the ones who took the risk of having a kid. But the game sort of addresses this possible rebuttal as well, with the big reveal for what his link is actually all about. Cole Ichijo is adopted. His dad was unable to have kids, and since their family line had passed on for hundreds of years, and they didn't want the generation upon generation to end, they didn't want the family name to die, they adopted. In a way, they saved Cole from the orphanage by taking him into a rich house full of nice things. He felt the pressure and the blessing of inheriting as the head of a family almost by pure chance. But the real conflict, and why he wants to be nice to them goes even deeper than this. Turns out years later, while Cole was in middle school and two years prior to him in the story, his dad did end up having kids. He had a baby girl, after all. Suddenly, Cole is starting to wonder if his family cares what he does at all anymore. He had been raised as someone they needed to a kid who was adopted for a purpose that is a non-needed purpose anymore. Not to say this is how Cole's family feels, but the presence of this biological child makes him wonder what his purpose even is anymore to them. If they even still want him as their family. If he's anything but an unnecessary burden on their lives and their wallets. As a possibility to bring shame to them and their family. The next rank, Cole doesn't come to basketball practice. After it ends, you see his shoes in the shoe locker, and you go look for him. Eventually, you find him on the roof. Here, he talks about how he feels that he's lost his love for basketball. How it's not his family, actually, that's keeping him from doing basketball, surprisingly. But instead, his family gave him their blessing to do whatever he wants. This hurts, though. It seems while Cole does like basketball, for a long time, it has represented his independence from his family, who he is as his own person a way to carve off something for himself outside of his adoptive family's customs. Now with the boot heel taken off, he almost wonders if they care at all about him, if they forgot he was there. 
their kindness actually ends up reinforcing Ko's insecurity, shown slightly in the link prior. Suddenly, he's free to make his identity anything that he wants, but the person that he had been trained to be over his entire life is unnecessary anymore. He has the freedom to be who and what he wants, but no longer knows what he currently is. When you offer doing something fun with him, he jokingly mentions going on a group date, which is actually something fun that Cole sets up in Daisuke's social link to make him feel better, so it's fun to get that back and forth reference, showing that regardless of the link, Cole's ways of handling and interpreting things always seems to be the same. On a meta level, it's good to see that sort of consistency in writing for characters. Back to the point, Cole appreciated you looking out for him, and promises to be back to practice soon, but he mentions how he just wants a little space. How he has some relatives to meet, and how he feels sick of putting on a face all the time. Maybe Cole's real self and his facade have begun to meld, making him wonder which parts of his identity were truly his after all. He hates being made to wear the mask, but feels abandoned when he can't wear it at all. It doesn't seem to make sense to him. This is the understanding of Cole that they intend for you to have in the second book club scene, which takes place two months later at 7.17, implying that this is a struggle Cole has been wrestling with for a while now. The segment itself doesn't add up to anything that we don't already know. Cole likes Chie, Chie is dense to that fact, Daisuke is bad at academics, and so on. For the next link, he mentions something on himself that he's really short for a basketball player, something normally seen as negative but how his process of working past the tall guys and making those baskets anyway always make him feel like it's something that he can do better than anyone else. But instead of comparing himself to you, Daisuke, or the other players, he says he can do it better than his grandma and his little sister. It's not about ability to co, it's about the role. It's about the purpose, being needed, filling a space made for him and it becomes apparent that this is why he carved out basketball as the space outside of his family custom. Then it comes back to Inaba. Who cares how hard he trains, or if he fills a role? He doesn't even play basketball games. They don't even have enough members to do it. He'll never make a name for himself or go anywhere with this place in life. The role is useless. In fact, he's only in Inaba because that's where the Ichijols live. So, even as he feels abandoned in his purpose and being granted his freedom, he still feels restricted in making anything of those freedoms. Cole feels like he can't do anything, nothing that matters at least. Cole sadly leaves having the rest of the social link with you and Daisuke. You fill Daisuke in like he did with you earlier in the link and Daisuke is convinced that he needs to set up a skirmish game to get Cole to really reignite his love in basketball that he felt that he had. The next rank is just that. Cole is surprised to see an opposing group there and at practice ready to be played. Daisuke tells him that he knows that no matter how hard he trains or feels that he isn't going to get anywhere, that Cole still has him and he still has you. He wants Cole to know that he doesn't have to do it alone, but Cole's frustration isn't really about basketball. Anyone paying attention at all can see that. It's about the sentiment under that. Even though he's starting to feel like the life that he was built on, the person he was made to be, is being swept out from under him, that the bonds he made are still genuine. And that he doesn't have to exhaust himself looking for an answer. He has his friends, who will share his burden gladly. They lose the game, as you might expect, uh, with two people who know basketball, one soccer player and two slacker players. But after some usual jokes and chiding remarks, Cole says that he does feel better, at least less alone, now. This is the point where Cole feels comfortable to say much of what has been sewn into the story up until now. He asks directly, he's not related by blood, he won't be their heir anymore, so does he even have a purpose? Cole is challenged rightfully by Daisuke with this, so what? Just because they're not blood, they're not family? This is after Cole mentions the kindness and understanding they've shown recently toward him. Cole doesn't take it lying down though. He fights back. He essentially says, if there's no difference, then why are they already hiring tutors for the two-year-old daughter? If it's really no different, why have they suddenly switched their focus of their training to her instead of him? And honestly, fair. Cole isn't meant to be in the right here. 
But he does have good valid reasons here. It's really nuanced. As much as I like Persona, this Link has really gone above and beyond the norm for building this complex story in regards to realism, depth, and character detail. It's a nuanced struggle, and a unique one at that. Where as much as I like the other Links, minor conflict characters like the delinquent group in Chie's Link or the teachers in Eddie's Link, these accessory characters are often a bit one-note and nearly comedic in their levels of extremity. I don't think that drags down those links at all. They serve their purpose well, but it's amazing how even a two-year-old that we never see has such a realized impact in the story and through Cole's eyes and how Daisuke can, using his sense of the situation described by Cole, be led to disagree and argue with him. This is some of the best writing in Persona 4. The argument quickly turns to desperation, though. He drives home, he doesn't have to go to gatherings anymore, he's allowed to quit his lessons, they don't expect anything from him anymore. He asks Daisuke, how doesn't that feel like he's been replaced? It's awkward. Daisuke feels like he may have spoke where he had no right to, and Cole feels like he's yelled at his friend who cared about him above all else in this situation. Neither of them feel good. If he can't find it within himself, and his adoptive parents don't seem interested in granting it to him, he thinks he will find who he's supposed to be through his biological parents. He ends the social link deciding to check out the orphanage. The next links are this action and resolution. He gets a letter from the orphanage with flowery words from his supposed parents that he never met that they had left years ago. A note stating that they had actually died from illness, but they called him Cole to mean good health and prosperity. The letter doesn't contain any names or clues as to who they were. He mentions how nice and similar the orphanage was to whenever he was there as a child. People remembered him. He felt cared for. Initially, he feels he had no one anymore because of this, with a reminder that Daisuke and you are there for him. Thing is, though, this letter? This was all a lie. Meeting Cole again, he feels listless, with no biological roots to ground himself to, and a feeling that the self that he was was a mask no one needs him to wear anymore. He feels lost. Then he realizes, even worse, that the letter is a fake. For a ten-year-old letter, it should have had more wear and tear, but it seems to be brand new. His reaction to this is actually, strangely, happiness, though. He doesn't know who his parents were. Likely, they didn't want to be found, even if they were still alive, but they weren't the ones who made Cole himself. The person he recognized at the orphanage who took him in, who raised him. The Ichijos who chose him of all kids and treated him as their own for many years. Even his own mother, who, while not around, still chose to give birth to him under some circumstance. Someone was there to create him, foster him, and push him along in his life. His life had been filled with the kinds of people who, in some large or small capacity, allowed him to live there and become who he is. He mentions thinking he had no roots, but it wasn't true after all. Daisuke mentions how he's been trying to tell him that, but it's important that Cole came to the answer himself. He laughs through his almost teary red eyes, and that reinforces that through it all, this subtle aspect of his personality was still there that even through the changes of interests, senses of purpose, perspectives, the same Cole was experiencing all of these actions. He is himself. As if to drive it home, Daisuke asks if they want to go for a swim, and Cole remembers doing that as kids with him. That's the thing. Daisuke has always been there with him, all that time. Rank 10. Cole decides to keep doing basketball and continue the lessons that his parents had always given him, but had now told him were optional. He mentions even that he asked his parents outright if they wanted him, and with an emotionally loud family moment, saw for himself that care that his mother and the rest of his family has for him. He feels somewhat of an embarrassment and shame over how he feels and felt over this arc. He is who he is because of the people that shaped him and who he is can't be taken from him. The experiences he's had, the time he's spent, he talks about how he got caught up in his immature idea of finding himself that he saw painted in the artists that he appreciated, but that his idea of self was totally wrong. Finding yourself is first and foremost about what's within. It's first and foremost the you. 
Cole is one of the few representations of somebody who was left at an orphanage, adopted and then raised in that environment that I've seen portrayed in games. And alongside being extremely well written and nuanced, it does one of the things that Persona does best when representing walks of life. It represents a person, not a stereotype. The fact that Cole is adopted is central to his eternal conflict and overcoming his personal feeling of identity and purpose, but it's not even told to the player until the fourth rank of his social link. Not because there's any pacing problems, but the opposite. Cole is a full person. The amount of traits, descriptions, details, and aspects to his character could fill a page if you wrote descriptive traits out one by one. He's not the poster boy of adoption. He's not the poster boy of high society, or of being a brother, or of a high schooler. He's not the poster boy of a basketball player. They went out of their way to even make him short, after all. He is a person with personal conflicts who occupies the experiences and opportunities that he's been given in his life, both in and outside of his control. Persona's good at that. Although, here has to be one of the best examples Persona 4 has to offer, especially for a side character that shares a 50% chance with another side character on an arcana that you could easily play the whole game without even starting. Finally, to mention as well, the third book club event happens only when you have Cole at rank 7 or higher and concerns Cole and Daisuke coming to visit your room. Cole takes time to analyze your living space, the place that you call home. When Nanako comes in, he assumes and asks if Nanako is your little sister, mentioning how she's probably sad when you doesn't play with her, and how they should all have fun with her. This is reflective pretty directly to the listless grasp on his family and home and what it really meant to him, as well as the eventual grappling with wanting to be a good brother to his baby sister in the future. These series of book club events are a whole wellspring of projection from Cole, which is really heartwarming stuff and shows the way that he interprets things. Great stuff. So finally, let's look at his name and arcana. We covered Ichijol near the start, but Cole, mentioned in the link as well, stands for prosperity. However, this was just flowery language given by the fake letter. Something else his name describes is a great powerful bird. Something Cole mentions to the player earlier on in his link is that he wishes he could break free of his shackles and be like a bird. That birds had it made and could fly as they please. He wanted to be that. And I think that the idea that his name refers to the great prosperous bird elegantly flying to the heights that he decides best reflects the character by a long mile. Cole Ichijo, as I've said 500 times, is a person who shares the strength arcana in this game. The arcana for strength generally follows with Cole like this, from what I can tell. Strength is classically depicted as a woman taming a lion, but the strength is the relationship between the two, rather than one controlling the other. It generally has to do with control and expression, and usage of an animal nature or carnal desire. With Cole, it could be the idea of keeping to your pack, something people, and very much animals, do normally. Cole struggles with having confidence in who his pack is, and if they even consider him a part of theirs. In alchemy, the taming of the red lion is the way of self-realization. Cole learns to not let the insecurity to focus on his adoption, or not being a biological family member, define his place in his family. And through the taming of that, the feeling reaches self-realization. As you might assume, the negative polarity is how we find Cole with his insecurity and doubts running rampant, causing issues for his own self and view on life, throwing them into question. By the end, he is in the upper polarity, with the strength to coexist with his inner feelings, control the faulty insecurities, and find his place among the people who love and care for him. Strength sometimes refers to better health, where previously there wasn't any. This could refer to how Cole's adoptive father considered himself to be infertile, but after Cole's adoption ended up having a baby girl after all. In a professional environment, strength in the lower polarity could refer to work ethic that isn't necessarily being taken seriously. In Cole's case, this fits well with his efforts in basketball, not being taken seriously first by his parents, and then by his family, and then by himself. 
I hope this didn't lean too much in on summary compared to other segments. I tried to provide analysis from a character and thematic standpoint, as well as the meta standpoint for the translation and character writing. But there are so many facets of Ko's character, I thought that were worth considering that just, who oh boy, this ended up being a long segment. Let's talk about special attack triggers, woo! Persona 4 Golden adds fusion attacks, something present in a completely different way in Persona 3, under the guise of special attacks that the player can perform only when a player contains multiple personas specifically needed in order to trigger that special skill as an option. In Persona 4 Golden, they operate as fusion of party members in the active battle, which I honestly think is a much smarter way of going about things. The fusions are Kanji and Naoto, Yukiko and Chie, and finally, Yosuke and Teddy. These moves sometimes register in non-story boss encounters when an all-out attack fails to kill all the enemies on the board, but generally are some of the most fun-looking skills in the game. Unfortunately, they almost never happen, so you barely ever get to see them, as if you're not severely underleveled, if you're in a position to down all enemies on weakness, you most likely are strong enough to just kill them. And even if you don't, the chance that these moves appear even under these circumstances is fairly low. Also, since Persona 4 relies on you individually leveling the characters, it's likely that if you go in blind, you may not have the proper pairings at reasonably corresponding levels for your party build, or for you to even reach that first prerequisite. From reading on forums, and also in my own personal experience, it seems that most people only really encounter the Twin Dragons fusion with Yukiko and Chie unless they're actively trying otherwise. And I think that mainly has to do with the way that the game presents its balance to an average uninformed player. Your squad will originally be Yosuke, Chie, and Yukiko. Chie does big physical damage output with buffs, debuffs, and ice early on. Yukiko is a dominant healer and also deals very high fire damage skills for her level. And Yosuke does some buffs and debuffs as well as wind weaknesses. When Kanji gets introduced, a lot of players probably want to try Kanji out in the least, and typically set off Yosuke is my prediction, which may or may not become a permanent set off. Something else we could consider though, is that since Kanji's moveset is more close to Chie, they might actually trade him out with her. So since at least for one dungeon you are required to have Yukiko and Chie on your team, and at this point you are at your most limited in terms of skill variety and level, and since both of them have very apparent usefulness all through the game, you run possibility of spending the most time with them on your party. Because of the way that Yosuke may have already been axed off your team by the time that you start the Mitsuo dungeon, and the nuance that comes with using Teddy super effectively, it's unlikely both of them will be on most parties' teams if people are going in without fully understanding the effectiveness of how to use Teddy properly. And for Naoto and Kanji, that's the biggest risk. Due to Naoto only being playable as late as heaven and beyond, if at any point Kanji got swapped off your team and is underleveled and isn't just naturally with you, as heaven is really when the teams have been established and there's not a really strong reason to take time to go back and overlevel all your characters just to get them within a reasonably similar gap. So yeah, while cool in concept, it feels almost like fusions were a secret and how unlikely they are to regularly be encountered through regular gameplay. And coming off of original Persona 4, when I first saw Twin Dragons, I legitimately had no idea what I even did to make it happen. If it's a secret, or supposed to be rare, or just an additional boost for people struggling, that's fine, but it currently feels a bit underutilized in the game, and I think that has to do with how poorly balanced and considered it was. I Ebihara, the stuck-up pretty girl, the one with the rich family, the moon arcana, and the shallow diva is probably one of the characters who caught me off guard the most whenever I subsequently failed to pay attention to her on my first few playthroughs of Persona 4 and Persona 4 Golden. You either meet her by starting Cole or Daisuke's social link, and having her be introduced to you as the standard team manager. Now, when I think sports team manager, I think Yachi or Kyoko from Haikyuu. Wholesome, hardworking, intelligent, motivated, generally passionate with a love and wonder of and for the team and sport. I crushes those dreams I had by stating instead she's just doing this as a means to not fail after skipping too many classes. This is more a remedial punishment than anything she actually cares about, but hey, who knows? Now that she's here, she can probably develop a passion for, and she's walking away. 
So I'd say while this represents the mentality of many I actually went to high school with, it's not something that really inspired confidence in her from me as a first time player. Still, if you talk to her once again when she appears in the school, she'll ask if you're down to skip class sometime, and so a mechanically unique and fun way to start the social link happens. Well, in terms of time management, someone like Naoki takes triple the free time opportunities just to start his link. With I, you meet her in someone else's social link, and then basically gain her first rank for free as she grabs you out of class, a time that you normally would have to choose for yourself between her and another, and she takes you to the city. I think this mechanically lightens the load on her link, and it certainly makes it more exciting than your typical introduction. I'm gonna skip the normal recap of her character because many of her significant elements, while they can be inferred, are not really referred to until her later bits. So let's get ahead of ourselves and jump right into her social link. When her link begins, she takes you basically as someone who can carry her bags for her while she shops for new clothes, occasionally belittling you, saying things like she thought that you were goody-goody, calling you a servant, etc. The most important thing that she tells you here though is that her family is new money, which I learned the meaning of exactly in my sophomore year of high school reading the book The Great Gatsby for a report. If you haven't been a sophomore in an American high school in the last few years, or for some reason hadn't read The Great Gatsby at this point, she explains basically that her dad ran into wealth doing land speculation, but that until recently they lived a fairly average Japanese life. So they've gotten rich out of nowhere, basically. This gives question somewhat to Ai's mentality as her pompous, above it all, pampered appearance normally is associated with old money, or someone born into wealth, which should raise question as if her vanity is all that it appears to be. The next link explores Ai unable to find anything that she wants, citing that she has all the things that she wants already. She asks you to get her a latte, which actually says a few things about her character that we'll get into later. We'll find out that I craves a genuine appreciation from someone, but has a very warped view on what type of person deserves that appreciation, which causes her to act like she does. Here, she is simultaneously trying to fill that empty spot she normally fills with money by buying things, and to test if she's done well enough to earn the appreciation from you. I always opt to say, let's split one, as the most grounded and possibly suggestive answer. From there, a sales associate showing up trying to pester her into buying more, since she's known to be a heavy shopper in this area. But after some rejection, she asks if you're her boyfriend. Note that she doesn't say new boyfriend, something all too easy to assume about a character like I, especially with the supposed rumors later on of her being easy or getting with multiple guys. The implication of only boyfriend, in general, back to back with the reinforcement for how often she comes here, seems to assure the player that you may not just be a pack mule that I tries to frame you as, and is instead possibly the first guy to ever come with her here. In other words, I spends much more time alone and lonely than she cares to admit. I then imparts her frustration about the salesperson after you leave, stating a line very insightful to her point of view, for now. There's no such thing as a relationship without ulterior motives. She says this with a bit of heartbreak in her expression, and it's clear that it's something she's tried to convince herself is true from poor treatment and experiences leading up until now. More hints that she didn't just magically become haughty because money plopped into her lap. She also states irritation for the lady calling you handsome and being friendly to you, which one may initially take as jealousy, but I think it's fair to drop here exactly why that is. I has done everything that she can to lose weight, change her interests, and be an attractive person. It's not something that comes naturally to her, in physique and personality. So some of that spitefulness might have been felt whenever you got treated special for being attractive in her eyes, even though there's some likelihood the reason that she took you along to begin with was part of you quelling her own insecurities. Next, I comes and decides that it's okay to come shop with and for you instead, mentioning how when she was forced into becoming the team manager role, she was chewed out about learning to not always put herself first. And despite her not understanding sports, at this point, she now agrees that it, it might be nice to cheer you on from time to time upon further reflection and getting to know you. This is followed by a brutal rejection of some rando who runs up and tries to confess to her. She turns him down because he's weird and ugly but you're not. She ends the social link stating that she doesn't want to date anyone right now, which is right and wrong. She hasn't found anyone that she feels compelled to date, sure, but she does want to date. Her name is Ai Ebihara, for God's sakes. Her name literally refers to pure deep love. 
I, being the root of Aisteru, the type of I love you that you'll never hear in an anime confession, the type of love so intimate and powerful only to be said in private and refers to an intimate mature statement of long-lasting love, her last name Ebihara constructed of three kanji that refer to, with context of her first name, the ocean-spanning, wilderness-bearing, long-lasting, pure, original love. How on earth could she not want to date somebody? Her name screams that she wants to be the exact thing that she said doesn't exist. A relationship without ulterior motives. One where people can know each other as deeply as possible, grow old, spend their lives, and die together. So, given the importance of love to her character, I now present you with a very love-focused second half of Eyes Social Link. While waiting by the school lockers, either Cole or Daisuke show up with the other sports club team members, depending on which strength confidant you chose earlier on. This will minorly change the dialogue in this link, but not really from I. Either Cole or Daisuke will find themselves alongside you, confused as to when the sports team begins to objectify I's body, while simultaneously insulting and gossiping about how easy she is before you and, and your selected strength social link tell them off. Either Cole or Daisuke apologizes for the other members afterward to you, mentioning he knows that you are somewhat close with I, but Cole or Daisuke are your buddy, so you kiss them on the lips and let them go on their merry way. After leaving, I immediately comes back, a bit too quick and convenient with her timing. It's implied that she heard the whole thing. You get a dialogue option to say either, did you hear them, or let's go, and since it's already apparent she heard, I always choose let's go. I think it sort of cements without saying it that what they said was garbage and doesn't matter, and that you are not seeking any sort of thank you for telling them off as you should have, because that's just normal good person behavior. She tries poorly to convince you that it didn't bother her, then she says, they don't even know her, what does it matter what they think? which is a good mentality to have, but fundamentally opposed to the lie about people that she's convinced herself to believe, and ends up assuring no one. She blushes and thanks you, but decides to head home for the day. I should now note that going into her ranks 4 and 5, that I is one of two social links in the game that can be reversed, a feature carried over from Persona 3 that, unless you're thick-headed or intentionally answering every question as cruel as possible, or a huge fan of Persona 4 who knows a lot of trivia, probably wouldn't know naturally playing the game. Honestly, I'd finished seven playthroughs before I saw any of the stupid options for myself, and I had to look them up with a guide to cause them. I say that because this link and a couple we've already talked about actually offer chances at reversal, which are essentially apology periods where you have to waste more free spots to get the person to forgive you. This gives more explanation and context for why they essentially gave you the free rank 1 and I introduction. Because if you're an idiot, there's a good chance that you'll use one rank up spot apologizing to her later. She does have another major interesting thing about her link though, and it's that her link branches in a much more severe way than most of the other links. But that begins at the next link, so we'll circle around to this in a second. On this rank, you think that I is going to confess to you as she meets you on the roof, but she actually blindsides you with a confession for either Cole or Daisuke. Now you have to ask them what they think of her before you get to the next social link. After asking them what type of girl they like and getting a lukewarm answer that ultimately is unsatisfying, I then asks in her next social link to ask them directly if they like her specifically. The second question happens within the social link, and it actually varies a bit in how the scene is scripted. If you're doing Daisuke's link, you already know that he ends up trying to reconcile with his ex-girlfriend who he has feelings for still, but for now he doesn't say much, just that he's not interested. With Cole, you get a Easter egg confession that you only saw implied in the hard-to-see special book club scenes. That is, that Cole actually has a crush on Chie, which is, of course, not the first or last mention of that in this full essay series, because it's funny. I is obviously heartbroken by the news either way, though, and I'm sorry that we're kind of hitting summary territory here, aren't we? Don't worry, the analysis is coming back soon. I overreacts to this discovery, attempting to take her own life, which is honestly a huge shocker that blindsides me every time because you go from this childish errand run of finding out if the boy likes her or not, he he he, and then her very existence is ready to be ended upon rejection. She finally tells you and tries to explain why this decision was so rash though. She tells you what's been implied this whole time, that she used to be poor, really overweight, and that she was bullied because of both of those things. 
On one level, it becomes clear that this is a story about what matters being what's deep down, and that what's deep down can also affect how you treat your own body and those around you. That beauty is fleeting and isn't the only thing that matters, but this, while I'm sure is relatable to many people and a good message, is only really part of the message of Eyes Link. I is a person who wanted people to appreciate and accept her, and due to the lie of magazines and culture, mistakenly thought the things she naturally was were all bad. That her interests and the things that made her her were valueless. At this point, I has spent years doing all she could to be seen as an attractive, lovable person, informed only by the lies of people who bullied her and the companies that intended to profit off of her insecurity. She became reliant on the lie of happiness through the shallow products. And so for this, it seems to her not just like she got rejected, but that even after throwing away everything she used to like about herself and everything that made her her own person in an attempt to have a single person that would actually love her, that deep down, no matter how much she tries to change, she still has no value inside that she's a worthless person who was born sick, born unworthy of love. Honestly, tragic. She's still swimming with this emotion though, and so she reaches out as if willing to settle with becoming your girlfriend, and this is where you get the fragment of her link. I is the only social link in the game that can be broken entirely, although in Persona 4 Golden you're allowed to fix it later as well. This only happens if the player pursues the romance option with I here, and let me explain why. She just opened up to you about this reliance, doing everything she could to feel needed by someone, but feeling worthless herself. Her reaching out for a relationship with you here is her reaching out for that acceptance once more, thinking, well, he's still here, maybe he'll give that to me. I'm embarrassed to think there was a time that I felt this way to some extent with one of my friends, when in a lonely slope all the way back to my sophomore year of college, getting depressed and eating out a lot, my past girlfriend studying abroad, who we'd ended our relationship months earlier, I felt lonely. Thankfully, I realized how I was feeling and didn't embarrass myself too much, but a relationship is not what a person that's going through that needs at that moment. They need time to work on themselves again, to find and accept the person that they want to be, not the person that they've been told they have to be, to be loved. So the best option and the original option for the successful max rank is to turn down Ai's confession, but agree to be her friend. If you choose to romance her, you essentially serve as a validation machine. At one point she asks, do you need me? And when people say you're a happy couple, she feels unsure and uncomfortable, fidgety about it. Because it's not the deep, pure love that she gets her namesake from. It feels superficial. She gains self-worth, you gain hot, rich girlfriend. You don't love each other. Eventually, you both break up. The social link breaks. Although in Golden, you can finish it. With her assured that your appreciation for her comes from deep down and not this facade that she thought attracted you. The next step is what I already said on the main route. It's her finding and reaffirming the parts of herself that she threw away. There's also a reference to her being a girl who doesn't really like cream puffs, which is possibly a fun nod to Naoki social link. Eventually, she faces the harassment of the people who think she's easy and are spreading rumors, and stands up to herself, getting slapped in the process. Talking down to cruel threats against her and really finding her ability to say something even when it's denying an appreciation from others. Because she acknowledges being appreciated for what you aren't hurts less than being forced into a cage that'll never fit you. She does one final confession at the end of the link, but this time she takes it with a positive gleam. She's grown. One day she'll find her love and she'll be a great partner to them. Be her true self. The self that she's grown proud of. Ai Ebihara is the moon arcana of Persona 4, and the second best moon in the Persona series. In this card, the crawfish leaving the water represents the person the card is meant for, them leaving the place of the public subconscious and returning to their spiritual attainments. This makes sense as Ai submerged herself in the thoughts and ideas of others to make herself feel loved, but it was only after she left those outer lies from childhood bullies and corporations that fed on her that she was able to confront the world and return to who she really was deep down. 
The moon can represent the yearning to return to rest, something also signified in the cards like the hermit through the idea of an old man. As it happens, the same old wistful man meaning is part of one of the kanji that makes up Ai's last name, Ebihara, referring, as I said before, to a deep, long-lasting love. So the moon desires to reunite her love with the true version of herself seen after leaving the pool of the unconscious. The path in the card is also sometimes referred to as the path of better bodies, which speaks of organizing our truth into who we aim to become. For I, she did everything to build a new physical self using the false truth bullied into her by others, but she was able to start and build again the true self within her after self-acceptance. In the higher polarity, it is an avoidance of the deception given by the highs and lows of the path. After I tries to rebuild who she is, she is confronted and even slapped for being a person more honest to herself. But she doesn't falter here. She pushes forward with newfound confidence. On the lower polarity, this refers to an extreme amount of crushing effort, tears and sweat and so forth. And this is the overcoming of a fear of illusionary threats. This threat, of course, is the false idea that no one will accept or love I unless she dedicates herself endlessly to making herself a more superficially attractive woman. In the sense of the body, it can also represent body image issues, insecurity toward one's appearance, and an obsession over working out, dieting, or changing your form, often to negative circumstances. As is sometimes the case, I believe this is obvious enough to leave as described. I Ebihara that one who seeks her acceptance, the true, mature, and long-lasting lifetime love, bullied into buying a lie that deceived her of her own self-worth, and overcome through the rejection and reflection of a self that she can love first. I is definitely a standout social link from Persona 4 Golden, both mechanically and narratively, in regards to her story and structure, and I hope that I have covered her thoroughly enough to give her justice. Sana is a banger. Absolute banger. Uh, what are your thoughts on its sort of instrumentation in context of like being a bathhouse and of like uh, Edo period, like Japanese history, and also the modern period, and I guess how that relates to Kanji as a person? Big question. Yeah, so, no, 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 you're fine. I, I actually, I feel like this one is the most embodiment of the place and person of almost all of the like dungeon tracks mm -hmm. um and that's partially because of the really aggressive drum kind of section mm -hmm. uh it uses a lot of symbols lower like tom hits and stuff mm -hmm. and it's very indicative of kind of punk like a punk kind mm -hmm. of style and i think that that fits kanji's look really really well mm -hmm. but then there's the like uh, main electronic section it's very dance clubby mm -hmm. and it reminds me of the way that kanji's shadow sees the sauna mm -hmm. you know um it has this persistent beat that you'd often hear in older like 80s almost i i, I might say I, I might be wrong on the exact decade it might be like 70s but um in old like media in film in particular uh like classic films and stuff you would often see any kind of dance segment play this this driving bass along with that percussion and stuff and i think that that fits really well with how kanji or kanji's shadow rather sees the sauna would you think that the, the like bum 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 because it's a very like shh 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 sound mm -hmm. um do you think that there's any possibility that could be some sort of artistic like uh diegetic um like aspect of like steam mm, of like the steam pressurized like hot air because it kind of gives that sense of like heaviness and anxiety that would be present also with this hot steam kind of like going down on your body i guess in the bathhouse i i so like i i could see someone saying that's a stretch but i could also see that actually being what the composer did so like from the perspective of music director composer myself I could see them actually using like the symbols or something very um, like uh, shimmery, like a very shimmery type of instrument, which they do use throughout the piece, um, using that to kind of represent the release of steam, like in a steam house. So I could definitely, I don't think that's too much of a stretch.
Kanji Tatsumi, our wonderful cinnamon boy, soft inside, crunchy outside, probably one of the most beloved characters in Persona 4. According to Newsflash, Persona Channel 2015, Atlas announced him to be the sixth most popular character on their Nico Nico livestream. Although, I wouldn't be surprised if it was even higher in the West, especially in the years that have happened since. Kanji is a cinnamon roll, a teddy bear type character, someone who is rough and rugged on the outside, and sensitive and kind to those who meet him and get to know him truly. Serious about his values and dedicated to caring for his mother and her store, having no qualms about disrespecting authority of any kind if they stand against what his true values are, while all the same being extremely respectful to any authority that he honestly thinks deserve it. He's the fourth addition to the investigation team and the core of the second dungeon in Persona 4 Golden. The initial impression of Kanji is this sort of secretive, violent delinquent, driven home by his imposing height, tendency to use aggression as a form of warding off unwanted attention, and his choice of clothing. He does all right academically, if I wanted to be optimistic, but his attendance record is very poor, and he's generally considered similar in terms of social aloofness and sexual euphemism unawareness that Yukiko has. Making sense, considering out of the entire cast, they actually have the most similar type of background, between Tatsumi Textiles and the Amagi Inn, often having a sort of amicable relationship. Similar to this, before being introduced into the story of the game, Yukiko was the only person to personally have known Kanji, although mainly superficially. And we see that elaborated on in very slight ways, although Yukiko seems not confident enough to correct the record on anything in particular. Kanji loves his mom. Growing up at the textile shop, he came to love sewing, animal crackers, and generally, despite these more gentle things, became a person so invested in these things he loved that he became a violent person who warded off anyone he thought were bad, often by physically fighting them. Famously, getting on TV after being mistaken as a crazy biker gang member, when in actuality he was fighting off biker gangs in Inaba that he thought were ruining the safety and security of his beautiful town that he loved. Also stereotypically with how he looks, he has an unintentionally harsh mouth, often using very disrespectful Japanese slang, but this acts more like a natural defense mechanism to get people off his back, rather than anything that he means in terms of, well, meanness. That's enough introduction, let's get into Persona 4's Emperor Arcana, Kanji Tatsumi. Looking first at the dungeon, before we make our way in, we see the continuation of this trashy late night public access television theme that the game has been going for, leaning into those real life sensational shows from the mid to late 90s and some of the early aughts. Kanji appears in a towel as a mock reporter doing research on the a superb site for those searching for sublime love that surpasses the separation of the sexes. This hyper caricature like gay stereotyping and flamboyance and the tone change of his voice in both the Japanese and English performance is an immediate contrast to the inflection and appearance of Kanji in the game thus far. And obviously due to this hyper change leans in on the curiosity over the secret meetings with the strange boy from earlier when trailing Kanji. This risque parody play on investigative journalism through the Midnight Channel tells us a few things, but I'm going to wait until describing any other significant factors before going into my analysis. Upon arrival into the dungeon, it's confirmed to be a sauna, a big sweat box, or as the TV title states, a bathhouse. Western culture has a history of associating baths and showers with men as gay, with jokes about dropping the soap being overdone and noticeable to most people. Thing is, due to the stomping out, sometimes literally, of burgeoning Christianity through the Sengoku and Edo period, Japan used to be a very sexually open culture prior to the modern period, especially in comparison to many other countries in this time period. Being gay hasn't typically been seen as an overwhelmingly immoral or sinful act, with many prominent figures in Japanese history being some form of gay or bisexual. In fact, in some factions, the pursuit to being the greatest male self as a samurai often led to the glorification of maleness that would celebrate homosexual behavior as a sort of type of appreciation for maleness of the highest degree. 
Yes, in general, the Koljiki, the records of ancient matters that concerns so much of the mythology of Persona 4 and is the founding of the Shinto doctrine, is very sex positive in general. Buddhism typically asked for celibacy, but only in that sexuality is a desire that must be expunged like any other in order to escape the cycle of death and rebirth. The Meiji Restoration era, starting in 1860, generally sent homosexuality for the first time in Japanese history as a negative thing, as an act passed in 1872 was the first to ever criminalize the act of sodomy although it was quickly repealed seven years later in 1880. Still, due to the westernization of culture, among other things, leads homosexuality to be understood negatively or sometimes denied, although not the same cultural understanding, perspective, or scrutiny that is associated with many of the other historically Judeo-Christian cultures and classically Abrahamically aligned ones of the time. Oh boy, so what was that all about? Basically, I wanted to give a better context for people who may have been raised in more Western or traditionally Judeo-Christian or Abrahamic cultures that this sort of general idea that homosexuality is by default a sin is not something that was inherent to many cultures during a lot of the similar time periods. Much of the anti-homosexual sentiment seemed to have been buried after an introduction of Buddhism, but more so after an introduction of open cultural exchange in the 1800s. Previous to this era, Japan was fairly sex positive. That's what I'm trying to get across because I know a lot of people may not be obviously Japanese themselves or speak Japanese or have personal experience in Japanese culture. This is important because there's something very distinct being done here with the bathhouse theme that is lost, I think, on Western culture that mostly see gay people and bathhouse as haha -ha prison sex joke. I wanted to get across that there's so much more going on here. So what is going on here? Something called cruising for sex, or hatenba, became common as well, with a well-known gay bar being reported as early as the 1600s, named Yinmachaya, not being the only one, and bathhouses with explicit purposes of gay men meeting each other for hatenba. In other words, it's not that bathhouses being naked around men is inherently gay, like one may associate with Western lens, which is actually fairly normal among Japanese families even to this day, with fathers and sons bathing together. But specifically, the idea of gay and haten-based bathhouses in Japan have existed for a long time and even somewhat continue culturally today. Some regular bathhouses will even offer specific haten areas. So if the implication of the bathhouse in Persona 4 didn't seem subtle, it's probably less subtle than you even thought. Before we continue with greater context on some of the history of homosexuality in Japan, I do feel the need to mention gay bashingu which in katagana is literally the English words gay bashing. It's worth noting that this is something recent culturally wise because the loan words are brought from English, aligning with the westernization of the Meiji era and beyond. Gay bashing refers to violence perpetrated toward gay men sometimes performing hatenba at public parks, as is another historically popular place for gay people to meet and hook up. These gay bashing cases sometimes lead to hunting or slaughter cases, one famous example being Ashihana Park, where a man stabbed another man performing hatenba in the thigh and killed him. The trial determined that it was a quote-unquote mistake murder caused from conflict. The last addition is just to add that while homosexuality has been approved, praised, religiously backed, and supported, and generally seen as culturally acceptable to some degree or another in broader Japanese history, the extreme change in attitude and remnants started from the Meiji era still exist today. So while depending on the area or place, as is historically true regardless of culture, support may actually be much higher or lower in Japan, other places, groups and areas as well as, of course, individual discriminatory people still exist and the justice system does not often try in the way that we would think is fair. There's plenty of institutional discrimination against gay people across the board. Many of the offhand comments from Kanji come in two categories while you work through the dungeon. That is, references or euphemisms to gay acts or ideas, the ideas of yearning for understanding of something he can't quite describe. Meeting Kanji on the third floor, there is a mention of looking for the encounters but not finding them possibly due to the fog. The sign also refers to this place as a rosy, steamy paradise rather than a bad, bad bathhouse. Going to classic imagery in the rose, the meaning seems to be the same here. The rose represented the idea, the concept of romance, but the thorns being the much harsher reason for the search. 
For Yukiko, searching for her prince was merely the way to escape her indecision, but with Kanji, that thing is yet to be made even apparent, although hinted at so far. The mini-boss is mostly absent of gay euphemism, but instead is literally referred to as a fight, saying that now that he sees fine young men have arrived, he wants to see them fight and pour their blood and guts. The ultra-violence and hyper-masculine depiction of the boss gives a feeling that what Kanji is searching for is all things manly, but through the fog is only able to find these hyper-masculine classically associated images. The mini-boss also is a wrestler with a pink mustache, which is most likely a reference to Hulk Hogan. This isn't just because of him being one of the most popularly recognized wrestlers in wrestling history, but also because he performed under the WWF in the 80s New Japanese Pro Wrestling, or NJPW. Another thing of note is the Western idea of man being at play here, rather than the reserved, refined bushido that often perpetuated male society and perception in Japan. Certain Western traits started being adopted in the post-war period, in the Showa period, during World War II in 1946 and beyond. This is when the occupancy of Japan by American soldiers began for the rebuilding period. In this time, alongside countless other cultural artifacts, the increased height and musculature of soldiers, as well as the long-standing involvement there from Hollywood and American media to Japan depicting a strong, dominant type of man, someone with thick facial hair, eating meat, and even the idea of drinking carbonated drinks like Coca-Cola became associated in Japan with manliness via cultural assimilation. Finally, we find Kanji disagreeing with his shadow. Kanji's shadow goes on a tirade on why he prefers men to women, but none of this has to do with love or attraction, instead coming from this seemingly a deep-seated personal experience and bullying by girls who question his meekness. They also refer to him as a queer in the pejorative sense, probably planting this idea that the things he likes can't be manly. They can't be who he is, but instead must be representative of something larger that he doesn't feel comfortable associating himself with. His more calm and non-manly hobbies, something implied being raised by an old mother to work at a textile shop, he likes sewing. In fact, in an optional Risei Night dialogue, Risei remarks after wondering where Kanji gets his clothes, that it's likely all his modifications are actually custom, and that he, indeed, is the one who's making a lot of his clothes. There's also aspects of this that are elaborated on more, of course, in his social link, but we'll get to that in a bit. He speaks on how he felt unaccepted, undesired, and degraded by girls that he grew up around. Girls who expected him to be playing with bugs and fighting with the other boys in the playground rather than the naturally gentle and quiet boy that Kanji was. Now for the Shadow Kanji boss fight. The sign in the room before the fight and behind him actually says Otoko Komoryo. Moryo generally meaning to protect or guard, and Otoko meaning for boys. Together is generally meant for the protection of men and boys. The symbol of the two circles in close proximity is a normal sign sometimes used to refer to money or weather in Japan. In this case, I believe that it follows the meaning of strong recommendation, the flower petals for new life, change, and rebirth, and the love on the circles that close in around the sign and banner, I think, fully means to fully embrace, protect, and foster the development of our young men, rather than stifling and crushing their true selves. Let men embrace who they are. Protect manliness any way that it exists. The boss himself has two lackeys, both made half black and half white, with the classic macho mustache. This is likely the yin and yang thing represented by the positive and negatives of masculinity, and also by the two types of kanji. One of the enemies is named nice guy, while the other is tough guy. They both put up barriers for each other and protect kanji with buffs. The two sides of himself. The weaker nice guy, who he feels he's always been deep down, and the tough guy he feels that he has to be in order to ward off judgmental people seeing him as weak or girly. The two sides of Kanji that protect him. The figure in the middle similarly has an enlarged musculature of the black and white henchmen enemies, splitting in the middle to cradle a naked and defenseless Kanji. The tough and nice side letting him remain within the flowers while from either side the facade digs thorns into his actions adding to the idea of him being defenselessly cradled between the two halves. The red circle cheeks are often associated with childlike behavior, youthful naivete, or meekness. 
each side of him also wields the gender signs, turning them up and down, seeming to convey the confusion. Although when he attacks, he sometimes throws them into the air, confidently flexing as they stab into the ground, more reflecting the female sex symbol, a prideful confidence in having a feminine nature. Upon defeat, the line actually changed a bit, possibly due to a Western audience likely not being privy to many of the cultural aspects of this dungeon and arc. In English, he reaches out desperately in sadness and says, Accept me! In the Japanese, he says, Iku, which means many things. To go, to die, and to come, but, like, in a sexual way. This likely was a double entendre, fitting euphemism with failure and a desire to have someone go away with him. So while the intent of the line wasn't totally carried over, I think the important aspect of it was without seeing too overly insensitive or homophobic. In regards to mythology, I couldn't find much like the previous three, only Japanese cultural artifacts that build more on this metaphorical image. It may or may not feel like it to you, but there are many things that I don't include due to myself thinking that they may be a bit of a reach or don't add anything meaningful to the understanding of the character. Still, I try to find everything that matches. Here, if it wasn't already abundant by many prior lines, Kanji says, it ain't a matter of guys or chicks. I'm just scared shitless of being rejected. So, uh, our family's run a textile shop for generations. Oh yeah, you, you already knew that. My parents are kind of weird. They, they say stuff like, dyes are one with the universe and cloth is alive. And that's the kind of house I grew up in. So I've been interested in sewing and stuff since I was a kid. The second I say stuff like that, People look at me funny. Girls make fun of me, the people in the neighborhood treat me like I'm some zoo animal. So I was sick of everything. I guess I wasn't really afraid of girls. I was just scared of people in general. I know Kanji's sexuality is a largely spoken about aspect of his character, so we will circle around to it later in his segment, but I want to make sure that we cover his full character and context first. So for now, with that, Kanji awakens to Take Mikazuchi, which is what we'll be getting into next. Take Mikazuchi, lore-wise, is a god of thunder and lightning, which explains his electric-type attacks from Kanji. He was also birthed from the blood rended when Izanagi killed one of his sons, Kagatsuchi, following the murder of Izanami. He wasn't the only god born from this event, such as O Yamatsumi, who also has purpose in Persona 4 Golden Story, but this is the place that Take Mikazuchi was born from, sticking to the theme of the main cast coming from Izanagi's actions, the protagonist, our inner self. His design represents this too, with a lightning bolt being held as a weapon. The large skeleton on the design, despite fitting with Kanji's shirt, also pantomimes the classic view in cartoons, manga, and more of a person's skeleton becoming visible when they're struck by lightning. The body shape, however, is a robot, something that can operate with the strength of its parts, but instead is given artificially big manly muscles, things unnecessary to a machine as if the true functioning strength of Kanji is existent regardless of his muscles. The smaller head and general shape could also refer to further reference of wrestling with a mask and a disguise. Other aspects and moves I also discussed and have further ties to his ultimate persona, which of course I covered in its own separate segment. Kanji Social Link is the first of the main cast who doesn't become available through a cutscene hanging out event. Instead, he's conscious of a rumor around school that targets him, and due to him not wanting you and the others to have rumors spread about you guys, he doesn't want to cause any of you all trouble after all you've done for him, and so he stays away. But he says that if you need him to reach out, he'll do what he can. This is only if you find and listen to him first, of course. You might miss out on the dialogue if you spoke to the girl on the second floor who mentions him starting his own gang to bully people. This is actually a reference to a recurring delinquent group, the one seen in Chie Social Link as well as many others. She tells you where he is and says it's scary that he's hanging around outside the sewing place. Like, that's so creepy. This dialogue is supposed to inform the player that Kanji has an available social link, but you can't actually start it until you've spoken with her and heard the rumor about him. 
The funny thing is, in the practice building, some additional dialogue is him shyly letting you know that he wasn't peeking in on the room he's standing next to, which is the sewing crafts club room. It's a cute sign that he doesn't have the courage to quite go into the room, but he's still interested in what's going on inside. Upon re-meeting Kanji, he asks you why you're making a scary face at him, and if you're going to tell him something bad. The first social link is, in my opinion, probably the weirdest of his social links and is framed really awkwardly. When the girl tells you the info of this obviously false rumor, the internal dialogue of Yu Narukami says, it seems Kanji is bullying people. Even if you haven't already met the real delinquent group, you should still know this is false. Then, in this social link, it's kind of framed like you're taking him out to lecture him. The first option, responding to if you're there to lecture him, is basically three varyingly harsh ways of responding yes, with the least yes answer being weirdly passive aggressive saying, I'm just here to talk, as if you're some church pastor getting on to you for kissing your girlfriend in the back of the youth group bus. Then, after Kanji hears the rumors about him being in the group, he is surprised and asks if you suspect him. Again, you get three answers that basically cast doubt on Kanji, with the least aggressive being, I want to believe in you. Once again, feeling very, very passive aggressive. I mention all of this because to my knowledge, this is the only point where the protagonist is definitively and confidently wrong about something in Persona 4. Like, we already saved Kanji in the bathhouse. Why would you believe a rumor monger more than a person that he should have learned more about in the bathhouse? It's also odd, with it being almost never seen otherwise, the main character taking the reins from the player. I enjoy the novelty of it in a sense though, just from its sheer rarity, but it's probably one of my least favorite ranks. The rest of the social link is great though, and all of the dungeon analysis stuff will be coming back as we cover his link. You eventually let Kanji know the rumors are no trouble to you and that you just want to help. Kanji asks then if he can talk to you sometime, how he feels cramped inside of himself, and how he feels too dumb to work it out on his own. He says that, but Kanji is, while not the brightest, also a pretty active thinker when it comes to figuring out who he is. He's someone who is more concerned than most of the characters in trying to understand himself. You see this contemplative face that he makes very often as a way of reflecting on aspects in cutscenes going forward, some of which we'll be mentioning in further contexts. The first thing that we cover with Kanji Social Link is the ability to tone down the tough guy side of his personality. It becomes very clear that he says aggressive things almost without will when he feels threatened in some way. It's become a chronic way of coping with a deep sensitivity, and so is something he will have to actively think about when talking to others in order to overcome this defensive reaction. He tells the Aya cook he's gonna destroy the store, and then looks over at you and adds, just so he can rebuild it better than ever. It comes off as an awkward comment, but he's trying his best to momentarily right the wrongs that give the wrong impression. He wants to be a man, but he doesn't want anyone to feel hurt or threatened. We also see a cop come in and question him what he's up to, despite him just sitting in Aya minding his own business. He says that he's always getting interrogated like that, how he feels like because of his defensiveness and current expression of himself, he's causing trouble for his own mom and others around him, mentioning her sprouting more white hairs. He also hates being wrongly accused of things when he's not trying to cause trouble for anybody. It ends up being the same as whenever he was bullied by the kids at school for being too girly and weak, but in reverse by adult strangers. Kanji mentions something here which I think is very wholesome to his character, filial piety, without explaining it to the player. This is a teaching in Confucianism regarding the respect between parent and child, the idea that the child should give great respect to one's parents and elders. In Japan, the idea of kohai and senpai goes farther than an assertion of class placement of older and younger in school. It does the work of the senior co-workers and the junior ones. It goes into family matters. There are essentially four levels of Japanese based entirely on respect or intimacy for the person that you're speaking with. The words you use, the grammar, the intonation, all of this is important in Japanese for people to relay proper respect to others that is something that Kanji actually shows a lot of care to do, as he doesn't just call you Yosuke, Yukiko, or Chie 
Senpai, from time to time, he refers to Yosuke in conversation with you as Yosuke Senpai, even when he's not around. And he dotes on all of you for being responsible, kind, and taking care of him, as Senpai should. His mention of filial piety also adds to this aspect of his character. He is probably, ironically, one of the most actively concerned with respect for others of any of the characters in the game, which plays good contrast to him also being seen as so harsh and him wanting to become better. For this scene, it ends with him talking about how he now feels he has the power and people behind him to make a better change for himself, to help this city, because he feels he's caused a lot of trouble for everyone. Next social link is Kanji taking you to meet his mother, because she wanted to know you. This is really sweet, and showing that the sensitive relationship between him and his mom is, you know, very close, but also showing that filial piety and respect for his elders is a big priority to him. However, the introduction goes off the rails very quickly when he's misinformed about his mom actually being in the hospital. Turns out, she was in the hospital, but only to take someone there. From here, Kanji gets upset and storms off. This link serves to introduce the plot thread that Kanji's dad is dead, and that that specifically was a very traumatic experience for him, and start planning what his arc ultimately ends up focusing on, what it means to be a man. Kanji's mom mentions how she feels that Kanji has become cowardly, how he used to love playing house or doing home ec instead of sports and physical education, how because of this, he didn't have very many male friends, but girls didn't accept him either. They thought he was weird. This confirms more of what the shadow alluded to. After this consistent unacceptance, he started getting into fights and bleaching his hair, but she mentions lately he does seem to have some sort of change in him, that he might actually be letting himself have fun again. That's why she wanted to meet you, because she thought you may have been the cause of it. And while the true cause was him facing his own insecurity as his shadow, I guess in a roundabout way, you kind of were the cause for that too. The next area we see on the next rank is going to the general location for much of his social link in the future. Kanji notes that this is a place that he always liked, in part because it made him feel... This has fractioning reasons, but for the moment I want to point out this as another irony to his current appearance. He makes himself seem big, aggress and intimidate others out of fear, but he really desires to be small, to help others, to not stick out, be respected and left to rest. Maybe like all the houses down the hill leading into the mountains. But it also goes to the flamboyant nature of his shadow. While he acknowledges there is a part of him there that wants to be accepted, he doesn't want to be the type of person to assert his acceptance over to others. He just wants to be loved and understood for who he is on his and whoever else's own grounds. It's poetic. An artist should totally draw a whimsical, watercolory picture of Kanji looking wistful, looking out at the town down below. That would be nice. There's another assertion toward the hospital being a place that makes Kanji feel weak, although he doesn't go into things himself, and he notices that the kid from the hospital is sitting there by himself. The kid lost a doll that a female friend had given to him. Truth is, though, he didn't lose it. A boy in his class stomped on the doll and bullied him for having a doll and being girly. Then, to prove he wasn't girly in a moment of insecurity, made him throw it into the river. But he did want the doll. He let her down, and now he feels awful. Kanji's response is to chastise the boy for running away. Then everyone goes down to the river, although only Kanji goes in to search alone. After failing to find the doll, Kanji insists that the boy apologize to the girl and take responsibility, telling her that he threw it away. But in exchange, Kanji has an idea to make a custom version of the rabbit doll for the boy himself. This doubles down Kanji's strong sense of responsibility and justice, while also showing his kindness. He doesn't realize it, but in this, this action he's taking is a harmonious combination of the tough and nice guy self, and a reach towards the idea of manliness that he's really been searching for. He relays to you how he contextualized the situation. The boy was looking for acceptance, and to do it, made the person cry who already accepted them. He sees this as him and his mother, and an opportunity to stop the kid from getting into a toxic acceptance cycle that he got into. With a kid that seemed interested in traditionally feminine things as well, it obviously gained some sympathy from him. Next link, he gives the rabbit to the boy. The boy wants one for himself as well, and turns out that Kanji may have enjoyed doing it a little more than you would have thought. He made a second one, just in case that did happen. 
Kanji's initial embarrassment to admit that he made it is kind of cute, but whenever the kid learns that he did make it, he doesn't see Kanji as weird or gross, as a freak. He calls him cool. This is important to Kanji because Kanji lying or trying to avoid the fact that he made them is him searching for acceptance because the things in life we love most often hurt most when they're trampled on. To get personal for a moment, you know, there are many things in life that I love deeply and feel are important to me. Things that have significance and quality that I am attached to or even that I think are important pieces of media outside of me. With these pieces of media, I often don't try to sell or convince anyone to experience them unless the person is really close to me. Even then, I might end up not doing it. It's because I'm scared of them not liking it or of misunderstanding it. Because in a way, I feel a part of myself is being rejected or misunderstood when I see it mischaracterized. It's very rare that I feel this way about media. Generally, I can enjoy something and then separate it from the author or from other people's communities and perceptions. But when I do feel that way, it doesn't come out of nowhere. It's a valid feeling to have, and it sucks. It sucks most when people don't state a lack of interest or don't point out potentially valid criticisms, but through their misunderstanding, devalue the piece of art without any sense of respect. I've seen some people express mockery toward the idea itself of giving high value to media and art, but art is not just entertainment. Art is a reason for being. It is the most expressive way of conveying aspects of the human experience that make breathing worthwhile. It's the most dynamic form of understanding philosophy. The things that we do in this world, our hobbies, the things that we consume in this world, a complex dish, a painting on a wall, a specific story or gameplay mechanic, these are the things that allow us to contextualize and translate life's meaning to others. So of course, it's not just a game, just a movie, just a show, just a painting. It's never just a rabbit, just a hike, just a drive. Never just a drawing, just a speech, just a song. Those things are life. And if one of those things is deeply close to you, they are important and deserve as much respect afforded to them as the average person. Take pride in what you do and what you like. Take pride in life. Just wanted to get that bit out of the way. There's likelihood other aspects of this idea will lay in the rest of his arc and elsewhere, but after Kanji is taken aback for not being mocked for the things that he loved and enjoyed, he promises to make more stuffed animals for the child. The child leaves and the game notes that Kanji looks more mature in his smile than usual. Still feeling embarrassed as if he got exposed for something, he tries hard to hide behind his tough guy demeanor, but it kind of falters. In this case, him being a tough guy and nice guy presented to the child that you can be manly and still sew, or cook, or do anything traditionally seen as feminine. Because manliness is what you define it to be for yourself, and femininity is who you are when you want to be feminine. The significance of the place is brought up again, saying it really is a great place, but mentioning how he never noticed how the wind was different before, until now. Whatever change that is, it's a seemingly pleasant one for him. The next rank is divided into two segments. The first is the boy telling Kanji that everyone loves his things, how even his mom once and offered to pay for one, and how his teacher was wanting a pink alligator. Kanji doesn't want to be paid, he sees it as wrong since he's not a professional, but this shows potential in Kanji's ability. It's not a useless hobby as he mentioned in the last link, but something he could genuinely do. Kanji mentions the pink alligator is probably in reference to a storybook, and this is not the only place the storybook is mentioned. Nanako also reads it for a school assignment at one point during Adachi's social link, although I think that the mentioning of it here is much more different. People like to mention its inclusion as if it's just a trivia piece, and that's fine, but you have to think back to how this recontextualizes Akinati's work from Persona 3. In Persona 3, Akinati, the son, the dying man, writes a story to leave a legacy. He writes a story about a pink alligator who, due to his color and being an alligator, is unable to easily catch food, but finds a friend in the singing bird. 
One day when he is dizzy and tired, he accidentally eats his friend from his hunger, and upon inducing vomit to retrieve it, confirms the bird is dead. He then cries so much that he drowns himself in his tears, causing a beautiful lake to form in his place. A place with beautiful flowers and delicious fruit, where the other residents end up relaxing and being happy, never knowing how it came to be, or of the alligator who created it. Traditionally, the story is about Akinati not being able to live a long and happy life, but how he could still pass on knowing that maybe his story would leave a legacy for those to read it. Consider it being reading material at school, and even seeming to be common knowledge among the residents of Inaba, the book seems to have been a huge success in the time since Akinati has moved on. But the story's use of the metaphor makes it fill with kanji in a very different way. Kanji is the pink alligator, being aggressive, someone people fear, but being pink or girly, feminine, on a base level considered weird. This is his tough guy. He is pink, but he isn't bullied because his aggression masks that insecurity. The bird is the nice guy. He sings, loves to keep others company, and is a nice person willing to lend a helping hand. At one point, Kanji was hungry for acceptance and almost swallowed the nice guy part of himself to obtain it. But in facing his shadow, was able to see the value of both parts of himself, and instead of being left alone forever, he accepted it and tried to strike the right balance. Kanji got the happy ending that Akinati had trouble writing, because Kanji does have further opportunity to grow and change. This isn't the end of his story. The second half of this rank is when Kanji opens up significantly on the major thing that happened to him in elementary school. He mentions how, thinking back, he had this crush on this girl way back in the day, so he fixed her backpack strap by sewing on it to make her happy. But the next day, all the girls in class were making fun of the girl for what had happened. He mentions how she cried. Kanji is a really well-written character partly because of lines like this. I don't know why, but, you know, I've done something wrong. His heavy amount of self-serious reflection and genuine compassion in observing things, met with slight stiff inarticulateness, really portrays the troubled, soft, yet stiff character of Kanji. They did a great job writing him. From here, Kanji ends his link, saying that he likes being thanked, being appreciated for whenever he does something nice. He never thought it would happen, but he wants to make others happy, and he's happy to be needed again. He's embarrassed, but... He mentions that he's going to go to the fabric shop in Okina and buy himself some more stuff, by himself, for the stuffed animals. He's taking strides, finally, to accept and take pride in the things that mean something to him. Next social link, a ton of dolls are given to the kid, and the kid, after being refused for the offer to pay, confirms that he is from Tatsumi Textiles, so he runs off to see his mom. Here we get the tie-in into Kanji's central character arc in a more blatant fashion. Kanji tells you how he used to think that the word strength was about doing what needed to be done, like a man. He mentions how he saw catching the killer as a part of that too, but there's something else he needs to confront. The proper suggestion then is his past. He mentions his other him in the TV world, the girl he made cry. He thinks to himself a bit, and then he says, it ain't that easy to become strong, is it? Kanji thinks a moment before he then smiles with a gentleness that the player states he'd never seen from Kanji. Kanji doesn't say what he's decided. Instead, he says he needs to go back to the store, since his mom has been hassling him to sell his creations at the shop. Coming back to filial piety, and now him finding something to pay his mom back for and show his appreciation. In the link where he mentioned filial piety initially, he talks about his persona ability and how he mentions that he's finally able to return the favor to the people he loves by catching the killer. Here, he changes this assertion. No, he already had and has the ability to pay her back. It has nothing to do with supernatural powers. He has power with the things that he loves and cares about, separate from his persona. It's honestly a good bit of subtle character writing that I'll mention again is something some people really talk as if the Persona series doesn't have. Truth is, people who say this just aren't taking the time to notice it. Next social link is essentially the fruit of his actions. Every bit of the link so far comes back in together. The cop, his mom, the kid, the delinquent group, and his insecurity of it all. It all ties into a bow here. 
The cop comes up to him as the rumors have spread further about the delinquent group. When you try to explain the misunderstanding to the cops, they attempt to take you in too as a confidant. Then the kid in question shows up and speaks for Kanji. The cops can't believe it. The idea that Kanji and his rough exterior would be making dolls for children? He finally asserts confidently to people who have traditionally judged him harshly what his interests are and the things that make him insecure. He finally faces the possibility that they may laugh or mock at him, but he doesn't step down. Lastly, his mother comes in and also reassures that her boy Kanji would never do such a thing and that of course she believes Kanji without a second thought. Kanji's a good boy, a good man, and the connections that he made along the way all stand in testament to him. Kanji allows himself to cry. He always plays tough, but it's clear that Kanji has accepted fully the part of himself he tried to hide so deep and far away, and he's happy with who he finally is for once in his life. The last loose end draws us back to his favorite spot. The other day I went to visit Dad's grave. It's the first time I went on my own. I had a lot to tell him. How was it? A well, I felt like I could finally face him. A little late, though. <laughs> Dad told me something right before he died. If you're a man, you have to become strong. I felt like he was telling me I wasn't a real man. It pissed me off. So I changed my looks and pushed myself away from people. Fighting gangs, thinking I was keeping mom safe, and even trying to catch the killer. I was just being stubborn. I thought all that was how I was becoming strong. That I was really making up for all the trouble I caused. That wasn't it. That ain't what dad meant. I still don't really get what being strong means, but I'm gonna start by not lying to myself. No more being scared of everyone, hiding my hobbies, staying away from people. Anytime, any place, I'm gonna bust right through as my own self. That's the way to deal with that other me in the TV world. As long as there's someone like that snot-nosed kid to accept me, I ain't afraid of nothing. There's one more thing I figured out. Rise stopped by our store the other day. She said the dolls were cute, so I told her I made them. Then she said that was creepy. Kind of stung, but I kept on showing her the other stuff I made. And in the end, she said, Maybe you're an amazing guy after all. Pissed me off the way she said it, but that aside, I get it now. This is what he was talking about. Just been throwing in the towel all this time. Of course no one could understand me. I've been keeping my distance out of fear. So I decided that I'd do things my way, no matter how tough. But it ain't just about hanging out with guys who understand you and telling the rest to get bent. You gotta make an effort if you want people to understand you. It didn't even cross my mind to try to tell them my story. I let them think whatever they want. I didn't put in the slightest effort to try and make them understand. It's easier for me to act tough. So from now on, I got two rules. Rule one, be myself. Rule two, Get people to understand me. Now I can say it straight out. Huh? That other me is me. Kanji's story is about the search and understanding for what it is to be a man. And the conclusion that the elements of being a man that are important are to be true to yourself, to stand by your principles, and to the things that make you, you. Try to understand those things, the people around you, and let others understand it as well. Everything else can be manly, if only you do that, and have confidence while doing it. Kanji learned that he is the artist of his own destiny. Others may draw a picture of him, but he's the one who paints it. And he is the one who has the power to show their artists where their mistakes have been made. Being a man isn't about getting into fights, being aggressive, musculature. It isn't about sports or hobbies, even. Being a man is about whatever you do as a man. The stereotypes are just the normative societal averages. That is the core of Kanji's link, and about the struggle that he overcomes. But there are still more aspects to it, so now I want to finally talk about Kanji's sexuality, and how that comes into play in regarding the themes of manliness in the story, what his sexuality is, and what it means to him. Something made abundant through the story is, like Yukiko, Kanji has a general aloof and childish understanding of sexuality and love. When jokes, references, or euphemisms are made, a lot of the time he's totally unaware to their implication. 
I think this leans in on the reinforced idea that Kanji isn't confident how he feels sexually, but also, like Yukiko, leans on the relatable adolescence of the characters in trying to figure out exactly what is how they feel. This idea of aloof confusion is reinforced heavily. It's implied after the hot spring in some of his optional night encounters, for example, that Miss Kashiwagi is trying to come on to him, but he's totally unaware of her advances and keep thinking that she's taking him into her office because he's in trouble for some reason, when it becomes obvious to the player that she's trying to seduce him. Something also can be seen in when he pushes Naoto to enter the beauty contest so that he can make sure how he feels. But it seems ill-fitting for someone like me to get up on stage. I wonder if there's any way I could take it up with the school authorities. Uh, I don't think it's a problem at all. I mean, just do it, you know? Seriously. What are you saying? Um, I beg you, please be in it. If you do, my, uh, doubts will finally be cleared. Come on! Make me a man! Doubts? What are you talking about? Despite this, there is also a number of things stated by Kanji directly. One example is him recalling how he remembers liking and having a crush on the girl that he fixed the strap of in elementary school, and that it might have been due to that that he felt compelled to help her. This also leads to what he said both as a shadow and not an idea that because he was embarrassed for helping the girl he liked, and was specifically targeted by girls, as well as the fact that the girls in his home ec classes started to bully and stay away from him, his impression of girls as judgmental and cruel sort of became a traumatic experience for him. Coping, he decided he hated girls and closed himself off to his feelings of them. He seems not to find overly feminine or cutesy women attractive at all, such as the many running gags of Kanji not understanding Risei's appeal, and of him asking how old she is when they first meet, which is definitely one of the best roasts in the game. What is fairly unusual is Persona 4 perhaps uniquely gives one character in the party, that being Kanji, romantic feelings toward another, that being Naoto. Not in a subtle, there is a bit of an implication sort of a way, but in a very blatant way as to the rest of the group even teasing Kanji for his obvious liking of Naoto and his poor ability to be subtle about it. Yosuke even pushes as to supporting Kanji to make moves on Naoto sometimes, although to no notable avail, obviously. Naoto, who despite being female, presents in a traditionally masculine way through the earlier parts of the story, opts to hide and keep her bust pressed down. When Naoto does try out for the beauty contest, Kanji is definitely attracted to her, but her outfit doesn't show her as any more feminine really than what the general standard for her already was. She basically ditches the hat and that's it. Maybe you could argue that she's wearing makeup? But it being so subtle, along with the context she's in, and her feelings in that situation, Occam's razor implies that's not really the case either. Later, when Yosuke mentions it being a bummer that Naoto didn't come into the second round, Kanji agrees but then gives a super wholesome line that I'm including just because it's like literally like the cutest thing ever. Too bad, Kanji. Huh? Uh, no, um, well, yeah. But don't you think it was brave of her to at least show up in the first round? The thing is though, while we don't have the details behind the meeting of Kanji and Naoto before Kanji's dungeon, in specifics other than Naoto seeming to ask Kanji questions in due to him being a possible future victim for the case, from Kanji's point of view, he felt inexplicably attracted to Naoto from when they first met. This could be due to Naoto seeming to not have any issue with his appearance, rumors, and attitude of Kanji, giving Kanji the idea of being accepted, which aligns more with his character arc. There's many hypothetical things that we could maybe guess as to the root of the attraction here. Trust me, I deleted a paragraph of doing that just after realizing that I wasn't largely analytical or contributing to the central point. Going into his dungeon, he is confronting some of the feelings I mentioned earlier. I think it's possible that these potential homosexual feelings compounding with the memory of being called queer for his hobbies coincided with his search to understand what it meant to be a man. Persona likes to make mythological and historical parallels, and this idea lines up perfectly with the samurai I talked about in the past, who revered and sought the ideal maleness in craft, some of whom, by showing homosexuality as an act of understanding, research, and appreciation for the male form. This also lines up with the Midnight Channel for specifically being an investigative journalist. 
He is going in to find out how men really are, and who knows what will happen to him as he goes in, as he says. We also then see, being raised by a traditional mother in a rural Japanese town and family business, the melding of traditional Japanese culture, prior to Meiji era even, and values, and the modern-day westernized view on manliness becoming all mixed up in kanji, especially with the declaration from his father and his burgeoning sexuality. This goes back to mix the Western and Japanese depictions of manliness in his dungeon, with more Western wrestlers and references to Western icons and hyper-masculine, hyper-muscular men set within deep-seated historical gay locations like Hatemba bathhouses. Kanji's sexual curiosity and confusion, his seeking to be a man, all the stuff that he introduces to you that seems to be crammed up inside his head is something he has trouble organizing, and this chaos clash of cultures in the dungeon help reinforce that. After defeating Kanji's shadow, but before Kanji passes out, he says, It's not a matter of guys or girls, he's just afraid of the rejection. He says something similar outside of his dungeon, too, that he wasn't just scared of girls, he was scared of people in general, the rejection of it all. Which would seem to concern from a more sober kanji the sentiment of the statement the shadow was putting forward, and how that really was truly how he felt deep down. I say this for clarity because while I don't feel it is as much of an important factor with kanji, the TV world isn't just a reflection of the subconscious of the individual, but the attitudes toward the subconscious and the general impressions of the individual by the public subconscious as a whole. With all the given evidence, it seems the most supported perspective is that kanji is… well, as he says he is. He wants someone he can love and feel accepted by, whoever that sex or gender may be. He does seem to have personal preferences and tastes, as all people do, like him definitely not finding more cutesy hyperfeminine archetypes like Rise attractive, and obviously loving Naoto's androgyny before and after he is aware of her biology. He also is aloof and unaware, and hints multiple times that he is still trying to figure himself out blatantly in the text of the story. So then, with his own personal tastes withheld, tentatively, and for the time, we know him, Kanji, is attracted to men and women. Whether this be bisexuality, pansexuality, or any more of the sort, whatever term you think is best, if the person fits his personal preferences, and most importantly, if they accept him as who he is, the sex of the person does not seem to be a concern. What does his sexuality mean to Persona 4, though? Well, largely, it's just one piece of the confusion toward his identity and how he understands societal conventions for manliness and the seeming misalignment of that in his personal interests and feelings. It adds a unique human element where, regardless of a person's sexuality or self, if they are not heartless, they can come to empathize and understand more about themselves. And while there was by no means any reason for me to go this extensive into this aspect of his character, Considering the legacy of discourse, I thought it was suited being thorough for a full analysis, rather than a shorter blurb. Now moving on, the specific kanji used for kanji's first name, kanji, which include many different combined combinations of kanji for interpretation containing the characters for complete and two, his last name Tatsumi is a single character, and that means to abstain. As we discussed, Kanji has two halves inside of him, the tough guy and the nice guy, but he wasn't complete until he embraced and let both take appropriate reign inside of himself, instead of one protecting or destroying the other, as far as abstain means in regard to his name, I believe that you could thoughtfully come up with something as easily as I could. There are plenty of things that Kanji abstains from, learns to stop abstaining from, and learns to start. I don't believe his last name says a huge amount additionally in regards to his character that we haven't already covered, or that is extremely specific without maybe reaching. Kanji Tatsumi is the Emperor Arcana, a card that represents reason, the ability to see things as they are. This is something that Kanji is seeking to understand, fighting between interpretations, time periods, and cultures, and of course with his own feelings before grounding himself and coming to an answer. 
The answer also represents power, but not outer power, inner power, seen as the emperor is, without his court, in informal clothing, sitting on a throne of ram's horns and red color palette. This also represents Kanji, who chose outer power to defend and scare off those who would hurt his feelings and the insecure parts of himself. Over his arc, he becomes confident. He loses that insecurity over his hobbies, as well as becomes a less aggressive and violent person. His outer power becomes inner. The higher polarity then, of course, means to see things as they are and use your power in a good way that benefits and understands the reason of yourself and the world. It also represents one who aids and helps others with his inner strength, rather than ruling with his position. In this case, Kanji showed the inner power, his love for sewing, and used it to help a boy and eventually so many others, giving them the things that they wanted. While before we met Kanji, he was suppressing this side of himself and fighting with others, vocally being aggressive even to his mother and random others in the world. This is representative of the lower polarity, which is when the person does not see the world as it is and instead is deceived by appearances. His constant misunderstandings of people as attacking or looking down on him and having his weakness is represented here. The lower polarity is also associated with negative masculine stereotypes like machismo, the act of being overly macho, making war, which in Kanji's case is just his obvious violence and abrasive nature. It also connects to the anger of saying or acting without thinking. All of these very clearly connect to Kanji's growth, starting in the lower polarity and working and finishing in the upper polarity as a calm, confident, mature person. Kanji Tatsumi, the Emperor, the person, is one of the most long and closely beloved characters in Persona 4. As I'm writing this, I actually can't think of a single person I've ever heard say they don't like him. Although, of course they must exist somewhere. Then again, I don't really want to meet them. Kanji's story is more than a tough guy with a soft side. That generalization shows no respect or understanding of who Kanji is. Kanji is a fully realized person. Someone who, due to his personal pride, his fear, and his seeking of acceptance, was thrown into a mishmash of cultural identity clashing with his interests that only started to press on him even harder and harder as he came into adolescence. Kanji is someone who respects his elders, follows rules, and is inherently gentle and understanding. And by the end of the game, he's someone who truly only lives by the way he feels happiest, becoming the ideal man that he struggled so long to define and discover. His message of being comfortable with your identity, whether that be in your interests, hobbies, talents, or sexuality, is something countless people have latched onto, as is so easy when you have as kind of a heart as Kanji. He's clumsy and articulate, but even as that may be, he decided to try his best to make sure other people can get to know the Kanji that Kanji came to love. In regards to the theme of truth, things follow pretty clearly. Kanji was obstructed by his own lack of understanding, compounded with the combined cultural influences and negative reinforcing factors to search for a manliness that already existed within him. Eventually, he faced himself and realized that a real man is Kanji. Hello! Good to see you again. Um, thank you very much for making it this far. The kanji segment is one of my favorite segments, mainly because I think one of my favorite parts about this series, uh, what I drew emphasis from and what I had the most fun researching was just cultural and historical things that were outside of my own, like, base background. Uh, it was really fun and interesting diving into the history of different cultural affects and trying to get a better understanding of not only like that culture, but then also myself and the characters within the game, kind of how you can reconceptualize things. Um, my Japanese is pretty bad. It's like a second grader, and that might be like a compliment to myself. Um, but I think something that I've learned with like Japanese and grammar structure is a lot of language learning isn't just learning words to plug it in. I mean, some are, but with something so structurally different as Japanese, a lot of times it's reteaching you how to think. It gives you like a whole new way to conceptualize ideas. Um, 
And I, and I feel like that's sort of what happens whenever you look at these broader concepts, especially surrounding gender and identity and sexuality. Whenever you look at these topics through a historical cultural lens completely segregated from, you know, the typical Abrahamic background, it creates a very interesting and like unique way to position and reconceptualize these ideas. I hope you like the kanji segment. It's one of my favorites. Uh, although a couple of my more favorites are still yet to come. Thank you uh, once again very much, and uh, do not, d don't watch this in one setting. Don't do it. It's impossible. It's impossible. Don't do it. All right, item balance. The sheer amount of different items and different ways to obtain them, the different contexts, their availability only being inside or outside of battle, sometimes putting effects on the player, I think makes for a massive amount of fun if you're not irritated by a clogged variety of items that do very similar things. Truth be told though, as most of them are light HP recovery items, most of the time I only used them whenever I needed to conserve SP in a dungeon instead of healing with magic. The items that can downright help a ton are pretty rare and very limited regardless of your playthrough, like some extreme SP recovery items like Somas, or extreme health items like bead chains. In general, it never felt to me like my items were carrying me through any of the fights, but more served as last ditch efforts to help or push me across the finish line, or to do a weakness when I didn't have enough SP, or recover HP in the same circumstance. So generally, I'd say item balance is fun, not too serious, but isn't super involved in the average gameplay loop either. SP as a whole, on the other hand, I think is very strangely handled. All non-physical Persona abilities require some sort of SP, and the way that the game handles SP recovery feels badly balanced as well. Um, just bad. I, I, don't know, I don't know what to say. The game doesn't let you recover SP by returning to the floor like Persona 3, which I actually think is an improvement since the way that it worked previously basically just punished the player by making them redo stuff they already partially did, essentially turning time wasting into a punishment, turning fun video game time into busy work. In Persona 4, the punishment is harsher, but also less easy to be abused by someone who just has time to waste. It kicks you out and makes you spend another day if you want the SP recovered, which means you're trading in-game days and possible social link upgrades for new SP and dungeon traversal. Alternatively, the Hermit social link exists in the game to offer SP recovery, but it's pretty expensive so early on, using it more than once a dungeon can basically drain all the money out of your account. This is good, because it causes the player to think about the resource balance. It punishes the player by offering essentially a optional high exchange rate or resources for a resource normally limited to a day. If you want that exchange rate down to be more reasonable, you have a whole separate system of tasks to do to lower the money through the fox. Some rare seeds in the garden can also offer SP recovery items in dungeons, if you prepare them properly. And of course, through chest hunting, you can sometimes find SP recovery items as well. It offers a decent balance early on, although I think SP is personally too limited at the start of the game. And I mean, you could always use multiple days, of course, and maybe that's what was intended, but... If you want to maximize your experience with the game, giving up story and character beats for SP seems like an offer you'd want to avoid as a last ditch negotiation. So the system has its ups and downs, but it's mostly more strategy based approach to SP recovery and a lesson in proper dungeon preparation. Here's the thing though, this whole system that I just described, which I think is not actually half bad, breaks with one mechanic. You can get sodas from the vending machine. That's right. The whole SP system comes down with a soda machine, five a week, at a restore of 10 SP each. Normally going into a dungeon, I'm sitting with 20 to 25, maybe even more of these SP recovery sodas, which sure aren't a full restore, but unless you're needlessly wasteful, this strat basically makes it so you never need to use the fox, or even rely on other SP recovery methods. And it's cheaper than bargaining with the fox, even if you've basically got them maxed out on their social link. As for the first dungeon, just three or so will almost fully restore you unless you're empty. And by the late game, ideally, you will have so many left over from the previous dungeons, as well as SP recovery moves if needed, that it will be irrelevant then as well. 
Now, because I've seen arguments like this in terms of Pokemon criticism, I'm going to assume a similar straw man exists somewhere in the Persona community as well. If it's overpowered and breaks the system, then just don't use it! But that's part of the problem. If you're analyzing a system and looking at all of the parts that make up that system, and you notice a part of that system can override and ruin every other part of the system, sure, you can close your eyes and pretend it isn't there, but isn't it a lot better to just remove or change it to fix the problem? You can't just tell someone to close their eyes and say the problem isn't there. You address how this one mechanic in the game is actively fighting with the goals of the system it's a part of. Now, to be fair, you kind of have to find these sodas yourself, so there's a chance that you may never learn about them on your own, but they are also available at literally the first roaming area you're given access to in the game, and purchasable immediately after the first time into the Shadow World. So yeah, overall, the balancing system is probably much improved, but a few key factors unfortunately common in the game pretty much break it. And that's my thoughts on SP balancing. Through all the social links in Persona 4, and even across the Persona games in general, I'd say it's pretty easy to argue that none are more unique than the Hermit Arcana of Persona 4, often referred to as the Fox social link, and that's mainly due to its gameplay loop. Rather than the typical hangout and chat upgrade of links with a single character or party member, or auto-upgrade links with story events, the Hermit of Persona 4 is actually a series of tangentially related specific side quests that you manually do as mostly non-time-passing events over the course of Persona 4. Truth be told, it wasn't until my fourth playthrough of Persona 4 personally, third of Golden, before I finally sat down and committed to doing the whole link properly. You see, the purpose of the fox, and the incentive of doing so, lowers the price of SP healing in dungeons, something that, if you're trying to do in one day, can sometimes be challenging without the proper items. But getting those proper items isn't actually that hard if you know what you're doing, which I think demotivates a lot of people from truly devoting themselves to doing this link. Aside from that, what is the purpose of this link? And I really think for Persona 4, it actually does quite a bit to pull together different themes and ideas in a very seamless way, as well as integrate more interesting quests into the side story, as most other quests are just farming for specific weapons or traded materials. The first couple links are simple enough. Give an old man medicine so he can care for the shrine, helping a girl with her love life, helping someone with their overeating, or getting their dog to come back home. A lot of these ranks are seemingly random, just helping them with the wishes that they placed on the Ennas at the shrine, in order to, by proxy, help the fox's notoriety as a helpful spirit go up. The central purpose for a lot of these links, other than offering a gameplay mix-up from the normal links, in a meta sense, is to contribute to the idea of the living world of Inaba. Persona 4's living world is one of its best aspects, with moving parts and exact people being trackable through arcs, more so than in 3, where not much changed with most of the nameless NPCs, and not much in Persona 5, where things were so large-scale that it often lacked the intimacy of knowing each resident. That's not a criticism or problem with those other games, it's not a better or worse type of thing, but it is a good thing for Persona 4 to be strong at, since the small town, rumors spread fast, everybody knows everybody vibe is a big part of the setting of this game in a small town. There are a few links that go above and beyond though, and I want to cover those ones in a lot more detail. Rank 5 to 6 is, in my eyes, the first real link, as it's more serious than just wanting friends or having a crush recognize you. More than generalized fears of losing, not that those issues are small by any regard, but the man we meet in this link is depressed, and feels that the last bit of meaning has left his life. How he used to love making model figures, but running this shop with hard times over the years, he's lost the joy, the meaning of his life that kept him going on, struggling financially to keep the store open, and partially through that, associating his struggle with his passion. Building the model he gives you reinvigorates him, and the link is over, but the character actually isn't. From there on, at nighttime, unrelated to the Hermit, you can actually go to his store and receive either a robot or a scooter model, and collect up to 12 combined. When you make all of them, you can 
go and visit him, and he tells you that he has no more to give. He had a few spares, but he decided to share them with the children and other big model fans in the area. And aside from the few that he's keeping to himself, that's all he got. It's kind of hard to describe, but I never saw a picture or anyone post about this dialogue. Model making is barely mentioned in Persona 4. It's very possible a player could go the entire game without knowing it was anything other than a tiny little part of one social link. Heck, if they didn't do that social link, they may go the entire game wondering why their shelves stayed bare. Because while it is another avenue of upping stats, it's not necessarily crucial or important. And in fact, there's not any reason to really even play the game and get all of the models unless you really want to unless you enjoy seeing what the game has to show. But even then, in modern days, you can just watch a video like this that I've put up and see what they all look like, as I've recorded in 1080p. Weird to say, but I felt a connection to this guy, even though he remains nameless as a hobby shop owner in the struggling shopping district of Inaba. Even though I made one gunpla one time and didn't even like it that much in real life, I'm not a model nut. To him though, he tells you, again, that you made him realize that models give his life meaning. And why else but that he enjoys them and that they mean something to him. They bring up his mood, they make him happy. He says he's closing up shop, but he realizes even if he does, even if the store fails, even if he decides to close, that's no reason for him to cut modeling out of his personal life. His last line, is, you're my final customer. Thank you. What am I, except for a person wholly dedicated to the things that I enjoy? What have I been doing all of this time writing this? This being one of the last handful of scripts in terms of my order. This has been three months, including the footage gathering process. All for what? The possibility of it not getting any attention. All for posting on a channel that isn't monetized as I write, and now that I'm actually recording the audio, still isn't monetized as I'm recording the audio. How many more patrons will I get, really, from poring over reading chunks of the Nihong Shoki or Kojiki, sputtering about for hours on end with my limited Japanese on the internet, trying to find personal Japanese blogs for nuggets of information the West maybe missed or failed to ascertain through translation at all? How many more patrons or donations have really come through in these hundreds of hundreds of hours working on this giant project over the last few months? Maybe I'm silly, and it's a lot. I, these videos haven't come out yet, and, you know, you can always be positive, but I'm writing this before the first video comes out, and I hope one thing connects more than anything. I have passion. I'm hungry for knowledge. The media, this language, this culture, it's interesting to me, and because it is, I value it, and no one can take that from me. It's the sort of interesting thing that makes me want to get out of bed and write what is, at the time that I wrote this script, 130,000 words for this total project. And now recording the audio, I know the word count is even higher. Working, learning, growing it gives me energy to stay alive. So, whether it's model figures or video games, whether it's a foreign language or culture, whether it's something that seems unbelievably instrumental to society, or something meant for entertainment, the things that we give value to in life are valid and worth the value given, solely because they bring joy to us. The things that make you willing to walk another day on Earth are never to be undervalued. And maybe it seems weird, but that's what I get from the middle-aged man running the failing model shop. But deciding once the shop closes to continue with things that motivated him to want to open it, and imagine the programmers, the modelers, the people on the Metasense who worked on Persona 4 Golden 2, imagine them making these models when Persona 4 Golden came out. This didn't need to be in the game, but somebody thought it would be nice. Somebody thought. Wouldn't that just add a little bit more freedom and liveliness to the sim aspect of this world? And they added it. To this day, with few people knowing or experiencing that you can get all of the models over a dozen in this game. I just wish that I knew more accurately 
where the robots came from, since I can't seem to find an origin or any discussion around the source really, since this is such an underthought and talked about character and part of the game. I feel like I'm drawing a major blank on these models, so I'll leave that to you. Please tell me if you recognize them. Same with the license plates on the scooters. Originally, I thought that they might be references to dates in the game, but many of the dates shown don't cover particular story events, so my warm little unfounded theory is that those are like the birth dates of the people who worked on this unnoticed tiny aspect of the game. Maybe I can get big enough base of people behind me and find it out someday for myself. Maybe even ask them in Japanese if I continue learning with my passion. There's a few more similarly small social links after this man here, but the other significant quest, if in similar theming, is the Old Man and the Guardians. He similarly mentions his regrets never being able to catch those great fish, but the more that you talk, you learn about his deceased wife and how he wonders if he's lost his own meaning in life. When you show him both great guardians, his first thought is that maybe he can die happy now, pass on to the other side, see his wife, and not be ashamed or regretful, seeing the fish in some way, even if it wasn't him who did it. Which would be sad, but kind of heartwarming. Instead, it's much more motivational. He kicks that death-welcoming mindset to the side and decides to jump wholeheartedly back into fishing. What he loves, similar to the model man. Whether it's a culture or language, a hobby, a sport, an exercise, a game, a view, an accomplishment, a family, a friend, we are subjects that decide what brings our life's purpose. As our own subject, we are the number one priority in that decision. Once you finish all the Hermit Anthology quests, the shrine is so successful with the gratitude of the people who've had their innas answered at the shrine that it gets a huge overhaul and the fox is overjoyed. So looking at the Arcana, what can we draw from the Hermit and what it means in regard to not just the fox, but the experiences we have here and the messaging of the Hermit as a whole? Well, a few things I found are here. The Hermit represents the Fool's journey. After gathering the experiences of the world, he circles back to the mountaintop and holds out his light to guide the way so the others find their way to the mountain as well. I think this makes sense, as the Fool is the player's arcana, working through the experiences of each of the residents of Inaba, helping them on their way so they can return to the mountain. In this case, the Shrine after solving the problems and having their experiences. It's basically a one-for-one -one mimic of the idea of the Hermit in that regard. The Hermit is drawn alone in the card, traditionally. In fact, what we consider a Hermit is someone who lives alone. But they're never actually alone, with half of their body turned to face toward the Divine. The Divine accompanies them along their duties. In this case, the Inarikami, or the Fox God that we find at the Shrine, gives us our directive and guides our actions to help others, to act as the path shower for the people lost and troubled. In Upper Polarity, the card deals with spiritual union, the presence of the light and an inner spiritual force, a divine teacher. In the Lower Polarity, it represents true isolation. Rather than a spiritual solitude, it is loneliness and the inability to solve one's own issues or guide the paths of others. So I feel, in a very literal sense, the Hermit is represented here. The god, the divine, we convene with here is the Fox of the Shrine. Fox shrines are very common in Japan and are generally associated with well-being of general affairs, business, personal relationship. So that's the Hermit, a link that I've come to appreciate a lot, in the very least conceptually, for its unique role in the game, despite me ignoring it on most of my initial runs entirely. While a 100% run can be a little scary with this link, it's really nice mix-up gameplay-wise, represents its arcana well, and follows through on the game's setting and themes. Corner of Memories plays multiple times in the game. Uh, one of the notable times is whenever there's a time skip forward before the final day. Um, you sort of see pictures of the group hanging out, and you hear the song playing, and then you also see it at the start every time you boot up the game. I think it's meant to sort of build in this motif into your head, and then as you go through social links and finish, and all these emotional moments, and all these uplifting moments, and all these major messages, you get reminded and brought in subtly with these motifs through Smile and Reverie, which always play in these sort of emotional moments or at the climax of different arcs. 
Uh, of course, by the time you reach Nevermore, then the song is already familiar to you, even though you've technically never heard it before if you're going in totally blind. So I guess uh, to talk about what makes these tracks so emotional, what makes them so complex or interesting, or what exactly they're doing whenever they borrow pieces of each other, um, I'll leave that up to uh, the professional man himself, uh, Shabu, who's been helping me with all these segments so far. A Quarter of Memories, I think, is really important to talk about first because it acts as kind of a base for Nevermore, Reverie, and Smile. Um, it has a really great melody, but the uh, the melody and harmonic structure are carried over in parts from Nevermore, Reverie, and Smile. Uh, for A Corner of Memories in particular, the melody has a really strong rhythmic bass as well. It has this like dun 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 dun, dun you know, has that kind of quarter notes into half note feel, and then it has the quick dun 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 dun, dun, dun that whole section. What's interesting about that is that it has a lot of diversity in the rhythm alone. What's the most interesting thing, though, is in the harmony and melody. So, Corner of Memories, at least how I'm reading it, doesn't have a strong tonal center. So, uh, it doesn't really stay in the key. It does stay in, like, the key signature for most of the piece. Uh, it changes a bit later, but it doesn't have a strong tonal center. I think that there are parts that are kind of Dorian flavored, Lydian flavored, and Mixolydian flavored, even a little bit of Ionian flavored, which is the, the major key, but it's mainly Dorian. What's interesting about that is that it's the two of the scale, and the two of the scale is going to be minor. So it is minor flavored without being minor, which is, you, you would call um, Aeolian, yeah. if, I'm, if my brain is Is that kind of what gives correct. it that sort of like nostalgic kind of... Uh... I don't know, it's like, like it's a happy song, but it's like sort of that sort of recollection, I guess, that feeling of recollection. Yeah, I think that that would be exactly what's causing it. Um, especially, it gives it a bit of a wistful, wistful quality, uh, partially because there's no real strong tonal center, or at least in my reading of it. Um, and something to note that's really interesting for the, the argument of, of Dorian is I believe unless I'm, I have a bad recording or something, it ends on a two of a new scale. It, it changes keys about like eight-ish measures before the end, um, and it ends on a two, which is Dorian. So uh, it does kind of linger around that Dorian, which is very popular in, in a lot of Japanese games, but mm -hmm. also it will accent the three or the four, which is Lydian and Mixolydian respectively. And so I, I think it's it's that wandering around with no real tonal center that aids a lot in the feelings that players feel when they hear that. Do you think that the like the wandering aspect? Do you think it's like a like a lost wandering or like a free wandering? Like, because I feel like having no center could be something very like liberating, or it could be something mm -hmm. that's like very like, you know, I guess negative. I don't know. In this case, I think it's very positive. I, I don't think it, it. I don't think it always comes across as ultra positive because I, I read the the piece kind of melancholic. Mm -hmm. um, well, it's sort of like these great happy days have now gone past us. But yeah, like we've we've solved the issue. We're all ready to go on with our lives. We're excited for it. But unfortunately, this year where we spent our lives together uh, has come to a close. Yeah, it's very bittersweet, and I think that what Corner of Memories does really, really well with its kind of wandering of tonal centers is that establish a new tonal center every time, like a dun, 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 right? Like that feels kind of central. And then that feels kind of central as well. But those are actually two different tonal centers. I was going to say that Nevermore takes this melody and has a lot of the same... Uh, core aspects of it but it adds in tons of instrumentation and most notably adds in vocals which i think you can mm -hmm. talk a little bit more about the lyrics than i can so there's two different uh variants of nevermore one's like kind of this chorus that sings it and one is more like i think to the book i feel like it fits in more with like general uh persona vocal tracks that are in the rest of the game 
Um, but the lyrics, um, I think, are pretty straightforward with what you would imagine they're saying. The Nevermore is kind of used in both a positive and a negative light. Um, in one of the phrases, it says, um, I won't forget most of all the days we all spent together. Nevermore, no matter how dark it gets, I know I'm not alone. I'll find it, the most precious thing I lost. Nevermore, it's as if I can hear your voice. It's guiding me. And there's like another part where it says like, um, like riding the train uh, away, which of course is a reference because at the end of the game, you get on the train and you leave Inaba but how you'll still be connected through the bonds that you've shared and created. Even if you're far away, you can hear that voice guiding me. Um, so I mean, it's very nice. Um, and it, it's like it's like sad to be going, happy uh, the experience happened, and not regretting the experience either, despite all of the you know horrific things that happened. That it was more than anything for the positive. Um, and that even through the negative aspects that it all came out on the brighter side. I think that that's pretty evident in the music itself. It's a bit brighter um, in, term, in terms of its content and especially in the instrumentation and orchestration is a lot brighter and op more open because I mean a corner of memories is mainly just the piano, right? Mm -hmm. uh, I mean uh, strings as well, but um, it's pretty sparse in comparison to nevermore which has like i think it has trumpet it might actually be a live trumpet i can't i can't entirely tell uh there are parts where it sounds not good and parts where it sounds good so it's <laughs> it's difficult to tell brass is <laughs> mm -hmm. brass is difficult to get right when it's bad but um trumpet uh guitar piano drums like you know it's got it's got way more and it has a it, it's a lot more open in its orchestration so it's it's a lot more spread out and stuff which i think aids in that kind of bright interpretation of of the theme do you have anything else that you would want to add there um with reverie or smile or anything else yeah uh reverie and smile are both interesting because they're kind of the furthest bastardizations of this theme that you can get without being completely different uh, Reverie, I think, has a really gorgeous section where n n no melodic content is playing, and it's just got this, like, synth playing chords, and that's where you can really hear a corner of memory is coming through, doing that walk down as if it were playing, like, uh, a corner of memories, but just kind of the important harmonic bits. So it has a lot of the same aspects of a corner of memories, but it's even more minor flavored. So it comes it comes across more traditionally sad. The melody is a bit more wandering. Um, it's it's less like final in a lot of its tonal center uh, musings, I'll call them. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, and so it kind of wanders around and, and is a lot more unstable in that kind of way that you had mentioned of, of it being more in a negative light. It's kind of in that more sad way. Uh, Smile is interesting because it's it like hardcore references nevermore which mm -hmm. i don't know what came first the chicken or the egg in terms of nevermore or a corner of memories i would maybe guess that a corner of memories came first in the uh, very least it's the one that you're meant to have an experience with first uh, yes so at least that can be said yes so smile being so closely tied to nevermore specifically i think is really really interesting it actually mimics the uh chorus and verse uh, very, very closely, and one of which is not present in a quarter, corner of memory at all. It's a much happier version of those things. So Shadow World uh, would reference it because it actually has, uh, I think, two or three chords where the harmonic motion is the same mm. as dun, 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 that, yeah. that whole section. Um, so it's kind of this amalgamation of, of stuff. The fake confident extrovert, the escapist drama student, Yumi Ozawa. Sharing the Sun Arcana with Ayane, Yumi is one of the four split path social links in Persona 4. Despite sharing an Arcana, Yumi's social link at a glance appears totally flipped from Ayane's personality and struggle, but as the Arcana implies, they may be more similar than you think. 
Almost immediately in Persona 4, you are given the option to joining the band or the drama club as a place to up stats. Choosing drama, which ups expression, introduces you immediately to Yumi. Yumi is a really interesting social link because while she is not the only social link to deal with grief, she is the only one that you get to see the active process from prior to during to after. It gives you all the complicated feelings that get wrapped up in all that, and things that might be said and then regretted and then capitalizes on this process. Yumi herself is a character that, no matter what time after the release of Persona 4, people have always seemed to be mixed on, with her being rightfully upset through much of her link, being cited in the past as a downer or a drag of Persona 4 and 4 Golden. That's definitely true, it is a drag, although I don't think it's a negative, and it's not like she's even close to the only one with a deeply sad narrative. Yumi herself is a girl who puts on the face of over-friendliness, quite literally an actor who acts in her daily life. This seems to be the irony that she was meant to be representing by being in the drama club, when she thinks that she can't fill the role of the strong, confident, bubbly girl in drama, rather than showing her weakness and being emotionally vulnerable, she tries to escape into her acting. So either she shows up to fill the role, or she doesn't show up at all. I find her personality to be a bit more complex to pin down than most of the characters in Persona 4, if I'm honest, when it comes to describing her. I think she's more of a quiet, serious girl by nature, almost more like Hifumi from Persona 5, but puts on a sort of pseudo-idol enthusiasm, like a bad Rise impression. Unfortunately, I don't think we get the full depth of that with the English voice acting in this particular case, but I think taking the time to listen to some of the Japanese voice lines really gives this idea strongly. She also seems to always have her guard up and block potentially revealing moments with slight tsundere inflections, but often feels guilty when she does this and apologizes shortly after. As a character, she is certainly not an easy to pin down archetype, but she feels very fleshed out in a sort of unique realm, which I think adds to the uncomfortability and confusion she faces trying to grasp at who exactly she is herself with the actions of her link. But enough general description and vagueness, let's look at the link directly. Yumi Social Link is probably one that fakes people out the most. You start with the idea that there is some vague tension with the members of the drama club and Yumi, although nothing serious, as well as a clear nepotism with the president and vice captain dating each other, which recurs slightly through the initial links. It seems, though, that everyone is comfortable speaking their minds, and the players note to themselves that this seems like a friendly club. An unassuming player could easily make assumptions that this link may be about vanity or confidence, or something to do with the drama between the club members, at least. This link surprises, then. Once others leave, it's clear that Yumi is extremely punctual and energetic, throwing out flirty lines immediately about how it's good that you can take orders, and getting very into the teaching process. At first glance, it would seem that Yumi is extremely talented and passionate about acting, first and foremost even offering to let you borrow DVDs to help you train in your free time, if you'd like. I've been around plenty of drama students through high school, and I'll tell you, none of them were as passionate as Yumi. This almost noble, wholehearted dedication is made to later sell you on how good of an actor she truly is in a different way. Next link is the only actual practice that involves player interaction. It importantly denotes that, mostly due to her being the girlfriend of the president, that Mitan, as he affectionately calls her, will act as the main character in their play. The line that you are given emphasis to, to interact with, is actually original from what I can tell, or is at least an obscure enough reference that even after searching thoroughly through the Japanese side of the internet, I failed to find any interview or personal blog dissecting it. Then again, it is a minor line in the social link for a character people have a statistically unlikely chance of completing or caring about with enough gumption to really emphasize. What is said in the line is, What crazes me is not the light of the moon, nor the golden sea, but merely the trickle of your tears. We'll be addressing that in a bit, so keep it in mind. 
It notes that Yumi plays the role perfectly, as if she became the character. Knowing her ability, she issues a partial challenge for anyone to do it better than her. Definitely aggressive, but showing that she can do it best and that she deserves that role without being too blunt about it? This is a fun bit of parallelism if you compare the two Sun Social Links side by side. In INA's Link, she was put aside for a senior member even after being expected to prepare for the role in his absence, and was unable to stand up for herself. In this case, another person got the role they didn't deserve, and Yumi stood up to take what she thought was more rightfully hers. Just a bit of emphasis done on intentionally contrasting the plot lines and character traits of the two who share the same arcana. Anyways, point is, Yumi gets a bit direct, calling out the club director, and ends up earning herself the role after all. A role that should secure the idea that this social link will follow this apparent play. A play they've shown through the game that they even put effort into writing a poem for and having you recite in the game. A third into the social link, though, the drama club is interrupted on hearing her mother is in the hospital. She runs off to the hospital, and you decide to go check on her as well. You learn that her mother is actually fine, and she called her there knowing if she didn't manipulate her daughter to get to the hospital, she wouldn't have come on her own, because the one truly in the hospital is her deadbeat dad. Yumi's father walked out on Yumi and her mother, cheated on them with another woman, and tried to start another life, but was abandoned by his new life whenever he got this horrible disease. On his deathbed, he came back to the wife that he abandoned, the wife he cheated on, and asked as a last wish to see his daughter Yumi again. Even though her mother thinks it is what she wants to do, to feel at peace and not letting him die alone, Yumi, understandably, doesn't want to grant him that peace. When, after all, he already proved that when she needed him, he abandoned her. But something curious happens. Yumi decides, despite hating him, to start missing practices to go see him anyway. You start seeing Yumi grapple with these different feelings, anger, resentment, positive feelings that she tries to reject, sometimes taking it out on the player before apologizing promptly. How is someone supposed to react to that? I can't say there's a definitively right way, and Yumi is struggling with this. It's clearly a huge weight on her heart. From here, Yumi initially takes it out on the club, taking it too far as trying to escape her feelings through the acting she loves, but when no one else is as committed to the craft as she is, it becomes hard to do because she can't escape into that facade. No one else is playing their parts well enough. This sort of behavior is also seen in another link, partially recontextualized, and Ryo Iwasaki's social link too, her drive for the club being a way of running from that. Of course, despite it being a version of Persona 3, to make sure there's no confusion, Persona 4 did come out before Portable. Yumi talks to you about how she hates to go home now, as after practice, when it ends early, she has to go home to an empty house that's quiet and cold. She can't help but think of everything going on. Still, she tries to escape the feeling by gripping onto the positive. She's got the lead role! She can't let it slip through her fingers now! After this, she stops coming to practice. She starts to struggle with a clear repressed abandonment issue that she has where she feels like nothing is in her control and she can't do anything, ironically leading to her actually losing some control with the things she had achieved all herself. Next, she mentions the warm smile that he gives her, saying he's so happy to see her that he loves her. Next, he offers her money. He says, you want to watch TV? Have the hospital remote. You want manga? Here's money. You want food and ice cream? Have all you want. It boggles her mind that in her eyes, he thinks he could buy back her love like he never even left. It boggles her more that the kindness that's coming from him doesn't even seem manipulative. It seems genuine, and that angers her all the more. She starts to go to the hospital more often, explaining that it's to ease her mom's burden, but ends up helping her father take the medicine herself. He mentions not wanting to take some of the medicine, knowing he's going to die regardless, and if his time is counted, he wanted to spend as much time awake with them as he can before he passes on, rather than letting the medicine lull him into an eternal sleep. This makes her, no matter how she tries to push it down, remember the moments as a child where he was a kind, loving father who played with her and cared after her. 
She takes on the mentality of her mother eventually, that she doesn't wish to avert her eyes no matter how she may be feeling. She wants to, despite this grief, be there to see and experience the last truth of her father until the end. Maybe she will find reconciliation or better understanding in it. In the next link, Yumi's father dies. The only time we as the player see him and the resulting conversation aims to put to rest the fears, the insecurities, and leave Yumi with a positive memory. He states how her first name Yumi comes from the idea to bear fruit, and she will bear fruit to herself and the world, that she will achieve great things, and that she is the fruit of her parents' lives, the true thing that they have cultivated and that they care for. He gives this to her, a bit of knowledge about her as his final gift, and then dies. Forgive my Japanese. Watashi wo kuruwaseru no wa tsuki no hikari de mo naku kogane no umi demo nai tada anata no hitosuji no namidana no des. The watashi, as we know, is intended from the mouth of a wife to her husband, but in this it reflects on the last actions of Yumi's confusion toward her father. Tsuki is a long-used literary tool, as tsuki and tsuki sound similar if one mumbles, or has a strong accent, or maybe is only listening arbitrarily. So the light of the moon is instead the shine of love. The kogane no umi is the water of life, the wide-spanning riches that await in the world, the ocean of money. It is the material things offered. The tears are the genuine article, a gift only to be given by and in the role of someone who loved you so to bring you into this world. What crazes Yumi so is not the fact that her father still claims to love her, even after abandonment. It's not that he stupidly tries to supply gifts as though they could ever mend the bridges burned. It's the fact he so loved her that his final act was to give her the pure purpose and the hope of a happy life that he had dreamed for her as she begins to sob. The poem directly reflects what her father attempts throughout her social link, and the ways that Yumi attempts to then cope and understand these actions. At the end, she has to realize the simple humanity, that even if she saw a monster, love and a beating heart brought her into this world. And even if he forgot and betrayed her, his feelings in this moment, when she was born and when he died, were no less pure. From here, Yumi is back in the drama club, so happy ever after, right? Well, it's the case now that she is having trouble acting. She has trouble stepping away from herself because she feels that she's finally become a person with a life that she doesn't want to run away from. She has just discovered her value and wants to explore that newfound self for the first time. She talks about how she didn't want to think about how he abandoned her. She wanted to know why he left, but she never wanted to know how he felt about that fact. She wanted things to be simple, and as she says, run from it her entire life. But now that she's been faced with the situation, she has so much to sift through to find the truth. So she decides to live up to her namesake, to bear fruit, achieve great things, bring joy, and value herself and this world. So then, she quits. She decides to stop filling the role that never needed to exist, for acting as a person who she never was, to fill her own life and role head on, being her honest self. She mentions being unsure of if this is even something that she should do, but how she chose not to consult you on her decision, or anyone else for that matter, because she realized this is her life. If someone is to decide something like this, she can't regret the choice or blame it on someone else later due to her own indecision. She has to be the one to take the step. Yumi Ozawa, as the game said, the first name means to bear fruit, but her last name means small marsh or swamp. From a seemingly small place, a small town, a family, a life, from a bad situation, a marsh, a swamp, to grow, succeed, and contribute greatly. From a bad situation to flourish, this is her entire namesake, which fits her situation perfectly. Another way to interpret Marsh is a brilliance or grace, which easily adds on to the acting, but from a bad situation to grow brilliantly, to sprout and spread and bear fruit, 
it couldn't match better. Let's touch on her arcana, finally. Yumi, like Ayane, is the sun. The sun represents an awakening of the self where previously the self was dormant. Yumi ran from who she was and filled the role in and out of Drama Club of faces that fit every situation. Eventually, she put it down and let the face under the mask shine brightly. In the lower polarity, like as we meet Yumi, the card often deals with egocentrism and childlike willfulness. The albeit deserved confidence of Yumi sometimes took the role of pushing others out of the spotlight for her own goals and to further the hiding of herself through the negative coping mechanisms. Her ego stunted her from reconciliation and growth, in other words. While I personally understand why Yumi felt as she did, this ego could also deal with her initial rejection of even seeing her father as he lay in the deathbed for final closure and a goodbye. The childlike willfulness to want to run away from herself and roleplay all these characters that weren't her also shows a sort of stubbornness that has stunted her growth. In higher polarity, this card can sometimes represent the birth of a child due to the fruitful nature that the growth of the sun represents. That fits almost awkwardly well. Yumi's link revolves around her being born and how they considered her to be a joy and something fruitful to their lives. Generally, the sun represents a change in outlook so separate as to where the original self may not be recognizable. In Yumi's case, this was true, mainly because the self that she showed was never her true self to start with. Yumi Ozawa, a poignant story about a girl who ran from her abandonment and trauma with a justified spite, but learned to reconcile and face the truth, warts and all, about her family and what deep down she meant to them. Someone who faced the truth about her life and the ones who brought her into this world. Let's talk about the After Battle cards. Now, this is different between Persona 4 and Persona 4 Golden. The original Persona 4 is basically the same as the Persona 3 card game, but in terms of Golden, sometimes you get a card game where you balance positive and negative effects of cards with the possibility of raising your limit on those said cards. This offers good in-moment balance and rewards for you if you're trying to get specific things from battling and grinding, but also requires strategy to not overstock moves, because in the same way that the game ends when you run out of turns, you also can't discard turns that you have actively earned. It makes it a mostly really fun and rewarding puzzle, working to mix up the battle and exploration gameplay, and keeping the pace of the dungeons fresh but unfortunately, the level of randomness in the amount of cards or their effects can sometimes eliminate the strategy almost entirely as you may be given impossible puzzles, so to speak, with no proper way to address the cards. It's not a total problem, and while the feature is helpful, it's often not critical unless doing something very specific, but it is just disjunctive enough, I think, to go from what the game calls a bonus into a hassle or sometimes even a general negative, especially if, say, you have a sweep bonus from a previous set and you're grinding for experience, but after a big battle with the extra turns are forced to choose a no experience card, nullifying any progress made in that level. It's even worse if that's a golden hand encounter. Not a super common problem, sure, and not a major issue at all, but hey, this is supposed to be in depth, right? And it is something that I think could have been done with more balancing and tweaking of the way that the game operated so they can maximize rewarding players who showed good strategic play. Risei Kujikawa, the idol in isolation, the thick-skinned admirer, and the investigation team's new and replacement navigator through the world of the subconscious. Despite being the sixth party member, including yourself, to become a part of the investigation team, and not showing up until a little prior than the third dungeon, which is hers, she's actually the third person that the player sees in Persona 4 when turning on the system. And showing up while doing an ad on TV, no less, which drives home immediately her widespread popularity. Rise, or as her idol name goes, Reset, is a prodigy idol who came up through her middle school years as a rising star of the idol industry. TV cameos, commercials, and plenty of live music gigs, Rise is known far and wide, with much of her merchandise even appearing when least expected in the game, like an infection, like as the keychain in the Shrine Prize, or as a model figure at Juness late in the game.
Nanako is also aware of her from her TV appearances and is a huge fan. So if this much of her has managed to spread even to somewhere as isolated as Inaba, it only attests to her renown. When Risei finally does enter the story, it's during a bit of disillusionment with herself, as she has publicly stated a leave of absence from the entertainment industry, with some people at the conference within the crowd citing as much as they're asking, asking if she has an illness or if she has some sort of psychological issues due to being in the entertainment industry. It's lastly capped off with a question slash statement of confirmation over where she's going to be staying in her private life. It's uncomfortable and immediately gives the idea of Risei's private and public self being strained and stretched by the public perception. And of course, it's not hard to believe that this would make anyone feel trapped. The next day, Risei is the talk of the school. The idea of an idol coming to podunk Inaba is big news after all, especially for the residents. After a figure showing clear resemblance shows up on the TV, the investigation team makes an immediate haste to see Risei and warn her about any possible risks. Something I think is easy to pass over is how initially, despite Yosuke's over-exuberance claiming how hot Risei is, they actually mistake Risei for an old woman from behind when they first see her. The rough hair through the worker's clothes and the more reserved attitude completely throws them off, but in a lot of ways, the sullen Risei we see here is a lot more of a private and rarely seen self than even the one we see after she awakens to her persona. This points retroactively with what we learn later on to the idea that Risei's primary psychological trouble here isn't just the quote-unquote real self or fake self, or the pop idol reset versus the elementary school bullied Kujikawa, but instead it points to her inability to separate the two properly, or more than two, the multitude of different selves that she balances between her private and public lives and around different people. Because as she'll come to learn, and as I'm extremely excited to talk about whenever it's appropriate, all Riseis are Risei. It's just a matter of gaining control over those many identities and powers to use those to express herself in the most honest, true-to-herself fashion. But this is obviously just the first implication of something like that here. At the end of the dungeon is when it covers it more explicitly. The first thing Risei says when appearing on the Midnight Channel is, Maru Q, push reset. Now, we know that Mara Q is the name of the family business her grandmother runs, and is, due to naming conventions for family business, is likely to be Risei's mother's and mother's side of the family's last name, with her taking on Kujikawa from her father's last name. Something also revealed later in Risei Social Link, something we will obviously cover more depth in its own section later, we learn that Risei's family submitted her idol tape to the idol company without her knowledge, and Risei only found out when she had been accepted. As a young bullied girl, her family excitedly pushing for her success, Risei probably felt she had no choice in the matter, and states as much later on saying she only accepted it because she wanted to have friends. Thus, the Midnight Channel broadcast is a distorted bastardization on that idea by Reset's mind and lust for the viewers. The term push or to push something is commonly used when referring to new songs, new merchandise, or new idols. It's something that recurs as well in her own social link through the main story with Risei's coming replacement, Kanamin. So to recap, when Risei comes on video, she is stating on behalf of her family, Q, please push reset. So then the name of the dungeon, Q Striptease, takes on an extremely sad and disgusting meaning. From a family where the name meant business, in this sentimental personal extent, a girl who desperately reached and wanted friends, being fed by her family unintentionally, that would strip her of her private sexuality. Doing it intentionally, but with no real context into Risei's ability to handle it. The average idol's starting age in Japan is 13, with Risei seeming to have started even younger, maybe even at 11 or 12. Her birthday is June 1st, making Risei at the time of her dungeon less than a month into her 16th birthday. This is due to middle school and high school both lasting three years in Japan, the last year of Japanese middle school being roughly equivalent to the American freshman. So Risei likely started idling prior to puberty and has been sexualized and speculated upon all through her development, without a time or sense to develop her own sexuality in a context not heavily tailored by the media. 
In her Rank 10 romance, she even mentions how much more difficult it is to confess to somebody and be open when it's for real, when it's not on TV. The Risei on TV is so well put together, she's talented and smart, often seen as this natural of the industry, but Risei doesn't know what part of her is even her, and what's being fed a line. So you see this B-roll audition tape mixed in with this sort of X-rated late night adult program, in purpose and message of her midnight channel appearance. It's supposed to make you uncomfortable. Even in her Shadows live commentary, leaning in on the idea of being young and starting high school, it's gross and heartbreaking. But I believe this is the full context we need to understand the name Marikyu Striptease, as well as what her Midnight Channel broadcast is supposed to be emulating in terms of parroting old schlocky late night Japanese public broadcasting. Once entering the dungeon, it's made pretty clear that the aesthetics mix the idea of a strip club with classic burlesque stage shows, with the heavy use of colors and spotlights drawing it as if on a stage. It also mixes in the runway of modeling, with the runway lights taking spot under the walkways of the dungeon. In regards to design, it's at some of Persona 4's most blatant here, featuring silhouettes of women, kiss marks, and an abundance of hearts on the walls, as well as curtain openings between hallways and rooms. On the floor, you see a mixed design of fancy hearts, as well as a purple tile floor featuring eyeballs looking up at the player. The idea of seeing yourself before you even know yourself to an infinite criticizing public, all the while trying to make them fall in love with you. A you that is carefully choreographed and directed to you by the people behind the curtain. And while more blatant than the previous dungeons, I think the imagery makes up for sophistication in its visceral impact. The song for her dungeon as well is the only one aside from heaven to feature lyrics. At first, it seems as though some sort of sexy whisper moaning, and that fits well with the heavy breathing and themes of the strip club, but when you listen to the lyrics, they aren't sexy in nature at all. The lyrics are still somewhat contested to this day, and wrong almost everywhere that claims to have them on the internet. Trust me, I've looked. I was surprised initially not to find an official statement on the lyrics from Atlas, but that almost certainly is because of two things. One, the voice featured is not Rise, and two, it was not recorded by Atlas. It's a pre-existing sample that to my knowledge made its first and most famous appearance in 2001 in Dance Dance Revolution, under a beginning sample for the song name Drop the Bomb by Scotty D. Are you ready? Here we go! Yeah. Scotty D, or Scott Dolph, is a bilingual composer hired by Konami who has worked on countless projects in small and big parts. Due to this sample likely coming from a DB owned by Konami, or under similar licensing, the source of the source, assuming it's not this song, could have come from literally anywhere. So let's look at the lyrics in question, which despite people claiming to hear many verses, the sample is actually only one pair of lines that repeats. The line within Risei's dungeon, while miscited all across the net, is The singer is speaking English, but is natively a Japanese speaker, and so is the accent. Like pronouncing I more like I, and the slight grammar issue later in the second phrase. This was pretty normal for the time, assuming origins if not in 2001, then even earlier, as we see this sort of thing even in Atlas games from the time and way after, including some similar grammar gaffes in Persona 3's OST. It's normal to sound weird, in other words, but it makes sense why the pronunciation with its given effect has led to much confusion over the words, or even caused people to hear different lyrics and phrases, when despite everything, the line repeated is the same vocal sample. But let's look at this in closeness to Risei. With what we already know about Risei and the visual imagery of the dungeon at hand, it's a need to drown out her feelings and focus on her goals, even when she doesn't have the will to pull the trigger herself. Just keep turning up the music, keep sending her the next project, the next task, what can she do? It's all a part of her dream. 
In the song it comes from, you get the pushback on this idea, like the girl starting the song is stuck in a cycle with the singer pushing to break free from it. You can pause and read the lyrics for yourself if you would like to, but the gist of the song is about fighting back against the voices telling you the way to success in your future, and how you are smart and powerful enough to make the decision yourself. How you need to use your own brain power to come up with your solution and take the reins back from other people who've been controlling your decision entirely. I think that clearly fits with Risei's story enough to be long and redundant if I covered it in detail, and so I'm gonna move on to the next bit of analysis. The mini-boss of the Reset Dungeon is a white snake with gender signs intersecting, the arrow of the male going through the hole of the female. Obvious enough imagery, especially with her saying, to be gentle before the fight. The white snake is often associated with the goddess Binzaiten, a goddess of fertility, wealth, and fortune. From the outside looking in, Rize has it all. She's young, attractive, rich, a celebrity, but like the white snake is said to live thousands of years by shedding its skin, she doesn't know if the person that's left there is even her, and feels choked and constricted by it. For her actual boss fight, we enter the center room and stage, with the strip pole in the center and several hostess bar-like couches gathered around. The glass window on the top is made of split glass that changes color and shape as they cross over each other, like how Rise is a different person under different scenarios and around different people. The real Rise is collapsed on her knees in the modest tofu shop clothing, representing her non-celebrity side, the ordinary girl. The shadow Rise standing at the pole with her perfect posture, wearing a brazen golden bikini and laughing confidently, represents the bastardized look at how Rise felt about the her that served the public, that was obsessed and drooled over, marketed and mass catered for strangers' satisfaction. The truth is, Rise does want the eyes on her. She wants to be liked. She doesn't want to be bullied like she was in school. Becoming an idol is what changed that for her, and that's what she wanted. But now, around everyone, almost everywhere she goes, she's seen as positively before she even meets others. But she had no idea as a child signing up at the time what being seen meant in context of an idol. She wanted to show herself, but she never wanted the dark side of it, not to mention the way her own burgeoning sexuality and confusion is being lost and contorted in the marketing, which as she states later has enhanced her bus size in public showings. The image that she's been created into, that is produced by others outside of herself, how much of that is her? She likes bringing joy, she likes making people happy, but she doesn't like the feeling of loss of control, the powerlessness of it. The shadow mocks her and the team, represented as the audience, in a sort of, well, this is what you wanted, right? The reset on stage doesn't just represent the public persona, though, as she makes fun of the idea of reset, that she isn't real, that it's all reset. And so, coming into her own sexuality, her desperation to be liked as the person that she feels she deep down is, and not the image crafted, and the slight spite toward the audience, calls her to, on the poll, say, I'm no one but myself. Come on, look at me. A desperation to regain that power, to regain that control over her behavior and image, over herself, even when it's a self that she doesn't want. Because at least she'll be in control, right? Shadow Rise's boss form is a naked woman textured in many colors, flowing, cutting off, alternating seemingly at random, very similar to the glass panes above Rise before the fight, which lead into the interpretation I mentioned earlier. Since the actual woman's body is obstructed in detail, all but her form, by the colors it's fair to say, are the many faces of Rise and the many ways she's interpreted by the people in her lives. The many colors, the many emotions, the many sides, all making up Rise, all a part of her, none being the whole and none offering the true glimpse beyond her form. All obstructing Rise from clear view, the head is replaced with a satellite dish and a hardly doubtable reference to her reaching the wide audiences she does, but also her want to reach other people. The satellite then delivers her to others' lives and screens, while they remain still far away from her, like the empty seats surrounding the stage. Nobody really knows Rise, but everyone around her has an opinion. 
Similarly, Shadow Rise's attacks focus on heavy move analysis and resistance nullification, how she's been raised in the industry that has turned her into someone adept at reading people and understanding what they want from her, able to change and adjust at the drop of a hat. Which is actually a trait we continue to see a lot from her after this dungeon, but maybe most notably to her relationship with Yosuke, who she often butters up to make him motivated and take her side in different arguments and conversations. Due to Teddy's intervention, the full analysis attack fails, and Rise wakes up, ready to confront herself. I was trying to figure out who the real me was. I realize now that I was on the wrong track. There is no real me. It just doesn't exist. You, me, even Rosette. They were all born from me. All of them are... me. This is a concept I have rarely seen covered in games. The one time I saw it ever addressed was in a book, and somewhat in Bojack Horseman, I guess. But to understand Risei's revelation, I think another way to ask this is, what are the traits of a human soul? There is a way that we act in front of our family. There is a way we act in front of our friends. Different friends and different family members, too. There's a way we act in romantic relationships, and even in different romantic relationships. There is a way we treat strangers, both the kind and the non-kind, the sketchy and the non-threatening. We have a personality, but that personality has many facets to it, all of which can never be displayed equally all of the time. We take actions, but many are contradictory. Do we average out all of our actions and say that's us? No because decidedly there are actions on the fringes left off of the equation. Actions decidedly ours, our principles, our political and religious beliefs, changing, unchanging, they are all parts of us. And they show that whether minute or infinitely, in all of the other aspects of our lives to varying degrees at varying times, we could get specific head trauma as well and our personality would change before we had the capability to understand our change in judgment. What makes a soul? What makes a person? The child? The adult? Our greatest failure? Or the height of our power? Is it the things that we're remembered for after we're gone? Aside from the life we have, what makes us separate from another soul? If our personality is biology, if our actions are informed by experiences, what makes us, us? A book I read once contained an argument between a couple. The man desperately asked to be loved, not for his actions, not for his faults, but for who he was deep down. Well, the book asked, what is deep down? If you take away the personality, the actions, the achievements, what are you left with? A soul with no traits at all, nothing to distinguish one person from another. Carl Jung, for the 80th time, whose work, Persona, is based on, knew this concept well. He spent his time looking at the way that we play out through our archetypes and replay the roles of characters long dead and long revived. So to ask, who am I, is probably one of the most difficult questions of all. And yet, despite your grasp on the conclusion, your most true answer will always be, I am me. So who is the deep down? Who is the soul? It is either nothing or the culmination of everything. So when Rise says there is no real me, and follows with it that all pieces of her originated from her and are all her, that's what she means. To some, this realization is terrifying, but I also think with maturity, it's an extremely freeing revelation. The realization that there is no such thing as a real or a fake me, but that every time I personally make a choice in action, positive, negative, young or old, it all goes into defining the broad history of who I am. This realization causes Rise to then awaken to her first persona, Himeko. Himeko, historically known as Yamato Hime no Mikoto, was a princess who was bestowed the sacred mirror, the ancient symbol of the sun goddess. This reference of the sun goddess, who is Amaterasu, ties Risei to the main cast, as Yukiko's ultimate persona is Amaterasu, also for the 80th time. This mirror, despite the obvious link, was also said to represent wisdom and honesty, a mirror that reflects the truth of the world. The name of the mirror is Yata no Kagami. This, of course, serves Risei's role as navigator well. Someone who is to lead the team through the fog should have wisdom and clarity they should be able to see the truth. 
The design is now adorned with a white robe and sash, probably a callback to Yamato Hime no Mikoto being a ruler of Japan, as well as having priest-like status, being translated from Old Japanese roughly to the Daughter of the Sun, which gave the authority that the gods were behind her ruling. The body design is largely the same as the shadow as well, except all of the bright colors are now gone, as if revealing the true self, but with the dignity of now being clothed in a formal manner. The design of the satellite also changes, but the satellite itself stays the same, something that carries over to her other personas as well. After Risei's recovery, and in a group scene where you end up alone, Risei comes up with a believable yet flattering reason that leans in on your reliability to start hanging out with her. Then, upon accepting it, immediately gets excited, beginning her social link. This is something that becomes apparent immediately. It's not that Risei is vain or fake per se, although she does act in a sort of fake way. I think that's part of her realizing that she can be whoever she wants to be. She wants to be around people that she likes, and she wants to make them happy. So, she likes saying things that will build people up, sometimes in a direct and more shameless way than many would probably be comfortable with. In fact, it's something that gets pretty consistent snide remarks from Chie and Yukiko when she does it around or in front of them. She knows now that all of her is her, and she uses that to free her, letting herself do whatever she wants and truly taking power over her own body and personality for herself. If she wants to jump and be cheerful, if she wants to be over the top with her emotions, if she wants to read the room and choose the way that she thinks is best to act, even changing on a dime in emotions, that's in her power. The control of herself is finally in her hands, and despite it leaning back on the fake idol behavior that she's been taught over the years, those years of her life were her life, and she's using the things that she knows how to do the way she wants to do them. It's liberating. The first free link for Rise involves you, as she mentioned, going around and visiting places she otherwise wouldn't have. This is really good to give an initial idea for just how strict and scheduled her life was as a child, just how out of her hands her life continued to be during her idling years. And so, whether in the agency or before, it gives you an idea that her parents rarely let her go out or even eat unhealthy foods at all. Her life has always been regulated under someone else's thumb, so this time, entering high school, staying with her grandmother, and helping at the shop is the most free she's ever been in her life. Rank 3 also lets her use the excuse of being shown around town as a reason for hanging out, but the part of her character we gain insight into is completely different and starts setting the seeds for her central conflict in her link. Rise feels she finally has the courage to disavow her public persona when asked. People come up to her and, for once, she's able to tell them, No, you're mistaken. I'm not reset. She even talks about how it's true. She isn't reset, just a normal girl, and that's fine. But that isn't what she learned in her dungeon. That isn't what she had taken ownership of since it, either. It starts to show this sort of confusion over what she had already covered. This interpretation is only half true to the lesson that was already covered, and you can tell it is because she still, while in the process of gaining control over her many selves, is not yet fully understanding how to wield them. Reset is Rise, but Rise is not Reset. Every part of Rise is Rise, but no part of her contains her entirety. Rise thinks she has realized herself and escaped idling, but it will become clear to her that she isn't fixing her problem with the conclusion, she's using the conclusion to avoid her full resolution. You see that with her complaining about Inaba, but saying that she loves it. For her grandmother, for you, and for the fact that she has something to do that personally motivates her. The case has become an outlet instead for her escapism. Next link, we meet Inoue-san, Rise's previous manager who she greets with hostility. She makes up a lie that you're her boyfriend on the spot, and tries to get him to bug off about her movie appearance. Even though she has separated things with the agency privately, Inoue seems to genuinely be cared and concerned for her. For as cutthroat as the idol industry can be, and for the seedy underbelly that it can often have exposed, it's not just a hole for evil people to exploit teenagers. It's a business and an art form many people take genuine love and passion for their entire lives. Inoue seems to be one of those, 
as even though Risei has taken a leave, or stated her intent to possibly quit as a whole, Inoue saw something in her natural ability and feels invested still in seeing her succeed, even as the industry tracks forward. Inoue wants to make sure Risei isn't left behind, something made more apparent as the overall link goes on. My favorite line from Risei in this link is, I'm no longer a personality. Another way to address this is, she isn't a personality, she has one. She sees this number one as a way to avoid having her free time and youth crushed until the industry spits her out. We get the mention again of the movie here, and how currently it's being put on hold. Risei mentions how, since she was Inoue's daughter's age, Inoue took her in and treated her like family. But now that she's left, he's just a stranger. The player should recognize pretty easily that even as she says that, she's trying to convince herself of it. Obviously, Inoue isn't acting as if that's the case, nor does she seem to truly believe he is. Next link, Risei lets us in on how she's felt since arriving to Inaba, how she spent a lot of time to herself thinking, a lot of time trying to separate herself from Reset and find who she was apart from her identity. But even in trying to separate her from the public persona, she found herself feeling like an actor. She floats the idea that nobody can be their quote-unquote normal self all the time, so sometimes they just have to adjust. Like how she was always going to be on her best behavior around her parents, but she feels able to express herself more openly now in Inaba, with her grandma not pressuring her, and with the investigation team offering fun memories, free of judgment. Her grandma tells Risei that she's like tofu. Even though it stands out from all the other foods, it can be shaped and mixed in with any flavor or recipe. That it's resilient, malleable, and strong. Her takeaway is just that it's incredible, but doesn't make the connection about the malleability, the ability to retain itself among other flavors to her own life. Being formal around her parents, flirty around you, laughing around her friends, taking in the quiet moments up on the hill and petting the cat, working the store, Risei takes all sorts of different shapes and auras everywhere she is in life. Malleable as can be, but she's always Risei. Risei takes this opportunity to talk about her childhood and mention that it's not just that she didn't have friends in school, but that she was actively bullied. How she was introverted, always looking at her feet, unable to speak with any confidence or conviction, so everyone ignored her, leaving her alone. This is where we learn the info I gave earlier about Marukyu, that a relative of hers sent in the audition without letting her know, and that it passed like her family was pushing her onto the stage, regardless of her own confidence or decision of whether it was a good idea to. She didn't ever want to be an idol, she just wanted to become a better version of herself. The idea was that she could make friends if she became famous on TV, and it was the only reason that she went through with it. Then came her existential crisis. Even if everyone says hi and is happy to see her, the one that they like is the fictional character sold to them. She's still unknown to everyone, even as merchandise with her face and name litter the country, like a freakish, unalive entity wearing her face and taking her name. She's totally off the mark, though. If she truly accepted Reset as part of herself in her awakening, she wouldn't be teetering back and forth like this. She asked the player, more so to state her own thought, that even now, you're only spending time with her because she's a cute famous idol, aren't you? although she realized how unfair that is to ask right after doing so. When she went back to school, everyone who once ignored her and bullied her now came up to her, wanting to know the famous Reset. This is likely where she internalized her mindset that those two people must be separate, because those people were being fake, and her loneliness wasn't helped at all. The reason that they were fake isn't because they were impressed and interested in Reset, but because they also weren't interested in the girl who played her. It's not the interest in one that made it fake, it was the lack of interest in the whole that made it possible. Then, she felt like it was all her fault, like she was the one who wanted to change, and so she did it. But now, even if people don't ignore her, her ability of getting to know people in a normal capacity under good faith is always being pulled out as a possible manipulation. So now she thinks if she just quits being reset, things will go back to normal like how they were before. 
but with her added self-confidence and maturing. She doesn't realize yet that that can't happen though, even if she quits. And more surprisingly, maybe, that's actually a good thing. This link is just jam-packed with info, but it closes on a positive note, with her reaffirming being happy that people know the real her, and that she has a power that can help people, which is what she loved about being an idol in the first place. How she'll transform this time into someone everyone likes. Her power in the metaverse and her reason for doing so, her joy in helping others, it isn't so different than her power to inspire others on the stage, and make people's lives enriched with her music and performances. Being a person everyone likes, and being a person you like, isn't a one-step transformation either. Neither are they necessarily coincided or contradicted. She's been working toward that since she started as an idol, and this is just part of her overall trajectory toward that. The thing is, Rise already had a glance of realizing everything that I've been saying. The thing that we're waiting for is for her to stop running from the truth, stop averting her eyes, and stand firm in what she's already affirmed herself. Next link, when Rise leaves a moment to retrieve the tofu for you as a gift, Inoue shows up and hands you a letter to give to Rise, and because he believes that she'll actually listen to you, he emphasizes just how much of a talent and a one in a million performer he believes she was. After Rise sees him, she chases him away and she reads the letter about a girl that was bullied, like Rise, and who now watched Rise and gains inspiration from it to move forward and keep trying. Rise states also being part of an anti-bullying campaign in her career. This is the first big thing that makes it hard for Rise to keep distinguishing her desire to help others with her persona and her desire to help them with her career in idol work. She insists that she has no regrets but falls back with a pensive look on her face, a lonely smile as the game describes it. She feels she's disappointed a bunch of people, good people who look to her for strength, let down people that she wanted to help, but she continues to run, doubling down with her fantasy. Maybe she'll just inherit the tofu shop and then get married to you after all. Another line that she says to you is, it's dangerous to tell everyone what they want to hear. An ironic line as she focuses a lot of her actions around doing that very thing, even if just now she is starting to choose when and when not to do it. Rank 7 revisits Rank 3's location at Okina Station. Here, she, instead of being pestered constantly, is seeing posters and even passerbys mentioning this idol named Kanamin that is starting to take her place in leave. She insists that it doesn't bother her, but gets jealous as she hears herself dissed for being fake while her replacement is being praised for being real or authentic in some way. When in all reality, the real they see is just a produced mass persona too. Afterwards, Rise asks you if she's happy where she is right now, who she is, the way that her relationship with you operates. It's clear the criticism from random people toward Reset was taken to Rise's heart, even though she's insisted that they were separate. She tries to sell herself to you in a really sad display. Y you like having a cute underclassman, right? An ex-idol is a commodity. In her insecurity, she finds herself seeking validation in the same traits that she's been trying to dismiss herself from. After being pensive and frustrated that this topic still takes up headspace despite her quitting to try and escape that feeling, she lashes out, why would I sacrifice my real self? Like she has to choose one or the other, when that's a false dichotomy to begin with. Depending on when you do this link, Nanako also shows up and reaffirms that she likes Rise because she's Rise. Nanako doesn't seem to differentiate between Reset and Rise. She just sees the girl on the screen and the girl that's friends with you, the girl who is nice to her. It doesn't matter what it is that they're doing because they both come from her and she likes both of them. They're both Rise. While not changing the message, this is probably the most grim social link change from Nanako's hospitalization, but it resolves around the same. She's clearly struggling with her decision, but insists she'll feel better next time. She talks about how when she was working and idling, she felt alone, truly alone without someone to understand her problems. So now, she asks that you would stand by her, so that it's different this time. This is also the first romance flag for her social link. I don't want to be more redundant since this isn't just a summary, so I'll say that this link continues to take this route of instilling Rise's tinges of doubt and jealousy. The mayor mentions her replacement, and Inoue finally decides to give up on her coming back. He says he has to move on for the sake of the job, after all. 
After she started to feel like maybe her work wasn't as important after all, after she felt undervalued, Inoue confirmed her talent, the things she decided on. She still hasn't realized it, but the feeling of life passing her, of her losing direction, being uncertain and not sure if she can go back on her word, puts her into tears. Finally, her will to change. Embracing her also triggers the romance. She mentions you and the others, but the last thing she says is, there are other people who need me, right? And as she'll see, this is more than just the people she named. She leaves to think it over. In her rank nine, she finally realizes that Reset is Risei too. Yeah, you knew all along, huh? <laughs> but really, that's how it was. Reset's name in lights, idolized by the masses. That was me too. I didn't want to lose that me. There's no way to become someone else. I ran away from my plain, gloomy self. Then I ran away from my idol self. Right now, I'm a high school girl just enjoying school life, I guess. I would have run away from that as well if I didn't realize. I've been trying to become how I wanted to be. I pick a role, and then after a while, I keep chasing the real me by picking another role. When in fact, those roles are all me. I don't want to run away anymore. I don't want to search somewhere else for myself. I'm gonna hang in there, as the complete me. In a lot of ways, Risei's Link is the most redundant of the investigation team. Her central conflict isn't really a process of resolution following her self-discovery, but facing her self-discovery all over again. I think Risei's boss and the idea of the multiple selves and how it's wielded is a complicated topic, and the game didn't want to bog down the pacing or make things seem unnatural by writing an over-hour-long essay on it. So they divvied it out across the social links to hopefully make clear to the people in the back who didn't get the message the first time. But I don't think it's just good in this sort of metatextual way, either. Risei's conclusion of the self that she found and accepted was just another version of herself to claim and then run from. It was another stage, putting on different clothes, running to different ideas of her true self. Even the one that accepted the traits that she didn't want others to see. This link was more about her realizing and finding identity in what she thought was important, and then realizing she could do that being an idol as well. She just never made the active attempt to. She was so caught up in the loss of control that she didn't guide herself to the opportunities that she was given. So in a way, she needed this break to sort things out. Before, she did idling. Before, she sought friends. But now, with friends, she wants to help others even more. And with their strength to quell her loneliness, she can do so by revisiting the stage with new motivation. In her rank 10, she makes that decision to rejoin as an idol and to keep you watching her, being her anchor and her support to make it through the tough times. I've made up my mind about something. You see, <sighs> I'm thinking of going back into showbiz this spring. I am Rizad, after all. Do you remember the fan who gave me that letter? I'll do it for her. For my old manager, Inoue-san. For my family, everyone. You. And for myself. A Rizad without a fake smile. Senpai, I won't make the same mistake. There's no such thing as a me who isn't me. So I won't run away. I won't try to be someone I'm not. There's a lot of Rizes inside me. I won't try to change them. Instead, I'll let people know that those Riseis exist. That's the me I want to be. From this, Riseis persona transforms into Kanzian, which is, for once, of Buddhist origin and not Shinto. Kanzian Bosatsu, the often androgynous Bodhisattva of mercy and compassion. It's said that due to her compassion of those who are suffering, she delays her own ascension to Nirvana, or the Enlightened Realm. This mirrors Risei, while she finds her identity and home in the people that she finds in Inaba important. For all those hurt like her, all the little girls who see her as a beacon of hope, she returns to her career to carry out what she thinks means most to her, helping bring the others hope with the power and talent and skills that she's been given. 
Kanzeon, sometimes called Kanon, is extremely popular in Japan, like Risei, and her small Jizol statues can be found all over the place, mirroring not only the mass knowledge but mass marketing of Risei's merchandise, even as seen later in the game with the small models I mentioned. Many shrines are named after Kanon, and the fit is a really good one for Risei, not only in her character description but her character arc. The design of Kanzeon in Persona 4 is similar to the last, with instead of the plain modest white gown, now a black and white gown, with slits exposing the sides of their legs. From the less modesty to the two opposite colors, I think this is meant to represent the proper integration of Risei and Reset as one figure, the model and the modest, the public and the private, and her ability to combine her personal private motivation and strength with her talent for being an idol. Her reach can go even farther in the world, with even more satellites now coming off of her figure. Risei's ultimate awakening is all that's left now. She's stewing on how the girl who looked to Risei for strength is now finding new friends and how things keep going forward. Risei now has to stew over the idea of relationships in general, the complicated nature of connecting with people, and how time, natural changes, and other people will always create a web of information that makes the relationships rarely stiff and rigid. She mentions how even if it's no one's fault and there is no malice, people continue hurting each other. Risei is talking about this girl, of course, but she's been thinking of the people who she feels she abandoned as well when she went to step away from her career. You will always be you, and you has many faces, but no matter what face or faces you display, you will always be hurting someone when helping another. One step forward toward a goal is one step farther away from another. Risei mentions this mutual respect that she now has for this girl who relied on her, this girl who has moved on. Finally, she evolves into Kolzeon, which is an alternate spelling for Kanzeon, representing the same figure as I mentioned before. From her design details, that's already in another segment, so I'll save my breath here. Risei Kujikawa is a member of the Lover's Arcana, and nearly every part of her design and personality points toward that with vigor. The Lover's card is about love. I, I mean, on the basic level, Risei is the most romantically suggestive and forward girl in the game toward the protagonist. The angel in the middle of the Lovers is the angel Raphael. It's an air sign and considered to be ruled by Gemini, which fits with Risei also being a Gemini, since she's born on June 1st. The Lovers also represents the harmony of the subconscious mind, with the man representing the subconscious, the logical, and the woman representing the feminine and the intuitive. Then Raphael represents the superconscious mind, the divine directive. Risei's case, I think we can see this as the unity of the many selves, brought together by the divine directive, which Risei finds to be helping others no matter what she's doing. Sometimes the card refers to the interior marriage of the conscious and the subconscious, also contributing to the many selves inside of Risei that is stretched fervently by her character, dungeon, social link, and overall arc. As one would imagine, on higher polarity, lovers represents union, and on lower it represents discord and disharmony. When we meet Risei, she is fighting with herself, unable to tell what is her and what isn't by rejecting the part she's embarrassed over or doesn't understand. Then, by the end of the dungeon and her link, she has come into harmony with her many selves, rejoining eventually as an idol, with the newfound inner strength and directive operating in harmony. Some additional aspects of her character I have yet to have talked about, and the largest thing I think would be considered a character flaw is her manipulative nature. Part of Risei's arc is her coming to term and pride with her ability to be who she wants, and the balance of the many selves inside of her, sometimes leaning more in the sucking upside, but there are multiple times when she takes the flattery beyond mild self-gain, with no losing parties, and into, instead, manipulation. There's multiple times that she decides to fake cry or get overly angry about things she doesn't actually care about, but the primary example is during the Hot Springs trip, where Yukiko realizes that she should apologize after it's found out that the boys were actually doing nothing wrong or perverted and had been robbed of their bath time due to poor time management, essentially segregating them into their room by themselves to do nothing for the night and feel sad. Risei is the one who steps up and suggests Yukiko not make the situation right, and instead convinces all the girls it'll be their little secret. 
She doesn't need to apologize if they never admit to their mistake. Plus, this way they can have the bath the whole night with no downsides. This is pretty unapologetically scummy behavior, as many characters have at least one moment of throughout the game. But it does well to further her more well-rounded character. It also, due to its placement in the story, shows the other side of this imbalance that Risei is struggling with that we normally don't see. Her journey of coming to try and understand how to wield the different selves positively. She is also shown to express some moments of spitefulness coming from an insecurity of being undervalued. Since Kanji doesn't have any attraction or interest toward Risei, she seems to take it as a personal insult and says a lot of backhanded compliments to him throughout the game. Although, again, this is just one aspect of the pretty balanced character relationships from the investigation team in general. It's not like Risei and Kanji hate each other, even if they give each other a lot of sh**. Risei's first name could mean many things, but due to it being written in hiragana, most answers would have to be left up to speculation. Her last name Kujikawa, however, is constructed of three kanji, with ku likely meaning a period of long time, ji referring to the sense of love or affection, and kawa being the classic kanji for river. In other words, the long-pouring current of affection. Risei makes herself the river for those seeking affirmation and a place in life. Her work spans a long ways across the country and affects many people for time and time immemorial. That's the image I believe that we're supposed to draw from it. Also, the idea of this long-standing affection through a river of many ages also likely ties back to her persona, Kanzeon, or Kanon, who has the oldest temple in Japan, the Sensoji. This came around in the late 600s after supposedly two fishermen found a statue of Kanon in the river, taking it to the leader of the village and deciding in its sanctity to enshrine it. Risei Kujikawa's arc is about the never-ending search for the deep down, the true Risei, the trait of the soul, only for Risei to realize that it's only when each part of her lights the way that she can truly follow the path. It's a story about the balances of the many selves and many faces that we hold to the people in our lives, from personal to public, formal to casual. It's about us, and how while it is only natural for us to adjust and change in behavior and appearance, that there's always something tying us together. Ourselves. The dungeon design of Persona 4 was certainly an improvement visually for the series from the last game. Each dungeon now reflects the theme of each arc, and they're all roughly the same length to get through. But in regards to puzzles, unique mechanics, or anything of the sort, they're basically non-existent. At their most thought-provoking, it's often a matter of explore until you find an item in the dungeon that lets you proceed. While I appreciate Atlas's consistent effort to try and innovate and try new things, I am very glad that they left the random generation behind in favor of more polished and designed dungeons in the following game. Then again, it is Persona 4's success that most likely pushed a budget increase to start with, so it's not entirely fair to judge it there either. One thing should be said about the random generation though, and it's that I have played many games with random maps, from many companies on many consoles through many generations, and Persona 4 does have one of the most solid and non-glitchy AI generation systems I've seen for its game. If for nothing more than the sheer fact that I haven't experienced even once it bug out. Never in my eight playthroughs, one on the PS2, seven on the PC, did I ever have to reload a level or floor because the next area or part of the level was unreachable. So thank goodness for that. It seems almost too innocuous to even praise the game for, but the amount of games that fail at this baseline entry-level start-of-the-run activity can't be underestimated. So, good going. Eddie Minami, the Temperance Arcana, the Stepmother, the Mystic, the future MLM victim, is probably one of the most unique characters within Persona's Social Link system, even across the other games. The Persona games are made with a wide array of life experiences and backgrounds in mind. Their entire structure is built upon the idea of these underlying systems of archetypes that transcend culture and time. But that may be something that slips a lot of people's minds in a game with two total unrelated female characters that you can't date or do anything weird with. 
And of course, this isn't an indictment on the quality of those characters and story, which I obviously think are great. Obviously. Look what I'm doing with my time. Obviously, I think they're great. But I think the disconnect happens when Eddie draws to empathize with a life perspective not often the oness of the average player base for a Persona game. That is, to empathize with a very unique struggle of a stepmother and her attachment with her child. Even throwing things in her personality more likened and common to young and even more aged mother stereotypes, being a focus on mysticism, but we'll get into that later. I like this refreshing story, and it's cool that it sort of fills out the three ways that disjunctive family relationships are seen through the story of Persona 4. In Nanako and Dojima, you see both of their sides near equally. In Shu and his mother, we see Shu's perspective primarily, and in Eddie and Yuta, we see the mother primarily. I think this was intentionally done to broaden not just types of family dynamics that can exist, but the validity of each perspective involved. Family, found family, and reassurance in who you are and who your family is being a consistent sub-theme throughout the game. Eddie's character arc is essentially to stop wallowing in her own self-defeatism, her pessimism about the resulting actions of her own decisions, and her learning to take firm grasp of her life and her destiny, making effort to move things the way that she wants with her own power and her own will. You begin the temperance social link after taking the daycare job in the shopping district, and among the other children that you look after, you see Yuta, who seems to be somewhat of a problem child, although not a malicious or mean one, necessarily. The first thing we see is Yuta being left last to be picked up, as Eddie gets there later than she was supposed to. This illustrates her general lack of motivation and direction in her life immediately, but it also introduces her in a very negative way, something Persona 4 is not shy about doing in the slightest. From Ai to Shu to Naoki, Persona 4 introduces a lot of characters this way, and while understandable, it is unfortunate that because of this approach, many players aren't willing to stick it out or commit to these links on their first playthrough, when going in blind at least. From the initial interaction, Yuta running ahead, and then the other daycare supervisor coming over to gossip to you, you get an idea that this is a fairly fresh union. Eddie is his stepmom, and neither of them really know each other or know how to understand each other and their place in their newfound relationship. Their relationship with one another is still fresh. In between Social Link 1 and 2, it's confirmed that Eddie and Yuta have lived together for six months, and the man that she fell in love with is now in the city on a long business trip for hours and days on end. So essentially, she has been saddled up with this kid of her lover, a kid that she barely knows, as his primary caretaker. A very unique, difficult situation. Her loneliness, initially being from the city, and feeling the judgment toward her as an outsider in this town, something we see in the previous link, also weighs on her. It makes her question if she made the right decision after all, if she belongs here. She's someone who is very lonely, with no one to talk to, no one to get advice from. She mentions that she rarely even gets to have the conversation that she has with you in her daily life, because of her being so far away from everyone she knows. Her husband being unavailable and this new child that's been thrown in her lap knowing almost nothing about each other, the age difference, the gender gap, it's too much. Rank 2 starts implying Yuta's potential guilt over this woman having to do things for him all the time, and his implied awareness at the workers and other mothers judging her. It's something we see more later, but I think we get those first few kernels here. She also mentions in this link the jealousy for TV dramas and the perfect families and fathers in those shows. This is the first of many links focusing on the TV in her life, which, for a game so focused around people watching a midnight TV station, is actually not that much of a visual metaphor in most of the situations in the game. It's, it's not used much in other social links. It's clear, though, that the imagery of the TV is being used in the same way that is implied thematically for the rest of the game, though. It's clear here that she feels negatively toward Yuta, but not because she dislikes him. It's more of a self-pity, a negative feeling that she tries to describe here as well. 
Next link is the first mention of the Featherman Rangers show, a parody of Super Sentai, or Power Rangers as we know them in the West, and more specifically one of Yuta's peers provoking and belittling him for not knowing about the Rangers, causing Yuta to chase him around. There doesn't seem to be incident, and it's probably a mix of play, but I remember this exact sort of thing on the playground when I was young too. There would be that one angry kid who people would intentionally provoke to make him chase everyone. Even though it was a game, there was still genuine anger there, and genuine insult involved. I think that's what's getting portrayed here, and sets the groundwork for a different aspect of Yuta that we're informed of later. After seemingly that same friend goes home with his dad, Yuta asked Eddie when his dad is coming home. To her lack of an answer, and him going off to stay with the friend, this gives insight into their mutual loneliness, rather than just Eddie's side that we've come to know so far. This is also where Eddie opens up about her regrets and feelings of abandonment in her marriage. I mean, he did marry her, give her his kid, and then he runs off to China for months on end? So yeah, in my opinion, he's probably a scumbag, as a husband and a father, but that's not what I want to draw attention to here. Instead, it's the fact that you can't read her expression. This is extremely rare in Persona 4, even with manipulative or complicated characters. You normally states outright that the smile seems fake, or that someone is smiling wholeheartedly. He gives the interpretation in his description to the player. But in this case, the interpretation of people's emotions and general ability for him to read people is probably not even thought of much whenever you play the game. But here, he actually doesn't know. It shows that there is a difference between you, some omnipotent narrator, and you, the person within the game. Confused enough that he doesn't give a straight commitment. He can't tell if it's genuine or not. And I think that comes down to one thing I mentioned earlier that her story is very much outside the wheelhouse of the experience for you and the average player base. That, and I think her emotions are so multifaceted and mixed that maybe she even doesn't know if the words she says sometimes are genuine. She's clearly a very open person, but she doesn't at this point have a great grasp on her own life and decisions, her own feelings and thoughts and the root of those things. Next rank, Minami attempts to bond with Yuta by going to a nice restaurant, but he's not interested. This is the first time that Minami will try to buy his approval. But for anyone who paid attention to the subtle foreshadowing, Yuta isn't interested in going to the restaurant, not because he doesn't like or want to spend time with her, but because he feels guilt over her having to take care of him, even though to him she's still mostly a stranger. Which is pretty nuanced for a kid character, honestly. Still, Eddie doesn't understand this, so she feels tired and rejected over and over. She feels like maybe it's just hopeless. She mentions the TV again, this time. How she left in the middle of a show. She mentions how maybe it wasn't worth it to try. And that from the TV, she heard something about maternal instincts kicking in due to breastfeeding. Something that she's never done. This isn't a completely accurate thing when it comes into psychology. From the psych courses that I took, many will feel maternal instincts for the child after the birth, even for mothers with severe nipple inversions who maybe can't nurse the baby personally. And along those lines, some mothers still don't feel that feeling toward their kid even after breastfeeding. The point here is, TV has gone from a way to escape to a way it informs Eddie's worldview and fills her loneliness. It's turned from an escape from the negative into something that actively misinforms her life and makes it worse. This next part is why I joked about her being a future MLM victim at the start of the essay, but it essentially is a more radical reveal to what we've been talking about with the TV. She mentions a speaker on the TV that teaches that life was determined before our birth, that we're all just little robots following our program as our creator made for us, so whenever anything happens, there's nothing you can do about that. It was already decided for you. She asks if that makes you feel better for you to hear. She asks if you think it's a wonderful concept, as she clearly is inspired and happy with. And I'm obviously going to respond no here. No, of course not. I hope for most people the toxicity of this mindset is apparent, and if I wanted to go into all of the routes for why, it would demand its own separate essay, but I will still give a few cliff notes on why here. 
What she's talking about is a general stoicism combined with determinism. Stoicism generally being good at treating your anxiety whenever it says not to beat yourself up for things that are out of your control. But then this determinism is saying that it's all out of your control. When you combine the two ideas, in other words, everything you do, everything that happens, it's all out of your control and nothing is your responsibility. This isn't a very nuanced type of determinism though. You see, free will is not technically observable. There's not any way to see or study. We can only lay claim to our experience of it. But in that way, there is not a means to prove other animals don't experience it since we haven't found the biological difference that would seemingly turn free thinking humans into a robot. But as AI gets more advanced, it should be able to replicate a thinking process like free will, just from logical faculties. Combine that with a desire for pain and pleasure, and since every human is a little different, it's a line that is honestly very, very blurred whenever it comes to our current understandings of science and even philosophy. The takeaway really is that functionally though, it doesn't matter if we are predetermined or have free will, because we are all under the inescapable feeling that we are moving with our own direction and directing and observing our experiences as we live. It's too real, too close to us to ever separate ourselves from it. And so even if it turns out that everything we do is determined and we are like little robots, it doesn't actually change much about the actual practical way that we live our lives, how we operate. So in other words, we are still in control of ourselves, even if the we doesn't refer to some ghost in the machine, but instead the culmination of the machine's parts and mechanisms. Meaning that even if we are determined, it doesn't change the fact that we still make the choices we do, and that every moment we make a choice, it was already like that. But anyways, hopefully that was a somewhat brief analysis for those that it may not have been immediately apparent or some people who may just have been curious on to why this mindset is largely flawed on a few levels. Obviously, this is a side the game takes as well with the false breastfeeding information given prior in the story. This is meant to be wrong. And after all, how could you seek the truth if you give up on directing your experiences entirely, either simulated or not? Telling her that it's not a good idea prompts her to pout and say that the speaker who said it on TV is really popular though, which is another obvious bandwagon fallacy. She says, it's nice to know someone like you and that everyone's entitled to their own ideas. And that isn't a bad sentiment in and of itself, but that's where that toxicity comes through. It's clear that she is using it as an excuse not to confront your denial of her belief. It's also ironic, as while she says that people are entitled to their own ideas, her idea was literally that all ideas and processes are not our own and are out of our control, which is a contradiction unto itself. She frowns for a bit, but then she says that she liked the speaker, so she went to see a lecture personally and was moved to tears by the idea of a higher power guiding her actions. This lack of free will linked with a higher power is really fun because in the context of the TV, it sounds like an MLM of some sort, but it also is a reference to the mentality and belief of the god in this game, Izanami, and her view of the mentalities of Inaba, that they are people who don't truly seek the truth, but seek convenient truths to escape their struggles. But it could also be a reference to the law system in mainline Shin Megami Tensei, which most of the time positions law as a free will lacking area being directed by the command of Yahweh or God. Meaning if I were to analyze this with the Shin Megami Tensei lens, she is a law aligned character motivated to do so out of a fear and guilt over the free will of her own actions and the comfort that a stronger, smarter power can carve the life intended for her instead. The real point of this link though, and wow, we've talked about this one for a while, but it really is dense, is her mentioning again that she is far from the city without much to do, and all that she has is the TV and internet to keep her company. As Persona 4 is focused on the improvement of the self and grasping for the truth, this makes Eddie's central struggle apparent. It's her willingness to escape into media and let others decide for her what truth is, instead of seeking it and finding the answer on her own. This time then at the TV leads her to be fed lies about relationships, motherhood, and even her own personal directive. This is basically where you step in in the social link as Yuta comes to you for your perspective on the situation and you let him know better how she feels and get to more substantially understand his guilt and how he feels sorry for her. 
This is about the time that her self-defeatedness starts to take hold. You realize the mutual pity that they hold for each other and how really what they need to do is communicate properly, which I've seen some people use as a way to dismiss this link as if it's ever really how reality works. This mother who feels like she is oppressing this child's life whom she hardly knows, and from her perspective, he could never care about or listen to what she says in his youthfulness. Why would she open up to him? That seems immature. It seems like she's not guiding as a parent. She's not filling her role. And why would he or how would he even understand? She doesn't think he'll understand, care, or listen, and she has reason to believe that from his actions. Yet she also doesn't blame him. She thinks maybe she would do that too if she was in the same place, that acting in that manner is only natural for a child. Yuta also feels his very existence is a burden on his mother, and so he intentionally acts up so that she will forget about him and focus on herself instead. Why would he open up and tell her? It would only create for her more sympathy for his perspective and make her try harder to make it work despite her, from his perspective, still being forced to do it. This is good writing. It may not be the most exciting social link and most of them do take place with basically the same location, but this is a complex conflict that really makes sense if you pay attention to the characters and who they are. From here, you're essentially on the resolution of the rest of the social link. There are many elements brought up that are resolved one by one. When playing Featherman with school kids, it becomes apparent Yuta doesn't actually know much about Featherman, and that's because Eddie is consumed with listening to the TV and letting her tell it its truth. It's, it's lies. Her character arc resolves then when she realizes it's not necessarily material goods that Yuta wants, but to watch this show and they can do it together. I was scared, but I've learned my lesson now. I won't just try and escape into my own personal time. She then gives up the thing that has been telling her false truths and chooses her own truth to be a mom that listens and speaks. Watching the show together with Yuta, they begin to finally bond. There is also a bit where Eddie gets him a Featherman Ranger and he speaks to you about wanting to return the favor with another gift of his own driving home Yuta's good nature. Next, the mentioned violence is brought up again for the forefront by gossiping housewives saying that Yuta is a bully who attacks people and will eventually become a delinquent. When Yuta misunderstands why his mom is crying, he hits you. But it should be clear from prior context, such as the kids intentionally belittling Yuta and trying to provoke him, that the housewives, what they're saying? It's wrong. He's not a violent bully, but someone who's extremely sensitive with a big heart. Someone that isn't afraid to take action, step outside of the group, and defend others when he feels like they are being treated poorly. Of course, punching people is a big no-no, as you say as a kid, but the underlying personality and motivations behind these actions prove to be anything but premature delinquency. Eddie learns then not to give into or listen to the gossip around her son, the false truths about his behavior and who he is and what he's going to become, but instead reach out to the truth and know who he is for herself, as someone who should know best. His mom. Yuta also comes to understand and be more defensive and affectionate toward his mother from the things that keeps her down. It's a great story that I honestly think is overlooked for so many people for such a long time, and one with a lot to say if you couldn't tell by the length of this segment. On to the Arcana. Eddie Minami, as you know, is the Temperance Arcana, which to my research has the relevant meanings in regards to her character. The Temperance card involves an angel, specifically Michael, which from the SMT analytical perspective I briefly mentioned earlier, makes sense with her tendency toward law alignment. Michael is mixing the liquid in his card, which comes to the root origin for Temperance. Temporarity, meaning to mix and combine things in a proper manner. This mixing is something underlying the themes of other traits to be listed. One foot is on the land and the other is in the water. The water represents the pool of the public subconscious, something already heavily present in Persona's Jungian focus, but with Eddie specifically, I think it represents her one foot in reality and one foot in escapism. 
This escapism being from large group seminars, famous speakers on TV, she is linked to the perceptions of the public, but also has a life very separate from the one she sees on the TV, like with the families and those dramas that she was so jealous of. The Temperance card is an encouragement to test and try things out. The Hebrew letter it comes from is Samek, which actually refers to the tent pole in the center of the tent that keeps it stable. Eddie struggles not wanting to try, fighting against giving up, and throughout her arc testing and trying various things, eventually coming to understand Yuta and move forward. This card is also heavily focused on the idea of a guardian angel or leading force in one's life direction and stability of one's mind. This is represented pretty clearly by Adi seeking a higher power initially as a means to make her own decisions, but this is also false. She eventually finds her real guardian force or angel in the child of Yuta, who through mutual understanding causes her to feel more comfortable in the situation she's landed in. The intelligence of the temperance is that of the trial, which means that you will only find the answer once you try and try again. This matches, of course, with Eri in a very obvious way, so I'll move on. On the higher polarity, once again, it's braving criticism and taking heat from others, like the other mothers and school teachers, but regardless, finding and pushing through in your own path with your own angel near you. On the lower polarity, it's unwillingness to try and the desire to run from trials that have met you, which obviously contributes to the idea of her being in low polarity or reversed whenever you first meet her, and slowly seeing her switch to this higher state as she reaches a better place of mind. She goes from being late to picking Yuta up and almost forgetting, to actively wanting to be by his side. So, in summary, Edi Minami, someone who had decisions that she regrets, loses faith in her ability to direct her own life, unable to try, and failing whenever she does. She is a character that learns to stop turning to the lies of TV pseudoscience, half-baked philosophy, and the lies of the gossiping peers around her, and in turn find her own truth, ultimately succeeding in her trial and forming a strong mutual bond with her stepson a unique and dense character arc that speaks to the range of stories Persona is capable of telling. You may not relate to her specifically, but there's plenty about this message that could apply today to any generation if you just replace the TV with whatever you might end up finding dependence on for truth. Like a phone, social media, or the online news, a friend group, or maybe a work circle. But there was so, 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 so much you. to cover here. The story is plenty relatable and offers lots of good. Honestly, I'm surprised just how long this one ended up being from whenever I first sat down to work on and do it. When it comes to side quests, side quests are a pretty weak part of Persona 4, because despite there being so many of them, almost none of them offer anything of super notable importance. Some are secret, hard-to-obtain cosmetics for bragging rights, which is mainly why I have these awful outfits on in all of my videos and fights. Most of the actual tasks given in Persona 4 are a manner of going out to a specific floor and farming a specific enemy for a mostly otherwise useless drop that you would have just sold to the blacksmith anyway, then returning it for a weapon or some other sort of material reward. The reasons given for even needing things like this most of the time is fairly flimsy too. Easily one of the weakest aspects of Persona 4, which is also probably why almost no videos even mention the darn things. That being said, they also can be seen as non-essential filler, made assumably just for someone who wants to spend more time in the world of Persona 4. They are so ineffective and so easily avoidable that you can finish the whole game without solving maybe two of them, and even that might be over-exaggerating the amount you need to address. And doing absolutely none of them has basically no drawback whatsoever. There are a couple of other quests, like the Two Sisters quest or the Feeding the Cat quest, but these barely reach the bar for a side quest, and also barely exist in the game outside of those two examples. The best side quests in Persona 4, to summarize, are actually already anthologized in the Hermit Arcana social link, so if you want to do some side questing, just go talk to the fox. The cutest Pikachu egg the world has ever seen, our endearing Look at her! Ayane Matsunaga. 
She's one of the four split path social links in Persona 4 Golden and is one half of the Sun Arcana, which you have to choose between Yumi. Ayane is a fresh personality and perspective in Persona 4 Golden, showing herself to be a lot more than the initial impression for anyone who pays attention. She's the band student, a trombone player first year at the Yasugami High School that you've started attending. She's available pretty early, pretty much immediately in the game like her other Sun counterpart, and is one of the only social links that doesn't get cancelled when it rains, along with the fox. Ayane's story is a classic one, yet not one super heavily portrayed through any of the Hashino personas, at least not as its primary message, and that's the plight of someone whose happiness and success is actively hindered by their unabashed selflessness. Ayane's Link is about starting to learn to stand up for herself and finally have the self-respect to acknowledge that her wants and needs don't always need to take a backseat to those around her that her thoughts, life, and experience do have value as much as any other. From the moment that you walk into the band, it becomes very clear that despite not being a major player, INA is the band's sort of pack mule, gathering surveys, reaching out to find possible performing venues, getting keys and things that the band needs whenever she should be practicing instead, and being saddled with cleaning up after everyone else leaves. She's a new member, so it makes sense in some regard, in a Japanese school like this, that some of these things might have been given to her as Kohai responsibility, but the fact that it's always just her paints a more sad and unfair picture of the situation. When you enter and introduce yourself to everyone, the band captain introduces you specifically to her so that she can catch you up to speed while the rest of the band performs. It may not be apparent on the first playthrough, but this is clearly meant to be a reason that INA initially lags behind in her playing skills. Everyone else plainly gets more practice than her, and while there is another reason why her playing falls behind, we'll continue to that whenever it gets brought up. Something that is established in her very first link and continues to be expanded upon immediately is her discontent toward how things are, but the brave face she puts on to pretend like it isn't a bother. You see this with her constantly stuttering, tons of ums, errs, and uh, if you don't mind, litter her sentences as she attempts not to provoke, upset, or offend anyone around her. You can see this in her, we don't take attendance, so you don't have to come if you don't want to, but practice makes perfect, so with an ellipsis implying her voice is being carried off. Something to mention about the band is that it's one of the social links tied to boosting the expression stat. This actually has narrative and thematic significance too. It's not a random buff. Since band deals with perfecting an instrument, they could have easily linked this to diligence, like the origami job does. But while expression also makes sense with music, inherently, it's also tied to INA's and really both of the Sun social link troubles. That is, expressing herself honestly to the people around her. So as you come to the band room and see her more and more, she expresses herself better each time. Going back to the last quote I mentioned from her, she actually follows it up with a self-depreciating dig that she's not too good at expressing herself. Then I asked if she had a boyfriend because I'm a funny man, funny man indeed. Going forward for the next couple links, it focuses on her trying to get better tone and her feeling discouraged. And although she seems fragile and weak-willed, under her selfless nature, she actually has a hard-working heart of iron. She never gives in to excuses or tries to cop out of failings, but just gets more and more motivated each time. Which is epic, because that's a good way to be alive. She did such a good job. Uh, this is also where we get introduced to Takeru, an upperclassman who also plays the trombone, plays all the solos, and sometimes even takes her spot entirely at events. Even though she's the one saddled with setting all of the events up, which... Hey, I mean, he does play better than her, and upperclassmen take natural authority. Still, it's clear that despite her acknowledging and believing these things, it still hurts her a little inside, doing so much work and never getting to shine. She even mentions never playing a single show so far, excusing it as her not being able to play in front of an audience anyway. She apologizes for bringing this up, and early on apologizes when you say you're gonna help her clean up, which is something plenty of the other band members should be at least trading positions to do, like with all of the other clubs. 
The game really smashes your teeth in trying to portray through every facet of her character what kind of person she is and what kind of insecurity she's dealing with without just having her monologue in detail her problems. It's very well written. After she sets up the venue in Social Link 3, you finally have the opportunity to ask her if she's really doing what she wants. After she insults and speaks down to herself, talking about how she can make up for it with scheduling, accounting, and cleaning for everyone, it's apparent, despite wanting something different and working so hard, she just doesn't see her time as an equal value to everyone else's. Avoiding eye contact as she tells you, if they're happy, she's happy. Finally, once you get to Social Link 4, INA and you start training alone, which is where you learn her family isn't exactly too well off. And as is typical of the smaller and older Japanese homes, due to the thin walls, she doesn't have much opportunity to practice her instrument at home, which makes her time spent doing other work at school detriment her even more than plenty of the other students who are already getting more practice there. She could go to public areas to practice, but she feels if she goes alone that she'll just be a burden to the others in the area, that she'll be actively impeding on other people's nice days with her sounds, that people will see her practice as bothering others, rather than what they would if multiple or a group were there to practice. There's a really beautiful line that INA says on the floodplain, that she may not have talent, but she still has dreams and that her dream is to make people happy with music someday, which, for a reason to play, is pretty overdone in Japanese stories, but I think the place that she's coming from still makes this very moving for her character. It's clear she has a goal where she wants to be responsible for making others happy. She wants someone who really needed it, in her words, but as we see, she keeps blocking herself from reaching this goal because she's prioritizing others' convenience. It's honestly a really well-written bit of irony in her character arc. Now that her character has been thoroughly and naturally explored, we hit the rank 5 event, which is the big event of her link. Takeru hurts his arm, and INA is going to have to make a clutch replacement for the upcoming show. She's still insecure about her playing, and feels people don't really want her on the team, but this is an opportunity to achieve her goal finally, without getting in anyone's way. And as the event is at the hospital, this is where, if you didn't already pick up on the obvious implication, as the event is at the hospital, which is like the ideal place that someone who really quote-unquote needed to hear it would be. This is where, if you hadn't picked up already in her story, it's made more clear that her parents are probably fairly poor, or there's an implication that they maybe don't prioritize INA in their lives personally. Giving some idea as to where this toxic selflessness and lack of value for herself may come from. The idea that the reason that she plays the trombone is because her family already had one and wasn't willing to buy her a smaller instrument more fitting and easier for her body size and natural frame. Rank 6 shows that she's really grown and gained the courage to now practice day and night where you had been at the floodplain, even if you aren't with her. For the sake of the team and others, she's willing to take on that guilt of playing alone, working even harder and harder, finally facing a fear she had. After this dedication, it's noted that Takeru has mostly recovered, and everyone feels awkward, as they don't want to tell INA to relieve her spot in the show back to Takeru. It's clear that they are implying to her that it is the thing they want her to do. This is part of the group social aspect in Japan that may be seen as passive-aggressive in the United States or other similar Western countries, but is generally seen as a more respectable way of trying to get someone to conform and act as they should without being rude or putting direct pressure on them. You can choose to stick up for her, which you should do, because of course you should. But even so, INA reads the room and gives up her place, putting on that fake smile she's become all too accustomed to. After everyone leaves, it's made clear what you should already have realized. She never wanted to give up her spot. That she just wanted to make others happy. That she didn't want to be a bother. She claims that it's no one else's fault, but things never seem to clear out for her whenever she wants something. She regrets sacrificing the dream, 
but this mistake finally makes her clutch her truth. Maybe it's because she's finally felt comfortable voicing her opinions to you that she could finally hear her own feelings without putting herself down. She talks about how this was the first time she felt so dedicated, but had it taken from her. Finally, Ayane's ray of sunshine comes to the forefront. She decides she needs to be more selfish. That if she always is concerned with pleasing others, no one will ever see the best her, because they'll be too focused on their own pursuits, and she'll be unable to clear a path where she can shine helping the others through her actions. She tells you that you helped her feel her own voice, that you actually supported her feelings and let her speak her mind finally to understand herself. This speaks to a fundamental truth that anyone who followed the old videos on my main channel would know was my own problem and still sometimes is. I never ask to collab with people because I don't want to waste their time or be perceived as using them. I try not to take many sponsorships because I don't want the video to flop and waste the sponsor's money. This is just in context of YouTube, of course. It runs and used to run a lot deeper than that, but that is reality. There's not a single action, nor lack of action, that can ever not negatively impact someone. We walk through life every day, pushing people down just to stay alive and keep ourselves afloat. Every job we take theoretically takes food off the table for another person. Every friendship we make takes time away from them spending that time with another person. Every goal we strive will have to be better than and outshine so many others' goals and dreams just to be seen and realized. But you know what? All of us are in the same boat there. We are all forced to do this. And it doesn't matter what government, what culture, what economy. It's all an innate trait of living and even dying. From the moment you enter existence, your action is a puddle rippling even far after you're gone, and how you live and how you died changes how that ripple changes things for countless other people in ways you will never recognize or know. So be kind to others. Help people who are struggling. But if your goal, if your dream is built on making people happy, on doing your best, on making the world better, no one has the right to say your dream doesn't matter. Be selfish, to some extent. We can't not be, no matter how hard we try. And it might help someone else to be selfish like that along the line. Now, I think that's a good place to stop the analysis of her character, but truthfully, if I want this series to be an ultimate overview, there is still major obvious aspect I have to get to. That is INA's Arcana, of course. The Sun! So let's look at how the Sun connects to INA. The Arcana of the Sun represents awakening, the moment that someone becomes adept. Which, while awakening, could really apply to any social link. Becoming adept at something could easily apply to her becoming better both at expressing herself and becoming more adept at her trombone playing, as through her link, she becomes great at it. The card is sometimes in lower polarity associated with egocentrism and in all forms deals with childlike willfulness. While I don't think this is typically meant as a positive for the card reading, selfishness plays a big part in INA's arc, and it is very much a good thing for her as she stops her childlike willful avoidance from what she wants of herself and blind acceptance of the will in others. In some spiritual readings, the sun can represent a huge change in outlook and self that barely represents where you came from or who you once were. I think this contrast implies that INA's brighter, more cognizant future is a very rapid change from that doormat that we see when we first meet her. Also, she's just a ball of sunshine, always smiling all the time, even when she feels awful. Aww. Now outside of her arcana, I want to look at INA's name, because it seems very intentional. The name Ayane is a classically feminine Japanese name that with proper kanji translates literally as colorful sound, which makes sense both with her character and with her being connected to music. Ayane's last name comes from Matsu, meaning pine, and Naga, or Nagai, which means long or lengthy. Matsu Naga. 
refers to the tall Japanese pine trees. In Japanese culture, the pine akamatsu and kuromatsu are also seen as symbols for steadfast, bright futures, and also fitting of ayane. They represent a rebirth, a renewal, and a hopeful future. Ayane is great. What a good character, but everyone sees her Pikachu cheeks and doesn't seem to really give her much thought. But as usual with Persona 4, the writers at Atlas have given careful consideration to herself and her arc, and for it I think we see an amazing character, and an amazingly unique and interesting message and take on the role of selflessness and selfishness in our lives. Demon Fusion operates pretty smoothly. The menus are clear and most easy to navigate. The amount of numbered fusions from dual to triple to quadruple and more and more and more special personas also make it seem like there are a lot more personas than there are, and more rare ones than there are. And of course, the inclusion of skill inheritance and fusion by result is something that is absolutely godsend and that it's very hard to go back to not having an older Mega Ten in Persona games once you've experienced it. The level of convenience is just generally a huge step forward, and it was never a huge pain to fuse in Persona 4 because of that. Of course, going back to this from SMT5 or Persona 5 isn't a full negative, but many quality of life features are also missing here, like the full reverse compendium fusion option from SMT5. I don't think it's that unusual to hear people ask, what was up with the last bosses of Persona 4 Golden? I mean, yeah, sure, you fight a god, that's normal. but. After I think a lot of people retroactively realized that the Namatame fight wasn't even against Namatame, and the game keeps going after Adachi and Ame no Sagiri, it starts to feel like a whole new phase of the game has started. So I want to clarify what Kuni no Sagiri and Ame no Sagiri are, from a story thematic and mythological standpoint in Persona 4. The first thing that I want to point out that I felt embarrassed not immediately noticing myself is Kuni no Sagiri and Ami no Sagiri are pretty much straightforward translations. It's not Kuni no Sagiri, it's Kuni no Sagiri, aka country, possessive particle, fog, or mist. It's essentially the spirit of the country's fog. Given thematic detail with how fog represents lies in Persona 4, the country's lies, the things the country refuses to face. Ame no Sagiri, then, Ame meaning rain, or Ame meaning sweet, generally translates as the rain's mist or fog, but this is actually wrong. It more likely refers to a more obscure usage of Ame, which in this context means sky, or more so, heaven. The usage of fog or mist in Persona 4 is representative, as I mentioned, of the blockage or obscuring of truth, the main message of the game being about the importance of seeking that truth, no matter the cost. But that's for another segment. We'll get to the meanings of the Sagiri in-game in a second, though. Instead, for now, let's cover the origin in Mythos. Kuni no Sagiri and Ami no Sagiri are both actually technically grandchildren of Izanagi and Izanami. They were formed from one of Izanagi and Izanami's children, not created from Izanagi's purification ritual like many of the other characters in Persona 4. This child was O Yamatsumi, a god of the mountains, the sea, and of war. It's notable that this was before the purification, but sometime after the death of Izanami, because the supposed inciting incident of his birth was when Izanagi killed the child Kagatsui, who murdered Izanami, the timing of his birth actually makes him the elder brother of the gods birthed during the purification, such as Amaterasu and Suzano, who are Yukiko and Yosuke. He then had eight children with Kaya no Hime, or Nozuchi, two of which children were the genderless deities Ame no Sagiri and Kuni no Sagiri. And there's the genealogy and how it connects to the others. Yay, yay. So what does that mean? So let's get into the character design and meaning. Kuni no Sagiri, whom you meet in the Heaven Dungeon, under the host of Namatame, is the will of the people in the general public, an underpinning fear of the truth and unknown that occupies the public subconsciousness. Representing the ignorance is bliss mentality. The character design is a series of cogs with peace signs working as halos over the character who's holding a peace sign and wearing a shirt that says love and peace. Seeking truth is an active process, one that requires growth and understanding, 
and make decisions putting aside false promises and red herrings. Sometimes the truth is painful. It's something that requires change. It's uncomfortable. And people in their youth, and as they age, always cling to the things they think they know. They seek out things that match their personal beliefs and personalities, and take comfort in those things to such an extent that they avoid the grueling effort of finding the complete myriad of truths that make up reality. Instead, seeking to cling to the incomplete interpretation of their truth, or their perspective, without having a proper understanding of the way that the multiple perspectives converge. This desire, this natural tribalistic tendency, is Kuni no Sagiri the fog laid over the country, the lies and obstruction of the truth, that just says, just be happy, isn't loving people and avoiding conflict a virtuous way of acting? I'm trying to help people, I'm trying to save others, I'm a good person, and I won't address any alternative, I won't seek to understand the greater ramifications of my actions, my intentions are pure, that means I'm good, right? Since that is the lie of the Kuni no Sagiri. Since the mindset creates such a hug box around the self and stifles people's growth, it becomes a robotic way of living. Without personal growth, without change, how can a person really be human after all? As established in multiple of the other segments, the ego is the aspect of Persona 4 that is honed in on as the aspect that makes people human. And the aspect of ego that makes people human is their ability to grow and change. Without that, they become just a creature within human skin. The Kuni no Sagiri is the robotic, blissfully ignorant will of the masses to feel happy and claim to do the right thing while avoiding the truth and control over their actions. And it's something that we all have inside of us. There's always some moral issue we aren't confronting, some idea that we avoid. It's probably impossible to expect someone to perform, or even be possible to perform, an almost never-ending confrontational cognizant awareness of everything in the world around them, at all times. But this Sagiri isn't birthed just as the shadow of that aspect innate in all humans. It becomes active when this feeling of avoidance and complacency has gripped the heart of the public, and led people to deafen their ears from the hurt of their fellow man. This is driven home even more by the control move that takes control of your party whenever you're in the Kuni no Sagiri fight. Through their mythological backing, story implementation, character, and boss design, I think Persona 4 did honestly a wonderful job visualizing the ideas that Kuni no Sagiri represents in an almost effortless looking way. Ami no Sagiri is the mist, the foggy cloudiness caused in heaven, sometimes referred to as heaven's first fog. While Kuni no Sagiri takes hold of the earth and the countries of man, more specifically Japan, obviously, the Ami no Sagiri is said to be the heaven's first mist, or the Japanese spirit of fog representing the heavens. Try as I might, I couldn't find nearly as much info on Ami no Sagiri as Kuni no, and that's coming from someone who owns a copy of the Kojiki. But it is my inference, based on the little I could find, that its role in the story or what it represents is this. Ami no Sagiri seems to be the heaven to earth, so to speak. If Kuni no Sagiri is the distorted fog of the people of earth, let Ami no Sagiri be the will of heaven on the earth. The heavens and holy beings fighting against the truth, decisions, and free will is a common theme expanded upon in countless other Magami Tensei titles, with law normally representing the heavens, and even seeing the loyal followers of law forfeiting their free will to an all-knowing god. However, this isn't Yahweh. And while it's a spin-off, the way Mythos works in Persona is vastly different from Megami Tensei. Still, I think since the Kuni and Ame no Sagiris are aspects of Izanami in Persona 4, and the story of Izanami deals heavily in averting your eyes from the truth, and the punishment for avoiding to do so, but since this connects to her will as a god over the protagonist of Persona 4, who uses Izanagi, and over mankind as a whole, who she sought to snuff out, was multiplied under Izanagi, it makes sense to say that Ami no Sagiri is the will of God, or at least the will of the goddess, Izanami, on the people. That was kind of wordy. I, it was hard to even read, to be honest, but I hope it made sense. The character design and battlefield are fought in reflections of that idea as well. 
First, while the Heaven Dungeon is this otherworldly depiction of heaven, the final stage of Magatsu Inaba takes you literally into the sky far above Inaba where you can see the city far below you. So over Inaba, in the heavens, a giant eye observes the people's actions. Then the design continues to this sort of condensed ball and seems to represent underwater sea mines, specifically moored naval mines even down to the shape and types of extrusions. They fit the look pretty naturally of Ame no Sigiri. When the cutscene starts for the fight, the image also focuses on the mountains behind them, possibly a reference to the parent O Yamatsumi, his father, god of among many things, but most primarily, the mountains. Then the notable move of creating fog so that the player can't hit Ame no Sigiri makes sense with the fog theme, obviously. I, I don't even think I really need to go into that. Another move, Nebula Oculus, refers to the far-off clouds and colorful forms of being beyond our galaxy, and Oculus refers to, obviously, any round eye-like opening. So for an attack from the Eye of the Fog God in the heavens, I think it's basically copy and paste for how that applies as well. Within Persona 4, Izanami created and disconnected beings of herself to act as avatars for different parts of herself avatars to judge and take action over the world. The view of humanity from the fog of heaven and the will of the people to accept the fog themselves. But as is justice, it is not the right of the masses or the individual to force a life someone doesn't want upon them. To use your free will to take the free will of others, there is no logically consistent way to establish that as right as a fellow human. And as a god, well, in the spirit of JRPGs and Atlas games everywhere, that right doesn't suddenly bestow upon you either, just because you're more powerful and take the title of God. Teddy, Persona's first divisive mascot character, in that some people love him and some people hate him, and there are plenty of valid reasons of interest and irritation to be found. We'll be going into that in its appropriate area, but being the boy wonder he is, for now, there's a lot that the game holds off on clarifying about him until the late game, many of which are linked to his origin under Jungian archetypal theory. So let's jump into all of it. Teddy is the original navigator and technically the second person to join the protagonist, Yu, on his journeys, if you count in battle involvement, voicing the tutorial for the very first battle. His official entry as a party member is just as Risa switches in for Navigator at the conclusion of her own dungeon, the third one, making him the second to last member of the investigation team to awaken to their persona. So what impression do we get before then, and what do we know about him exactly? Well, when first arriving into the TV world, despite him thinking that you must be the killers, he doesn't let his gut feeling dictate action. I think that's something really important to note. I mean, think about it. If someone was throwing people into your world and killing people, I imagine you'd be more defensive. But Teddy, while he's very doubtful of you, is mostly curious and skeptical of the crew, opting to give them a chance at proving their innocence. I think this shows Teddy's general optimism and willingness to see the potential hope in people and their situations, but almost more importantly, it shows his ability to grow and change his opinion, which is very important to his character arc. Teddy operates as the general guide to the TV world early in the game, although most of what he dishes out is spoken with uncertainty. The more that he's questioned by the investigation team, the more Teddy starts to question it himself. For what reason does he not know? How long has he been there exactly? When did he start being there? And the most pressing of questions, why is he there? What's his purpose? His reason for existing? Well, while I planned on putting it later into the Teddy segment initially, I think for the sake of efficiency and fully understanding his character, I'm going to have to go through the explanation that we are given for Teddy on a metaphysical level first something we don't learn until much later in the game. But I'm gonna cover it now and add some other inherent aspects of his character that we can draw conclusions on based on the things we already know about the world of Persona 4. I've come to the conclusion that this will make it the most easy to understand Teddy's actions going forward. Teddy is a shadow. The reason he has no memory is because he took no action. He had no free will, no waxing or waning, he just was. Somewhere along the line though, Teddy began to grow desire, desire outside of his archetype, which we never actually see in the game. He sought to grow relationships, something archetypes are inherently incapable of, as archetypes are already associated with other archetypes in an infinite and unchanging capacity. 
The only exception to this rule, really, is when one archetype becomes another through completing their arc. For example, Satanta in many of the SMT and Persona games can turn into Suchelaine, as the archetypal story that the archetypes are based on are actually the same character, at different phases in their life. In the Irish story, Satanta slays the guard dog and becomes the replacement for that dog. Satanta becomes Chulain's hound, Su Chulain. We don't know who or what Teddy was before growing an ego, but that's actually thematically relevant to his search and seemingly finding nothing of himself within. We know instead that the form Teddy takes is using the ideas of the public subconscious of likable, friendly characters. His design as a bear was taken on to be friendly and likable from Teddy's understanding of the subconscious. Because Teddy's idea of a friendly and likable character comes from Japanese subconscious, one might wonder why this goofy mascot bear appearance, but it's actually really well supported because he is a Yurukara. In Japan, there is a subset of mascots made to basically promote and be friendly and welcoming to you all over the prefectures and even in small shops. Unique characters with big eyes, often worn in costumes to promote anything at local fairs or promotional events. From a single ramen shop to a farm to a train to an entire prefecture or city, the reference would be more blatant for Japanese audiences, obviously, since Teddy's Japanese name is Kuma, which literally just means bear. It's the Japanese word for bear. He's a bear. Get it? But you're probably wondering why that's important. No, the reason this is significant, that he's called Kuma, that he is a bear, is that the most popular Yurukara character is Kumamon, a black bear valued at over 100 billion yen, or roughly 870 million USD. You would be probably pretty hard pressed to find a local Japanese person who doesn't know about Kumamon. So, of course, when a shadow looked upon the public subconscious of Japan for a symbol of friendly, lovable characters, this is the answer Teddy would stumble upon. So, now that we established the game's origin for Teddy, as well as the more lore and meta reasons for his appearance and namesake, let's get back to his in-game arc, and use this information as a launching pad. Teddy's general character arc takes place during the Risei dungeon, and reaches through much of the idle space between there and Kubo's dungeon, with some final revelations and conclusions being made after Heaven and before Magatsu Inaba. Teddy acts alongside Marie as two perspectives on a character arc that balances with the theme of reconciling your true self. In both the case of Marie and Teddy, they seek to ask a variation of the question that the game continually asks us with Teddy asking, how do you find your true self when you feel like the you deep down isn't stable enough to be a well-rounded person? How do you find your true self when you're not even sure what you are? And with Marie, how do you be your true self when you don't identify with, accept, or truly hold in common the values that once made you you? Like many of the characters in Persona 4, Teddy grapples with identity, but with him, it's less about grappling with the sides of himself that he is embarrassed by or shuns, and more him gaining confidence to be the self he feels he is, when he's not sure there are any other sides at all. Anything deep down. This, of course, makes the most sense to parallel his struggle with Risei's, which is where his arc primarily takes place. Risei's arc, more than anyone in Persona 4, grapples with the idea of the many Risei's that exist within her, with her arc more or less being to understand how each of those sides make up pieces of the true, real her. Teddy then, as you go through Risei's dungeon, is constantly responding to the taunts of Shadow Risei, as all navigators do typically with shadows. But this time, you mainly get two responses from Teddy. One is talking about how he's feeling dizzy or drunk and how he believes that they should turn back for the day since he's feeling off. And the second feeling, which is basically to nullify the first, he passes on it with the excitement by the goading on of Shadow Risei and the obvious sexual undertones. Once the battle with Risei is concluded, Shadow Risei prepares for her ultimate counterattack. One shot takes the investigation team out in a cutscene. And so, Teddy, in desperation and wanting to do something to save them, if you tell him to save himself, he refuses to abandon you. He doesn't want to be alone again. And to prove it, he takes his action and stakes his whole life on it. Shadows lack an ego, and therefore lack the ability to grow and change. They are stuck in their archetypes. The ability of a shadow to act on their acquired knowledge is to cement the idea of a shadow's ego. Teddy already had partly formed his ego when we first met him. 
his appearance being debatable proof by itself. He also shows healthy skepticism and seeks to understand the situation, which fundamentally means that he can radically change and is willing to undergo this growth. This change does happen as his curiosity and doubts toward you and the party continue through Yukiko's dungeon, with him mentioning how he still had his doubts about you before you rescue her. He, however, believes that you are good eventually and aims to help you for the first time truly on your side during Kanji's dungeon. Something about the constant jabs at Teddy not being human and being called a bear, just generally not treated friendly like the subconscious led him to believe, causes him to question his form, his origin, and what exactly he was, since he acted more human than shadow, but looked more shadow than human. Those doubts draw his dizziness, and once he cements his ego by saving the crew, his doubts are able to manifest as a separate shadow to self. But this shadow says a lot about Teddy, more than just the insecurity and doubt he's feeling. The voice inside Teddy's head whispers fears of uselessness and of being nothing of value. It twists the truth of Risei's revelation of there being no deep down, no real her, into a literal interpretation that misses her point entirely. Teddy's inner self sees this as verification of insecurity, but it's interesting to note the calm, logical, emotionless personality taking the eyes of the later to come Sagiri fights. This is the first pushback from the game over the concept of truth and finding yourself directly, and could be implied to be the first threat sent by Izanami, just as Marie was a dwarf of Izanami through her ego, and sharing a similar arc to Teddy, Teddy could have also come from Izanami's pieces thematically, or have been one of the many unnamed grandchildren who existed in the Kojiki and Nihon Shoki alongside Amino Sagiri and Kunino Sagiri. Although, I have an idea for a more specific god that he might be a reference to. The game supports this theory with Chie asking if this is Teddy's hidden thoughts, but Risei responds that it seems that the shadow Teddy is only part of what they're seeing, that there seems to be a much more powerful force intervening. With the things that are to be stated, as well as what I've already mentioned, the game clearly is pointing toward one obvious conclusion, of this being Izanami intervening. Although a first-time player obviously wouldn't be privy to that. Another good example of this consistent writing in Persona 4, and not feeling the need to give all of the info at once in P4. Instead, leaving pieces to understand later, perhaps on a second playthrough. Other Teddy, notably not called Shadow Teddy, mentions how, though we may have the ability to grasp onto something, we lack the means to know it is the truth that we're grasping. And this is true, but only in technicality. This idea was most recently popularized by the philosopher David Hume, known mostly for his religious criticisms, but in this case, it refers to something he coined the problem of induction. That is, in summary, because the future has never happened, it is impossible to give an inductive inference of the things that will come to be. Using past experience is volatile to grasping the truth of the future, because past experience is always in the past, and things to come have never happened. Honestly, I think this is an embarrassingly pretentious and ridiculous argument, even if Hume has done well in other respects and arguments. The crux of this argument is essentially taking the abstract lingual terms of past, present, and future and applying them as literal constructs rather than the abstract descriptions of events that they are. It is true that since the future is always unknown, that we are always not certain about anything in the future. But it isn't true that the future has never happened. The future is always happening, always changing into what we are calling the present and the past. If the future never had truly happened under Hume's argument, then we needn't worry about it because it's never going to happen. That's the problem with this Hume argument. You must both worry about the future, but also double down that it has never happened. No. Since time is, roughly speaking, a repeating sequence, we can in fact ascertain a rough idea of what will happen, or the truth, through inductive inference, aka past experience and experiential evidence. Because there's no reason with past evidence to think the future will change its pattern in transformation to the present. In fact, there's as much, if not more so, reason to believe it will stay the same. Going back to John Locke on objectivity, or more so, certainty, once again paraphrasing, 100% certainty is unobtainable, because we can never know if we don't know something of everything, and that something can always hypothetically exist. But, 
Certainty in the practical sense, also called objectivity, is not determined by 100%. It's determined by the most substantiated, least contradicted logical conclusion of a given situation or subject. In other words, we both have the ability to grasp through the murk and the ability to ascertain enough details to pursue one over the other. We have the rubric to find truth. Truth is therefore not unobtainable. It's something hard to obtain, sure, maybe impossible to obtain entirely, but not something impossible to run towards or to understand more today than the day before. Reality is real, and our ability to ascertain things about it can be proved wrong. The ability to think itself proves truth exists and is determinable. Anyways, Other Teddy uses this far outdated philosophical perspective on truth to argue that you should close your eyes, lie to yourself, and live in blissful ignorance purposefully. That it's a smarter way to live. Obviously, no. There is far more value, far more things to experience, far greater possibilities given for understanding how to engage with the world. Shutting out all of life leads to a small, contained, circular, and bland existence. Living in intentional ignorance is no smarter than it is more fun. It's a sad way to live, a way so sad that to exist at all is to make compromise on that very belief. While Teddy responds with his misunderstanding and claims to be trying his best to understand, the other Teddy points that this exact effort to understand is what's pitiable and should be avoided. Which, yeah, of course this is just more of the earlier garbage, but other Teddy uses this to bounce into a different angle of this idea which I think reflects another thought that was popular for the time. He reaffirms that Teddy is hollow, empty, that he has no meaning but seeks one as a desperate denial of his nature. The other Teddy reveals that Teddy has no lost memories, and that the only thing he's forgotten is that he is nothing, that he has no purpose or intended meaning. We know now what he's about to say, with retrospect of finishing the game, that he's going to say, you are but a mere shadow. Teddy understands what's about to be said, and cuts him off, turning from blissfully ignorant to immediately aggressive. But it also lets us in on knowing Teddy does have an idea of who or what he is all along, but that he just wanted more. These inner thoughts keep telling him it's impossible though, even though he dreams of being so much greater than he is. This idea of being inherently without meaning and having to find our own, or how much that is even worth doing, goes back to Jean-Paul Sartre, a Frenchman from the Depression era of France in the height of the 1930s and through the mid and late 1940s, who is famous for formalizing the belief of existentialism. You know, existentialism, that word that people claim everything in media is when they want to sound deep, but most of the time is just something depressing or causes a feeling of dread rather than anything to do with the actual philosophy? Well, here's the actual existentialism, or at least the aspects that are relevant to Persona 4. Sartre claims that since there is no god, humans were born without purpose. He claims that only created things can have a definitive purpose, like a shovel's purpose is to dig holes. If it were not for needing this problem solved, the invention of the shovel as we know it would have never existed. But here we are, existing seemingly with no directive, completely unlike the shovel, no inherent problem that we are made to fix, at least in Sartre's perspective. Sartre also believed that since we do not have inherent human directive, that every action we make mars the meaning of what it is to be human onto our understanding. In other words, the things humans do are inherently human, no matter what they do. Then he questioned himself, if we are all human, what gives a single person the right to act and define another human by their actions? So since in Sartre's perspective, acting any which way seems to violate the rights of other humans, but we must act to exist, the ultimate question of existentialism became, should we or should we not kill ourselves? because suicide is an action, but it also prevents other actions. Is it the most sensible conclusion to take? This logic is also heavily flawed, but this is a Persona 4 analysis, not a debunking bad philosophers who were popular at some point video. So I hope that you can see the parallels to the other Teddy here. Teddy seeks to have a meaning that the other Teddy insists there isn't, as they both know that he is a shadow, an archetype meant to fill a specific role, with no life, no growth, and no personal perspective allowed. He's like a shovel who desires to start a family, a ridiculous idea from their perspective. 
or like humans who have no direct inalienable purpose, something inherently left to our decision through our free will or perception of it. So Teddy could, in a sense, be seen as taking the third option offered outside of existentialism, often called absurdism and coined by Albert Camus. That because life is crazy and filled with these contradictions, why not face the world head on? But still, this is not a valuable perspective to take, because it insists upon the premises of existentialism being true in the first place. You could see Teddy as avoiding the existential by pursuing the absurd, before realizing that none of this has to necessarily be true, and instead, he chooses to focus on the practical, what's in front of him, the existence he desires and the wishes that he wants to become true. This is something affirmed by him becoming human, truly, later on. But I'm really starting to get away from myself. Basically, other Teddy is doo-doo poo-poo bad ideas, and Teddy can be whatever Teddy decides. Other Teddy insists upon granting them all one truth, that they will die here, going more into the existentialism theming. Next is possibly my favorite, if not then in the top three of my favorite boss designs in Persona 4, with giant Teddy coming up from the crater with a shattered face revealing nothing inside but his Amino Sagiri-like eyes. Something to note about this crater is that it could be another reference back to how Shadow Teddy was being assisted by Izanami to create the other Teddy we saw before the fight. It gives an idea that maybe Teddy was born of one of the dwarves given by Izanami, that initially he was supposed to serve Izanami, guarding the Shadow World, but eventually grew his own free will. Why does the gorge he's crawling out of possibly refer back to this? Well, the sixth child of Oyamatsumi, child of Izanami, alongside Amino Sagiri and Kunino Sagiri that we see in the game, was also named Kunino Kurado, who is the god of the gorge, the great steep abyss, the fallen land. For Shadow Teddy crawls out of this gorge, is symbolized even in his shadow to be escaping out of Izanami's initial influence into his own being. Also present on the Sagiris could be that other power of Izanami resting inside of him that Risei detected, and giving more credence to the visual imagery of Teddy wearing a costume, being not hollow, but filled with fog, filled with the influence of Izanami. This would make sense for why there's a black void inside of Teddy, rather than actually being hollow as the game says, and being able to see inside of him. Aside from the gorge in place of the pole, the arena remains the same as the Risei fight, but it also contributes to the game's intentional parallels between the way that Risei and Teddy's struggles are polar opposites. While Risei was concerned with the other selves taking stage in her life, Teddy fears that there are no other selves, no self at all, to take the stage. Making the pole in the center of the stage into an empty gaping hole now suddenly follows a very clean parallel. After the fight, Teddy accepts that it's okay for him not to know himself, but that he lives, and him living and experiencing the world, knowing others, will naturally give him the equipment he needs to understand himself, and even to just decide who he wants to be. This revelation then awakens in him his new persona. Teddy's initial persona is Kintoki Doji, the name of a popular folklore character, Kintaro, after meeting and then accompanying Minamoto no Yorimitsu to Kyoto. Before meeting Minamoto no Yorimitsu, Kintaro was called the Golden Boy, often depicted with a bib with the character Kane for money or gold. When combined with other characters, it often takes on the reading of Kin, meaning gold. Therefore, Kin Taro, with the last two kanji making up Futo or fat, and Iratsuko or Lo in the first reading. It would refer to young boy or young lad, while the second reading can be referred to as retainers, followers, and vassals. So. It's kind of fun! The last kanji of his name both refers to him being a little boy, and to his eventual retainership with Minamoto no Yorimitsu. Enough about the name though. He was often described with a red bib with gold written on the front, and abnormally strong, using a tomahawk to take down any enemy. He lived in the mountains far away from other people, but when by happenstance Yorimitsu found him, he saw his strength and asked for help. That's when his name changed to reflect Teddy's persona. I think the parallels are actually quite clear here. While Teddy's clothing being red with gold lining, not counting his blue fur, as well as him being isolated in the TV world like Kintaro was in the woods, and after finding Sensei, or you, decides to join you and come back. This was, of course, after he proved his strength, 
which Teddy does by saving the party and notably by choosing to be alone and work to improve himself or become strong before crossing over to Kyoto or Inaba as a member of the investigation team or as the retainer. It lines up pretty perfectly. Of course, this intersects smoothly with Teddy's own character arc wanting to become strong and defend those he cares about, as well as understand himself without becoming too frustrated in the process. Kintoki Doji, as a persona, takes on a short stout or fat build made of metal. The red coverage with the gold line pattern on the front is also reminiscent of both Teddy and Kintaro's colors in regards to the suit and the bib. The front is also a safety hatch, and a safe pretty much universally represents valuables, goods, or important things left in safekeeping, which is likely a heartwarming resolve to Teddy that he isn't hollow inside or meaningless, but that his value is worth cherishing and protecting. It also, like the suit he already wears, could imply something likely literally being inside Teddy, that is, the body that he ends up growing after we leave him to train. The missile he carries in his hand is a Tomahawk missile, referencing King Taro's Tomahawk, while still managing to keep up the industrial themes and aesthetics. And aside from the blue cape representing his blue fur, and maybe being a reference to him serving Yorimitsu, it could also refer to Yorimitsu as he's always drawn in blue clothes, something expensive and hard to obtain in olden times due to the rareness of the dye and the frequency of it to fade. As you go to leave Teddy, he confides in you motivation now, and how you make him want to grow stronger, and your social link then goes up for a second time. Teddy's social link is one that progresses naturally with the arc of the story, and so due to covering the story in another segment, I'll try to only mention the parts that are relevant and important to his character insight specifically. You know, not to be too redundant. When meeting up after Motooka's death, Teddy is found to have crossed over into Inaba for the first time and is revealed, secondly, that he has his own physical body. This is sort of the ultimate KO in Teddy fighting to become human and developing an ego. The TV world is the level of the subconscious, a place housing the psychological aspects of ourselves within our minds. The place for our souls below reality, so to speak. That's why on their own, a shadow cannot cross over to the real world. They must have an ego, and to have both an ego and a shadow is to be, at least in technicality, psychologically human. He also got the appearance of an attractive, somewhat androgynous and twinkish boy, made very clear by how the game depicts him in an explicitly sensual context and by making Yukiko and Chie flustered by it. This can be taken as another of the ways that Teddy understood the look of a likable person through the subconscious, first as a Yudokara and now as a cute boy. During the really yucky Chie money moment, you also get a few observations of Teddy from the cast, which makes sense but don't overall add up. They mention how apparently Teddy was blabbering in the women's section about something, and Yukiko says it's not a big deal since it is his first time in the real world. But I think the amount that you buy into these statements is, for a lot of people, the general rule for how much you like or dislike Teddy. If he is just the ignorant, forever-a-boy Peter Pan archetype, then it's hard, if even fair, to judge and interpret his actions as in bad, cruel taste. If he's really just a puppy stuffed into a grown dog's body, you can't get too mad whenever he chews on the couch. The thing is, though, the game seems to intentionally make vague if this is the case or not, in order to excuse Teddy's actions as sort of a fanservice character that replaces Yosuke's sketchy actions as the game continues. It also lets him fill the roles that Yosuke isn't willing to go so far to do. Even this scene reinforces that, as with Teddy's introduction and first crazy moment, it's Yosuke positioned in these scenes as the sane rational one, not approving of the situation. It's a passing of the torch, in a way, toward fleshing Yosuke into more than his basic setup of comic and relief elements. How they solve this dilemma of passing the buck to Teddy is kind of weird, though. On one hand, he does a lot in the Peter Pan archetype, or the newborn grown boy excited to see the world, but you also have to remember that he was a shadow. And both his costume and human appearances are based on the mass collection of human subconscious knowledge that he used to construct himself. He had a reason for making himself look how he did. He's never seen this side with his own eyes, sure, but he has a grasp on at least the mental faculties of humans, what is considered cute or ugly, what is considered friendly or rude. He should have awareness of social acceptability. That's a basic cousin of why he even has his appearance, after all. And yet, he seems to push the limits of social acceptability many times in the game. 
Is this due to him also absorbing the subconscious thoughts of more bad people as well? That could be implied, but there's not a lot of evidence explicitly in the game to corroborate that view, so a lot of the time it comes down to personal interpretation. It's very rare that Persona 4 does that too, leaving something not inconsequential to character interpretation up for grabs and personal viewpoint. You have to remember, there's never really any seeming misunderstanding on Teddy's part outside of these scenes. He even famously, or infamously, makes constant puns, and not just about bears either. The coherent understanding of a language, being able to consistently make puns in Japanese where the multiple levels of formality and social acceptability are somewhat baked into the language, and still miss some points consistently, seems more like he doesn't take what he's doing wrong seriously, and is using his perceived idiocy as a crutch or excuse. The main reason why this seems more suspicious is that his constant and consistent misunderstandings or offenses are almost always in relation to women. Some of the comments Teddy makes, like scoring with a hot stud or a date with Chie, are actually both perfectly appropriate from a meta writing standpoint. Sure, they stand as recurring jokes, but that isn't really their point in the story. Yukiko excluding Teddy in her princes, and Chie constantly shutting him down and ignoring Teddy by calling him not human, while he was earnest in his bear form, is now being flipped on them. It's sort of like getting their just desserts. It's a mutual exchange of teasing. Same with Yosuke to an extent. He didn't treat Teddy as harshly or callously as Chie, but he still actively engaged in dehumanizing and teasing him, which Teddy is now able to get revenge on, but the way that Teddy does it with Yosuke is often really out of hat, especially considering Yosuke is giving Teddy a place to work, live, and eat. And in exchange, Teddy shows off Yosuke's porn magazines to his parents, blames Yosuke for his own perverted actions, and tries to shift the blame of his actions onto Yosuke as often as he can. The fact that he can assume being innocent while painting Yosuke as the other perverted person shows that he has knowledge of what he is doing and how it comes across to others. The game paints very heavily that Teddy is aware of how people see his actions and chooses to push the line as far as he can anyway. And listen, I'm not just here to do a big rant about Teddy, but I do think it's important we do our best to understand him. I'm not going to be redundant and go through everything, but I will say most of these moments seem to be painted with a sort of teasing manner, just sort of comments between friends, really not anything that weird, especially given the mutual back and forth nature of it, since other characters Teddy teases often are teasing him too. But aside from Yosuke, there is at least one more case where Teddy goes too far for me to possibly justify. Rise is probably the most sexually open character in the game. At least she's not bothered by little comments and generally puts plenty of comments out there herself. She also generally has a friendly relationship with Teddy, not teasing him, and instead is very supportive toward him in most cases. So it feels extra ickier to me whenever his grossest sexual moment is toward Rise. After Teddy disappears and everyone is glad to see him finally alive, Rise starts hugging him and saying how she missed him. Then he gropes her and she smacks him. What? I don't know. However which way I try to reason or cut this in my mind, this just seems unacceptable. Like, Teddy doesn't take sexual harassment seriously, or he thinks he's immune for some reason or another to the consequences, especially with what I believe is the most substantiated interpretation of his character. He did that on purpose, and with full intent, and even if the subconscious argument didn't exist, this moment is still extremely late in the game where he has been chastised for much, much less and continues to push things further regardless of what he's been told. With this context, we also get into his relationship with Nanako. I will say Teddy doesn't seem like the sort of person to ever bring harm or any ill will to Nanako. He literally gives up his life to bring her back, and his promises to keep her company brings him to tears thinking of how he might fail her or the others. Teddy does have a heart of gold inside of his weird bare exterior, and the culmination of his character arc is very much launched by this set of events. And on the flip side, Nanako really likes Teddy too, whether it be because of his childlike nature or his natural whimsy and wonder for the world. A curiosity shown to be a big part of Nanako's character, it makes sense why they get along well. Teddy is dedicated to the people that he cares about and would never let someone do anything to make his friends uncomfortable, even if he himself sometimes crossed that line. 
A notable act of good that Teddy does is spending days straight to take care of you whenever you get a bad cold on the true route of Persona 4. You are bedridden for days, but while other friends come to help you, Teddy has to do his best of aiding your recovery for days straight. Once you're finally better, he's collapsed and is sleeping from exhaustion. That is a worthy trait in a friend, for sure. Not even mentioning that that's not nearly as big as giving up your life entirely to bring back another person you care for. I think some people wouldn't be able to do that no matter what, or when faced with the chance, would struggle or think to change it. But Teddy wishes that he could do anything to bring her back, and the feeling in his heart verified that he meant it. Teddy's return in conversation with you doesn't really give much more insight than I've already covered in the beginning explanation for who he is near the beginning, but I think Teddy concludes and awakens to his second persona like this. He has struggled with valuelessness, not being wanted, important, or needed, being useless all throughout the game while questioning his own existence and value. Finally, while always seeking that affirmation that they didn't want to get rid of him over and over, he lets sink in his value as a person and the value that he brings to other people he cares about most. He evolves first into Kamui, a god of bears among the Ainu people, but since his second and third form are fairly similar, I'll ask that you refer to the segment on Ultimate Personas for that information in detail as not to be redundant here. Teddy's place after rejoining the group and reawakening to his ultimate persona remains the same. Lighthearted and goofy, not being too serious over things that aren't absolutely required, but taking the full measure to protect the people who helped him find his meaning. Even in the final cutscene, he is still around and determined to stay. Teddy has finally grown and finally become what he wanted, his own person. A being with the ability to grow and change, able to learn new things and understand life for himself. Teddy is the star arcana of Persona 4. They say the stage of the star is achieved through the two previous stages of spiritual enlightenment, the devil with the consciousness of bondage and the tower with the awakening and realization. The star is the stage of inner revelation. Teddy realized he was bound to the shadow world. No longer did he aimlessly exist in the space, but became conscious of his loneliness. Then, as he thought of who he wanted to be, he realized he was not whatever that was. He dealt with the rude awakening, but had a revelation that he could make a change within himself, causing himself to eventually become human, as we saw. This card is ruled by Aquarius, often associated with meditation, which Teddy embarks on after Risei's dungeon, telling the others to leave him alone with other things to think about for a while, and that he has a lot of work to do while he starts doing his sit-ups. This also connects to the Star Arcana's Hebrew letter Sari, which is a fish hook. The meaning of which is we cast the fish hook into our own minds to pull out the deeper held truth of ourselves. The pool of water we see in the card is the same meaning as from Ai Ebihara or the Moon's Arcana, and many others. It represents not just the pool of our own mind, but of the public subconscious as a whole. Fitting for someone who lived within that realm, and is attempting to fish themselves out of it, so to speak. The one foot on land and one foot in the water also represents the balance between one's unconscious and conscious mind. For Teddy in particular, this could refer to Teddy continuously returning to the world of the subconscious after finding his place outside of it, or of how he started as purely an unconscious mind, but grew an ego and was able to reach out of the water. On the lower polarity, this represents the search for guidance and truth from the outside world, from other perspectives often being led astray. And on the higher polarity, it is the finding of a stabilizing truth within, the parts that are true about you. You can play this information somewhat parallel to Teddy's other self, parroting that the truth is unattainable and that you will never have the means to grasp through the murk. But what if the answer then is simply to reach within yourself instead, so you can walk around through the murk unobstructed? Mini games! Woo! You're probably thinking, what mini games? Mini games are grab bag in Persona 4, and I'm personally glad that they exist. The fishing game is a little challenging and a little relaxing. The gameplay is not monotonous and doesn't waste your time too much, aside from trying to hurry and skip through menus and sometimes having the dialogue boxes hold out for a second longer than they feel like they should have. Fishing is the best mini game type element outside of shuffle time that the game offers. To do this effectively though, you need to catch bugs. The bug minigame I also found enjoyable, as brief and simple as it is. Basically, it's a one-note rhythm game where your timing discerns your success. Wait for the thing to blink, hit the button, easy enough. And I think a fair separation from standard gameplay loop, if just to mix things up for a moment. 
The worst thing, which probably shouldn't even be considered a minigame though, is the gotcha turn for Persona figures in Okina City. The dialogue boxes move painfully slow and operate completely on random chance. They don't take any day slot or skill, thank goodness, but because of this, it makes them feel like they are simply time-wasting garbage. Button mashing to get through as quickly as you can also barely helps too, because each message wants to have a dramatic pause and ellipsis. Probably doesn't count as a minigame, but hey, there was no reason to introduce it as such a joyless and obnoxious manner if you're gonna have it. Might as well give it some sort of minigame or give it a straightforward purchase option. Sayoko Uehara, or that creepy nurse who... <laughs> ...is probably one of the most dismissed and least stood up for characters in Persona 4 Golden. And I don't mean just as a person, but also in terms of character writing. And honestly... I can't blame people, as her initial impression is blatant indecency toward a high schooler, which is kind of multiplied in creepiness by the fact that she refers to him as a child after, quote-unquote, showing him all the muscles on his body. And while I could try, theoretically, to talk about the time that this game came out, possible cultural excuses or explanations, I really don't have any interest in doing that because what she does here is creepy, and also wrong, and I don't think that should be excused, and I'm... As much as I love this game and so many things about it, I'm not gonna go to bat for things that are just this blatant. However, I still think dismissing her character and her addition to the story as just as some creepy or pedophilic nurse from Persona 4 is neglectful to her character, but more importantly, what she offers to the story and narrative. You see, the indecency that starts our social link is only really the hook for her character and does not remain a major part of the link. It clears up pretty soon after you enter it. So let's talk about who she is and what really drives her, as well as the way that she changes herself for the better as she goes on. After your initial intimate session with her, she notes how you seem different, and it feels like there's something inside of you, like a secret that you're not sharing. Sure, this could be interpreted negatively as some kind of grooming or flirtiness, but I think it's really just the first touch at her deeper personal hang-ups and her own character arc. From a character writing standpoint, I want to say that I think the idea of making a nurse struggle with insecurity over aging and loneliness was a brilliant choice on behalf of Persona 4's writers. Her job, as she muses on about, perfectly visualizes her insecurity in her everyday work life. Her actions as a nurse are to help people who are hurt, and when they get better, they leave her. Her job is to give people love for the goal of being left behind. And for someone who gets so easily attached and cares so deeply, this breaks Sayako's heart time and time again. This loneliness takes hold of her as she tries to seek refuge in the only relationships that don't leave immediately, that of her co-workers. She's a huge flirt, in other words, even being transferred to Inaba Hospital only because of an affair that a married doctor had with her that the doctor's wife sought to punish. Something I always found really notable and unique about her character is the way that she denies and tries to play off her serious feelings as jokes, or non-permanent parts of herself. It's a coping mechanism that when she says, does, thinks, expresses an idea, she feels a fear to commit to it, when all she really wants desperately is an idea to commit to her. She expresses early on that she feels spite towards the younger generation, yearns and takes pleasure in seeing them fail and ruined, even saying that she's talking about you to some extent, which gives a darker and malicious tone to her previous flirty actions. But she follows things up, making sure to note that she's joking. She probably doesn't mean it, but she does feel it on some level. She feels like she had a bright future once, full of opportunity and desire to help people, but now mess up after mess up, every procrastination, poorly thought out encounter, after failing to her loneliness, she's in a swirling mess of adulthood, getting older and older with none of her solutions found. It's terrifying. The game never specifies her exact age, but 
Due to the way she talks and the years of experience matched with the fact that she's finished nursing school at her youngest, she was probably in her late 20s, but possibly now in her mid 30s or even later. And what of it? She's still single with no one to love, no one to welcome her home or care about her. She's been punished and sent to a small town too, with barely any single people her age to meet. Older doctors are married, and younger part-time workers are, well, they shouldn't be considered in her age range. She wants that emotional depth too, not just a sexual pleasure. She wants a place to belong, to be needed, which I think is really relatable as a central theme, and this is driven home more and more in her rank six, when she finally finds out about a previous child patient she cared for who died while she had been transferred. This news disturbs her, because she feels like she maybe is part of the thing that she finds spite in toward the world. She fears and feels malignant toward people who always leave her. She feels like a screw-up who makes everyone leave. But if anyone took the time to make her their priority, maybe she wouldn't be so alone. In this case, she realizes that she is the one who leaves too. She's not a victim of abandonment, or maybe not just that. She plays a part in it, too, and this idea finally awakens her to make a change and stop pitying and spitefully looking at the rest of the world. From here, Sayoko doesn't really know how to handle the motivation and new life purpose that she feels like she's gained. For making sure that she's always there for people, regardless of the length of the time people's lives cross. She takes her job super seriously from this point onward in her social link and eventually overworks herself. But after reanalyzing, ends up studying and becoming a doctor to work overseas helping people in disadvantaged nations. Honestly, one of the most radical changes in character you see in the game. She learns this. Abandonment is a two-way street. Sometimes you leave, sometimes others do. Sometimes it's more justified and sometimes it isn't at all. But for what happens, you at least have a role in your choice to engage. You at least have got your side of the street covered. After all, every goodbye doesn't have to be a bad one. So with that, let's try to get an insight into her greater arcana as well. Sayoko Uehara is the devil arcana that, among other things, represents herself through the arcana like this. The devil is the one who dwells on the threshold of change, someone who realizes that they are bound to something, feeling a discontentment with their life with an ache for change. These traits, of course, fit Sayoko to a T, her ache toward loneliness, her feeling of never-ending entrapment, and being left behind in her nursing job makes her feel discontentment spite for those not in her situation, and an almost undedicated hopelessness at finding a way out personally. The hand of the devil represents the material and surface level of the world, taking things at face value. This is often something that could cause a lack of inspiration or depression, which we find in Sayoko as we meet her. Reveling in the taboo of underage men, cheating with other people's husbands, using these surface level pleasures and excitements to try and cover up for her loneliness and emptiness inside. The place the devil sits is on a half cube representing incomplete or half knowledge. Sayako was shaken, feeling she was always being left by people, only to realize that she too plays half that role. On higher polarity, or the solution, the devil represents hard work and endurance. It also represents frustration that leads to action, both of which are obvious fits for her character. I should note too that while some of these may sound general, Sayoko is one of the only characters in Persona 4 who truly changes the course of her life through frustration. Most may feel confused or frustrated, normally the pattern is attempting to run but then turning to face and accept parts of themselves. Sayoko is one of the few who instead of running, are unaware of how to deal with that issue in the first place. So that's the creepy nurse, Sayoko Uehara, the devil. It wasn't until my fourth playthrough of Persona 4 Golden that I finally really sat in and listened to Naoki Konishi's words through his social link. 
I always avoided or never finished his link because of something about the multiple wasted days just to start the social link and his general wood elf appearance being off-putting to me, which is totally unfair and only cheapening the experience for myself. But it was then, after I had spent so many hundreds of hours playing the Persona series and honestly still enjoying it an absolute ton, that I finally had a moment again to feel like I understood Persona for the first time. The period I was in when I first played Persona 5 on PS3 in 2019 of May was a twisting, constant turmoil of uncertain anxiety. Following the divorce of my parents and my dropping out of college two months prior and my relying on YouTube to try and make something of myself so I didn't die of some meth overdose working at Sonic a handful of years down the line, it wasn't Persona necessarily that changed any of that in my life, of course. Persona is still a game, it's media. It was dedication and work, a bunch of luck, and some extremely reckless persistence that got me where I was. Primarily unrelated to Persona, you could maybe even say, but the reflective nature of the characters that let me understand new, unique perspectives on real human situations drove me emotional so many times on understanding my own life's experience. I remember the first time playing Persona 5 when Futaba hugged me at the end of her link and inexplicably noted to herself that she was crying, even though she was happy, for finally conquering her anxiety and having a person to rely on, for not wanting to die anymore. I remember bawling at that scene and so many scents in Persona have brought me to tears and reinvigorated the joy in me that is to continue living and trying. Everything gets old though, and after I had begun to think that I had scrubbed this series for all its best personal moments, as late as September of 2021, Naoki Konishi made me ball again. The reason I mention this and give such a big foreword and context where I haven't done on any of the other segments is because it was actually his story that made me want to do an analysis on him specifically, but I knew that not enough people would see it. Not enough would appreciate it. So, in a way, it was that moment that inspired me to make the first true semi-comprehensive analysis of Persona 4 Golden. At least as much as I could think to do, and definitely more than currently exists, at least in video form. But I've seen the Japanese side of the internet, and I'd take that for in general as well. Not just recapping the story 80% of the time with an occasional non-analytical opinion thrown in, or not just rambling some half-constructed review for 40 minutes throwing in jokes that actively contradict details of the story with some positives and negatives listed for a standard video analysis these days. I wanted to do a proper analysis. Here's a fun bit of trivia. Who are the first 10 characters you meet in Inaba? Dojima, Nanako, Marie, and Golden, the gas attendant, wink wink, maybe a nameless NPC or two, but before you even get to Dojima's house, for the first time, when he gives you the opportunity to walk around because Nanako realizes that you seem sick, and you don't realize it, but you meet Naoki and Saki Konishi. This is the only time they are ever seen in the game together. The only raw, momentary minute you can capture their lives personally before death rips them along other sides of the river for the rest of Naoki's numbered life. And what they say alludes to one of the most significant lines in Persona 4 Golden for me. But this isn't all about me, believe it or not. It's about Naoki. So for now, put a pin in that. Shelve that. We'll be getting back to it later. Naoki Konishi is the brother of the second murder victim in Inaba, which is probably how he in Inaba has gotten used to being referred to as. But as he no doubt yearns for acknowledgement of more than just that, Naoki Konishi is a brother and a son, the son of the family Konishi Liquors store in the North Shopping District, that like many other shops in Inaba, is having a hard time financially surviving with the Super Center Juness having moved into town roughly a year before the player character Yu begins his story. Unlike many local businesses, they've managed to stay afloat just barely while being unable to keep up with the options and prices presented at Juness. Naoki Konishi is Saki's junior and helps out with the nurse's office at the Yasu Inaba High School, in which he also attends. 
His outside nature is generally standoffish, not overtly friendly or trusting, not that he thinks lowly of others, but that he doesn't warm easily to them. He has a negative impression of what people's intents or thoughts may be. When people's intents seem skewed or inauthentic, aside from his social link and school appearances, he is nearly entirely absent from the main story, which I think contributes to his feeling of standoffishness and self-isolation. But he's so much more than that, as we come to find out. Naoki Konishi's story, I'd say in a nutshell, is about a unique struggle to understand his own personal grief when it doesn't line up with the truth about a grieving son that he's seen in TV and movies, and his journey to accept what happened in his own way before grabbing his own life and learning to live as himself again. You initially meet Naoki when King Moron forces you to assist in the nurse's office in June. You find out they asked for assistance in order to not burden Naoki while he grieves. This claustrophobic, pitying atmosphere is exuded from all of them for a bit, going on about how he can't be helped and Naoki needs to be left alone before Naoki walks in and apologizes for being late. The atmosphere immediately changes whenever he comes in and they essentially shoo him away, saying he doesn't need to push himself and he can focus more on the family business instead. Not stating the obvious reason, but making the reason obvious nonetheless. When he says he doesn't want to be the only one not doing anything, they throw him on cleaning duty with you and then they quickly leave. It's clear they're avoiding him like the plague, maybe out of giving him room? But this really just seems like an excuse not to make themselves uncomfortable or accidentally say something that hits a wrong nerve. They don't want to envelop themselves in his grief that they have perceived. He immediately introduces himself to you, then mentions how you must have knew his sister and affirms that you're friends with Yosuke before saying he hates you and asking to leave after all. Having you do all of the work, despite him offering to help, this initially seems really unreasonable and rude and I think puts a lot of people off from actively trying to pursue him, which you have to do more than any other link if you want to actually get to know him. This really, though, is explained and elaborated on later, and through context clues you might be able to already form a decent guess for how and why he feels this way, given who he is, and how Yosuke is perceived in regards to Juness in the shopping district. Combined with knowing at this point that Saki didn't like Yosuke, it's hard to know how much Naoki was told by his now-gone sister. The second push to link with Naoki is an event where the infirmary members are called to help. If you say, let's go, he bluntly refuses and says he'll go alone. But irritatingly, a student comes up to tell you, you have the role of filling for an absent member in again, despite the absent member Naoki standing right next to you. In the infirmary, people are complaining about being drafted in whenever they had other after-school plans, and how Naoki has things easy now because he can avoid responsibility, which is, like, weird on multiple levels. They are a part of the reason that he has it easy, because they shoo him away whenever he shows up, and then the obvious death being way harder of a burden than some after-school chores, then the gossiping escalates. You are given the option to reproach them, and hopefully you do. Uh, they're being stupid after all, but after that, Naoki steps in implying that he's heard all of it and says that it's fine. Once he comes back in, the mood changes. He realizes nobody is going to act normally, so he leaves, causing the team members to resume work like clockwork. All of this is meant to drive home Naoki's perception among peers and in the town of Inaba within school. This sort of double-sided jealousy and crushing pity that he never asked or leaned in to receive either of. After seeing that Naoki had been hanging around outside by himself out of some feeling of obligation not to get off with the free time when others don't, paints this picture of someone who is intentionally trying to treat himself as he views as fair because nobody else seems to want to hold him to it. We haven't started his social link officially yet, and we already are seeing this yearning to re-normalize his life, at least in how he's perceived, because being left alone out of pity is still being left alone. It's lonely, and it's cruel. As if out of some test to you and himself, or some feeling that he helped after all, he spots some dirt on your shirt after cleaning and offers you a handkerchief. He almost opens up to you, but backs down, deciding to remain at school longer, possibly referring to him wanting to not confront his home and parents, where things are still feeling awkward. 
This handkerchief, though, is the final push you need to start the link. Upon returning the handkerchief to Naoki, he's left with some surprise, stating that you could have thrown it out, but obviously only a bad person would borrow a handkerchief, an umbrella, a textbook, the list goes on, and throw it out. That's because you're supposed to be a bad person, someone Naoki can direct his hate towards, and that's your side of the test. Naoki is now forced to recognize that you are at least a half-decent person, and gives him the excuse not to hate you. You treating him fairly by asking him to come with you to the infirmary, and you letting him leave when he asked, showed him that you neither pity nor disregard him, neither side of the double-edged blade. So finally, he feels comfortable, maybe daring to open up to you. Something people often attempt to lampshade Persona with as a whole is the criticism that in Persona, everyone just randomly chooses you as a stranger, that you're the best thing in life since sliced bread, and somehow through the basic platitudes and useless remarks or jokes, you can somehow change the perspective on their life entirely. But while this isn't totally absent from literally every social link, I think this shows the sheer extent that the story is willing to go as carefully as this encounter in order to show how your significance does make sense. And Naoki is this key example. People criticize Persona for repeating ad nauseum the same information over and over, but when the writing does savor itself in subtlety, they miss the point entirely. And I'm aware that this technical person that I'm criticizing is more of an amalgamation of criticism I've seen shifted to Persona rather than necessarily a single existing person, but I still don't think this is a straw man. There are people out there who display this inane lack of reading comprehension and hot takeifying of real artists' hard work and talent. But even if I'm aware, I thought that it was worth bringing up and refuting as Naoki is the perfect example of this complexity, and he's not an exception. Not only as a person, written by people as this segment is made to primarily discuss, but also as a character, cleverly written with unique narrative devices and for the medium that he's present for. And hey, this is an analysis after all. I'm at least attempting to be thorough. Back to where we were. Naoki makes a number of excuses for not needing the handkerchief anymore. From his mother accidentally slipping it into his bag, to no one using it anymore, to it being better for someone like you to get use out of it. But his quick run-through of all these different ideas shows his lack of commitment to really any excuse. He just doesn't want it back. Because of what it represents, and its reminder of the situation. This also is kind of a metaphor for himself as well, as he shows that he wants to return to some sort of normalcy where he can serve purpose in people's lives and not be looked down upon as a grieving brother whose sister was murdered. He is in a sense pushing that feeling onto the handkerchief that also had been branded as the dead girl's handkerchief. And nobody wants that thing anymore. It's left without use for the purpose that it was made. Still, like I said before my analytical offshoot, he realizes this means that you are a good person, and does end up thanking you, perhaps the first time that you've seen him smile this far. He apologizes for saying that he hated you, and is grateful that you didn't choose to hold it against him. Really, I think he's grateful to you that you hadn't given up on him yet. And after that, he essentially affirms the implied feelings of the previous encounters that I had already run through, and mentions being left behind again. Something that assures us that despite wanting to return to normalcy, it's not out of callousness or a lack of care for his sister. That he did love and care for his sister, but that'll be expanded upon later as well. He ends it finally suggesting that you two might be able to have fun hanging out sometime. So, the Hanged Man is in motion. Actually, saying it like that sounds a bit too dark. The next social link is in Aya, somewhere multiple important social links will be spent with Naoki. This link essentially establishes how Naoki loves eating there, but had been avoiding it since his sister died, and for all of the reasons therein. First, we get passing mention of people staring at him, which is reinforced later as another way that the pity for him has seemingly unknowingly been turned into pressure for his unhappiness. If they see him being happy even though his sister has died, they'll think badly of him, and every time they're around, they're always looking at him. He mentions how he has nothing to do at home, nothing to help with at the liquor store, being as young as he is. It gives insight into the performative nature of the obligatory kindness that he's being offered. And he mentions people coming in and sobbing, try to offer consolation, even though they never once dared talk to his sister before she died. But then, despite that, they feel the right to give empty advice to him, like, 
you should live for her sake, which isn't empty because of the quality of the words, but from whom they come from. It's honestly such a mature look at so many aspects of the grieving process and societal responses when that is mixed with a twisted sense of infamy, especially in a town where not much else happens and everyone wants to be a part of the story. It's really twisted when you take time to think about it like that, which he does, but it's also wholly natural. A really good quote I like from this rank is, living is hard, huh? Even though we're already going through it, it's like we're still learning. Since the social link and everything surrounding Naoki has been pretty heavy so far, the next rank opts to focus more on Naoki's normal side, finally getting us to see what sort of guy he is separated from the dead girl's brother. He tells a story about his friend messing with a teacher and him botching an apology because of the ridiculous reaction his actions caused being too funny to be remorseful about. And then he realizes that it's been a while since he kicked back like this and just enjoyed himself. Then the social link burns in the idea of being watched, the previous social link only mentioned in passing, with judgmental housewives, which, by the way, are the worst people in Persona 4. Like, holy crap, if there was ever someone who was wrong in Persona 4, it's the housewives. Then again, that's sort of just like a general stereotype of the gossiping housewife that you see pretty much everywhere, anywhere, all the time. Still though, like they're just making everyone feel bad all the time, but they reiterate this idea in Naoki that he isn't allowed to be happy. That feeling that he needs to suffer and grieve and never experience joy in a twisted way to honor his sister's memory. Even making assumptions about his family and the relationship he had with his sister, just because he dares to smile in public. It hurts. The next social link shows another thing that he mentioned briefly in rank two someone who barely knows him and his family, coming up to him and giving him advice on the way to live his life. But it's so judgmental, like she's his parent or something. This brings something to his character though, that we haven't been able to see yet, and sets up another upcoming link in Struggle, showing that there's actually a lot of similarity in Yosuke and Naoki's struggle. Someone that Naoki at this time believes that he hates. That is the fact that due to his parents running a business, especially one that is struggling, he has to just take the judgment and abuse. He can never stand up for himself. He can never tell people to just back off. It has a risk of harming his whole family line's business, his job, his placement, his parents' ability to make money. So not only is he subject to the lie on how grieving is supposed to work forcefully, but his hands are also tied when it comes to confronting the people pushing this lie onto him. You originally planned to eat at Aya, but with the mood ruined, you part for the day. The weirdest social link for Naoki is when you eat at Aya next. He starts with a bombshell, thinking about quitting school, that of course he decides later against. He just feels so isolated, like he's not doing anything or being allowed to do anything, and the town keeps judging every path that he takes, so this represents, for a moment, his faltering, and he reconsiders trying to lighten the hardships by going along with the lie and appeasing the thoughts of those unrelated parties. It's also the first time he directly and openly talks about his sister's death, but it's not honest. It seems regretful, at least toward the impact of her passing and how that impact on the lives of him and his family have gone, rather than him talking about the things you would imagine were more important, like the missed opportunities for everyone involved. Thankfully, when you return to Aya with him again, Naoki has no vested interest in quitting school or taking over the liquor shop. He talked with his parents, and they made it clear to him that they want him to pursue his own path in life, not just what he feels obligated towards. They accuse him of running away from school because he just doesn't like it, and while it's true that he faltered for a moment, it blindsights Naoki because it makes him realize how his eyes started to haze over. He's not like that. He says, if I needed to run, I could do it forever, saying it's possible, due to everyone's quote-unquote kindness, that he's allowed to drift by in his life right now, but he doesn't want that. Doing whatever you want for classes or clubs may sound nice, but when none of his actions have consequences, when no one tries to correct him on being right or wrong, when no one asks for his help, when they don't realize that they're removing his very purpose in life, like he doesn't exist at all, or like when Saki Konishi died, he became her ghost, like he's the one who died? 
He briefly faltered, but now he's back to a recommitment. He doesn't have an answer, but he pleads with you and himself a gaggle of questions on what he should do. He doesn't want to be even more isolated and alone. He doesn't want people to hate him, but he wants them to at least act like he's breathing the same air. He just wants to be treated fair. To Naoki, this breed of kindness is an unending cruelty. Okay, here it is. The rank that made me finally decide to undertake this giant analysis project. The progenitor, the seed of all of these months of work. Something that I think is one of the most profound and grounded takes on grief that I've ever heard analogized. Naoki apologizes for being so heavy last time, then quickly thanks you for not forcing your own ideas on him, for not being around him just out of pity, for letting him be human. He's shown himself to be a bit of an edgy troublemaker with his previous funny stories that he shared, but here he shows a more low-key side of himself by letting you know that he loves cream puffs, which in Japan are something seen as a girl's food. He talks about an intimate experience that at one point probably seemed like normal everyday life that displayed a very natural portrayal of siblings at that age. And I should know, having a younger sister. He talks about buying cream puffs and leaving them in the fridge for later, but then finding Saki to have eaten them often. My sister is like Naoki, who is also the younger sibling, and she did the same thing growing up and would get so angry when someone touched her food or drink, despite the fact that most of the time she would never touch it in the fridge and sometimes months would go by with an open can or 20 ounce bottle of soda just sitting there in the fridge. The soda long went flat. Everyone knew that she'd eventually throw it out, but she didn't want to waste it and would leave it there forever. There is a few cases with food, like wedding cake or noodles or whatnot, that would be kept in a sealed container in the back of the fridge, only to find it once it had visibly molded on from the inside of the container. I remember sneaking bites of some food after she didn't eat them for a day or so because I knew that it would be going bad otherwise, but leaving some because I didn't think she would notice, and she often didn't. So yeah, very realistic depiction of siblings, I think, here. He brings up that she would make some typical dumb excuse for her eating his stuff, like, I ate them since they were about to expire, which would lead to typical dumb sibling arguments. Which, to be fair, those were his cream puffs. It's not like it's her place to eat them. I'm totally on Naoki's side here, but this is where I think the link gets beautiful. He says now, the cream puffs don't disappear. He's bought some recently, and they didn't expire in the fridge. When I saw that, I thought, oh, maybe, maybe Sis isn't here anymore, you know? So I threw them away. This was so poignant to me. People say sometimes grief doesn't hit you immediately. Sometimes you block it out and you don't truly conceptualize what it means for people to be gone until some mundane event sets it off. Like this, this idea absolutely breaks me. When I was growing up, my grandmother repeated a story a few times to me on the day that she realized her dad was dead. She talked about how due to her being the responsible one in the family, she organized and put the whole funeral together herself, did a speech, shook hands. She was sad, but she never cried. It was a weird feeling to her, but I think she accepted it at the time, for herself at least, that he just went to heaven, and so it's not something to be sad over. She had a great relationship with her father as well. She often told me growing up that she sees so much of her dad in me, his sense of humor and his mannerisms. I always wondered what it would have been like to meet the guy, but something he really loved was fishing. He would go out on the boat before I was born and go fishing with my dad and my grandma and her sisters and their husbands or, or whoever wanted to and have these nice little boat trips on the lake. They tried for a few years after his death to keep it going. I remember my sister and I going a few times when we were extremely young, but my grandma told me that the moment she realized that he was truly gone, was when she made an off-handed comment while preparing the boat to get on the lake. She called out to her husband and asked if he had called her dad yet to see if he was almost there. After she realized what she'd said, she started bawling her eyes out. A whole year had gone by, and finally it hit her. 
down to something that defined in so many years of her life. That is death. That is grief. It's not always dramatic or immediate. It doesn't always make sense or hit us how we expect it to. I cry all the time when I watch movies and TV or play video games, but it took me over a month to cry over my parents' divorce. You rarely see that sort of thing, though, portrayed so well in media. This type of grief that is a slow burn, because movies and shows have to fit a runtime. They have to keep the attention, and for many, this form of grief seems foreign. But Naoki Konishi captured here more than I ever expected, in as something stupid as cream puffs, but that's how it is. Oh, maybe Sis isn't here anymore. There's no one to eat them, so they need to be thrown out before the mold sets in. He asked himself what would be best for his sister and himself, and while you get the choice, the answer he reacts to well is to take action. Now that he's opened up to you about this, he finally seeks to resolve the different things weighing on him so he can take action, the actions he wants. The first thing is him finally seeing Juness for himself, finally understanding more about where Saki went, and another is him reconciling that someone he hates and might continue to, Yosuke, actually has a lot in common with him. That even when he least expects it, he isn't truly alone. There are eyes out there who will watch him and take care of him, instead of judge and pity him. Then he visits the scene of her murder and comes to terms with the fact that different people react to different grief, well, differently. That he's not a cruel person, an unloving person. The fact he didn't cry doesn't make him evil or wrong, that's just because he's not some TV character. But because of that, it doesn't make him immoral. His acceptance of this leads him to realize he was punishing himself as much as the outside world was crushing him with their kindness. He wasn't allowing himself to really think about Saki's passing. It felt better to avoid his feelings and tell himself that he's a bad person than explore them, but now that he has thought about it and opened up, the floodgates are opened. He admits that he wanted her to live more, that she probably wanted to live, that he should live for her, not because of some stupid housewife telling him, but because he loved his sister. And so we reach the final rank. When you meet him at the Samagawa River for his final rank, he's clearly done a lot of crying and reflecting on his past with his sister. He mentions a story about her crossing the river by being agile and jumping from rock to rock, and how he was too scared and stayed on the other side. When Saki would try brave new things, and he, as the younger of the siblings, was too scared, he would cry. He says it feels like that now. Sis has crossed the river, but he's still here. But no matter how much he cries or punishes himself over it, she's never coming back. I've been trying not to think about it all this time. But I finally feel like I can face reality. He thought that there was no point to his life, or direction, but he's been able to grasp a direction now, and feel hopeful knowing that someone out there is willing to devote time to him, to let him know that he mattered. He's going to work on unifying his family, and helping them move through the grief the best that he can. He's going to work hard in school, help out at the store when it's an option. He's going to do more, and help the loved and precious ones he still has. Back to trivia! You didn't forget, did you? The only interaction we see with Naoki and Saki at the beginning of the game, without portraits and without names, what are they saying? Hey, do you know where my snack went? I left it in the fridge, but it's gone. Oh, I ate it just now. I thought it was leftovers. What? No, it wasn't leftovers. I, I was making sure to save that for later. And so on. It mentions how it seems that they're having a sibling dispute. And this is just... Honestly, chef's kiss for the writing of Persona 4. The fact that the seventh rank of an optional social link would be described and disguised in casual dialogue so early in the game is still one of the things I think you can't ever take from Persona 4's writing. It's one of those things that contributes to the idea of Inaba being a living world that I have another segment on. And that's Naoki. 
Someone burdened by the grief of his sister's passing, both by weighing expectations of his peers and his place in the town, and by himself through a self-hate over being sad the wrong way. Someone who learns not to punish their own happiness, to do their best to assist others, to honor the memory and keep carrying the torch from their side of the river. If you couldn't tell by the astronomical length of this individual segment, I felt that I had a lot to say, but we're still not done yet. So as you've seen with the previous segments, we're going to be addressing Naoki's Arcana, the Hanged Man, and try to apply the meanings that mirror him and his mentality and his growth. First, I should have clarified that the hanged man does not refer to a man being hanged, but a man simply hung upside down. This position often refers to inner peace and a meditative-like state, with things like the halo contributing to that feeling. The man part in Hebrew roots to a place that can also mean mind, so the idea of one's inner self, their mind being apart, suspended from the world below them, and seeing things from a place separate from themselves is important. You can see how this ties into Naoki with his views on grief. He's not evil or wrong to not grieve like those he's seen on TV and elsewhere, but in a negative way, he judges himself as being not a part of the world, and refuses to give merit to the real root of his feelings. The card also refers to entering a new phase in life accompanied by sacrifice. As morbid as it is, this is actually pretty clear. He lost his sister and now has to find his new direction and new way forward, as this place he once knew is completely changed for him. This sacrifice is also linked to death, or rather death and sacrifice are used fairly interchangeably, as death is actually the next arcana after the hanged man. This one is going to sound kind of wacky, so I just had to throw it in here. Apparently, the legs make an upside-down cross, and the arms and head form a triangle. This is the symbol of sulfur in alchemy, and inverted as it is on the card, refers to the completion of one's self-transmutation. Obviously, these games and characters are all on some level about change and growth as a person, so it connects in a general way, but also the way that it was specifically represented on this card to me felt really hardcore. On the higher polarity, this card has to do with getting out of your own way, something Naoki did tremendously as he pushed everyone away and punished himself for something that ultimately wasn't wrong or his fault to begin with. In the lower polarity, it represents extreme anxiety and isolation, the belief that you only have yourself to rely on, and which also matches Naoki's loneliness, partly caused by the townspeople of Inaba around him and partly by himself. Hello and welcome once again. We are coming up on one of my favorite segments and on my favorite character, Naoto Shirogane. Um, I just wanted to, I guess, give a better introspection into the experience of making this series. It's the biggest thing I've ever done in my entire life. It's the most work I've ever put in, in my entire life. And it's the longest I've ever focused on something in my entire life. It's a, it's really, this is a big deal to me, as silly as it is, as, you know, as likely as it is that people will just take a screenshot of the timestamp and meme about it on Twitter, but uh, this means a lot to me. I, I love this series, and I feel like I proved something to myself by being able to do this. Not only that, but I love doing this. Uh, I want to say this specific segment, I have to thank everyone who stuck by me already and who's with me um, through thick and thin. Whenever I was in 2020, my main YouTube channel blew up and I was able to have quite a few people in my streams, but slowly things started dwindling a lot. And by the time that I started my P4G series, uh, things had dwindled to 50 and 40 and 30. And eventually I was sitting at around 20 people, 10 to 20 in my streams. Uh, still though, there was quite a handful of people who continued supporting me, whether they showed up at every single stream, or would send me nice messages, or art, or obviously donations. Uh, it was a ton of help. After about five months of working really hard on the series, I actually ran into like some pretty major health issues. Uh, I went to the emergency room and they told me there was no problem. Uh, and then it persisted, and they gave me opiates. And I went to the emergency room again, and they said there was no problem. And then finally, I literally collapsed on the floor, and I couldn't walk. And a uh, 
an ambulance had to take me to the emergency room where I had emergency surgery in order to save an organ at like three in the morning. Uh, awful. That's horrible. Uh, put me in a bunch of debt, made me basically immobile for like a month. Um, but through all of that and those financial hurdles and issues, uh, through the dwindling support, there were still like people who stuck by me. And so, um, I, I just want to mention a few people here, uh, that I really, really am grateful for who supported me. Um, I'm not going to do a huge list, uh, mainly because I will always leave someone out. And so if I do a smaller list, I feel like people will feel less bad if I don't mention them. Because there really are, I mean, there's a few dozen people I could mention easily. Um, but a few stand standouts that I wanted to mention who were here basically every single day for multiple years, who sent beautiful heartwarming gifts or donated in order to keep me even financially viable at all to this point, that even made it possible for me to finish this series. Those people, Yuki, Hatchling, Flea Meep, Niku Nicole, False, Daniel Frousing, and of course, so so many more, so many more. I feel like um, there's a lot of weird talk about parasociality and parasocial relationships. And uh, considering the pandemic and everything that happened for multiple years, I spent almost all my time completely alone making content that I loved. Uh, barely seeing real people in real time. So legitimately, I talked to some of these people through Twitch uh, more than I talked to my own family and my own like supposed like best friends or whatever. So I kind of I kind of developed like a reverse parasocial relationship to uh, a number of people. Uh, so I just wanted to say thank you uh, formally. In the biggest project ever, you are now immortalized. Uh, and for any of you who have just found this video or just recently come across, uh, I really appreciate any support that you've already given or uh, maybe will continue to do in the future. Thank you so much again to all my patrons. Uh, literally, that's the only... I wouldn't be able to pay rent for many months if uh, Patreon didn't exist. So, thank you. Let's get on with my favorite segment. <laughs> 